Adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. who went past the third grade surely must remember the thinkings of the great thinker, Hypotenuse. It was he who said, Tibi fumis obsidio septum doro. Which roughly translated means everybody can do something. How very true that is. Take Otis Gum of Owl's Eye, Nebraska, for example. He can put six flashlights in his mouth at one time. <laughs> And let us not forget Adler Suggins. Mr. Suggins went over Niagara Falls sitting on a large bagel. No one had ever done that before. Adler Suggins only did it once. Hey, Bullwinkle, did you read where Adler Suggins went over Niagara Falls on a bagel? That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Didn't think they made those big bagels anymore. No, I meant it was amazing he went over the falls. Oh, shucks, that's nothing. Everybody can do something. It's like Hippopotamus said, Tubafungus Obsidian September daddy -o or something. Oh, yeah? Well, what can you do? For one thing, I can remember everything I ever ate. What did you have for breakfast two weeks ago today? Six pancakes, four eggs sunny side up, a slice of ham, three hot dogs, a bowl of chili, and a raisin cookie. Golly, that's amazing! Just talent, I guess. Of course, Rocky and Bullwinkle didn't know it then, but the simple fact that Bullwinkle can remember everything he ever eats is about to cause them both big trouble. For at that very moment, in the underground hideout of Boris Badenov... Boris, are you in that trunk? Nobody here but us souvenirs. Stop hiding, Boris. Fearless Leader is calling on radio. I can't talk to him, Honeybun. Fearless Leader is mad with me because I still didn't get Elliot Ness. Don't be silly. He can't bite you over radio. Oh, boy, you don't know Fearless Leader. <clears throat> Hello, handsome Fearless Leader. I like you better than any Fearless Leader in the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I bungled last three foreign intrigue jobs, but I, but I don't want to be liquidated. You know I can't stand pain. One more assignment. Honeybone Fearless Leader is giving me one more chance. Good for you, darling. I have pencil, Fearless Leader. Shoot. I mean, <laughs> what is assignment? Yes? Yeah. Got it. And don't worry, Fearless Leader. This time I will not fail. Cross my heart and hope to die. I was afraid you'd say that. Bye-bye, Fearless Leader. What is new assignment, Boris? Kill moose? No, steal formula. What formula? Who cares? Any formula. Boris couldn't have picked a better day to look for a formula, for in another part of the city, one Dr. Bermuda Schwartz was testing his new invention for the army. Now, when I push this plunger, that bridge over there is going to blow up with a million pieces. Very well, Doctor. Let it go. All right. Amazing, that bridge blew up without a sound. <laughs> I thought you'd notice that. Congratulations, Doctor. You have invented the first silent explosive. I call it Hushaboom. And you've got to admit, it's a little bit different. Now, it's very difficult to keep a thing like a silent explosive quiet. So when the three o'clock paper hits the streets... X-ray, X-ray, Hushaboom goes over with bang. Read all about it. A silent explosive. Oh, how nice. Well, that does it, Natasha. Professor Bermuda Schwartz is target for tonight. And the villain skulked off toward the professor's laboratory, little realizing that our heroes were heading toward it from the other direction. What will happen when they meet? We'll find out next time in Boomtown or Destination Schwartz. <laughs> Hey, Rocky.
Mikey, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Not enough must leave. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Once in a kingdom, on a street, there was a potter's shop. The reason that it was a potter's shop is because there was a potter inside who made pots. All day, every day, the potter made big pots, little pots, round pots, and square pots. I don't know why I make these square pots. Nobody ever buys them. Because his whole life was built around pots, the poor potter had developed a boiling temper. Each night when he'd finished his work, he would slam shut the door of his shop, grumble his way along the street. Grumble, grumble. Enter his house with a slam of the door and say to his wife, Where's my dinner? On the table, dear. Curds and whey? I hate curds and whey. But, dear, you hate everything. Huh? Oh, that's right. Give me a spoon, baby. Then, when he'd finished dinner... All right. Where is it? Here it is, dear. And his wife would hand him a pot that he would smash into a million pieces. There. Now I can read the paper. Following this, the potter's good wife would always say to him, John, I do wish you'd do something about that temper of yours. It's going to get you into trouble someday. He would answer, Bah! The following day, as he grumbled his way toward home, Grumble, grumble. He chanced to bump into a witch who was taking her sick bat to the veterinary. And, of course, he flew into a rage. Why don't you watch where you're sneaking? Well, you witches are all alike. Hog the whole road if we'd let you. You don't scare me, and that goes for your bat. Furthermore... Well, now it was a short time later that the potter's wife was in the backyard gathering wood when... My, John is home already. And she hurried into the house. Hello, John. Anything happen at work today? Nothing that I would care to talk about. Why, John, you've been turned into a frog. I was hoping you wouldn't notice. Uh, what am I going to do, dear? Hop yourself right back to that witch and tell her you're sorry. Maybe she'll take pity and break the spell. Willing to try anything, the potter hopped off down the road to the witch's house. Unfortunately, that time of year was the season for witches, and he hadn't gone too far before he met a second witch. <laughs> I think I'll turn you into an ogre. No, no, I'll run and hide. It was too late, but with a wave of her crooked stick, Jimmy. the old witch turned him into an ogre. Say, nice job, even if I do say so myself. Well, now I can knock off for the day. Ta-ta. Now the poor man was in more trouble than ever. And it wasn't over yet. Hi, ogre. Don't call me ogre. I hate being an ogre. Oh, well, shucks, I can fix that for you. You mean uh, you'll change me? Sure. And she did. Into a troll. There you go, kid. Now you can go live under a bridge and scare billy goats. Even though he was now a troll, he didn't have the slightest interest in living under a bridge. All he wanted to do was to get home without meeting any more witches. But that, it seemed, was impossible. Say cheese! Don't say it! You were gonna cast a spell on me! How did you know? A lucky guess. And waving her wand, she cast the spell, turning him into a handsome prince. Say now, things are looking up! But not for long. For the witch that just turned him into a troll saw this, and she became very angry. What's the idea of breaking my spell? When I change him into trolls, they stay trolls! How dare you! I say handsome prince! Troll! Prince! Troll! The next time around for the prince, I am gonna cut out! Prince! The second he turned into the handsome prince, off he ran as fast as he could go. He had made it to the town and was just a few blocks from home when... Oh, you blockhead! You are a nut! Why don't you... 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 Too late. Too late did he realize that it was the same little witch who had turned him into a frog in the first place. Ma'am, would it help to say that I'm sorry? I guess not. Sadly, the potter went home to his wife, resigned to the fact that he would live out his days as a frog. This, of course, would have been a very unhappy ending, except that this is a fairy tale, and in fairy tales, beside witches, ogres, and the likes, there are good fairies. Good potter.
daughter. It was letting your temper boil over that got you into all of this trouble in the first place. But I think you've learned your lesson. Therefore, I will help you. Boy, it sure feels good to get out of that wet skin. And you, good wife, must always watch your husband to make certain that his temper never boils over again. Farewell. Well, sir, the potter's wife did watch her husband. She watched him when he slept, watched him when he ate, and watched him from morning to night as he made pots in his pot shop. They lived happily from that day to this, and never again did he lose his temper, for, as we all know, a watched potter never boils. Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. Hello there. Today's poem is called... Hey, Moose, how come you always read poetry? Well, it's my part of you the You think you are the only one with soul? Uh, you want to read a poem? Certainly. Today's poem got the title, How to be happy, though miserable. But... Are you almost disgusted with life, little man? But... I'll tell you a wonderful trick. I... That brings you contentment, if anything can. Give me... Do something to somebody quick. Oh! Though it rains like the rain of the flood, little man, and the clouds are forbidding and thick, you can make the sun shine on your soul, little man. Do something to somebody quick. <laughs> But you got the words wrong. It says do something for somebody, not to them. Well, <laughs> after all, in poetry is not the word so much. It's the thought that counts. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Deep in the heart of the Northwest Canadian woods, a mysterious character wearing a cap and puttees was seen skulking. There will be no skulking in these woods, sir. So who's skulking? I'm looking for talent. In the Northwest Canadian woods, talent for what? For majestic pictures. I'm looking for a new matinee idol for the movies. What's a movie? Oh, I forgot you people are so remote out here, you haven't seen a movie before. I haven't seen a movie because there is no such thing, and you, sir, are skulking. So as I was trying to tell the Smiley, sir, I am a talent scout for Majestic Pictures, and I'm looking for the new silent matinee idol, a man who is brave, stalwart, handsome, strong. I'm your man. Trustworthy, cute. Say, this is him. Look at that profile. Why, that's Snidely Whiplash. Snidely Whiplash, eh? Has a nice ring to it. Good box office. Just the man I'm looking for. He's just the man we're looking for, too. Majestic Pictures can do much more for him than you can, sir. Don't stand in the way to boy's career. You haven't signed him to a contract yet, have you? Not exactly. You see, he's the most wanted man in Canada. And I can see why, too. That chiseled nose, that firm chin. Where can I get a hold of this boy? Do you suppose we would be standing? here if we knew. Hard to get, eh? Well, I must have that boy. But how can you, a mere flatlander, hope to get Snidely Whiplash when the Royal Canadian Mounties have been trying to get him for years? What do you have that we haven't? Money? Inspector Fenwick? Yes, Dudley? What's a movie? And Majestic will make me a star? That's right, Snidely, baby. You will be the idol of millions. Sign right here, sweetie. Halt! In the name of the RCMP, I have come, Snidely Whiplash, to bring you in, because the Mounties always get their man. Well, you're not getting this man. I just signed him to a 15-year contract with options. Gee, 15 years. That's a pretty stiff sentence. Snidely Whiplash went to Hollywood to star in silent movies. Overnight, he became a sensation. He was known as Snidely Whiplash, the great profile. He introduced the tango which swept the country. Everybody was doing his famous tango. However, in northern Canada, Snidely Whiplash laid a bum, mainly because the people there had never seen a movie. But his absence was sorely felt by members of the RCMP. 
They were becoming disenchanted. Without Snidely Whiplash, Inspector, there's no incentive to being Mountie. The Mounties have lost their golden life. Why, to bring in Snidely Whiplash was the dream of every young Canadian boy. I know, Dudley, but we must go on somehow. But on the brighter side, a new movie house has been constructed in town. Why don't we run over and take in a movie, Dudley? What's a movie? You are under arrest, Snidely Whiplash, in the name of the Mounted Police! Oh, come, Dudley, it's only a movie. So that's a movie. It seemed so real, Inspector. There he was, arch villain Snidely Whiplash. Oh, Dudley, I hate to be a nag, but don't you think just occasionally you could bring in a man? With Snidely Whiplash gone, they just don't seem important enough to bother with. But then the one thing happened that none of them had foreseen. Talkies. Oh, Snidely, tell me again that you care for me a little. May, may, I would move heaven and earth for you. I would swim the deepest river, scale the highest mountain. Why are they laughing at Snidely, Inspector? It's the voice, Dudley. Can't you see? The voice is so funny. I don't find that it's funny at all. In fact, I think he has rather a pleasant voice. Well, Dudley, I think this washes up Snidely Whiplash in Hollywood. I certainly don't see why. But you can't tear up my contract. I'm a star. And besides, my 15 years aren't up yet. You didn't read the fine print, Snidely Baby. It says, quote, in the event of talkies, if the party of the first part, that's you, talks in any manner, way, or form, like Dudley do right, the party of the second part, that's us, has the option to tear up the contract. Curses foiled again. That's what happens by associating with a do-right. You do wrong, wrong. So Snidely Whiplash had to return to Northern Canada with no more than when he left except a scrapbook. There were no cheering crowds, no band, no welcoming committee. Just one lonely figure standing on the platform, Dudley Do-right. Well, Dudley, I suppose you want to bring me in. Why, no, Mr. Whiplash. All I want is your autograph. Last time you remember, we heard quite a discussion of Bullwinkle Moose's one outstanding talent. You can remember everything you ever ate. Every time I swallow, it's a stroll down memory lane. Meantime, a short distance away, a professor named Bermuda Schwartz had just developed a silent explosive called Hushaboom. This, of course, gave him A1 priority on Boris's hate parade. But, Boris, how are you going to steal the formula? Steal it? He's going to tell it to me. Tell it to you? Why should he? Observe, Natasha. And the wily villain ducked out of sight and reappeared a moment later dressed as an old lady. Boris, this makes him tell you the formula? Certainty. What boy would keep a formula from his own mother? His mother? Who's there? Bermuda, baby, it's time. I know that, but who are you? Burmy boy, you don't know your own mother? Mommy, come in, Mommy. Tell me where you got the mustache. And Boris entered the house with a gullible professor. An hour later, he emerged smiling triumphantly. Boris, you got it? Natch, I got it. What took you so long? I had to bake my boy his favorite cake. You baked a cake? It's the least a good mommy can do. Well, see what you can do about that, mommy. Sure enough, coming toward them were Rocky and Bullwinkle, who, oddly enough, had no idea at all of what was going on. What's all about that? You hear, Boris? They're not even in on the plot. We don't take chances. Come on, I got idea. And the two villains approached the proprietor of a nearby fruit cart. Hey, you want to sell me this fruit cart? Sure, that will cost you $50,000. $50,000? You out of your mind? You got no choice, so you gotta buy it. We do? You in a bad trouble. You stole a formula from a Professor Schwartz, and now you gotta hide from a moose and a squirrel. Hey, how come you know all this? Hey, what do you think? I don't watch the Bullwinkle show. Well, I got no choice. I gotta hand it to you. Okay, let me have it. Boris, he trusted you. Yes, apparently he doesn't watch the show regularly. But I don't understand, Dalek. How will this keep formula safe? Watch carefully. I write formula down on inside of banana. Zip up the peel, tear up the paper. Now all we got is banana. Who would suspect it hides formula? I would. 
Oh, you're sneaky, no good, Natasha. Oh, Boris, you do care, don't you? Hush, here comes Moose and Squirtle. And at that moment, fate played her final card. For instead of passing the innocent-looking fruit cart, Bullwinkle stopped and said, See, I chew like a banana right now. How much are they? B -b 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 bananas? Yeah. We have no bananas today. See, that'd make a great song title. Those are bananas right there. Yeah, how much? They're not for sale. Oh, come on, I'll give you a quarter for one. No. Fifty cents? Bullwinkle, that's too much. A dollar. Well, Boris, I... no. Two dollars. Bullwinkle, no. It's a deal. Boris, no. Pay the man the two dollars, Rock. And Bullwinkle walked off munching a two-dollar banana containing a million-dollar formula. How does it taste? Expensive. Boris, how could you do such a thing? I didn't want to. He took advantage of my crooked nature. This will ruin you with fearless leader. What are you going to do, darling? Moose has ruined Boris, so now Boris will ruin Moose. And a steamroller can do it, too. Be sure to throw to our next episode entitled Flat of the Land, or A Rolling Stone Gathers No Moose. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. As long as you're back anyway, I might as well explain what's been going on. We all know that everybody can do something, even Bullwinkle, who proved beyond a doubt that he can remember everything he ever ate. What did you have for dinner 25 years ago today, Bullwinkle? Uh, moose milk. Boy, you really can remember everything you ever ate. That was too easy, Rock. 25 years ago, I always had moose milk. You were an addict? 
No, a baby. But Bullwinkle is grown up now, and he must learn to face the facts. And the facts are that Boris Badenov has managed to steal the secret formula to a silent explosive called Hushaboom. Then, disguising himself as a fruit peddler, he wrote the formula on the inside of a banana for safekeeping. But unable to resist making a fast buck, he sold the banana to Bullwinkle, who ate it, formula and all. Ruined to the quick, Boris immediately set out to ruin Bullwinkle. <laughs> Any second now, Moose is going to be part of Elm Street. Bullwinkle's gonna get run over by the steamroller. I gotta save him. And with that, the plucky squirrel shot into the air like a pullet. That's bullet. Uh, that's bullet. Boris not only missed the moose, but was unable to find the brakes to the steamroller. You all right, Bullwinkle? Just fine. What happened? Somebody tried to run over you with a steamroller. Oh, a squash and run drive, Ray. Oh, well. <laughs> Bye now. Thanks again. Who's that? This is a manhole, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a man. Rocky and Bullwinkle then crossed the street and entered the drugstore where they knew beyond a doubt they could get a soda to calm their nerves. What they didn't know beyond a doubt was that Boris Badenov and his henchwoman Natasha were under the table. How about a banana split, Bullwinkle? No thanks, Rock. I ate a banana a little while ago with H2O, NH3, C2H5, PDQ, U235, and a pinch of salt written on it. Boris must remembers formula. And so when Rocky and Bullwinkle left the drugstore, Boris was waiting with a fiendish plan to extract the formula from the innocent Moose. Here comes Moose. Let him have it, Natasha. Hey! Hey, what's the big idea of hitting me with a pie? Say, hey, you sound mad. Well, that's funny. I am mad. You can't be mad. Why? Look at that lollipop. What about it? That's really not a lollipop. That's a camera. Really? Sure, you're on television. No! A camera in a lollipop? What's the matter? You never hear of candied camera? Say, then you must be... Right. Alan Fink. Go on, say something to our audience. Well, what shall I say? Just tell us a little about yourself. Like, what was it that you ate about one hour ago? See, folks, about an hour ago, I ate a banana with h 20 h 3 c 2 h 5 pdq u 235 and a pinch of salt written on it. That's it. Come on, honeybone. Flushed with success, Boris ran to the nearest telephone and called Phyllis Leader. Hello, Phyllis Leader. Grab pencil. I got formula. It's H2O. Uh, H2O C. Uh, uh, ooh, I'll call you back. I'm practically liquidated. Who can remember all those numbers? And so, once again, innocence triumphs over evil. And the secret formula is to remain forever safely hidden in the confines of a moose's stomach, never to be heard from again. <coughs> Oh, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that either. What is in can be taken out. Is this really the end of Bullwinkle? Be with us next time for Mac the Knife or Operation Moose. <laughs> Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a man who, upon meeting a friend in the streets of the kingdom, said, Achoo! And his friend, knowing the proper thing to do, of course, said, Gesundheit! At exactly the same time, in a land far to the east, there was another man who also met a friend on the street, and he said, Achoo! His friend, too, knew the proper thing to say, for he replied, Hello, Charlie! How's tricks? Yes, R2 was his name. R2 had many friends. R2 had great wealth because R2 had the only Chinese restaurant in town that served salami pizza. R2 also had a fine son who greeted him one night with a question. Honorable father, I should like to marry and settle down. May I have you worthy permission? I must have time to think on such a heavy question. I shall give you my answer. In the morning. R2 was unable to sleep that night. He tossed and turned in his bed, fighting to make the decision. By sunup, the following day, he had made up his mind and gave the answer to his son. No. My father wise as boiled owl, but can he give one reason why I cannot marry? 
Yes. And that all being? To have a wife. One must have a house in which to put her. Then inexhaustible son will find a house. Wasting no time, the young man set off to do just that. He had not gone far when he came to a great river, and there, standing on the bank, he met an old man. I must cross this river, young youth. Help me, and I shall tell you a secret of good fortune. Knowing that a secret of good fortune could very well aid him in his quest, the lad agreed. But it was a rougher trip than what the aged one had expected. However, he kept his promise and told the young man the secret. Oh, 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 yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, oh, honorable, hooray, what a fine secret. Following the old man's instructions, the boy hurried off into the forest, where he soon found a grove of lychee nut trees. Picking up one of the lychee nuts that had fallen to the ground, he cracked it open. And with a blinding flash, a fine house popped out. A short time later, he once again stood before his father. No? No! What excuse to being this time? Excitable son has a fine house. Yes, but there is still one thing you need before you can marry. Dollar to chicken fly lice, he say a sweetie. Ah, uh, that thing is a uh, sweetie. You see? Honorable father, wait right here. Swift son, be right back. <laughs> Quickly, returning to the grove of lychee nut trees, he selected the largest lychee nut he could find. Then, with a sharp rap, he cracked it open. And out popped the most beautiful maiden he'd ever seen. Oh, hot diggy dog! What a being a sweetie if ever I see one! This time, R2 found no further objections and at last gave permission for his son to marry. The wedding was held and there was a great celebration. R2's son was now the happiest young man in the land, but it wasn't until after the wedding that he realized that his new wife seemed different somehow. For the first thing she did when he took her to his house was jump into a corner and stand on her head. A uh, big honorable pardon, but why is a former sweetie, present wife, a stand on head? And she answered, Why not? Unable to think of a good reason, he let it go. It was some time later that the young man, while returning from the marketplace with his purse jingling with coins, met a robber. Oh, he knew it was a robber because the rogue wore a mask and very clearly oh, said, Sigamat! Fearing for his life, the lad streaked for home with the robber in hot pursuit. Dashing into the house, he quickly told his wife, oh, This honorable bad guy after me! Oh, please, do not tell him! Frightened husband is hiding with money in cookie jar! Go away, please. I cannot tell you that frightened husband is hiding with money in cookie jar. Oh! A short time later, the robber and the money were gone. His wife was again standing on her head in the corner, but he didn't bother to ask her why. Instead, he said, It's very cold. I wish to warm myself. Uh, please, cookie wife, start a fire. She did. It was in the bedroom, and the house was burned to the ground. This was more than the boy could stand. Who, if I live to be 22, never again will I get a sweetie out of a lychee nut. It was then that his wife did the strangest thing of all. She began to bake fortune cookies over a small open fire. What was so strange about it was that when he broke them open, there were real fortunes inside. Oh! Rubies, gold, 1928 nickels, Wilkie buttons, i rich! Yes, he was rich. And the more fortune cookies his wife baked, the richer he became. Of course, his wife still stood on her head from time to time, but the boy loved her, and he called her his bargain, because she was 50% off. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. Hello, poetry pals. I'm wearing this Old Mother Hubbard because today's poem is Old Mother Hubbard. Pretty slick, huh? Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog got none. Hold it, hold it. You mean after five years of watchdog and I don't get a bone? That's what the poem says. That does it. I'm going on strike. On strike? I'll pull out every pooch from Potsville or Paducah. Mother Hubbard unfair to canines. But, but... She's anti-dog. No, I'm Mother Hubbard. Unfair! Now, wait. 
I don't have a bone, but will something else do? Like such as what? So she went to the bread box to get him some bread, but as soon as he saw it... You kidding, he said? So she went to the ice box and hauled out a steak. And as soon as he saw it, he started to shake. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. That's okay, huh? Well, it's not a bone, mind you. Well, then... It'll do, it'll do! Now, here's your new watchdog and contract. How come it's all tattered on the edge? That? Those are the fringe benefits. Drink up your milk, Chairman. I can't, Mr. Peabody. I'm racing my push cart in an hour. Oh, what has that got to do with milk? Well, I don't like to drink when I drive. I'll tell you what, you drink your milk and I'll give you an experience in driving. It's a deal. I wiped off Sherman's mustache and then set the way back and forth for the state of Indiana in the year 1910. Who are we gonna meet, Mr. Peabody? The man who won the first Indianapolis auto race, Barnaby Victor. We entered the way back and arrived at the speedway as the race was about to get underway. Two ancient vehicles stood idly at the starting line. Which car belongs to Barnaby Victor, Mr. Peabody? The one without wheels, Sherman. Mr. Victor, don't you know your car hasn't got wheels? That's all right, Sonny. It doesn't have any gas, either. And sure enough, his machine fell silent. How do you expect to win the race? I don't. Not with carbon dioxide running against me. Carbon dioxide was Spain's most famous racer, a man who would stop at nothing to win a race. Buenos dias, senor loser. Golly, Mr. Peabody, you said Barnaby Victor would win this race. And so he shall, Sherman. We must put tires on the car and refill the gas tank. But there's no time. The starter's ready to wave the flag. Well, I took care of that by switching flags. Instead of the usual one, he waved a flag bearing the words, Hooray for Cornwallis. The police arrested him as a radical, and the track sent out for another starter. Even though the delay was slight, it enabled us to complete our tasks. All set to go, Mr. Victor. He was all set to go, all right, but in the wrong direction. You go that way, Barnaby. Are you sure? Trust me, won't you? The flag was dropped, and the two cars sped off on the first of 500 laps. Barnaby Victor opened up an early lead, one that lasted exactly one lap. He's coming into the pit, Mr. Peabody. Forget something, Barnaby? Sure did. I forgot the ignition key. I had it a minute ago. You mean the key that starts the car? That's the one. But, Mr. Victor, you started your car. It's running now. Is that the key in the ignition hole there? Oh, yeah, there it is. Thanks for finding it for me. You sure he's gonna win, Mr. Peabody? Instead of answering, I focused a pair of field glasses on the track. Carbon dioxide had not only gone into the lead, he was making preparations not to lose it. What's carbon dioxide up to now? He pulled his car to a stop and painted a view of the Grand Canyon on a retaining wall on the far turn, and then he took off. He must be crazy. Hmm, like a fox. When Barnaby Victor saw the picture of the Grand Canyon, he thought he was at a drive-in movie and shut his motor off. Oh, he'll lose for sure now. No, he won't. I grabbed a bucket of paint, dashed to the wall, and splashed it against it. In black letters came the words, The End. Barnaby assumed the show was over and resumed racing. Soon, he had not only caught up, but was out in front. Now, if he can only hold the lead. But he didn't. Dioxide turned on a siren, put on a policeman's uniform, and forced Barnaby to stop. He then gave him a ticket for speeding. By the time we got there, Dioxide had resumed racing. Get going, Mr. Victor. Can't, Sonny. Why not? That officer took my license away. There was no time to argue. The race was almost over. Quick, Sherman, pretend you're feeling faint. Huh? A fainting spell. Have one. Oh, oh, I feel dizzy. Quick, we must get this poor boy to a hospital. But I don't have a license. You don't need one. We got into the car and roared off. Which way to the hospital? Just keep going. I'll tell you when to stop. Even with his foot down to the floorboards, Victor's car was not gaining on dioxide. It was then I noticed the speedometer only went as high as 50. So I simply broke the glass and pushed the needle. Naturally, the car went faster. As we went into the last lap, we forged ahead. Mr. Peabody, our gas tank, it reads empty. And that wasn't our only concern. Carbon dioxide had lit a stick of TNT and threw it into our auto. Put it out, Mr. Peabody. Ah, but instead of doing so, I let it fly in back of us. The explosion occurred just as we ran completely out of gas, but the shock wave picked us up and thrust us across the finish line, victorious. 
Barnaby Victor had won the race and carbon dioxide was banned from racing. Did Mr. Victor ever race again? No, Sherman. As soon as he crossed the finish line, he headed for a gold mine he owned in the hills and was never seen again. How come? Well, look, Sherman, the road only goes one way. And he never came out of that hole in the ground? That's right. Sherman, you are now looking at a one-track mine. Out of ten doctors agree that stomach trouble is both universal and profitable, but... Bullwinkle, what are those little A's and B's? The A stands for apple. And the B? Stands for banana. I ate one on St. Swithin's Day. When? St. Swithin's Day, 1943. Wow! Yes, Bullwinkle has the rather unique ability to remember everything he eats. The trouble is that Bullwinkle ate a banana on which Boris Badenov had written a secret formula. I will get formula back even if it kills Moose. Oh, I am so happy you see things my way, darling. Let's go. Boris, wait! On the corner. Wait on the corner for what? He's a policeman. How do we get past him? Fui! Who's scared of policemen? And folding his switchblade knife and putting it in his hat, the smug Boris walked right up to the policeman and said, Officer, would you hold my hand across the street? Certainly, little fella. Say, that's quite a mustache you got there. My mommy drew it for me, didn't you, mommy? That's right, darling. Well, give me your hand, little lad. Take my hand. I'm a stranger in Steubenville. And the unsuspecting policeman led Boris and Natasha right across the street. There you are, me bucko. And the kindly policeman patted Boris on the head. Unfortunately for the villain, his switchblade knife had a hair trigger and... <laughs> Say to Aunt Agnes McGee, what's that? It's a fingernail file. A 12-inch nail file? I got 12-inch fingernails. Come along with me, you're under arrest. As a spy? No. As a crook? No. As a killer? No. What then? As a juvenile delinquent. And so Boris Badenov's scourge of civilization was taken to juvenile hall, given a hot bath, dressed in sleepers, and tucked in for the night. Next day he appeared in court, was lectured by the judge, and his switchblade taken away. Then he was released in Natasha's custody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, Natasha, the disgrace. Me, world's greatest villain, a juvenile delinquent. What will fearless leader say? Well, oh, cheer up, sonny. You'll... Don't call me sonny. Boris Badenov, calling Boris Badenov. There he is now. Fearless leader. Hello, fearless leader, old body boy. You got secret formula yet, Badenov? Not yet, but any minute now, you know me. That's why I keep checking up. Well, your time is running out. Goodbye, sonny. Oh, boy. Well, of course, now Boris knew he had to get Bullwinkle off to some deserted spot where the police wouldn't see him. Okay, here is what we do. Boga, roga, boga, doga, boga, roga, boga, boga. I can't understand the word you say, Boris. Speak up! Ooh, I said, boga, roga, poga, doga, boga, roga, boga, doga. That's what I thought you said. You think I'm gonna let every Tom, Dick, and Gordon in on the plot? Apparently not, for just a short time later, a familiar-looking figure pedaled a bicycle up to our heroes and said, Telegram for Moose, telegram for Bullwinkle. Here, boy. Sign here. Okay. You're supposed to sign name. That's an X. It's my middle initial. Oh. And here's a nickel for your trouble. Nickel? Couldn't you make it a dime? I got two wives and baby goldfish to support. Make it seven cents. Okay, I give up one wife. Cheapskates. What does the telegram say, Bullwinkle? Oh, boy, get a load of this. Congratulations, you have been chosen to spend a free weekend at Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge. Signed, the management. Isn't that nice? Well, no. For if Bullwinkle had only known anybody who spent a weekend at Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge stayed there permanently. But we'll find out more in our next episode, Two Days to Doom or The Last Weekend. <laughs> Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
Poop. Go the way for me again. Well, see you next time. Ready, Bullwinkle? Owie! Poop. of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. started when Bullwinkle swallowed a banana containing a formula for a silent explosive called Hushaboom. Now Boris is trying to get it back by hook or by crook. I got a choice. And in our last episode, the boys had received a mysterious invitation to a free weekend at a mountain lodge. Wait a minute. Why would Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge offer you a free weekend for no reason at all? Who cares? Never look a gift kitchy itchy in the mouth, I always say. It was 17 hours later that they arrived at what they thoroughly believed was to be a carefree weekend. No, just a free weekend. Are you sure this is Lake Kitchy Itchy Bullwinkle? Not really, no. There's no lake. There's nothing here but that big old run-down house. We'd better go back. But at that moment... For he's a jolly good moose, for he's a jolly good moose, for he's a jolly good moose, which nobody can deny. Welcome to Kichi Ichi Lodge. Gee, who are you? Who else? I am Egbert Kichi Ichi himself. <laughs> kind of a funny name, isn't it, Brock? Kichi Ichi? No, Egbert. If this is really a lodge, where are all the other guests? There are no other guests. It's the middle of the slow season, isn't it, Hannibal? Yes, Egbert, darling. When is your slow season? From 1926 to 1982. But look at it this way. I can spend all my time just taking care of you. <laughs> <laughs> thoughty, mighty thoughty. We better be careful, Bullwinkle. I'm afraid he's after you for some reason. Don't be such a worry wart, Rock. Just the same, I'm not going to let you out of my sight. You hear that, Boris? Squirrel is not going to let Moose out of sight. We'll see about that. And he did, too, for after Bullwinkle had freshened up... Well, Moose, you look fresh as wireless. How would you like to step out on porch to see the view? Why, I think that would be lovely. Bullwinkle would have stepped out onto the porch, but for one thing, there was no porch. Plunging down two stories, the endangered moose landed in a carefully prepared tub of cement waiting at the bottom. Now what, darling? We fan him until he's dry. And that being a fast-drying cement developed by some gentleman in Chicago in 1928, it wasn't long before... Ah, there's a rock. Now to crack him open. Stand back, Hannibal. With a well-placed blow from a hammer, the cement split down the middle and fell into two perfect halves. Big deal. So now what you got, Boris? A perfect moose mold. That's what. And putting the cement mold together, Boris poured in a lifelike when dry plastic. When he had finished... Boris, you have made a dummy that looks just like other dummy. Uh, I mean, moose. Right, and that is how we fool Squirrel. You ho, Bullwinkle, where are you? Here comes Squirrel now. Quick, we take moose to basement. Bullwinkle, I thought I told you to wait.
wait for me. Bullwinkle? Bullwinkle, why don't you answer me? <laughs> now, Moose, I got you where I want you. What do you say to that? Why don't you answer me? Why didn't you say something, Bullwinkle? Why does he just stand there like a dummy? Dummy? Darling, you don't suppose. Oh, boy. Please, Moose, don't shut up your mouth. Could it be that I got the dummies mixed up? We'll find out in our next episode entitled Two Mooses Loose or Which One Has the Phony? There once lived a king who almost became famous for inventing the game of golf. It occurred to him one day that it might be fun to strike a ball with a stick, so he did just that. The ball flew into the air, sliced, and fell into a deep thicket. I goofed. Each time he hit the ball, the same thing happened. I goofed. I goofed. I goofed. I beg your pardon, sire, but what is that you're doing? Why, it's uh, quite simple. I'm playing a round of goof. He was close, but not close enough. He did, however, become famous for something else. It happened one morning as he was playing 17 holes of goof when his ball, which sliced as usual... If ever I catch the blockhead who broke my window, I'll... I am the blockhead who broke your window, and you will what? Y your Highness, I... I... Well, I'll just have to say, you certainly are truthful. The word of this deed spread through the kingdom like wildfire. The king told the truth. Told the yes. truth. yes, we have a truthful king. The truth. <laughs> that wasn't all, for when the king said to the butcher... I'm sorry that I broke your window, and I promise that I will pay for it out of the tax money. Early the next morning, the... Hear ye, hear ye, all butchers in this shop. It's time to pay the weenie tax. Already, it seems like I paid the weenie tax just yesterday. You did, but it's time again. The butcher paid the king the 20 wrinkle weenie tax. That is for the window I broke yesterday. The king kept his promise. Kept his promise. Kept his promise. Thus it was that the king became famous. The king was very proud of this reputation, but it was soon to lead him into a tragic situation. For in the woods, just out of town, there lived an old witch who was the best evil witch in the land. One day, as she was in the woods walking her bat, she chanced to see the king who was out for his daily round of goof. Three! And the witch fell in love. Oh, boy, are you good looking! Please, don't talk to me in my backswing. That's a nasty slice you got there, but I don't care, I'll marry anyway. What are you, a comedian or something? No, I'm an ugly old witch. Well, I noticed that. Now go away, you're goofing up my goof game. The witch knew that the only way she could get the king to marry her was by trickery. So, mixing a special brew, she was waiting when the king came out to play the following day. No sooner had she drunk the mixture when... She turned into a beautiful princess. When the king approached, looking for his goofball... Uh, pardon me, ma'am. Uh, did you happen to see a... Boy, are you good looking! I know. Do you want to get married? Heck yes. Promise? I promise. Happy as the king, the king hurried her back to his castle to prepare for the wedding. Unfortunately, the spell that she had cast upon herself was a short one, and when the clock in the tower struck twelve, the spell was broken. Surprise, honey bun! You! Oh, good grief, I'm a victim! A handsome victim! And you still have to marry me because you promised! <laughs> it was true, for being the king who never broke a promise, he knew he was trapped. Quickly, calling a meeting of his royal advisors, he demanded that they find a solution to his problem. There is only one way, Your Highness. You must get the magic wishbone from the Black Castle, but it will be very dangerous. Uh, what kind of dangerous? Well, you've got to defeat a dragon, a few ogres, you know, the usual thing. Well, just tell me where to go. I'll do anything. In less than an hour, the king was ready and on his way. The mere thought of having to keep his promise to marry the witch gave him the heart of a lion, and in less than two hours, he had defeated a dragon, an ogre, and a troll. Hey, what's a big idea? And a troll. Sighting the black castle, he dashed inside, and there, just as he had been told, he found a huge magic wishbone.
He turned to his own castle just as his wedding to the witch was about to start. Come on, sweetie. They're playing our song. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, before we go, I want to make a wish. A wishbone? How nice. Ready? Ready, honey bun. They gave a tongue. And just as it usually happens in fairy tales, the good guy got the biggest half. I got my wish! <laughs> good for you, honey bun. What did you wish? I wish that I had never promised to marry you. So now I have never promised to marry you, and I don't have to marry you without breaking a promise, uh, if you know what I mean. As confusing as it was, she did know. Who are you? Well, just for that, I am going to cast a spell on you that folks will talk about for years. And when the smoke cleared, she had disappeared. Well, now, it goes without saying that the king never made another promise. He played goof happily ever after. And one day, he even made a hole-in-one. I goof. I am Mr. Know-It-All. Today, for all you golf addicts who are having father-in-law trouble, I am going to show you how to shoot par. <laughs> Arriving at the golf course, we seek out the services of a caddy, preferably a big, strong one. Hi! Or a little weak one, as the case may be. First, I shall demonstrate the neophyte golfer's worst habit. Hand me my driver, caddy. Yes, sir. Now hand me a cup of tea. Cup of tea? What are you going to do with that? I am going to tee off. <laughs> That done, we now hit the ball. Gee, you missed. I know, which proves you should never drink when you drive. Having finally hit the ball, we discover it has landed in some thick woods. Therefore, I choose an iron for my next club. Here you are, Mr. Nora. That isn't an iron, you silly caddy. This is an iron. The iron will not only flatten out your swing, it <laughs> also flattens the golfer, or golfee. Tough luck, Mr. Nordahl. It went right into the sand trap. The only effective way to get the ball out of a sand trap is by blasting. Mr. What do you know? A hole in one. One moose, that is. Buenos dias, caddy. Where are you going, Mr. Nordahl? I'm going to play in a tournament down in Tijuana. Tijuana? I never heard of a tournament down there. Oh, come now. Everybody's heard of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a... Not that lesson. <laughs> this lesson. Snidely Whiplash, that scandalous, nefarious, odious, obnoxious, villainous villain of the Northwest had outdone himself. He had become so shockingly despicable that he couldn't stand himself. You are rotten to the core, Snidely Whiplash. Rotten, rotten, rotten! How did I ever get started tying ladies to railroad tracks? If I could only stop, but I can't stop. I've got this thing! I've always told you, Dudley, that Snidely Whiplash was a bad day. Yes, you have, Inspector. Well, I have invented a Snidely catching machine. And it's a beauty. How does it work, Inspector? Well, you see this dummy woman here next to the railroad track? Yes. Well, Snidely isn't going to be able to resist trying to tie her to the railroad tracks. He has a thing about that. So what will happen? Try it, Dudley. All right. Oh, oh, ah, oh, ah. I am bored, bored, bored. Why don't you go read a book? Is that all you can tell me? Go read a book? Well. Sometimes, Dudley, I don't think you realize just how hard it is being inspector of the RCMP, having to constantly make decisions, decisions, decisions. Could you make a decision about getting me out of this thing? Nell took her father's advice and did read a book. In fact, she read hundreds of books. And since the only books the RCMP had were books on law, Nell developed a fabulous legal mind. Meanwhile, Inspector Fenwick and Dudley put their snidely catching machine to work. You don't know how I hate myself for doing this, but I've got this thing about tying ladies to railroad tracks. Caught at last. Oh! 
Oh, Inspector Fenwick, you don't know how happy you've made me. I've been a fiend. If I'd kept it up, who knows where I would have ended. Release that man. What? You got no habeas corpus, and by judicature, this man has right to bail. I've told you, Nell, about using language like that. There'll be no profanity here. I am here to see that justice is administered. Please, Nell, really, I'm better off here. I'm a lady-tying fiend. Aha! Uh -huh. Forced you into admitting that, eh? What did they use, a rubber hose? Well, never mind. It will never stand up in court, Whiplash. In, in court? court? Oh, confound you, Dudley. Standing there with your placid, noble face, we may lose this case. I may have a placid, noble face, Inspector Fenwick, but just how can we win it? Let me ask you this, Dudley. How do you fight logic? Well... By superior deception. Deception, sir, but we're the good guys. Superior deception. Now, I'll be the prosecuting attorney and you'll be the judge. Don't you see, Do-Right? We can't help but get a conviction. But, sir, is that playing it the Canadian way? Order, order in the court. Will everyone please rise? Prosecutor, are you prepared to state your case? I am, Your Honor. Defense attorney, are you prepared to state your case? I am, Your Honor. And so Inspector Fenwick brought forth witness after witness, professing to the nefarious, odious, obnoxious, villainous character of Snidely Whiplash. And every time Nell Fenwick tried to object... I object, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Her objection was overruled. It looked like an open and shut case. Everyone in the courtroom knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Snidely Whiplash was as good as behind bars. But then, Nell spoke. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've come to speak not of the man you see before you, charged with a heinous crime of tying little old ladies to railroad tracks, but of Snidely Whiplash, that little Canadian boy running through the Canadian forests with no mother or father to take care of him, all alone, whose only pastime was to tie the mountain daisies together and to decorate the little forest animals, for they, ladies and gentlemen, were his friends. Tying things became a mania with him. He started to tie all sorts of things. Boy Scout knots, Boy Scouts, and finally, ladies to the railroad tracks. Your Honor, we know tying ladies to railroad tracks is wrong, but who's to blame? If we could have guided this poor barefoot boy, his only friend, a bunch of wild daisies, where would he have been today? Ladies and gentlemen, that barefoot boy is not on trial here today. You are. Nell! Oh, Nell, you're right. We are to blame. I find that barefoot boy over there not guilty. You mean I'm free to go? Yes, idly, but one thing. Yes, Your Honor. When you're running through the Canadian forest... Yes, Your Honor. Pick a daisy for me. Our story thus far is simplicity itself. What else? Bullwinkle swallowed a secret formula for a silent explosive, and Boris is trying to get it back. Luring Rocky and Bullwinkle to a deserted house, the villain was able to obtain a cement mold of the gullible moose and thus make a lifelike dummy which looked exactly like Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle, will you stop standing there like a dummy and speak to me? What would you like me to say, Rock? You pulled another boo-boo, Boris. I noticed that, but Boris Badenoff never gives up. Back to the basement. I still think Mr. Kitchy Itchy is up to no good. I'm going to snoop around and see what I can find out. Okay, and I'll step out on the porch for another look at the view. Look. Meanwhile, in the basement... Boris, what are you doing with dummy moose? There now, isn't she pretty? Ah, uh, pretty ugly. Not only that, but I fixed it up so that she walks and talks. Watch this. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Pure genius, darling. Now comes best part. I got bomb inside. When Moose makes date with Dummy... Then it's booby trap. Right, and it's about to trap a booby. <laughs> so Mr. Kitchy Itchy is after Bullwinkle. I gotta get upstairs, but fast. But Rocky wasn't fast enough. Come, Natasha. 
All we got to do now is find Moose. That was easy because Bullwinkle was just getting up off the ground outside. The view is lovely, but it goes by so fast. Oh, Moose, somebody here I like you to meet. Who's that, Mr. Kitchy Itchy? Bullwinkle, meet Jane Moosefield. <gasps> Jane Moosefield? You mean THE Jane Moosefield? Who else? I will push button, then leave you two to get acquainted. Run, Natasha. Bomb goes off any minute. My goodness, THE Jane Moosefield. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Friendly little thing. <laughs> leave us go to the kitchen. I shall fix us a bite to eat. My arm, madame. Meanwhile, Rocky had regained his senses and was rushing to find Bullwinkle. Golly, I hope I'm not too late. Would you like me to crumble up some crackers in your soup, Miss Moosefield? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Hello yourself. How about the crackers? Bullwinkle, that's only a dummy. Who cares if she's smart? Get a load of that figure. You don't understand. I gotta get you away from here. And with that, the plucky squirrel pulled Bullwinkle out of the old house and just in the nick of time. For it was then that Jane Moosefield, ticking loudly, crossed the room to the closet where Boris and Natasha were hiding. Bum should have gone off long time ago. I wonder what... Somebody's at door. <coughs> yes? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Well, hello! Look, honey bun, it's Jane Moose. Good heavens! What was all that about? I don't know, unless it had something to do with you remembering everything you ever ate. Oh, stuffy nonsense. By the way, what did you eat last? Uh, JXQTRLP. But Winkle, that doesn't mean anything. Sure it does. It means I ate alphabet soup. But unbeknownst to our heroes, a faraway figure is watching them on a super snooperscope. Pennsylvania must have that formula. We shall use our most ruthless, brutal, cold-blooded scoundrel. You mean... Yes, I go myself. Well, it looks as if our boys have picked up a number one enemy. Tune in next time for The Moose and the Monster, or Nothing But the Pest. <laughs> Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel, and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started.
last time, you remember, Phyllis Leader himself had decided to try to get the secret formula for a silent explosive called Hushaboom from our friends. Observe, Dimitri, you know what this is? This plan of New Pennsylvania skyscraper? Idiot! This is a silhouette of a moose! And here inside the moose is a banana. And you know what is inside the banana? Another moose? No, you idiot. Inside banana is secret formula. Of course. And we've got to steal it. Why? Because they won't give it to us. Very logical. How are we going to steal it? I shall use deception, fraud, double-crossing, and trickery. Of course. It's, it's the Pennsylvanian way. way. Meanwhile, our heroes were just leaving the ruins of Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge. Gee, the whole place just blew up in the air. Bullwinkle, I think that explosion was meant for you. Oh, they shouldn't have done it. No. A simple fanfare would have been plenty. But... Maybe with a few white doves let loose. No, I mean somebody's trying to get rid of you. Well, they've done a good job. What do you mean? I'm getting out of here. And in just a little while, our heroes were aboard a river steamer and heading for home, all unaware that inside Bullwinkle is a banana containing the formula for a silent explosive. However, as the boat rocks slowly back and forth... Bullwinkle, what's happening? You're turning kind of green. It must be spring. <laughs> and H3CO2, you to you three five a pinch of salt. What? I got the hiccups. I guess it must be the banana I ate about four episodes back. <gasps> and each 3 co 2 you truly the about a pinch of salt. But, Winkle, you can remember everything you ever ate. True. So you must have eaten a secret formula. If it's such a secret, how come I keep blabbing it all over? That's what I mean. you got to get rid of those hiccups till we can get to somebody in authority. Is that authority, Wisconsin? Oh, if our friends had only known, they were at that moment being spied on by that arch-villain, that crumb of crumbs, that fiend of fiends... Say the name. <sighs> Boris Badenov. Ta-da! Boris, darling, could you hear formula when Moose hiccuped? No, he's too far away. Come, we sneak a little closer. And just at that moment... <laughs> In the peach salt. Thanks, Brock. You're going to give away the formula for sure unless we find a way to stop your hiccups. Yeah. You know, what we need is a good hiccups, Doctor. Boris, you heard? I heard. Darling, that's your cue. You're supposed to show up disguised as Hiccup Doctor. Natasha, I can't do it. Boris, why not? This time they're sure to recognize me. They never have. 79 disguises I used on those two. Not one did they ever see through. So? The law of averages is turning against me. It wouldn't dare. Boris, you're forgetting Article 6 of the villain's handbook. Article 6? Yes, look here. There is nobody so stupid as the hero of a TV cartoon show. Well, maybe you're right. Come on. As I was saying, what we need is a good hiccup, Doctor. Allow me to introduce myself. Who are you? I'm the ship's medical officer. Ship's doc? Of course they do. That voice! Where have I heard that voice? See, Dalek? I see it, but I don't believe it. No, sir, let's hear that nasty hiccup of yours. And Boris held up a stethoscope which was secretly hooked up to a tape recorder. Will the villains get the formula? Be with us next time for testing one, two, three, or tape a number. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... Ooh. Should have tried E flat. Junior, don't you know dinner's on the table? Oh, please. <sighs> don't mention dinner, Dad. Oh, off your feet, eh? Yeah, thanks to one of your morals. Oh, which one is that? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's not one of mine. Besides, oh. it looks like you've had more than one apple. Oh, but golly, you wouldn't think 14 of them would give you a tummy ache. You would if they weren't ripe. But they are ripe. 
Look how red they are. Yeah, well, the skin may be right, but inside, that's something else. Like I always say, son, you can't judge a book by its cover. These are apples, Dad, not... I'm reminded of a fable I wrote some years ago. The Fox and the Three Weasels. Weasels have a very unsavory reputation, especially three weasels named Tom, Dick, and Larry. They began life behind bars, the bars of a playpen. We have got to break out of here. Yeah, I'm getting stir-crazy, see? I lost my pacifier. That night, when all was still, a rattle with a serrated edge was brought out. And the result was that three errant characters went out into society to launch an unparalleled crime wave. They began by holding up trains that ran under Christmas trees. Next, they robbed piggy banks. They even sank so low as to take candy from babies. Oh, what a haul. Yeah, 11 cents, eh? And 14, all day suckers. But these dastardly deeds brought the minions of the law hot on the heels of the weasel gang. Of all the stupid things. Ah, yeah, we'll be back in our playpen before we know it. And then fate intervened. For just ahead, a bridge spanned a river. Across the river is the state line. They couldn't follow us there. Uh, but, but look at the bridge. Uh, it's like only half completed. So what? Halfway across the state line is better than nothing. Offhanded, you'd surmise that this was the finish of the weasel gang, but such wasn't the case. For a ferry boat happened to be on the river, and the getaway car simply fell to the parking area. But this time, fate wasn't so kind. For that ferry boat was on a sightseeing cruise, and her first stop was Stony Island, home of the state prison. Naturally, the newspapers played it up big, and one of the periodicals came to the attention of Tycoon J. Fox, the canned soup millionaire. Hmm, I could use three lads like those. Indeed he could, for his canned soup empire was tottering. Sorry, T.J., but there's no market for chocolate soup. No, no, Chief. It isn't the alphabet soup the customers object to. It's what the letters spell out when they pour it. Maybe it's your advertising, boss. I mean, a motto that says, it's what we drank on the Titanic. My only salvation lies in winning the annual new soup contest. I've got to come up with a new soup. And then one day, an old janitor who had once washed windows in Tibet swept his way into the Fox's office. What's this, Broomington? Your resignation? No, Mr. Fox, that's an ancient recipe. It shows you how to make the soup of the seven moons. Fox knew a winner when he saw one. There was just one hitch. In order to make this soup, you must get the sprout of a has-been and the pollen from a wallflower. The only way to get them is to steal them. That's where the weasel gang came in. The next morning, the fox paid a visit to their cell. Then you'll get those ingredients for me. Oh, well, sure, but uh, how could we do it from in here? Yeah, wise guy. Nobody's ever busted out of Stony Island. Oh, no. The guards are eating soup for dinner. My soup. At six that evening, the lights came on and the guards went out from eating Fox's soup. The weasels and their benefactor walked to freedom. All right, boys, get going. I have to have that soup by tomorrow morning. The gang did their work well. They returned with their sack full and dumped the contents into a large vat. Now, leave me alone. I've got work to do. The new soup contest was practically over by the time the fox arrived with his vat, and the judges were about to announce the winner. No, do it! Don't say a word until you've tasted this. And that's where Tycoon J. Fox made his mistake. The judge took one small sip and immediately turned blue. My stars, look what's in that vat. There, swimming among the has-beens, were old shoes, alarm clocks, license plates, and alligator wallets. The fox turned to the three weasels. I told you to steal has-beens and wallflowers. And the fox and the weasels went to prison. So you see, my boy, you can't judge a book by its cover. The fable's right, but the moral's wrong, Pop. Mm, what should it be? Too many crooks spoil the broth. Mm. Hi, poetry people. 
Today's poem is the saga of a singing waiter, Tommy Tucker. That's me. Little Tommy Tucker sings for his supper. What shall he have? Brown bread and butter. How shall he... Waiter? Sir? Uh, how's the Irish stew tonight? Oh, the taters are old and the meat is a fright. Everything is left over from Saturday night. We sweep it all up, put it into a pot, and tell you it's real Irish stew that we got. Uh, what about the chicken liver? Way down the farm, the small me river. Far, far away, two, three, four. There they embalm our chicken liver, and that's what you get today. Uh, maybe I'll just have salad with Russian dressing. Russian dressing? Tomatoes, beets, and ketchup. We used to make it red. Just put it on your salad, and you'll wish that you were dead. Hey! Oops. Tommy Tucker, I got something for you. What is it, boss? My brown bread and butter? No. This. How about that? Five minutes on the job, and already I got a raise. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. again. And if you haven't already guessed, it's Peabody and Sherman here. Say hello, Sherman. Hello. Very good. Once again, we are about to take off on another exciting journey into yesteryear. This time, our adventure concerns a very interesting figure. Lady Godiva? Sherman, control yourself. The interesting figure I'm referring to is the infamous but colorful pirate, Captain Kidd. Can I set the Wayback Machine, Mr. Peabody? Why not, as they say on the telly. The year is 1697, the place, the high seas just off the coast of Madagascar. Although the Wayback had been making strange sounds of late, it still functioned perfectly. In a fraction of an instant, we found ourselves standing on the deck of a British merchant ship. There's not a soul on deck! A quick glance told me that Sherman's observation was correct, but looking up, I found the answer. The entire crew was perched high atop the mainmast, and before our startled eyes, all but one dove into space, plunged into the sea, and rapidly swam off in the direction of the mainland. The one who remained then took his dive into space, but his aim was poor. Gee, too bad you missed the water. No, it isn't. I planned it that way. You see, I can't swim. Well, tell me, why were you and the others deserting the ship? I'm the captain. They were the crew, and we're all scared out of our wits. Scared of what, Captain? That blasted showboat heading our way. The captain had good reason to be frightened, for suddenly a cardboard false front dropped, revealing a row of ugly cannons, cannons which proceeded to fire on us. We're being attacked! Yes, and by that rogue, Captain Kidd. You must have something of value aboard, Captain. And there, standing behind the wheel, was a slot machine. It's due to hit a jackpot any second. If Kid gets his hands on it, England will lose a fortune. We must make a run for it. And that's when a cannonball struck us at the waterline, and we began to founder. Rushing wildly about the listing deck, the captain shouted, Don't panic! Keep a cool head! And we did, for at that moment we went under, only to be scooped up out of the water by a large net. Seconds later, we stood facing Captain Kidd, Sherman, myself, the British captain. Har! Before I hit the jackpot, I'm going to give you three swabs a chance to walk to freedom. Oh, I say that's awfully decent of you. Indecent would be closer to the truth, for the walk we were to take was along a plank that stretched out over the water, which was teeming with man-eating sharks, and a few that were dog-eaters, too. Fortunately, the pirate vessel had drifted unnoticed to the shore of an island. Walk! And we did, off the plank, onto the beach, and into the dense foliage. We expected Kid to pursue, but all he said was, Who cares if the sharks didn't get them? They'll never get off this here deserted island. Heave ho, me arties! And with that, they sailed off into the sunset, while the captain frantically ran up and down the beach, shouting, Don't panic! Keep a cool head! Does this mean we're marooned? That's marooned, and we're not. You mean this isn't a deserted island? It's an island, all right. Manhattan Island. Five minutes later, we were inside a cab racing for LaGuardia Airport. Do you think we can get to Kid before he hits the jackpot? If we catch the five o'clock jet, there'll be no problem at all. How do you know where to find him? Well, he has to be at one of two places, Pittsburgh or Tortuga in the Caribbean. We settled for Tortuga because we missed the jet for Pittsburgh. As for Captain Kidd, he hadn't overlooked a thing. We were not only flying in a pirate airplane, but we had a pirate pilot and a pirate stewardess. We landed in Tortuga and were immediately brought before Captain Kidd. Arr! 
I don't know as to how you blokes got off the island, but as soon as I hit this jackpot, I'll take care of you for keeps. Now, you're a sporting man, Captain Kidd. Would you care to make a wager? On what? On whether you hit the jackpot on the first pull. If you do, you get the money, and we are at your mercy. And if I don't? We get the slot machine and our freedom. Mr. Peabody! Quiet, Chairman. Not only that, I'll provide the nickel. That was the straw that broke the captain's back. He took the coin, eagerly placed it in the slot, smiled confidently, and pulled the lever. It came to a stop on a lemon, an orange, and a grapefruit. You lose, Captain. Mr. Peabody, how did you know it would stop on a lemon, an orange, and a grapefruit? Elementary, Sherman. You can see right here on the front it says, Made in California. Mr. Peabody, you have England's dying gratitude, or something like that. From the edge of the pier, we watched the captain and the slot machine, which still hadn't paid off, sail happily back to England. What about Captain Kidd? He gave his promise to give up buccaneering and acquire an education. You mean he went to school? Yes, to Ohio University, where he proudly wore the school sweater with his name on it, which incidentally gave birth to a famous saying. Which saying was that? Oh, you kid. Last time you remember, Bullwinkle got a strange kind of hiccup. <laughs> An H3CO2U235 and a pinch of salt. See? Must be the banana I ate a few episodes ago. True, for that banana had contained the secret formula for the silent explosive Hushaboom. And if that wasn't bad enough... You call? Uh, yes. Boris had just appeared as a hiccup doctor with his stethoscope hooked up to a tape recorder. Come, come, hick right in there. From here, Doctor. Now, wait a minute. That stethoscope is hooked up to a tape recorder. Who says? The narrator says. And he never lies, right? Right. Well, of course there's a tape recorder. I got to consult your case with a lady doctor. A lady doctor? Yes, darling. Who is she? This is Dr. Biotic. Not antibiotic. You guess. Oh, I keep up with the kill bears, you know, and <laughs> an H3CO2U235 and a pinch of salt. Oh, Bullwinkle, you did it. Come on, Natesh, uh, uh, doctor. We got another appointment. What about my hiccups? You need a good scare, is all. So boo, darling. We got to answer emergency call. Bullwinkle, something's mighty funny about those two. That's odd. I don't hear anybody laughing. No, but in a small rowboat pulling away from the river steamer, there were a couple of muffled chuckles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, wait till fearless leader hears this tape, Natasha. It'll make even his ugly puss light up. Oh, he is ugly. Isn't he, Boris? Listen, he's got as bad a case of uglies as you can get. Why, he got aggravated uglies. He's got ugly he hasn't even used yet. <laughs> <laughs> and stupid. <laughs> oh, boy. Bad enough is that you? Oh, bo 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 Boris is fearless leader. On my two way wrist TV. Fearless leader, we were just talking about you. Well, don't. I'm top secret. Where are you, Chiefy? Right over your head. Look up, stupid. You heard him, Natasha. Look up. And sure enough, the sinister black superjet was zooming right overhead. Meet me at the crossroads in half an hour, bad enough. You bet, dear old superior, sir, signing off. Half an hour? We'll have to row pretty fast, Boris. You certainly will. And a one and a two and a big fat shoe and a three and a four. And as the helpless Natasha bent to the oars, back on board the riverboat, our friend friends were still baffled and confused. No, no, that's... that's... a Rocky and Bullwinkle, I know. Think he'd remember after all this time. But just then... You're Rocky and Bullwinkle? No, baffled and confused. Yeah, that's us. Come along with us, you're under arrest. Woofer, woofer! Protective custody. Official Secrets Act. They do? Walk this way. I can't. Why not? I'm knock need. Are you trying to be funny? Aren't you? No. You sure you're on the right program? Understand you can remember everything you ever ate. Oh, that again. Sure I can. Remember eating a banana a little while back? Do I? It had something written on the inside. It said... Grab him, Ben. And before Bullwinkle could move a muscle, he was bound and gagged. Hey, what's a big idea? Army, intelligence. That mean anything to you? Yeah, sounds like a contradiction in terms. Grab him, Joe. And in a trice, Rocky was also bound and gagged. <laughs> 
Well, it looks like a pretty quiet program from here on in. And just because Bullwinkle was going to give the formula for Hushaboom, which is... Grab him, Ben. And in a trice, I... <laughs> and meanwhile, Boris Badenoff is just about to play the tape recorder of the formula for his fearless leader. Tune in next time for the villain's victory dance or the jig is up. Ooh, I love these happy endings. <laughs> Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say. A uh, bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what, like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Episode, you remember some mysterious strangers tied and gagged idiot moose and sneaky little squirrel. <laughs> they also tied and gagged your friendly neighborhood narrator. <laughs> Leaving only us bad guys, eh, fearless leader? You say you got Hushaboom formula from moose? You bet, he's on this tape recorder. Let's hear it. Okay. I got to consult your case with a lady doctor. Hello, darling. That's you, Natasha. Boys, meet Dr. Biotic. Both antibiotic. You guessed. Bad enough if you think I'm here to listen to lousy puns, you... Wait, wait, here comes good part. Oh, I keep up with the kill bears, you know, and <laughs> NH3CO2U235 in a pinch of salt. Oh, Bullwinkle, you did it. There it is, fearless leader. Marvelous. Bad enough, I didn't know you had it in you. You think you're dealing with kids or something? Just for that, we are going to reduce your uncle's prison term to life. You're too good, fearless leader. And what's more, you could call me FL. Wowee! Now play that part back. I'll take notes this time. Okay, FL. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, there's something else. It's nothing, F.L., just a... Silence! <laughs> Wait till fearless leader hears this tape, Natasha. Boris, you didn't turn off machine. Oh, boy. 
This tape will make even his ugly puss light up. What was that? I'll turn it back now. No! He is ugly, isn't he, Boris? He's got as bad a case uglies as you can get. He's got aggravated uglies. <laughs> Pretty funny how I fell. He's got ugly he hasn't even used yet. Well, so much for the jokes. Jokes! Certainly, we were just kidding, FL. Fearless leader, are you bad enough? Of course, fearless leader, I wouldn't presume. This is the end for you, bad enough. Oh, boy. And as for that recorder, take that. And that. There, how do you like that? Ooh. I guess it didn't like it. Now what, Boris? What else? We run like rabbits. Good idea. On second thought, we take secret formula with us. You mean steal it? Why not? Funny, I can't think of a reason. And the two villains dashed off with the precious tape recording. Meanwhile, back on the boat... The chief do yet? Two minutes late. Everything set. Check. Got the moose tied and gag. Right. <laughs> Got the squirrel tied and gag. Right. Funny thing. What? Chief isn't usually late. You're right, that's funny. Funny, all right. Ha, uh, ha, ha. You know, usually the narrator says, and suddenly a familiar figure entered the room and like that, then the chief shows up. I know. Uh, Joe, hmm. only one thing. What? We tied and gagged the narrator, too. <laughs> Better take the tape off his mouth. Yeah. Otherwise, we stop the plot. Then, hmm? might be a good idea. Joe? Yeah? You're a scream. Ha, uh, ha. Uh. Rip the tape off his mouth. Right. No! One thing we forgot. Yeah? He has a mustache. No. Hmm? Had a mustache. And just then, a familiar figure entered the room. Hello, Hello chief. chief. Well, I'd say you got him. Good work, fellow. Good heavens, it's Captain Pinkfuzz. My goodness, what happened to your lip? We'll find out next time in the missing mustache... Our hair today, gone tomorrow. Once upon a time, there was a young prince who ventured into the woods in search of game. Somehow, during the course of the day, he became lost, for he found himself in a part of the forest where he had never been before. He was tired and hungry, and it was growing very late. Just then, he saw a light, and there, a short distance away, stood a great castle. Rushing up the path, he knocked on the huge door. If you're selling weird story magazines, we don't want any. Go away. Wait, wait. I am a handsome prince who has lost his way. Could you spare a 32-course feast in a master bedroom for the night? A prince? Well, in that case, come in. You're just in time for dinner. Taking the lad by the hand, the king led him inside. When they entered the main dining room, the prince was shocked at what he saw. There, there were seven chickens sitting around the table. And they, along with the king, proceeded to peck away at the dishes of corn that sat before them. Eat, boy, eat. What's the matter? You haven't pecked a thing on your plate. I'm suddenly not hungry. Oh, that's too bad. Now, what's that, Florence? <laughs> this is very funny. What happened? Florence just told a joke. Hmm, that's all. Son, I'm glad you came along. I've got a problem. Yes, I noticed that. The king went on to tell the prince an incredible tale of how a witch had come to his castle one dark day and cast an evil spell that had turned all his loving daughters into chickens. Oh, so that's it. Those chickens seven are your daughters. No, no, six of the chickens are my daughters. The seventh one is the witch herself. And here comes the plot. Right you are. The spell on my daughters cannot be broken until I can discover which of the seven chickens chickens is the witch. Well, now, this is the sort of thing that all handsome princes wait for. The next morning, he got up with the chickens and set about his task. It's no use, my boy. Chickens have a nasty habit of looking just alike. And that's true, but they don't think alike. The one that's the witch thinks like a witch. With a plan in mind, 
the prince soon had disguised himself as a beautiful maiden. Your mascara is running, and what's the plan? Simple. I pretend like I'm Snow White. There isn't a witch in the world that can resist a setup like that. Watch this. Lining up the seven chickens, the prince, in his Snow White suit, ran through the courtyard, proclaiming to the top of his voice, I am Snow White. I do so hope that any witch around here that is disguised as a chicken won't give me a poison apple. None of the seven chickens paid the slightest bit of attention but an ogre that happened to be casing the castle did. He saw that this was a chance to cop what he thought was a fair maiden, which he wasted no time in doing. But just then, a handsome knight chanced to arrive on the scene and rushed to the rescue. Never fear, fair beauty, I shall save you! With that, the knight flew at the ogre. <laughs> The prince was saved and his troubles were over. Almost. Ah, oh, fair maiden, you are truly lovely. I know, but knock it off, knight. I'm not a maiden. Your eyes, your lips, your... Okay, you asked for it. Ah, uh -huh, the lady has fire. Wait, dear one, wait, come back. The prince was not used to running with the dress on, but he did manage to make it back to the castle well ahead of the pursuing knight. What happened? Never mind. Help me out of this fair maiden disguise before anything else happens. But before they could do this, the seven chickens came clucking into the courtyard and gathered round the prince to see what the commotion was. <laughs> girls, girls, not now. Go away. The prince grabbed a broom and started swinging to shoo them away. All chickens being afraid of brooms, they scattered like, uh, well, chickens. <laughs> That is all but one. That chicken snatched the broom from the prince, hopped on, and flew it around and around. Whee! Your Highness, look at that. Must say I never saw a chicken do that before. Of course not. Only witches fly brooms, so that's the chicken that is a witch. The prince had guessed the secret, and the spell was broken. Not only did the witch turn back into a witch, but the six chickens were turned back into the king's beautiful daughter. <laughs> Pooper. My boy, you did it. As a reward, I'm going to give you a chest of gold and any daughter you wish to be your bride. Heavens, it's going to be hard to choose. They're all so beautiful. Unfortunately, however, before he could make up his mind, the knight, who still thought the prince was a fair maiden, galloped in and swept him off his feet. Now, lovely one, you and I, we fly away together, up, up and away! No, 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 no! Well, now, needless to say, the poor prince did not get the chest of gold, and he was never to get one of the beautiful daughters to be his bride. Of course, his mother had told him that there would be days like that, but she had forgotten to warn him about the nights. Copycats, today's subject is how to be a star reporter. In order to be star reporter, you got to bring back scoop. You can count on me, Chief. Here is hot scoop. Cover big boat fire at Pier 12. Are you sure there's a boat on fire, Chief? Positive. I lit it this morning on my way to the office. Running up the gangplank of the burning boat, you rush down into the hold where you find the fire burning heavily. This will be the hottest story of the year. Grabbing a nearby can of water, spelled G A S. You dash it into the flames and await results. <laughs> Hello, Chief. About that fire... Got another scoop for you. Rush over to Zoo. His two-day-old tiger cub smoking cigar. Are you sure there's a two-day-old tiger cub smoking a cigar? Positive. I lit it this morning on my way to the office. Dashing to the zoo, you rush into the cage, clearly marked Tiger. E-L-E-P-H-A-N-T, Tiger. Once inside, you proceed to spank the two-day-old tiger which weighs 40 tons and is smoking the longest cigar you have ever seen. Hello, Chief. About that two-day-old tiger. Never mind that. Come back to office. Is man about to jump off roof? Are you sure, Chief? I ought to be. It's me. At last you are to get your scoop. And did you get your scoop, Mr. Know-it-all? I certainly did. I stopped off at an ice cream parlor and got two of them. See? Tutti Frutti and Pistachio. Hello, 
again, Peabody here. The youngster depositing milk in a cowboy hat is my boy, Sherman. You're right, Mr. Peabody. It is a ten-gallon hat. I'm glad you're convinced. Put the hat in the refrigerator while I set the Wayback Controls. Where are we going today? Texas. To get another hat? No, to meet those stalwart right arms of frontier justice, the Texas Rangers. A twist of the dial to the year 1879 was enough to send us rocketing back through time and space until there we were inside the governor's mansion, which should have been in Texas, but was in those days somewhere near Springfield, Missouri. The governor was in conference with Captain R.J. Hotchkiss. How long have you been out on the road trying to sign recruits for your rangers, Captain? Six years. How many did you sign up? One. And that one was a girl, wasn't it? That's what they tell me. Well, I'm afraid the idea of forming a Texas ranger outfit is a waste of time. No, it isn't, Governor. Well, it certainly is if we can't get anybody to join. You leave it to us. We'll form the Texas Rangers. The Governor not only gave us his blessing, but his seat on the Overland stage, which enabled us to get to the city of Laredo, which in those days was somewhere near Newark, New Jersey. Well, Sonny, as you can see, the streets of Laredo are full of cow folks who ain't got nothing to do. How you propose to get them to join up? Like this, Captain. To the Captain's amazement and my amusement, Sherman walked down the dusty street on his hands. Hey, kid, where'd you learn to do that? I got it from the Texas Rangers. And so it went until when he got back to us, he had 22 cowboys with him. Say, the kid here says if we become Texas Rangers, you'll show us how to walk on our hands. Is that so? Say it so, Captain. We'll teach you, and you can teach them. Yep, it's so. Well, it seems Sherman had solved the problem with great alacrity, so we adjourned to the nearest cafe for lunch while Captain Hotchkiss prepared to induct the men. The lunch was good, but what we saw through the cafe window wasn't. Look, Mr. Peabody, it's a wagon full of hurt cow. Cowboys. That's a western ambulance, Sherman, and those hurt cowboys look familiar. Dashing outside, we halted the vehicle. Those men are supposed to be Texas Rangers. What happened to them? Some dang fool named Hotchkiss went and pinned badges on him. What's wrong with that? He made him take their shirts off before he'd done it. Recruiting rangers in Laredo was now out of the question, so we boarded the stage for San Antonio, which in those days was just south of Walla Walla, Washington. Well, I did just like to tell me. I got me some clues so I could stick badges on rangers. You going to perform some more hand-walking, Sherman? No, this time I think I'll try something else. When it came to blowing bubblegum, Sherman was undoubtedly the second best in the world. I don't have to tell you who was first. At any rate, Sherman walked down the streets of San Antonio, blew bubbles in all assorted shapes and sizes, including a definite likeness of a certain moose, who shall remain nameless on this portion of the show. Likewise, I'm sure. And by the time he returned to Captain Hotchkiss, Sherman had collected ten ranger prospects. Say, this little fella here with a talented lip says that if we unjoin the ranger outfit, you'll show us how to blow bubbles like him. Is that true? Tell him it's true, Captain. Yep, it's true. Hotchkiss was about to glue the badges on and swear the men in when a piece of paper fell from his hip pocket and caught Sherman's attention. Wanted the Dallas Kid and his nine rustlers. That's funny, Mr. Peabody. The Dallas Kid and his men look just like the new rangers. I stopped the ceremony just in time. That's right, I'm the Dallas kid. We uns was a gonna get the bubble gum and then revert back to our usual criminal nature. That blessed it, I thought it was too good to be true. Mr. Dallas, are you a good shot? Am I a good shot? If anybody here can outshoot me, me and my boys will sign up to be rangers. Well, that of course left it up to me. We adjourned to a target area and prepared to take our shots. It was then I thought of a brilliant idea. A Dallas! I won't even have to shoot to outshoot you. I venture to say that you can't even hit the aforementioned target. Oh, yeah? Shucks, I could do that standing on one, too. That's a pretty big target, Mr. Peabody. And these are pretty big bullets I am putting into this gun. Here, Dallas, try your luck. Dallas took the weapon, aimed, and fired. The bullet went straight for the target, but just before hitting it, made a 180-degree turn and returned to Dallas. You win, Peabody. Me and my boys are going lawful. How come he couldn't hit the target, Mr. Peabody? Quite elementary, Sherman. I took the precaution of writing the words Dallas Kid on the bullet. And you know what happens when a bullet's got your name on it. An hour later, Captain Hotchkiss and his rangers rode out of town. Did the Dallas Kid make a good ranger? Oh, one of the best, Sherman. But he became even more famous after he retired. You see, he built an amusement park and called it Wonderland. It became so famous, they even wrote a book about it. Really, Mr. Peabody? Well, of course, Sherman. Haven't you ever read Dallas in Wonderland? <laughs> Thank you.
Well, let's see what the score is today, shall we? Phyllis Leader is lying unconscious beside a tape recorder which struck back at him. Boris and Natasha are running away with a tape recording of the formula for the silent explosive Hushaboom. And our heroes have been tied and gagged by a couple of mysterious strangers acting under orders from the chief. None other than our old friend, Captain Peter Peachfuzz. Mm -hmm. What's the matter, Bullwinkle? Cat got your tongue? Do we let him go now, Chief? Well, naturally. But as the gag was removed from Rocky's mouth, he said... Hey, what's a big idea? Who are these fellas? And what's all this about a secret formula? A How fellas? How come you're tight and yeah, Chief. What happened to Put it these back. Why haven't you... Try the other one. Ooh! Hello, Bullwinkle. I said, hello, Bullwinkle. Well, didn't you hear me? Sure, but I don't want to get gagged up again. <laughs> Yes, I know, Rocky, but... Chief. Yes, Joe? We've got to take the gag off the squirrel now. Oh, the SPCA call in again? No, we need the gag for another show. What show? The Unspeakables. Oh, I didn't know they did comedy. Sorry, squirrel. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. You were just doing your duty. You know, Ben? Yeah. He's a true blue squirrel. Salt of the earth. Nature's nobleman. Gets you right here. Let's go. Right. Good Goodbye. Bye. Gee, those fellas are sure deadpan. I don't know. That goodbye was a little hammy. And now on to recover the stolen formula. Yeah, on this, this way. way. Now, wait a minute. We can't all go in different directions. But how do we decide where to go? Easy. Come in here a minute. And the captain led our heroes into the next room where there stood an enormous electronic machine. Pokey smoke. It's the Peter Peach Fuzz Polar Path Predictor Patent Pending. Hmm? It tells you what direction to go in. Well, how does it work? Well, I put a nickel in this end and... Boy, that's pretty impressive. Hush. It's about to give us the answer. Answer? That's your nickel, Captain. Yes, and it's heads. We go this way. And strange as it seems, our friends headed in a beeline straight for an old abandoned warehouse, which just happened to be the secret hideout of Boris and Natasha. Well, Dalek, you ready to put together the first batch of Hushaboom? You said it. Start tape machine. The next voice you hear will be Moose hiccuping and reciting formula. And as he recites, I mix ingredients. Go. <laughs> Hold that! Dolly, what happened? I think I mixed a little too fast, Natasha. Slow it down. <laughs> Sorry, Dolly. Here goes. <laughs> Don't tell me, Dolly. A, a little, little too, too slow. slow. Third time's the charm, Boris. I hope not. An H3 CO2 U235 and a pinch of salt. Aha! This has been a recording. Who cares? Natasha, I got it here. Hush a boom. And just in time, darling. Look. Yes, outside the warehouse, our three friends were closing in rapidly. Well, what can be closed in can be closed out. And Boris prepared to drop his lethal test tube right on top of our heroes. Don't miss our next episode. Boom at the top. Our Bullwinkle loses his head. <laughs> I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible.
Adventures of Ruffy and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that Jet A. Jerry Olace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you again. Likewise. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, let's get started. Last episode, Boris and Natasha had succeeded in manufacturing a batch of the silent explosive called Hushaboom. Natasha, this explosive may change the course of history. Sort of a boom to mankind, ha <laughs> ha. Please, no pawns. This is a solemn moment. Ooh, I can see it now. At last, safe crackers will really be able to crack safely. They won't even be arrested for disturbing the peace. Lovely night, officer. <laughs> Oh, is this going to be a great come and get it day, Natasha? Yes, darling, and they're coming to get it right now. Who? Who else? Moose and Squirrel. Well, here's our first chance to use Hoshiboom, Natasha. And leaning out of the top story, the wily Boris drew a bead on our boys. Boris, how much Hoshiboom is in test tube? <laughs> Enough to blow up all the nosy Parkovs and this whole building besides. But... Makes you feel all warm inside, doesn't it? Yeah, but... Bombs away! <laughs> But, Boris, if building blows up... And it will. And if we're in it... We will, too. We will... We will, too. Natasha, what am I doing? You're finishing off this episode with a bang, darling. I'll meet you around the corner in half an hour. Oh, I got to catch that test tube. And seizing a handy fielder's mitt, Boris dashed for the stairs. And so as our heroes reached the door of the warehouse... Stand back, stand back! Pokey Smoke, what's that? Just a plug for another show. What show? Well, it's either Dr. Kildare or the Game of the Week. Craziest looking ball player I ever saw. You haven't been watching Kansas City lately. Phew. Hey, nice catch! How many outs is that? Allow me to introduce myself. J. Robert Uppendowner, world's greatest scientist at your service. What kind of a scientist are you? I'm a physicist, a physicist, a physicist. I'm a druggist. See my test tube? Come inside. I got lots of them. Yeah, but what was that one doing up in the air? That's how all my ideas is coming to me. How? Out of a clear blue sky. I've heard of that, but I never really thought it happened. What is your latest invention? Uh, this, uh, well, it's a new soft drink. Soda pop? Oh, bigger than soda pop. What's it called? Soda pow. Catchy name. And because you witnessed my discovery, I'm going to give you the honor of drinking the first batch. Little do our heroes know that that test tube contains not soda pow, but hush-a-boom, the powerful silent explosive. Quiet, blabbermouth. Well, I whispered, didn't I? So here you are, you lucky fellow. Drink hearty. But, Dr. Oppendowner, don't you want to see how I like it? I already know. If you drink that, you'll never drink anything else. Farewell. And Boris dashed off to join his partner a safe distance away. Wonder. Shall we join him, Captain? Why not? That, that voice. voice! Where, Where have, have I heard, heard that, that voice? voice? Rocky, you've heard more voices than Joan of Arc. Well, he's how. And Bullwinkle raised the fatal test tube to his lips. Are we far enough away now, Boris? Should be, honey bun. Spotlight, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our little show. This is Buddy Badenoff, and I'd like to do a few impressions for you. Boris, you are not the star of this show. Natasha, besides you and me, who's left? You know, you may be right. <laughs> and for my first impression, it is one of the narrator of a television series. <clears throat> oh, for heaven's sake. Tune in next week for Boris Talks to Himself or Mockingbird Hill.
Once upon a time, there was a father who had two sons. One son, Swinburne, was very brilliant, but his other son, Maynard, was rather slow. It's not so much that I'm smarter, it's just this terrible void in his makeup. Don't tell me, don't tell me! No, 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 it's time you faced up to it, Maynard. You don't shudder. Everybody shudders at one time or another, but you, Maynard, oh no, you don't shudder. Well, you'd better start shuddering and darn soon. I'm not going to have any son of mine staying here, eating my food, who won't do the one thing I tell him to, which is to shudder. I suppose you think I don't try. I put icicles down my back, I watch thrillers, on TV, nothing makes me shudder. I just don't possess that one noble emotion of man, fear. Well, you're going to learn fear, and darn soon. I want you to spend the night with Oscar. Oh, I say, you mean the man who lives in that deserted windmill with the bats? Ooh, that's spooky. Look at your brother, Maynard. He's shuddering already. Now, why can't you be a good boy like him? Shudder a little. So Maynard's father took him to the deserted windmill, where Oscar assured him that by the end of the night, Maynard would come home cured. Later that night, Oscar put on a sheet and started to moan. Mm -hmm. But instead of shuddering, Maynard pushed him down the stair. You're right. He don't shudder. Well, that does it. Out, Maynard, out. So Maynard was driven from his home because he didn't know what fear was. Gee, I guess Swinburne and Daddy are sitting down to dinner now. If I could only have learned to shudder, I'd be having dinner with them, too. Did you say shudder? Yes. I do not possess that seventh sense, fear. Maybe you tremble a little. Nope. Get a little goose pimply. Not a pimple. Shake. Hair stand on end. Knees canuck. No, no, no. I think you are just the kind of nut the king is looking for. He has a job for you. How's the pay? All the gold in the kingdom and his daughter thrown into boot. Sick leave? Vacation pay? No, but you can take as long as you like for coffee breaks. Hey, I'll take it. Do you see that big castle on the hill? Uh huh. Well, the king lives in that shack right next to it. Too much upkeep running the big place, huh? Oh, no. But let's let the narrator explain that, shall we? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, yes. Well, the fact of the matter was that the king was living in the shack because he was scared to death of a giant ogre who had taken over the castle and delighted in frightening the king. Oh, 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 there's no escaping that evil ogre. <laughs> Just listen to my heart. That's the door, sire. If it's that ogre, I'm not at home. It's another applicant, sire. Hey, I understand that you got an opening that pays pretty well. Oh, yeah. The job is to stay the night in my castle. You know, kind of a night watchman. If you can stick through the night, you can have all the gold in my kingdom and my daughter to boot. And long coffee breaks. Maynard took the job as night watchman and entered the huge castle. Oh, boy, maybe this is it. Maybe this time I'll shudder. Let's see. Pulse normal, respiration normal, heartbeat normal, mental attitude, boredom. Oh, well. Oh, for me? I thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, I got something for you. There you are. Hey, listen, Charlie, would you give me my head back? Oh, hum. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, now you done it. I got a nasty cold in the head. Gesundheit. <laughs> Gee, that's a shame, fella. I know how those summer colds can hang on. But this is winter. That's why you want to take care of it. Or the first thing you know, zit, zit. Uh, but I'm too young to die. <laughs> so what did I do? Try one of these seven-way cold tablets. You'll find relief just seconds away. Ooh, ah, I can't breathe again. I feel fine, and suffering did not upset my liver. And because for the first time in the ogre's life he was in a dramatization, he turned back to his original form, which was a bunny rabbit, and was heard of no more. The king was able to move back into his castle. And here, Maynard, is your pay. Oh, thank you, sire, but I'm still a little depressed, like... You see, I didn't learn to shudder. And here's my daughter to boot. <laughs> when Maynard saw the king's daughter for the first time in his life, he started to shudder. For you see, Maynard was afraid of girls. But all's well that ends well, because Maynard shuddered so hard that he invented a famous dance. In fact, if you look around, you'll find that people are doing it today. They call it the twist. <laughs> Voot. Hello there, Bothy lovers. Today's 
whom is a saga of the sports world entitled Jack Be Nimble. Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick, Jack Jump Over the Cat. Hold it, Moose. Who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Nimble's the name, Jack B. Nimble. Nimble? My card. High Jumps Incorporated, Candlewick say specialty. You're sorry. Well, I sort of thought I'd jump over this one myself. Yourself? You got union card? What union? Local 89, Hop, Skip and Jumpers Union. Well, no. You jump over that thing and we'll snuff out every candle in town. Okay, you do it. No, you talking. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candle wick. Ta-da! That'll be $40. $40? How come? Minimum wage law. Minimum wage law? Certainly. Minimum wage is $1 an hour. So? So, obviously, I get $40 a week. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never worked. This time for sure. Resto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three... Any idea where Egyptians deposit their money, Sherman? Sure, the banks of the Nile. Oh, well, I guess they do. At any rate, that's where we're going today. Where? To the banks of the Nile. To deposit money? No, to meet Egypt's most famous and beautiful queen, Cleopatra. <coughs> I instructed Sherman to set the Wayback Controls for the year 42 BC. And the place? Cleopatra's royal palace. Unfortunately, when we arrived, we found the queen in the midst of having a shave. Hokey smokes! I didn't know she had a beard. She didn't. This was her evil brother, Prince Ptolemy. Oh, boy, now that I'm the ruler of Egypt, I'm really going to liven things up around here. Excuse us, your royal Ptolemy, sir, but where's Cleopatra? Floating down the Nile on a raft, and in about two seconds, the crocodiles should have her. You can be sure we hasten to the rescue. There she is, Mr. Peabody. And look, there are crocodiles all around her. Well, Nile crocodiles, as everyone knows, are frustrated actors. This gave us a plausible reason for putting on an impromptu performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin. I'll get you, little Eva. You won't get away from me. Oh, no, you won't, you nasty Uncle Tom. I shall cross yonder ice flows and escape from you. Well, the crocs, as I knew they would, pretended they were blocks of ice and gave a sterling performance. Sherman, or little Eva, dashed out across them with myself or Uncle Tom in warm pursuit. By the time we reached the far shore, we had not only picked up some new members for the Screen Actors Guild, but Cleopatra as well. Thank you, little doggy, for rescuing me. I am not a little doggy, Your Highness. I am Mr. Peabody. And I'm Sherman. How come you're not marching to the sea? That was General Sherman, madam. This one is only a second lieutenant. Suddenly the air was filled with the blare of trumpets. Looking over a small hill, we saw the valley below was filled with a huge army. Wow, whose army is that? Caesar's. Sid Caesar's? Julius Caesar's. Say, I'll bet he'd help Cleopatra get her throne back. He would if he became infatuated. You think you could charm the great Caesar into assisting your cause, Cleopatra? Are oh, you kidding? Cleopatra began her saturation campaign by entering Caesar's tent during his two o'clock feeding. Oh, your artist. This is the vilest Caesar salad I've ever tasted. Who's got the salt? Here it is, Julie, baby. You want some pepper, too? <laughs> At four o'clock, Caesar reviewed his troops. You, soldier, you know better than to hold a dirty spear. I am sorry, O oh Caesar, but I had nothing to clean it with. Clean it with mint. Spearmint? Arrest that man! And you, soldier. Hello, Julie, honey. <laughs> came when the great man dictated a letter that was to be sent back to Rome. And I shall return during the Ides of March. Is that all, sir? That is all, sign it yours sincerely, Julie Baby. Julie Baby? Oh, I must be going mad. Leave me! I seem to be haunted by the voice and face of a beguiling vixen. Perhaps I have a virus. 
You look good to me, Julie Tiger. Even the mirror looks like her. By morning, Julius Caesar was on the verge of an unnervous breakdown, and that's when Cleopatra, escorted by two Egyptian guards, who resembled a boy and a dog, had it out with him. You're devastatingly beautiful, you minx, you. Say you'll go steady with me. She will if you'll attack Ptolemy and kick him off the throne. Caesar, of course, would do anything, so that afternoon he and his vast legions lined up in front of Egypt's royal palace. Spear throwers, attack! A thousand deadly spears were launched in the direction of the palace wall. Wall, but Ptolemy was a clever man, for suddenly a huge screen popped up, a screen that had been coated with rubber. The spears merely hit the screen and returned from whence they came. Boulders were even catapulted, and, but they too bounced back. If this keeps up, we'll be victorious losers. Do something, Mr. Peabody. And I did. First of all, I covered myself with bandages. To the enemy, I would appear to be a dog mummy, which was sacred to the Egyptians in those days, as everyone knows. Then I left the Roman lines and ran as best I could to the palace wall. A mighty leap, and I was over. One hour later, I returned to Sherman, Caesar, and Cleopatra. Uh, you may renew the assault, Julius. But what good'll it do? I insisted he follow my orders. A barrage of boulders was again sent flying at the walls, and again the rubber screen popped up. Only this time, there was a gaping hole in it, courtesy of yours truly. The rocks roared through the aperture, and inside of ten minutes, the walls came a-tumbling down, and Ptolemy with them. Cleopatra had her throne, and Caesar had Cleopatra. As for Sherman and me, we had ourselves a short sightseeing tour of the marketplace in Cairo. Step right up, folks. Buy yourself a genuine Egyptian pharaoh barometer. Take a barometer home to the little woman. Look at that, Mr. Peabody. That man is selling barometers shaped like pharaohs. Yes, they not only sold slaves in Egypt, they sold barometers as well. I never knew they could forecast the weather. You never heard of pharaoh and warmer? Last time you remember, Bullwinkle was about to drink a test tube full of Hushaboom, the silent explosive. Meanwhile, a short distance away... Bill, that's the end of Moose and Squirtle. I didn't hear anything, darling. Sure you did. You just heard the silent explosion. Welcome to the Buddy Badenoff Show, folks. What channel are we on, darling? Tune in and see. But when Natasha tuned a small TV set to this very channel... Are you all right, Bullwinkle? It is a fiddle and twice as stingy. Boris, what happened? To find out, let's go back a little to when Bullwinkle raised that test tube to his lips. Well, here's how, Billers. Wait a second. You're not actually going to drink that, are you? Why not? Without a straw? Hey, that's right. I do need a straw. Three straws? Yeah, all for one and one for all, and nobody gets enough. Come on, there's some straws at my place. I'll just leave this soda pal right here till we get back. But unbeknownst to Bullwinkle, he had placed the test tube on top of a radio receiver, which was just about to broadcast a message from Fearless Leader. Fearless Leader calling Boris Badenov. Do you hear me, Badenov? As the mad dictator's voice rose, the radio receiver began to vibrate, and so did the test tube rack. Badenov, you incompetent nincompoop! I'll give you just three seconds to answer! One, two! <laughs> and as the hushaboom hit the floor... The building exploded. Boris, the whole building went up. And whatever goes up must come down. Are you trying to tell me something, darling? Well, yes. What is it? Duck! Oh, 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 oh. And look, Boris, somebody is throwing party streamers. Party streamers? Natasha, that was the tape with the formula on it. Well, we goofed again. Let's face it, Natasha, as villains, we are a collective flop. Oh, cheer up, Boris. Maybe someday we'll make the FBI's top ten. FBI's top ten? We can't even make Kane's hundred. Pardon me, do I understand that you blew up this warehouse? Boris, the fuzz is here. Here's our chance. You bet we did, Sheriff. And you're responsible for all this wreckage? <laughs> of course. Then I'm afraid you're under arrest. At last we've made the big time. You're arresting us as saboteurs? No. Spies? No. Master criminals, maybe? Oh, no. Mad bombers? No, no. Then what? You are little bugs. Come along. Oh, oh boy. boy. And meanwhile, a short distance away... Call for Captain Peach Fuzz! Call for Captain Peach Fuzz! Here, boy. Telegram, Captain. Hey, 
Hey, aren't you the little feller that used to step out of thousands of store windows and counters all over the country? Yes, but I had to stop. How come? Kept cutting myself on the broken glass. Hey, listen to this. It's from one of our viewers. He says if we'll get rid of the mad doctor, the Hushaboom formula will be safe. Move along, you. Can't flab the rabbi grabble death. Well, there he goes. The formula is safe. How do you know that's the guy, Bullwinkle? He was wearing a white coat and scowling. So that makes him... A mad doctor. Oh, Cisco. Oh, Pancho. Oh, hey, wait a minute. This is the ending of another television program about cowboys. It always worked okay for them. Yeah, but we don't do that on this show. We always walk arm and arm into the sunset. Like this. Yeah. And the narrator says... Tune in next time for the further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Bullwinkle Moose. Ho, 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 Cisco! Wise guy. Well, I guess that about wraps up another Rocky show. Certainly hope you enjoyed it. I did. I always say... A bullwinkle. Time for us to go. Already? Okay, but first, here are some of the people who made this show impossible. Well, Frostbite Falls is usually a quiet place, but today is a little different. For today brings the finals of the Northern Minnesota Checker Championships. As you can see, it's a gala occasion in Frostbite Falls. The town has gone sports mad. Hooray! And here playing in this usual slashing Devil May Care style is the defending champion, Bullwinkle Moose. I'll move here. <gasps> Ignoring the bloodlust of the thrill-mad mob, Bullwinkle was about to end the game when... It's a-coming! It's a-coming! It's Charlie Parlor Car. It's a-coming! It's a-coming! Wonder what's a-coming? Last time Charlie yelled, it's a-coming, it turned out to be Haley's Comet. That thing do again? We just had one 80 years ago. It's a coming, I tell you. What's a coming, Mr. Parlor Car? Look, the circus is a coming. That's what you're coming. It was true. At that very moment, the big wagons began to roll into town. And it wasn't just any old circus either. This was Bumbling Brothers Circus, the smallest, biggest show on earth. Come on, it's your move, Deb. You're right, and I'm a moving. I'm going to go watch the circus. Well, if that don't make a feller sore. Bullwinkle, don't you like circuses? Well, certainly, but I have a for sure win. Come on, Rock, I'm gonna give them circus fellers a piece of my mind. You know, that's what I like about you, Bullwinkle. No matter how little you have, you're always willing to share. And in a little while, our heroes were at the vacant lot where the circus was being set up. Gee, look, they got a real lion tamer, Bullwinkle. Claude Badley, king of the cage. Don't we know him from somewhere? You mean his voice is familiar? No, his face. There's a switch. Hey, you in charge here? That's right. Well, how come you busted up our checker game? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Wait right here. I get a free ticket for you to the circus. Well, that's better. Okay, where is it? Where's what? My free ticket to the circus. You're some kind of a nut. Get out of here. Boy, he sure changed his mind in a hurry. Yeah, Indian giver. Ah, there you are. Just for that, you can keep your doggone ticket. But I want you to have it. Nope, now I'm sore. Well, if you insist. 
Gee, Bullwinkle, that wasn't very nice. Maybe you were right, Rock. I wouldn't want to be a big sore head. Not with these antlers. Okay, mister, I'll take the ticket now. Just stop bothering me, I'll have you run off the lot, you mooching moose. Mooching moose! Mooching moose! Gesundheit. All right, you gonna give me the ticket or not? But, my dear moose, I've been trying to, here. Are you trying to make a monkey out of me? No, monkeys we got. A jackass, maybe? No, I've had just about enough. So it's not enough you want a free ticket, now you're picking a fight. Well, there's two of them. Of course there is. This is the Bumbling Brothers Circus. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, we are the Bumbling Brothers. You go. And I go. You go and I go. Yeah. yeah. So, so do we. we. Well, that explains it. I guess everything's okay. Well, that's an odd statement to make this early in the story. For just a few cages away, the circus's ferocious lion tamer was untaming a ferocious lion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, Satan. Go ahead, get sore. Yeah! Good heavens, it's true. Claude Badley, the lion tamer, is really that heel of heels, that king of the crumbs. Say the name. Boris Badenov. Ta-da! Well, what fiendish plan does Boris have in mind? And why is he tampering with a lock on the lion's cage? Silly boy. We'll find out next time in Lion in the Bedroom or the Cat's Pajamas. Once upon a time, there was an easel painter. He was a good painter and made a modest living for his wife and himself. All was well except for one thing. The painter didn't want to be a painter. He wanted to be a shoemaker. I am drudging my way to life. I want to do something creative. <laughs> Such as? Who are you? We're elves, obviously. We always considered painting creative. You call that creative, elves? I'll tell you creative. Making shoes, that's creative. Something for the feet, something that lifts, something to last throughout eternity. Shoes that sing. You mean you want to go down in history like Herman Cappuccino? Herman Cappuccino? Herman Cappuccino, just the greatest little shoemaker that ever lived. When Hannibal crossed the Alps, Whose shoes do you think he was wearing? Herman's? Herman Cappuccino. Ooh! <laughs> Tell me, Elf, how could I be a famous shoemaker like Herman Cappuccino? You gotta suffer! You gotta spend time on the left bank in Paris. Study. Visit the shoe stores. And all true shoemakers gotta suffer. And so? That night, the painter told his wife of his plan to become a shoemaker. His wife said, Shoemaker for not made, they are born. Why don't you forget it and go back to something sensible like, like painting? Nine. Even ten. <laughs> Anybody can paint. I want to sit in cafes, discuss shoe exhibitions, make shoes in a garret, and above all, suffer. So the painter left for Paris, leaving his wife to shift for herself. He entered the famous school, Le Beau Chasseur, and spent months working for models. Then he made 15th century shoes, 16th century shoes, 17th century shoes, 18th century shoes. He made rabbit shoes, snake shoes, and kangaroo shoes. He even made high button shoes, low button shoes, even horseshoes. He made walking shoes, running shoes, sneaky shoes, squeaky shoes, but alas, he made no singing shoes. <laughs> if only I could make a shoe that sings of spring, of love, how could I make a shoe with a soul? You gotta travel. Absorb different countries' culture. Yes, yeah, suffer. Not suffer, travel. Get with it, will you? Yeah, that's it, travel. <laughs> So the painter went to Italy, Switzerland, Holland, 
And he made Italian shoes, Swiss shoes, Dutch shoes. But alas, he made no singing shoes. Then, one night, after he returned to Paris, he heard the most beautiful music. He followed the lovely sound, and there, in a bundle of rags, was a singing shoe. That is truly a shoe with a soul. Well, uh, well, I hope to tell you it's got a soul. I must have that shoe. <laughs> now, now, wait, wait. A fine way to act. I just wanted to know where he bought them. We could have told you that. He bought him an Elvesville. Elvesville? Why, that's my hometown. What am I doing suffering around Europe when I could be home learning to make shoes that sing? So the painter left for the town from whence he had come, Ellsville. He found that everyone in Ellsville was wearing the same exquisite shoes that he had found in the bundle of rags. Where did you buy those exquisite shoes? Uh, 2311 South Budlaw, when you turn left at the you next... You don't have to tell me! That's my house! And sure enough, when the painter got home, he found the walls of his cottage lined with exquisite shoes, all singing merrily away, and who did he find sitting behind the cobbler's bench but his wife? Why didn't you tell me you made exquisite singing shoes? You never asked me. So... From that day on, the painter went back to his easel. Eventually, it happened that his paintings started selling, like hotcakes, and he became a very famous painter indeed, and his paintings hung in all the famous museums in Europe. But he never did become a shoemaker, and he had to be content with just being a very wealthy man. Which just goes to prove everybody can't be a Herman Cappuccino. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that means. For those of you who lack horse sense, here is Mr. Know-it-all. Hello, racing fans. Today's topic is entitled... How to do stunts in the movies without having the usher throw you out. You arrive at the studio and get the first assignment from the director. You all set to go, stuntman? I sure am, CB. Here is scene. You start car, car blows up. With me in it? Absolutely, of course not. We stop film, you get out, then car blows up. Got it? Got it. Camera, action. Take two. War pictures offer a great challenge to the stuntman. Especially if you're chicken. Comes now big bombing scene. Dommy is in foxhole. Bombs fall all around. You rush into foxhole, get Dommy. Got it, PW. Camera, action. Right out onto no man's land you run. Bombs busting to the right and to the left. Somehow you make it. Leap into the foxhole, fight off the foxes, and emerge with the dummy. Which is a bomb. And you are the dummy. Before the day is through, you find yourself on a 5,000-foot high cliff. In this scene, you jump off cliff into net. Comforted by the thought of the safety net below, you launch yourself earthward. The net is there, all right, but no one is holding it. And so, in conclusion, to be a stuntman, one must always be careful to avoid painful injury. Thank you, Mr. Know-it-all. You're welcome. <laughs> Into the northern region of Canada at the close of the 19th century rode Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties, lonely defender of justice and fair play, handsome, brave, daring, and hopelessly lost. These service station maps are impossible. Can't even fold up the thing. I think I should have turned left at that last tree. Meanwhile, a short distance away, Snidely Whiplash was up to his favorite pastime, tying women to railroad tracks. He soon had unexpected company. A 
Mountie. Correct. Pardon me, sir, but do you happen to know the way to the Royal Canadian Mountie Camp? Uh, why, yes, I do. Oh, this pesky knot. Could you give me a hand, or rather finger? <laughs> Always willing to help a citizen in need. There. <laughs> Dudley do ride to the Mounties. Get out of that if you can. Oh, fudge. Meanwhile, Nell Fenwick, the beautiful daughter of Inspector Fenwick, was out gathering chestnuts. Suddenly, she stumbled onto the biggest nut of all, Dudley Do-Right. What Dudley Do-Right are you doing with that other woman? I thought you always did right. I was doing right, Nell. That's how I got in this predicament. But could I tell you about it later? I think there is a train approaching. And so, do right, there's a fiend running loose in northern Canada. A fiend, Inspector? A fiend who goes about Canada tying defenseless women to railroad tracks. Oh. I know it must be hard for you to believe, you with your eyes as blue and heart so true. Uh, what happened to your finger, do right? Never mind about my finger, sir. This is far more important than mere flesh wounds. A rope-tying fiend is at large and should be brought in at once. And so the remorseless man-tracker started on his way. He didn't have far to track. Here, here. You oughtn't to do a thing like that, going around tying defenseless people to railroad tracks. It's not the Canadian way. You think I'm not trying to stop to stop tying? I'm hooked. It's a habit with me now. <laughs> I swear to you, after I tie up this one defenseless woman, I'm going to swear off, so help me. Could you just put your finger in this knot? Well, if you think it will help you kick the habit... Oh, it will, it will. There. <laughs> yeah. Curses foiled again. Hey, that's my line. Uh-oh, another woman. He didn't swear off. A man. Confound that whiplash. Nell. Inspector Fenwick. Snidely whiplash. Snidely whiplash? Now I wonder. But Inspector Fenwick did not get his nickname of the Canadian Fox for nothing. Now all of you have heard the old proverb, if you give a snidely enough rope, he'll put his foot in it. Why, no, Inspector, I don't believe I've heard that proverb. Don't interrupt, do right. We're going to use deception. We're going to disguise you as Nell. Me, sir? With those baby blue eyes, you are unnatural. True. What the inspector didn't know was that Snidely, realizing that the heat was on, disguised himself as Nell. Dudley, where are you? Nell, you heard your father's plan. Go on back to camp. You'll give the whole thing away. Nell, Nell, what are you doing? Nell, this is no time for hijinks. <laughs> there, Snidely Whiplash. Caught at last. Oops. So, Snidely Whiplash, you thought you'd catch the Mounties counter-counter-intelligence napping-napping, eh? But, Father, I'm not Snidely Whiplash. And don't think you're fooling me with that crummy falsetto voice. You must think we're pretty stupid at headquarters. Hey, buddy, don't leave stuff laying around in the tracks, huh? Trying to confuse me, eh, Whiplash? Well, it won't work. As if I wouldn't know my own daughter and my favorite constable. Inspector Fenwick always gets his man. Well, Nell, I guess all's well that ends well. My sentiments exactly, Dudley. Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. the circus is in town, and along with the peanuts and popcorn, it's brought a big top full of trouble for Bullwinkle. First, he ran into the twin brothers who own the show. Who go bumbling? And I go bumbling. And I'll be in Scotland for you. Then later, we found that the lion tamer, Claude Badley, is really Boris Badenov, and right now, he's busy infuriating a man-eating lion by making faces at him. 
Who's making faces? I'm imitating a moose. Pretty soon he'll be a moose-eating lion. Meanwhile, back at the entrance... Gee, you mean you're giving us free tickets to your circus, Mr. Bumbling and Mr. Bumbling? Just call me Hugo. No, 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 don't call him Hugo. Why not? Because I'm Hugo. Hey, that's right. Call me Igo. Yeah, I go too. Well, maybe we better go inside. And in a few minutes, our heroes were walking through the big top looking at all the menagerie animals. Menagerie, my foot, these are for real. Then there was the circus itself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, presenting Bumbling Brothers Three Ring Circus. I only see one ring. We put all three inside each other. It's a low budget circus. And now, here are the four flying galenders. Minus two. Little trapeze trouble in Vinamaka. Yes, our heroes enjoy the acrobats, the jugglers, the elephants. Let's get on with the plot. When do the bad guys come in? And then it was time for the lion tamer's act. That's more like it. Ready, Mr. Badley? Wait a minute. I haven't got the lions ready yet. Okay, boys, put the teeth in the box. That's right. Yes, so cowardly was Boris that he used only ancient lions with false teeth and made them take out their plates before they went into the cage. Oh, Boris, you're such a yellow belly. What are you talking? I could still get gum to death out there. But there was one lion whose teeth were definitely his own, Satan the man-eater. Pardon? Moose-eater. <laughs> well, Boris went through his act with the old toothless lions. Up, up, Simba. <laughs> Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. Those lions are so old, their joints are creaking. Yeah, looks like he's using the lion of least resistance. <laughs> Boris, they are laughing at you. Well, that does it. Natasha opened the door of the special cage. And let Satan out. Go ahead. And the trembling Natasha tripped the lever that would open the cage door. Oh, Boris, aren't you frightened? Not as long as I'm in this nice, safe cage. Yes, the fiendish Boris had set Satan's cage in backwards, and when the door opened, the fierce beast leaped not into the cage, but into the audience. Ah! Oh, no. Bullwinkle, the lion is loose! And he don't creak a bit, either. We gotta do something! Right! But what? Hey, I know! What? Let's run! We can't! We're heroes! Couldn't we get preempted once? Yeah. I know! Fly around his head and try to distract him. You take this net and try to throw it over him. And Rocky launched himself through the air straight at the snarling lion. In a rare exhibition of aerial skill and courage, the plucky squirrel zoomed closer and closer to the cruel jaws, while the milling crowd quickly made its way to safety. Meanwhile, Bullwinkle was edging closer with the net, and then it happened. What? What happened? You tripped over the net. Oh, come on now. Would I be stupid enough to trip over the net when I... Oop! Bullwinkle, are you... Yes, Rocky's kind heart had gotten him into trouble again. Now he lay recumbent beneath the lethal claws of the man-eater. Moose-eater. Squirrel-eater. Never fear, Rock. I'll think of something. I don't think I can wait that long. Well, at least wait until our next episode, a red-letter day, or drop us a lion. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Signing autographs.
Andres, Cecile, John, Miss. But your name is Bowinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Everybody's supposed to have fun at a circus, but as usual, things are different in Frostbite Falls. Nobody's having fun here. You see a mean lion tamer named Claude Badley, who bears a remarkable resemblance to Boris Badenov... Funny how that works out. ...has let loose a ferocious lion named Satan into the crowd. They're not having fun. <coughs> of course, the circus owners, Hugo and I go bumbling, are panic-stricken. They're not, not having, having fun. fun. In trying to capture Satan, Bullwinkle fell into his own net. I'm not having fun. And Rocky the Flying Squirrel was swatted out of the air and now lies helpless under the lion's huge paw. I'm sure not having fun. And as for Boris and Natasha... <laughs> we're having fun. Boris, that was one of the nastiest, dirtiest tricks you've ever pulled. Oh, Michael, do something. Oh, hey, hey, you lion. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> It's not working. I'll have to try something different. And Bullwinkle did try. He flapped a handkerchief at the lion. <laughs> Toto. He did a tap dance wearing a funny hat. Do -do 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 -do. He juggled four balls at a uh, uh, three, two. He uh, threw one ball up and down. Nothing worked. The only thing I got left is my pocket comb. <laughs> You're taking notes, Natasha? Notes? Notes? Music! That's it, Bullwinkle! Music! You gotta play something! Play? On what? Your comb! Ooh! And Bullwinkle slipped a piece of tissue paper over his comb and began to hum through it. <laughs> Bullwinkle, I think it's working! Yes, the lion removed his paw from our furry hero and began to stalk slowly toward Bullwinkle. Boris, the lion isn't going to eat the squirrel. Who cares? He eats the moose instead. That's bad. Yes, the lion drew closer and closer to the music-making moose. Then Bowwinkle began to play a lullaby. <laughs> the lion's eyes grew heavy, and before the astonished crowd, Satan, the fierce lion, lay down, closed his eyes, and went fast asleep. Hugo, did you see what I seen? Of course not. It's an optical delusion. Wow! Bullwinkle, that was sensational. Down, boy. Down, I say. Pow, pow. Get down there, you. You're a little late, aren't you, Mr. Badley? Well, better late than never, boys. That was a terrible thing to do, Mr. Badley. Yeah, shame on you. One more stunt like that, and we're going to write you a nasty letter. A nasty letter? He almost got us hit up by a nasty lion. You're not even going to fire him? We can't. Can't? He's the only lion tamer we got. And the circus. Just isn't a circus. Without a lion tamer. So he's got us over a bear. Hey, wait a minute. You do have another lion tamer. We, we do? do? Where? Yeah. Right here. There must be some mistake. The only fellow here is me. Me? You can do it, Bullwinkle. You'll tame him with your trusty homicomb. A sensational idea. You're, You're hired. hired. But what about... You're, You're fired. fired. You can do this to me. I have my rights. You pay for this. <laughs> Mark my words. Darling, they stopped being scared of you. Never mind, Natasha. In the immortal words of Count Dracula, I have only begun to fright. And Boris tossed a lighted match into a nearby pile of straw and started a raging conflagration. And a big fire, too. Don't miss our next episode, The Fire Eaters or Hot Lips. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah.
There was once an old fisherman who, in over 40 years of fishing, never caught a fish. Because of this, he was forced to live with his wife in a miserable little hovel close by the sea. But though they were very, very poor, he was very, very happy. But being so very, very poor made his wife very, very unhappy. No money, no food, no nothing. Just a kooky husband. Then, one day, as the fisherman sat mending his nets... Oh, alas, poor husband. You must surely be addle-headed. Why do you say that? Why else would you be so happy when we're so poor? Yeah, <laughs> it does seem kind of silly, doesn't it? But you just wait. Someday I'm going to catch a fish, and then things will be different. The old fisherman didn't know it then, but things were to be very different very soon. For the next day, when he hauled in his net... Wow, I finally did it. I caught a fish. I caught a fish. Yes, it was a fine, big fish. And a most unusual fish, to say the least, for it spoke to him. How do you do? Oh, hello there. You know, uh, you're the very first fish I ever... What'd you say? I said, how do you do? <laughs> Oh, come on. You can't say that. Why not? Well, because fish can't talk. That's why. But I can, and I'm asking you, please, let me go. The fish pleaded so hard, and the fisherman was so shocked at hearing the fish talk that he did let him go. Then that evening, when he returned to his hovel... Catch any fish? Yeah. Nice big fat one. But I let him go. Let him go? Why? He asked me to. Oh, well, as long as he... What? The fish asked you to let him go? Yeah. Certain now that her poor husband was more addle-headed than ever, the wife wrapped hot towels around the fisherman's head and gave him a bit of medicine that was guaranteed to clear even the most clouded mind. Oh, what talking fish indeed. Look, he did talk to me, and I can prove it. Early the next morning, the fisherman returned to the spot where he'd caught the fish and called out loudly, Talking fishy in the sea. Please come up and talk to me. With that, the big fish returned to the surface and said, You called? Yeah, my wife thinks I'm addle-headed because uh, I heard you talk. P please come home with me so I can prove you do. Very well. You did me a favor, so I shall return it. Let's go. The fisherman quickly took the fish back to his hovel, but his wife was nowhere to be seen. So he put the fish into their bed to keep him warm and set off in search of her. A short time later, the wife who had been out collecting seashells by the seashore, returned and seeing what she thought to be her husband in the bed. Lazy lout, what are you doing in bed? You should be out fishing. I beg your pardon, madam, but I am not your husband. I am really... A talking fish. That is correct, madam. Eek! The poor woman's hair stood on end. Then, two hours later, when the fisherman finally coaxed his wife down off of the roof... Ah, now, you see, dear, the fish did talk. Okay, okay, but get him out of here. Ah, but the fish, who, of course, <laughs> had never been in a soft, warm bed before, liked it so much that he said... Oh, please don't throw me back into that cold, old ocean. Let me stay. No, I refuse to have a talking fish in my bed. Oh, let me stay. I will grant you three wishes. Oh, boy, three wishes. Hey, that could make us rich. The wife was delighted at the prospect of being rich and agreed to let the fish stay. Then they set about the task of making their first wish. Now, a talking fish is something you don't see every day. So, uh, why don't we wish for a big theater so we can make people pay to hear him? So be it, number one. The wish was granted, and they suddenly found themselves owners of the largest theater in the village. Now what? That's easy. Now we've got to wish for lots of tickets to sell. So be it. Number two. The wish was granted, and they now had thousands of tickets. Everyone in the country wanted to hear the talking fish, so in no time at all, every ticket was sold. Oh, boy, look at the money. Oh, we're rich at last. We still have another wish coming, so let's use it. For what? Who cares? Anything. No, we better save it. He's right. After all, it is your last wish. Now, you stay out of this. Let's use it. Save it. But I think you... Use it. Save it. But, use but, it. I, but, oh, I wish you'd shut up. So be it. Number three. Oops, I goofed. The third and last wish was granted, and the fish was never to speak again. Of course, the audience demanded their money back, and the fisherman and his wife were run out of town as frauds. 
poor, once again, they returned to their hovel where several days later, a strange thing happened. For a small cat wearing boots approached them and, uh... Howdy! That cat! It, it talked! Right. You see, I'm... But before the little cat in the boots could continue, the fisherman and his wife tied a gag around his mouth and he could not say another word. Which is just as well, dear friends, for Puss in Boots is another story. Look, Bullwinkle, a message in a bottle. Fan mail from some flounder? No, this is what I really call a message. Time again for Bullwinkle's Corner. Hello there. Today's poem is called Taffy. Taffy was a Welshman. Taffy was a thief. You ain't kidding, governor. Taffy came to my house and stole a piece of beef. Hey, that's a whole cow. So I'm petting my part a little. I went to Taffy's house. Taffy wasn't home. Taffy went to my house and stole a marrow bone. Marrow bone, that's a whole leg of lamb. I went to Taffy's house. Taffy wasn't in. You can't read. Sign says out. I know you're in there. I can hear you breathing. Taffy went to my house and stole a silver pin. That's a pin? Just poetic license. If she went to Taffy's house, Taffy in bed took up marrow bone, hit him in the head. <laughs> I went to Taffy's house. Taffy was in bed. And do you know what the last line is? Of course. Took up marrow bone and hit him in the head. <laughs> what do you know? Unhappy ending. <laughs> Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... Meet my... Ooh. Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. <laughs> Hello out there, Peabody here, along with Sherman and Wayback. Wayback is a time machine. Sherman, a boy. I sent the Wayback machine for July 8th, 1888, just like you told me, Mr. Peabody. Good boy, Sherman. And now if you'll set the indicator for Richburg, Massachusetts, we'll be off. Off to witness the most titanic struggle in boxing history, the heavyweight championship battle between Jake Kilrain and the immortal John L. Sullivan. The way back, incomparable invention that it is, hurtled us back through time and space to the site of Sullivan's training camp. Hello, this is O'Hara, Sullivan's manager. I'd like to bet $5,000 on Jake Kilrain. Well, that's what I said. 5000 on Kilrain. Excuse me, Mr. O'Hara, but are you really going to bet against your own fighter? You're darn right I am. In John L's condition, he couldn't punch a clock. O'Hara led the way to an outdoor ring. There's your John L, flat on his back, and he's been that way all week. Too much training? No, too much mustache. That mustache of his is so heavy, he can't lift it. Between the three of us, we managed to elevate Sullivan to a standing position. Are you all right, Mr. Sullivan? He can't speak, lad. Too much pressure on the lips. Stand clear for a second. We'll see how he does. <laughs> John, 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 my lad, why do you think I give you a razor on your birthday? This is serious, Mr. Peabody. The fight takes place in an hour. What fight? You mean the slaughter? Oh, if only there were something we could do. There is. What? Shave him. O'Hara put in an urgent call for the nearest barber, and ten minutes later... There, uh, how's that look? Not his hair. The mustache. Cut his mustache. And after another ten minutes... It's a no use, mister. This man's a mustache. Won't a cut. I'm a rule of five a pair of C's, a four combs, and a half a pair of tweez. Well, I'd best be calling up Kilrain's manager and telling him the fight's off. Don't do that, Mr. O'Hara. Mr. Peabody will think of something. And, of course, I did. And in this corner, wearing black leotards and pink balloons, John L. Sullivan. <laughs> That sure was a great idea, Mr. Peabody. Those balloons are keeping the mustache up. Now remember, Kilrain, keep away from that left balloon. I, I, I don't like it. I ain't never fought no balloons before. Don't worry about it. What comes up must come down. Yeah. Uh, what's that supposed to mean? I don't know. It just sounded like the right thing to say. The fight was on. 
bound one, bound the two antagonists, more or less sizing each other up. Sullivan could hardly raise a hand due to his inactivity of the past week, and thanks to my talents with a brush, Kilrain was confused by three mustachioed opponents. How'd you get the black guy, Kilrain? I didn't see him hit you. He didn't! Th that left balloon did! Well, never you mind. Patience is a virtue. I like what comes up must come down better. For 30 grueling rounds, the battle raged. At that point, John L. Sullivan was slightly ahead. You fool. The judges took that round away from you. But why? I never hit them below the belt. No, but you hit them below the balloon. Now keep those punches up. The rain did just that. Unfortunately, by round 75, no matter how high he aimed, he couldn't score. It seemed that Sullivan's balloons had inflated slightly, making him immune to a ground attack. Come down and fight, Sullivan! Golly, Mr. Peabody, if John L. can keep away from Kilrain, he'll win a decision. Ah, but fate proved otherwise, for John L.'s lofty position placed him directly under the powerful lights, lights that gave off a staggering degree of heat. He's down! Sullivan's down! Two, three, four, five! Get up, John L., get up! It's his mustache, Mr. Peabody, he'll never make it! Nothing in this world will make him rise. It was then I noticed a gentleman in the first row digesting a huge platter of corned beef and cabbage. And if John L. Sullivan were any sort of Irishman, he'd rise for this. Uh, would you mind if I borrowed this for a moment? Thank you. Well, of course, the rest is history. John L. took one slight inhalation of corned beef and cabbage and turned into a raging tiger. Sullivan was the new champion. What a fighter he was, Mr. Peabody. Probably the most famous of all time. True, Sherman, but his manager was equally famous. Mr. O'Hara? Oh, yes, he joined the Marines and became the most talked-about celebrity of our time. I never heard of him, Mr. Peabody. Really, Sherman? You never heard of uh, Marine O'Hara? <laughs> Last time you remember, Bullwinkle had astounded the Bumbling Brothers Circus by taming a lion with music. <laughs> this was sad news for Claude Badley, the old lion tamer, who only tamed old lions. He was tossed out on his ear. Boy, am I going to make things hot for those guys. How? Like I said, make things hot for them. Oh, for heaven's sake. Now we got a fire. Quick, get the fire hose. Man the pump! Ready, men! One, two! One, two! One, two! But alas, as the crew started to pump water... Shh! Hokey smoke, the hose is full of holes! What could have happened? I'll bet that Mr. Badley had a hand in this. And guess which hand, Natasha? The one with the ice peak in it, darling. You guessed, you clever little dickens, you. This is terrible, Rock! Yeah, come on! We're going to the elephant! You mean going to the dog? I mean... You think big. But Rocky had a definite plan in mind. With Bullwinkle's help, he led all the circus elephants to the water tank and lined them up. That's it, Bullwinkle. Well, you can water the elephants if you want to, Rock. I'm going to fight that fire. Yeah, but... Oh, dear. Okay, fellas, get a big snow full of water. Now, elevation 30 degrees. Right 3 degrees. Range 50 yards. Open fire! <laughs> Meanwhile, at the fire, Bullwinkle was just ready to heave a bucket of water when... Oh, the fire's out! The fire's out! The fire's out! The fire's out! Gee, I don't know my own strength. Rocky, that was... Sensational! Stupendous! Super colossal! Even adequate! Gee, thanks, Hugo! I'm not Hugo, I'm Igo! Are you sure? Wait, I'll look in my hat. Yeah, I'm Igo! Well, fellas, I did it! Did what? Put the fire out. I cannot tell a lie. I did it with my little bucket. No, no, Bullwinkle. It was really rocky. And the elephants. Elephants? How could an elephant put out a fire? <laughs> you could have just told me. Well, that was the beginning of a new career for both our boys. Bullwinkle as a lion tamer, Rocky as an elephant trainer. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting in the center ring. That's this one. The world's greatest lion tamer. Bullwinkle, 
The musical moose. Yes, Bullwinkle had a sensational act. To the music of a hummercomb, the lions formed pyramids. <laughs> they leaped through hoops. <laughs> They even danced. <laughs> for a grand finale, Bullwinkle would put his head in a lion's mouth. Ray! And for an encore, a lion would put his head in Bullwinkle's mouth. Turnabout's fair play, I'll be thee. <laughs> but there was one person who wasn't sharing in the fun. Claude Badley, the former lion tamer. Rag flab the deck blagget flab. Please, Boris, such language. I'm going to get even with the whole circus, Natasha. How, darling? Easy. I go to the Fireside Book of Fiendish Plans under S. S? For circus. Darling, circus starts with C. And you know how it ends? How? Kaboom! Look at this. And as Natasha looked at the plan Boris had in mind, her hair turned white. Not white, darling. Ash blonde. Oh. Well, anyway, be sure to see our next Big Top episode, The Show Must Go On, or Give Them the Acts. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. The circus has a new attraction, thanks to the magical powers of Bullwinkle's fabulous hummercomb. For with the music of his tissue paper comb, he has become the world's most famous wild animal tamer. Come and see him. Bullwinkle Moose. And his two tapping tigers. Okay, fellas. And a one, and a two, and... Yes, to the tune of Bullwinkle's hummercomb, the animals did things never before seen in any circus ring. <laughs> What's more, they seemed to love their trainer. At the end of each performance, they carried him off on their shoulders. Boy, Bullwinkle, you're sensational. Okay, fellas, break it up. Oh! Of course, all the customers loved the act. Yay! 
All except two. Boo! And they weren't exactly customers. They had sneaked in under the tent wall. Snitch! Come on, Natasha. We can salt fireside book of fiendish plans. Boris, we can walk out with everybody else. Please, Natasha. I'm a professional sneak. So? I sneak in, I sneak out. Of course, the two circus owners, Hugo and I go bumbling, were delighted with the new act. Boys, the circus is simply rolling in that green stuff. And you know what green stuff we mean. Spinach? Chlorophyll? Money! Oh, that! But unfortunately, their relation was short-lived, for as the circus swung south into Nevada and Arizona, they ran into... Rain! Rain? In Arizona? In Nevada? In August? Impossible! Yes, for day after day, the circus wagon splashed through the mud, or tried to. Mm, boy, this wagon is really stuck. Hey, how do we get out of this mud? Mud? What's mud? You kidding? It's what you get when you mix earth and rain. What's rain? This is rain. I gunnies, I thought it was a mirage. But it never rains in Arizona in August. There is less rain in August than any other month. Well, how much is there in the other month? None. None. That ought to make August pretty dry all night. Of course, there's nothing that's less fun than a soggy circus, so the attendants fell off sharply. Hugo, there's only two people in the audience. And I got a confession, I go. One of them is my mother-in-law. That's funny. Why? The other one is my mother-in-law. <laughs> Of course, it wasn't long before the cash box was empty, and still the circus rolled disconsolately from town to town. But strange as it seems, as soon as it left the town, the sun came out and shone brightly. Bullwinkle, those rain clouds seem to be following us. Was it something we said? Then that's pretty strange. I think I'll go up and take a look. You mean? Yeah, give me a toss up there. Right, Rock. Where are you fellas going? We're out to lunch. Okay, Bullwinkle, let's go. Holy! And Bullwinkle flung the plucky squirrel into the air. Up, up, up he went. But just as he reached the clouds, he happened to glance down and... Pokey smoke, Bullwinkle. I see it all now. Well, you sure you're high enough? No, I mean, I know what's making it rain on our circus. It's... But at that moment, the sharp-eyed squirrel zoomed into a cloud bank and... Come in, Rocky, come in, Rocky. But not a word more could Bullwinkle hear. And what's more, Rocky didn't emerge from the cloud bank. Come out, Rocky, come out, Rocky. Well, things look pretty bad. Yeah, maybe if I call my hair a different way. And even worse, at that very second, million bolt charges of lightning began to flash through the cloud. <laughs> Don't fail to see our next episode, Loony Lightning, or Nuts and Bolts. <laughs> oh, my George, that's a good one. <laughs> What's so funny, Pop? <laughs> oh, it's you, Junior. <laughs> well, I'm laughing at a joke, that's all. <laughs> Somebody came by and told you a joke, huh? No, nobody came by. I heard the joke two years ago. <laughs> and you're still laughing at it? <laughs> well, I just got the punchline, that's... <laughs> Look, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful, Dad, but... Aren't you a little slow? I, I mean, two years. Now, wait a minute, son, wait a minute. You're forgetting one of my most popular <coughs> proverbs. He who laughs last, laughs best. I smell a fable coming up. Which reminds me of a fable. Now, you see? Not too far away and not too close either. There was a desert, the driest, most uninhabited piece of real estate you ever saw. Outside of the sand, the only thing that moved was two jackrabbits who were prospecting for gold. Hey, look at that, Charlie. You know what that is? That is high-grade date. Date? Date. But don't you worry, old pal. One of these days, we'll strike it rich. Come on, let's get some water. The only wet spot in the entire desert was a small outdoor restaurant operated by an industrious mule. The only thing the mule sold was water, which he procured from a nearby well. Good afternoon, gentlemen. And how are we today? We are hot and dry. So give us each a pitcher of water. I would like to comply very much with your wishes, but so far you have drunk 80 pitchers of water and you haven't paid me a cent. Look, we told you we'd pay when we hit gold, didn't we? Besides, 
Charlie has got a present for you. He has? Oh, well, that's different. Here's your water. Where's my present? Here. <laughs> he fell for it. He fell for it. Hey, that was a good one, Charlie. And the following day found the jackrabbits back on the job. And just like the day before, they eventually wound up at the Mule's restaurant. No, I regret to say you get no water unless you pay for it. Look, look, Mule. Charlie's awful sorry about the cigar joke yesterday. Ain't you, Charlie? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, to make up for it, I went into town. I bought you a real good one. Here. Well, I suppose it would be silly of me to hold a grudge. Very well. You can have your water today. Are you, are you sure this cigar is good? It's good, all right. Good and powerful. <laughs> <laughs> you did it, Charlie. You did it. You went and fooled them again. Now, on the following day, a very strange thing happened. Acting on a hunch, the two jackrabbits took a sample of dirt into the assayer's office and were told it contained not only gold, but silver, uranium, and even lanolin. And they were rich. That's right, Newell. Me and Charlie are billionaires. Here, have a cigar. No, you don't. Look, 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 Flam and me are leaving for France. And before we go, we thought we'd try and make up for all the nasty tricks we played on you. No cigars, please. Just pay me the money you owe. Mule, you hike me, honest. Oh, very well. But I warn you. Say, this is good. I told you. Well, Flem, let's go. You know, I I'm kind of proud of you, Charlie. For a minute there, I thought you was going to give that mule another exploding cigar. Oh, fun's fun, Flem, but after all... Well, sir, no one can have more fun in Paris than two jackrabbits, especially if they're rich. Ah, hey, this is what I call real living. By the way, how long have we been here? Two years and 11 days. Ah, hey, this is living all right. Sure is. Only we better go a little easier on our money. How much have we got left? Buck and a half. Uh -huh. Well, the spree was over, and there was nothing left to do but to return to the desert and dig for more gold. This is hard work. Let's quit and get some water. <laughs> nice to see you, Mule. Uh, by the way, I brought you a present all the way from Paris. Here. Uh, the Mule took one look at the cigar and promptly headed for parts unknown. As for the jackrabbits, they decided to get their own water. But can you imagine their surprise at finding the well empty? Hey, Mule! Come back! Let us out of here! So the Mule had the last laugh after all. And that's why I say... He who laughs last, laughs best. Gee, that's a swell fable, Pop. And a pretty good moral, too. Yeah, only a pretty good one? Well, I can think of a better one. All right, let's have it. <clears throat> you never miss the waiter till the well runs dry. You never do, oh, Junior. <laughs> Lovers of the good life, today we are going to learn how to avoid tipping the waiter. Check is three dollars and twenty-nine cents. Fifteen percent tip is customary. Keep a sharp eye now, and you will learn to save a fortune. Waiter, heavens to Betsy Ross! There's a live fly in my desert. I refuse to tip. Fly is no longer alive. Three dollars and twenty-nine cents, please. Expect larger tip additional effort. Which brings us to the fainting method, operating on the simple premise that when you faint, someone will carry you outside for fresh air. Once outside, you're safe. You just leave the money for the check. Oh, waiter. Oh, I'm feeling lightheaded. Oh, oh! This stuff's too good for a show like this. I'm filled. Shh. <laughs> Something must have gone wrong. 329 plus flowers comes now to 474, expecting much bigger tip. Then there's the disguise method. Hey, you, moose. There must be some mistake, waiter. I'm the lady that was sitting by the window. The moose left. Fine. Lady, your check was twenty-three sixty-eight. Tip naturally runs around five dollars for even cheapskate. Uh, but I haven't got more than five dollars altogether. Gee, Mr. Nordahl, you did it. You succeeded in not tipping the waiter. Yeah, and at two dollars a day, I'll have the bill and the tip paid in just a little more than three weeks. A month. 
Six months. Oh, well, they're closed on Christmas. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. Peabody here. You're just in time to join Sherman and me on another journey into history. What year shall I set the Wayback Machine for, Mr. Peabody? 1191, Sherman. And the place? The Holy Land, where we look in on the Crusades, led by that indestructible English monarch, Richard the Lionhearted. The Wayback transported Sherman and me to our destination, but as luck would have it, we arrived in the midst of a battle royal between the Saracens and the English. However, it was a battle of short duration. Golly, Mr. Peabody, all of a sudden everybody stopped fighting. I beg your pardon, soldier, but has the enemy surrendered? Oh, no, it's merely tea time. We always stop for our afternoon tea. Taking advantage of the brief recess, Sherman and I proceeded to seek out King Richard. It wasn't until we came across a regal tent at the rear of the lines that we heard... You dare to attack the King of England, do you? Well, take that. And that! Sounds like King Richard's in trouble. We entered, but saw no signs of the enemy. Arm yourselves if you value your lives. But who are you fighting? Him. Good heavens, a mouse. Yes, I was halfway through my Roquefort when the monster attacked. Couldn't you scare him off? Me scare him? Surely your majesty is not afraid of mice. Mice, fish, canaries, people, buildings, trees, you name it, I'm afraid of it. But why do they call you lion-hearted? A misnomer. Actually, I'm chicken-hearted. I would imagine that the war is going badly. Oh, yes. So far, I've lost two wedges of Roquefort, a slice of Limburger... Not your war, Your Highness. The war outside. Oh, that one. Yes, I wonder how it's going. We soon found out. Bad news, Your Grace! Out with it, man. Are we retreating? Worse than that, we've run out of tea. That is bad news. The situation called for an urgent meeting between Richard and his chiefs of staff. I say we should call the whole thing off. We're running low on crumpets. Gentlemen, I have a plan that would end the war in one hour. Wizard. Absolutely wizard. What is your plan? Who leads the Saracens? Saladin. Then you meet Saladin on the field of battle. Whoever wins, wins the war. How does that strike you? Unconscious. We adjourned to a practice area where I drilled Richard in the art of medieval warfare. This is a crossbow, sire. You merely pull the trigger and release the arrow in the direction of your opponent. You mean like this? Yes, like that. Of, co of course, your aim was bad. I see what you mean. Next, I instructed him in the handling of a mace. You mean you want me to smash that dummy with this? Exactly. Pretend it's Saladin. Oh, I can't do it. I'm much too much of a coward. You must force yourself, sire. Now swing, swing hard. And swing he did, launching a most prodigious blow. Couldn't I challenge Salad into a game of Parcheesi or something? No, you have to fight him. I guess you'll have to use this magic sword. Magic sword, Mr. Peabody? Yes. Don't you remember, Sherman? This piece of steel was fashioned by a dervish in Damascus. Whosoever wieldeth it possesses the courage of 20 lions. You mean if I fight Saladin with his sword, I can't lose? Precisely. Psst. Is it really a magic sword? Of course not, Sherman, but it may give him confidence. And so King Richard faced the fierce Saladin, and although Saladin was a master swordsman, when the smoke cleared... Later, inside Richard's tent, I disclosed the truth about the so-called magic sword. <laughs> I don't believe it. It's true, Your Grace. Look at the inscription. Made in Japan, not Damascus. Oh, that's wonderful. You mean your victory over Saladin? Oh, no. 
the fact that I can now look a goldfish in the eye without flinching. Thus, from that day forward, Richard lived up to the name Lionhearted. In fact, he never took a walk without at least two lions on a leash. Yes, Richard was Lionhearted, all right. Of course, he was no fool. last episode, the Bumbling Brothers Circus had fallen on hard times. It had rained steadily for weeks and weeks. Rocky, in an attempt to see what was causing the freakish weather, zoomed upward into the clouds. I can see it all now, Bullwinkle. It's... But at that moment, he disappeared into a cloud bank, and an instant later... Jump in key horse that. He'll be matriculated. Stunned by the massive dose of electricity, the plucky squirrel was dropping limply through space. A pitiful little furry bundle. Then, just when it seemed that all was lost... Yes, the mysterious black airplane had inadvertently saved our hero from a grisly fate. Hey, thanks a lot, Mr. Pilot. Mr. Oh. Pokey Smoke, there's nobody there. It was true. The front cockpit empty. The black plane flew on pilotless. And what's more, there's no control. That was true, too. So it was with a great deal of relief that Rocky saw that the plane was headed for a safe landing on a high mesa. No sooner had the wheels stopped rolling than Rocky leaped from the cockpit. I gotta get back to the circus with a nose. I got... I got... You got caught. That's what you got. And Rocky stared upward into the stony features of a huge, scowling Indian. Meanwhile, back at the big top... Cheer up, Bullwinkle. The show must go on. Must go on what? I don't know. It's just something... We always say at times like this. And the show did go on. That night, Bullwinkle's animal act was a tribute to his little friend. All the lions and tigers stood at attention and saluted, while Bullwinkle hummed taps. <laughs> Then they mournfully spelled out Rocky with white begonias, almost. Meanwhile, in the town square outside, the Bumbling Brothers were unveiling a statue of Rocky made out of genuine... Hey, wait, that's not Rocky. We, we know. know. It's really a Darius J. Schlump. We added the goggles on tail ourselves. But why? We got a special low price. The statue was already in the park. The mayor sold it to us. And he threw in this brass cannon, too. Now, hold on. The, the mayor sold you a statue and a brass cannon? Certainly. It was such a bargain. We couldn't pass it up. And here he is now. Allow me to introduce in myself, Mayor Avaricious J. Ward Healer. Are you kidding? We already met the mayor this afternoon, and you aren't him. Well, you're my the day mayor, that's why. And you're... The night mayor. I should have known. And further, if you'll notice the color from my beard, you're I'm also, also the, the old gray mayor. mayor. You know, Hugo, I think Bullwinkle's right. That's impossible. I think this fella's a crook. That's possible. What fella? Sure enough, at the first hint of danger, Boris had skedaddled. After him! And our friend started off after the false mayor, leaving the park to a pair of seedy old-timers. That certainly don't look like the Thaddeus schlump I knew, Chauncey. You mean the tail, Edgar? The tail I knew about. I just never saw him wear glasses. And meanwhile, what of Rocky himself? Well, he's tied to a stake in the middle of a mesa, awaiting heaven knows what. Yeah, what are we waiting for? We wait for Big Chief. It's pretty cold out here, you know. No worry. We build fire for you. And our hero's captor set fire to a pile of branches on which he was standing. Hey, you can't do that. Who say? The network say, quote, no cannibalism on TV. Unquote. We don't eat you, just roast you. Oh, well, I guess that's okay then. And the network approved flames licked higher and higher. Don't miss our next episode The Fire Chaser or Bullwinkle Goes to Blazes. Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Winkle. 
right. Bye now. See you next time. <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. When Rocky joined the Bumbling Brothers Circus, he never thought he'd wind up tied to a stake by a band of hostile Indians. Oh, well, that show be us. Soon, Big Chief come. Decide what we do with you. Well, if he don't hurry, there's only one thing he can do with me. Huh? Serve me with an apple in my mouth. Thought Network say no cannibalism on TV. Oh, it's all right to talk about it. You just can't do it. That network, all right. All talk. No do. Meanwhile, Bullwinkle, who had been chasing a disguised Boris through the desert, saw the glow of the fire and headed toward it. That must be him. Should be just on the other side of this big rocky. Bullwinkle! Looks like they're giving you a big league hot foot. Squirrel waiting for Big Chief to get here. Well, I'll go see if I can find him. Oop. You wait, too. Well, if you insist. But our boys didn't have to wait long. It's him, Big Chief, skunk who walked like man. You're Sarah. How? And like that? Blackbird capture squirrel, like you say. Moose just ad lib. Hey, what's all this about, Rock? I told you I knew why it kept raining on our circus. Yeah? Why? Because those Indians are rain dancers is why. And that big chief fella's been following our circus, doing rain dances every time we want to put on a show. And now we're going to make big sacrifice to great spirit. Toasted moose. And the Indian set fire to the branches underneath Bullwinkle. Now we have big celebration. It looks bad, Bullwinkle. Oh, what the ding dong, Rock. No you spoiling the party. Live it up, I say. Hey, fellas. <coughs> <coughs> A celebration like this just don't happen every day. <coughs> <coughs> you crazy, Bullwinkle. So let's have a ball. Come on, chillin'. Everybody dance. And hauling out his trusty hummercomb, Bullwinkle struck up a lively tune. <laughs> Immediately, the Indians began a wild dance. <laughs> oh, poor Bullwinkle. He's crazy with a E. It certainly seemed so, but the musical moose went on playing as the flames leaped higher and higher. And then suddenly... Bullwinkle, it's raining! Of course. These Indians are rain dancers, aren't they? Hey, that's right. And I figure by now, they got a good cloud burst whipped up. <laughs> it's raining. The fire's going out. Stop the music. Too late. The fires were out cold. <gasps> you plenty hep moose. Blow crazy comb. Thanks a lot. We gonna miss you. Miss us? Sure. Big Chief say sacrifice, he mean sacrifice. You Sarah sport. That voice, where have I heard that voice? Maybe he's that Kimo Sabi filly. No, he'd have a masked rider with him. You mean like me, darling? Great gobs of goo rock, it's him or her. Okay, boys, ready with the bow and arrows. They're gonna arrow size us, rock. What can we do? Nothing. How come? 
Because the masked writer and the faithful Indian friend are always on the side of law and order. You mean... I don't know how it happened, Bullwinkle, but we must be the bad guys. Funny, we're not wearing black hats. And Boris's band of oh. Indian archers drew a bead on our two heroes. Don't miss our next arrowing episode of... <laughs> arrowing episode of... <laughs> That's a good one. Come on, come on. It's the end of the episode. Oh, boy. The next episode is Flaming Arrows. Or Bowwinkle meets his match. Arrowing episode. And now... Hey, Rocky. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Enjoy your lunch, son? Oh, hi, Pop. Uh, this isn't lunch. Uh, so I can see. Candy, wasn't it? Uh-huh. I was gonna give it to my girl for Valentine's. Instead, you gave it to your stomach. Well, she doesn't like me anymore. She's got a crush on Butch Croesus. Well, I should think you'd be heartbroken. Well, I was. For about five minutes. Junior, you have just displayed a perfect illustration of one of my favorite adages. To wit, time heals all wounds. And now comes the fable, right? Right. This one is entitled The Owl and the Wolf. There was once a wolf who had an uncontrollable passion for clocks. Clocks of any kind, wristwatches, sundials, anything, so long as it told the time. Oh, man, them tick ticks. Ain't they the most? Now, this wolf was a highly unsavory character, for you see, he'd come by those timepieces illegally. Hmm, 10 o'clock. Time for me to go to work. Work was highway robbery in the strictest sense. Stop! I am the mass clock. Usually, the coaches stopped. How about that? An express? And sure enough, the next one did. Your clocks are your lives. Please, sir, all I have is this egg timer given to me by my mother. Like that's tough, turtle. And the cruel wolf took his booty and departed. Now, during the day, the wolf worked in a clock shop. What time do you have, wolf? Ah, uh, half past, boss. The boss was no fool. He knew that on the wages he paid the wolf, he could never afford an egg timer like that. Something was rotten in Denmark, which is where our story took place. So, uh, you suspect a wolf of being the masked clock, eh? I do, Inspector. All right. We'll set a trap for him and, uh, see what happens. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, something I can do for you? Yes, I'd like to know how much this alarm clock is worth. The wolf could hardly control himself. Never had he seen a clock like this before. Wow, a second hand, a third hand, and even a fourth. I'll uh, tell you what, I'll come back tomorrow, and uh, you let me know how much it's worth. Oh, and uh, incidentally, I'll be on the midnight stage tonight. It was an ingenious trap. If the wolf were the masked clock, he would definitely stick up the midnight stage, hoping to snare the alarm clock and the inspector would be well prepared. Halt! I am the masked clock! The wolf was there, but the inspector wasn't. For the midnight stage he had referred to was the stage of the midnight theater where he was appearing as a juggler. The following morning... Oh, good morning, sir. Uh, I missed you last night. I mean, <laughs> you're looking well. About this alarm clock, Wolf, how much is it worth? I can't tell you now, but uh, I will tonight. I'll meet you on the midnight stage. You guessed it. The inspector took the ride while the wolf juggled. Look, wolf, uh, we can't seem to get together, can we? It has been difficult. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a masked bear appeared. Pause up! I am the masked watch! Clock. Yeah. Oh, no, you're not. I am the masked watch. Clock. Before the inspector knew what was happening, the bear grabbed the coveted alarm clock and ran off. Quick! We must stop him, the dirty thief! 
You stop him. I got a juggle. Matinee today. The wolf bought a ticket on the first stage leaving town. Strangely enough, so did his boss. Why aren't you minding the store, wolf? I'm on the trail of the mass watch. That's why. Mass clock, you mean. Oh. The stage rattled on over the countryside, that is, until it reached a certain obstacle. It's the inspector. Everybody out. Okay? One of you is a mass clock. Which is it? Not I, sir. Nor I. Don't give me that. You see, I can tell which one it is by searching you and finding my alarm clock. But the two suspects remain steadfast. Look, there's something you should know. I loaded that alarm clock with TNT, and it's due to go off any second. Now confess, or we'll all be blown up. The seconds tick by, but the wolf and the bear refuse to admit anything. Suddenly, the clock, which was in the bear's pocket, broke the silence. Oh, my gosh, it's going to go off. Here, take it, Inspector. Ah, so you are the mass clock. No, sir, I am. Now, please, get rid of that thing before it goes off. Never fear. It isn't really loaded with TNT. I just said that to trick you. Well, it may not have been loaded with TNT, but whatever it was, the clock certainly didn't work too well. The wolf, the owl, and the bear all went on to bigger and higher things. It serves him right, Pop. You bet it does. That's why I say time heals all wounds. That's not what I say. I say time wounds all heals. Uh... Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. Hello there. Today's poem is the beloved old nursery rhyme, Rocky My Baby. Rocky My Baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks... Hold the... it! Hold it! You out of your mind, Moose? Oh, more than usual, G.J. All right, get that cradle down here. But, G.J. Look, this is a family show. No babies stuck in trees. No. We'd have the Baby Protection League on our necks in a minute. Well, it's just a doll, really. Who writes this stuff anyway? Uh, Mother Goose. Hello? Give me continuity. C.P., we got a woman named Goose on the payroll. Uh-huh. Get rid of her. Yeah, the gander's got to go, too. But the poem... Sorry, too much violence. But I like violence. You liked violence? You mean you like explosions? Trees falling? People being hit in the head? No, I like violence because they smell so nice. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... Midnight! Oh! Should have tried E flat. <laughs> region of Canada at the close of the 19th century, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police held fast to their tradition of, we always get our man. Bleak, cold, lonely, not a pretty place for a high-spirited girl like Nell Fenwick, daughter of Inspector Fenwick, commander of the post. You, Dudley do right Horse, are the only one who understands me. You know the longing, the boredom. If only once the Mounties would not get their man. If only once Dudley do right would do wrong like some other men do. I need bright lights, laughter, gaiety. What I'm saying, Horse, is that I want to go into show business. <coughs> but, Nell, you know how your father feels about show business. Oh, why don't you go out and bring in a man or something? Very well. Realizing that her father would never allow her to go into show business, Nell put on a mask and left the camp. <laughs> All right, all right, where the Wheel of Fortune stops, nobody knows. Next contestant, please. Name, please. I am the masked Ginny Lynn. Go ahead, Miss Lynn. Oh! oh. oh. 
rather unusual voice quality, boss. I'll say. This is our chance to go straight again. Look, they're all sound asleep. Keen. You have just won the Major Steidley Amateur Hour. You get the grand tour with all expenses paid. It's the hey, last Jimmy it's Lewis. Lewis. It's Lewis. 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 So Snidely with his mask, Ginny Lynn swept the country. No town escaped the ruthless masked singer. I really knocked him out in Toronto, eh? Meanwhile, a man from one of the ravished towns wandered into the mounted police camp. And, Inspector, you should hear this masked Ginny Lynn. Hoo-wee! Pretty square, eh? Like the squarest. Don't worry. As you know, the Canadian Mounties always get a man. You see, here comes a mountain now. Nell! Nell! I did as you said. I got my man. Dudley, how many times have I got to tell you? This is a dog. This is a man. Oh, all right. You're under arrest. No, 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 no. Not this man. Oh, well, never mind. This is about the squarest Mountie I've ever seen. Hmm. That's right, sir. Square shooting, Dudley do right at your service. Dudley, how do you feel about Lawrence Welk? Only terrific, Inspector. That's real toe-tapping music. I thought so. Dudley, I have a little job for you. You are the only Mountie square enough to carry it off. That's me, Inspector. Square and true, eyes of blue. I want you to bring in the mask, Ginny Lynn. And I know you can do it because... Ta-da! The Mounties always get their men. But this is a woman, sir. Go do right. And so one night in Saskatchewan... Snidely, there's a Mountie out there in the audience. A Mountie, eh? Listen, baby, I want you to go out there and sing like you have never sung before. <laughs> this will put him to sleep. Did you put in the cotton, Barney? Yeah. Okay, then draw the curtain. Oh, sing it, baby. Mama's little baby love shot. Then shot in. Oh, don't do 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 do. Snidely, he ain't sleeping. Well, then what's he doing? He's he's enjoying it. Oh, turn off the lights and call the law right now. Do 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 do. Miss Lynn, I certainly do enjoy your singing, but when you see, I am a mountie, square and true. So I really Dudley, must. Dudley, I thought I told you to go bring in a man. Nell, then you're the masked Ginny Lynn. Surprise. So Dudley brought Nell, Snidely, and Barney back to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Camp. Well, Dudley, you finally did it. You brought in your man, Snidely Whiplash, the most wanted man in the territory of this glorious nation. But tell me, where's the masked Ginny Lynn? Inspector, just wait till you hear her sing. She's a little old Florence Nightingale, that's what, and here she is, your own daughter, Nell. Nell? I knew there was something missing around here. You mean, Nell, it was you? You know, Father, how you've always held me back. Well, I got my break at last. I'm in showbiz. I'm a star. Just listen. Dee 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 dee. Oh, sing that thing. Jumpin' and chopin'. Mama's little oh. baby love chopin'. Oh. Mama's little baby love shortening bread. Oh. Sorry. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a. Not that lesson. This lesson. Rocky and Bullwinkle finally found out why it kept raining on their circus, all right. It seems they were the victims of an Indian rain dance tribe, headed by Chief Skunk, who walks like a man. Or as we know him, Boris bad enough. But the information seems to have done them little, if any good, for in our last episode, they were tied to stakes while the Indians prepared to use them for archery practice. This seemed like pretty chicken thing to do, Chief. You kidding? I got orders straight from Great Spirit himself. Oh. What reason he give for knocking off moose and squirrel? No reason, it's just policy. That figure. Well, unless Great Spirit gives sign, it's all up with those two. But at that instant, there was a rumbling roar, and the ground suddenly began to shake under their feet. Pokey smoke, Bullwinkle. Great Spirit angry, Chief. It feels like an earthquake. Looks like one, too. 
Maybe we're not supposed to harm moose and squirrel. Don't be silly. Look, I'll do it myself. And Boris loosed a flight of arrows at our friends, but he was jittering so much, and so were they, that every one of them missed. They got charmed lives. Charmed lives, nothing. They just locked in again. Luck had little to do with it, for that earthquake wasn't an earthquake at all. <laughs> It was really the thunder of a herd of circus elephants dashing to the rescue, directed by Hugo and Igo Bumbling. Oh, I love the pattern of tiny feet. We are coming, boys. Yeah, hang on. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere. And the elephants thundered through the camp, scattering Indians in every direction. In a trice, our friends were free again. But I wonder whatever happened to the masked rider and his Indian friend. Ayo, Jumbo, away! Well, I guess that solves our rain problem, Mr. Bumbling. Yeah, as soon as we arrange room for these Indians to stay in. Oh, that'll be easy. <laughs> if we want a room for an Indian, we, we just make a reservation. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, you know that joke? We, we know all Indian, Indian jokes. jokes. Who you think right Indian jokes? Indian comedians? Sure. You never hear of Bob Hopi. Redskin skeleton. Belt Silver Hill. Yeah, come to think of it, I'm part Indian myself. Yo, Indian. You never hear of Sitting Bullwinkle? Oh, 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 good show. Well, that did it. The tribe agreed not to bother the circus anymore, and Rocky and Bullwinkle were made honorary Indian chiefs. Now, there's something you not see every day, Chauncey. What that, Edgar? Indian chief with bushy tail. Oh, that not so strange, Edgar. Look next to him. What? Moose with feathers. Ugh. Well, it looked like happy days for the Bumbling Brothers' big top, but it wasn't clear sailing yet. For only a few days later, Rocky was called into the office wagon of Hugo and Igo Bumbling. What is it, Mr. Bumbling and Mr. Bumbling? Rocky, you've been in charge of the elephants all season. Ain't? Sure. And you've been working for Peanut, right? Well, if it's good enough for the elephants, it's good enough for me. Rocky, we got something to say to you. Oh, no, I don't want to race. You wouldn't get it. Rocky, you're, you're fired. Fired? Our Rocky? Preempted, yes. Cancelled, maybe, but fired? Never. Except, Except this one. Well, that's impossible. Be sure to see our next indignant episode. It's in the bag, or Rocky gets the sack. Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell.
Well, there was shocking news for Rocky in our last episode. After having taken care of the Bumbling Brothers Circus Elephants nearly all season, he was called into the office and... Fired! Fired! Sorry, Rocky. But why? Well, it was a terrible story the Bumbling Brothers told, and they told it terribly, too. You see, every week we weigh the elephants. You know, we've always had the biggest ones in the world. Every elephant at least three tons. It's a rule, 6,000 pounds. But less week. Only 5,400 pounds each. And we got ten elephants. Together, they lost 6,000 pounds. Rocky, I hate to say it, but you've lost a whole elephant somewhere. So you're fired. Gee, naturally. Of course, when Bullwinkle heard the news, he was furious. You can't do that to my pal. Either he stays or I go. Oh, it's all right, Bullwinkle. I don't blame him. Neither do I, but I'm a hero. I always gotta stick by my buddy. Well, I go, we got to have a good lion tamer. And that's me. So we better keep our lousy elephant trainer. And that's me? Unfortunately for our boy's peace of mind, the next week was even worse. Bullwinkle, this elephant weighs under 5,000 pounds. Yeah, his ribs are starting to show, too. Now let's look at this thing logically. That'll be a switch. Every elephant eats two bales of hay and 50 buckets of water a day. Not counting snacks between meals. And the kids feed him about 20 pounds of peanuts. That's about 200 pounds of food every day. They should be getting fat. Unless they're taking pills. <laughs> Bullwinkle, that's it. Whoa, whoa, what's it? They're taking pills. Without a prescription? Somebody must be sneaking reducing pills to our elephants. But who? Well, I give them their hay myself, so somebody must be putting something in the water. Who gives them the water? Allow me to introducing myself. Hey, don't I know you? Sure, Mike. I'm Gonga Drain, Indian type water boy. Gonga Drain? Hey, you're in another adventure of ours. What are you doing at the circus? Well, we already had the costumes. No use letting them go to waste. Gunga drain? You may talk of ginger beer when you're quartered safe out here with only penny for All right, all right, I know the poem. I don't like this, Bullwinkle. Neither do I, but it's the only dialogue we got. Don't you like Kipling? I don't know. I never... Oh, I just can't say it. You better come along with me to the office, Gunga Drain. I can't. Why? I think my mommy's calling me. Your mommy? Where's she? Where else? In Egypt. Bye. By golly, Bullwinkle, I think we did it. We sure did. What? We got rid of the water boy. I'll bet the elephants will get fat now. Alas for Rocky's hopes. The next time they weighed the elephants... Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. This one weighs under a thousand pounds. He does look svelte, I must say. But we got rid of our water boy. Let's see. You give him the hay. Right. I give him the water. Right. Who gives him the peanuts? The kid. Then some kid is doing it. Some kid. Bullwinkle, I'm ashamed of you. I won't believe it's a kid. Okay, me neither. Well, our heroes have demonstrated a touching faith in the youth of America. But at that very moment, a diminutive figure wearing a Rocky and Bullwinkle t-shirt was feeding peanuts to the elephants. Peanuts loaded with reducing pills. Don't fail to miss our next episode. A short wait for all seats or one of our trunks is missing. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was called Red Riding Hood because she, uh, well, because she was, that's why. Anyway, one day she was going through the woods to Grandma's house to sell her a membership in the PTA. As she went, she sang a song. La, 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 That's not much of a song. Well, I'm not much of a singer. La, 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 Now, although Red didn't know it, on the path up ahead, a wolf was waiting to, uh, to, uh... I hereby swear that I'll be good. I will not eat a riding hood. Well, what's all this? I just joined Riding Hood's Anonymous. What? I'm trying to kick the Riding Hood habit. La, 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 la. When you see a Riding Hood, greet her as a friend you should. Hello, Red Riding Hood. 
When you are misunderstood, extend your oh. hand to Riding Hood. Put her there, pal. Now wait, now wait, wait. Really, Red? I'm a new wolf. I sworn off Riding Hoods. See? Words of courage and hope to Riding Hood eaters. Is this on the level, Wolf? Sure. Listen here. Stick with your promise not to eat. Fight that urge for a Riding Hood treat. If you're really my friend, you'll buy a PTA membership. I'll take a dozen. I'll even deliver your basket for you. Where's it go? To Grandma's. It's a basket full of... Goodies. I'm sorry about that. That was my special wolf basket. Here's another one. Hey, okay. And the wolf set off towards Grandma's house. I'm going to see you, Grandma. I'm going to see you. But just then, a thought crossed his mind. Hey, uh, let me see here. Just as I thought, though riding hoods you may not munch, there's nothing wrong with a Grandma lunch. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to eat the grandma. I'm going to eat the grandma. But when grandma heard the wolf coming... Hey, you know what, grandma? I'm going to eat you right after I give you this basket of... Goodies. Young man, you dropped your basket. Well, isn't this interesting? You ready for lunch now, grandma? Oh, but you've made a mistake. I'm not a grandma. I'm a riding hood. That's a grandma. If you're a riding hood, where were your PTA tickets? Riding hoods don't sell PTA tickets. They sell D-A-R tickets. D-A-R? Yes, Daughters of American Riding Hoods. They do? How many? I'll take a dozen. Good. Now to get that doggone grandma in the woods. Fine. Here's a nice basket of goodies for her. I'm going to eat the grandma. I'm going to eat the grandma. Hey, grandma, you told me a fib. I did. Yeah, you want a riding hood? I just saw a real riding hood, and she sent you this basket of goodies. Look, Wolf, right here in your own book, see? That's a grandma. Grandmas, you can tell a far. They belong to D-A-R. Oh, darn her. And the wolf sped back to grandma's house. Let's see now, when the grandmas claim their riding hoods, be a photographer in the woods. Yes? Good morning, madam. If you are a riding hood, you can have your picture taken with a real Shetland pony. Free! Sorry, I'm a grandma. I knew it. Your time is up. You're right. Every second counts. Yeah, it does. You've got to get these dispatches to the front. You're the only one with a horse. Carry on! Trust me, Colonel! Did the wolf get here yet, Grandma? Oh, he's been and gone two times, child. I just sent him off with a package of... Goodies. Well, I guess he won't bother us anymore, and... Uh, you know, I've decided to quit riding Hoods Anonymous. I'm gonna eat both of you. Now, now, remember, I pledge, I pledge, I will not eat. One riding hood can spell defeat. Run! Every day in every way, I am not eating riding hoods. Run! And Red Riding Hood and her grandmother dashed out of the house just one jump ahead of the wolf. Well, it looks as if nobody lives happily ever after. <laughs> I did. You did. Sure, I got to be a member of the PTA and a member of the DAR. And besides, I got these 200 baskets full of... Yeah, goodies. Well, I was right. Nobody lived happily ever after. discussion concerns how to tame lions and pick up a little scratch on the side of your head. <clears throat> In order to tame a lion, one needs four items. A whip, a gun, a chair, and a tame lion, like Teddy here. <clears throat> Got up on the wrong side of the cage, didn't we? 
First, we proceed to test the whip. This is done by snuffing out a candle that sits on the head of a small flying squirrel. You sure you know what you're doing, Mr. Nordo? <laughs> Haven't missed yet. We are now prepared to face the lion. Are you ready, Teddy? <laughs> now for my next subject, how to run the four-minute mile in 30 seconds with whip and chair. Wait a minute. Aren't you going to show us how to tame a lion? Not with Teddy being as ready as he is. Oh, come on. Very well. I shall tame him with hypnotism. Teddy, look into my eyes. <laughs> No, I am the master. You are the slave. You are in my power. Now I shall demonstrate the most dangerous feat of all, putting my head into Teddy's mouth. Teddy! That's wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message! Just in time! Is it important? Is it? Just look! Hello again, Peabody here, and you're just in time to accompany Sherman and me on another journey into history. How far back do we go today, Mr. Peabody? Back to the year 1797, Sherman, where we join England's most celebrated naval hero, Lord Horatio Nelson, for the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. As is customary with all my inventions, the Wayback Machine performed perfectly, transporting Sherman and me to the main deck of Nelson's flagship. So Britannia rules the sea, does she? Well, I'm afraid that motto is due to go into extinction. Pardon us, Your Lordship, but what seems to be the problem? You mean you haven't heard? We just got here. Well, this blundering crew of mine left Port Minus one very important commodity. You forgot to bring cannons? No. Ammunition? No. What then? We forgot to cast off. Sure enough, an unbelievably long hawser held the flagship in check. Does that rope stretch all the way back to England? All the way. And unless we get loose, we can't go into battle. I suppose you've considered cutting it in two. We've considered it, yes. But you see, admiralty law frowns on such action. One must cast off, and one must cast off while leaving the dock. Oh, I'm afraid it's hopeless. Meanwhile, just off the coast, the Spanish fleet lay at anchor. <laughs> Look at that silly Nelson. He is like the sitting dog, yes, my captain? Yes, like the sitting dog who is at the end of his rope. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what we do. We send him a message. Hi, George, it's a communication from the enemy. Dear Lord Nelson, you are cordially invited to attend an informal battle staged in your honor at 6 p.m. as ever the Spanish Navy. Isn't there something we can do, Mr. Peabody? There is one thing. Lord Nelson, I suggest you send a dinghy back to England to cast off the hawser. Impossible. A dinghy would have to make it there by six so that we could go into battle. There isn't a man alive who could row that fast. Mr. Peabody could. He won the International Regatta three years in a row. Four years, Sherman. Four years. And so, wasting no time, we headed back to England. Unfortunately, upon arrival, we found the dock heavily guarded. Nelson should know better than to leave port without casting off. It just isn't done. I'll have him broken for this news. Now, remember, no one is to touch that hawser. No one, understand? Uh-oh. Now what, Mr. Peabody? This calls for subterfuge, Sherman. Pure, unadulterated subterfuge. Alt. Oh, ghost there. Stand aside. It is I, the head of the RRI. Oh. Oh, uh, now, off a mo, I never had no RRI. What's it stand for? Royal Rope Inspectors. It's our job to inspect rope, like this one here. Oh, now take your hands off that there hawser. It's almost six, Mr. Peabody. We've got to hurry. I said take your hands off that hawser. That's Navy property, that is. Hmm, look at this. Intestinal calcification of the fiber. What's that? Sounds horrible. Never fear. England will care for your survivors. My what? Survivors. 
You see, unless we get rid of this rope, you're going to become infected and... Well, get rid of the ratty thing. And get rid of it, we did. Just as Big Ben told Six. Of course, the rest is history. Nelson succeeded in sinking the Spanish fleet. Oh, so Nelson was like the sitting duck, eh? I think we made a boo-boo, yes, my captain? Yes, we made a boo-boo by joining the Navy instead of the Army. Come on, push me into shore. Later that evening, we returned Nelson's dinghy. England owes you much, my friends. Goodbye and good luck. Well, Sherman, shall we go? Well, I guess so, Mr. Peabody, but I sure am disappointed. Why is that? Well, I never did find out why Lord Nelson wears an eye patch. However, it wasn't a total loss. Sherman did discover something about wrestling. For there, on the poop deck, someone was giving an exhibition. It was Lord Nelson's half-brother. That, of course, is how the term half-Nelson came to be. success as the world's only musical lion tamer. <laughs> but his pal Rocky isn't doing so well as an elephant trainer, for all of his elephants are losing weight at a frightening speed. And what's more, the reason appears to be that they are being fed reducing pills by a little boy. No, I won't believe that a kid would do such a thing. He don't know me very well, do he? Yes, unbeknownst to our friends, the little boy and his mommy were really Burris and Natasha out to destroy the circus. Bowwinkle, I just can't watch those elephants shrink away to skeletons. I'm going to leave the circus. You hear that, Natasha? One down, one to go. You can't leave, Rock. Think of all the little kids who have faith in you. Yeah, I guess I can't let him down. But at that moment... There he is, that mean widow squirrel that won't feed the pretty owl fence. Shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. Please, Ethelbert. Ethelbert? I'll give you a hit with my all-day soccer, you bad squirrel, you. Come along now. Ethelbert? You see, Bullwinkle, even the kids have lost faith in me. Ethelbert? Now all we got to do is get rid of Moose and the circus is ruined. How we do that? Easy. Tonight is going to be a fake lion in the cage with him. A fake lion? Looky here. We get inside this fake lion suit. But instead of jaws, this lion has a steel bear trap with poison teeth. Oh, delightful. And when Moose puts his head in lion's mouth, I pull the trigger and... <laughs> no more Moose. And we got a little something to hang on the wall of the den besides. You mean lion skin? I mean moose head. Sure enough, that night, when Bullwinkle entered the cage, there was one substitute lion waiting for him. At first, all went well with his act. Until it was time for the grand finale. Not knowing of the deadly steel trap that waited him inside the fake lion, Bullwinkle bent down to place his head in the lion's mouth. Boris's hand touched the trigger, and at that instant... Telegram for Bullwinkle Moose! For me? <laughs> Be with you in a minute. Hey, Rock. It's from the Bullwinkle Fan Club in Missoula, Montana. Don't put your head in the lion's mouth. It's a trap. Weather continues fine. Love the kids. A trap? Gee, Bullwinkle, they saved your life. Pretty thoughty of them. Boris, let's get out of here. Again, the zipper is stuck. That's a pretty fierce lion, Bullwinkle. He must be a man-eater. I know. I just heard the man talking. I think we ought to give this lion to a zoo. A zoo? And the boys did just that. So next time you're at the lion's cage at the zoo, listen carefully. And behind the bars, you may hear... Boris, I told you to get a lion suit with buttons. Oh, roar. What's that mean, darling? That's lion talk for, shut up, you mouth. Of course, as soon as summer was over, school started and our friends returned to Frostbite Falls. But Bumbling Brothers Circus went on to even greater glory. The elephants got fat again, of course, and the lions did their routines even without a trainer. I guess Bumbling Brothers Circus is world famous now, Bullwinkle. Yeah. I hear they're very big in England. Of course, there they just call Bumbling Brothers Circus by its initials. You mean? Sure. You never heard of the BBC? <laughs> no. 
Ooh. And with that transatlantic jeep, we close another true life adventure of Rocky the Flying Squirrel <laughs> and Bullwinkle Moose. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The feed, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more. Mexico. Just over the horizon lay the sleepy little village of Mucho Loma. English translation, much mud. Folk who dwelled there were so tuckered out, slashing their way through the streets, they spent most of the day and night regaining their strength. Tell me, Jose, you old stick in the mud. Are you too tired to play tiddly winks? I'm too tired to tiddly, but I'm gonna take 40 winks. It was just about then that Guadalupe Rodriguez made his untimely entrance into Mucho Loma. It will be chilly today, but at Tomali, but oh by golly, blame it all on Sam or Sally. The arms of Morpheus were fractured. Hey, you with the big mouth, you are under arrest. What for I under arrest, senor Sherry? City ordinance, no more cuatro, dos cinco, being a loud mouth during siesta. It was one year later that a tight-lipped Guadalupe walked out of jail, mounted his loyal steed, rode at least 200 miles without saying a word, halted in the middle of nowhere, and said... Dirty cotton-picking town! Revenge had burned deep into his tone-deaf head, and his plan for attaining it was at the very least bizarre. First, he stole a branding iron, one with an O at the end. Next, he made off with a black cowboy suit that had once been worn by Sunset Carson. That night, when all of Mucho Loma was peacefully slumbering, a masked rider galloped in and raised an unbelievable ruckus. Hey, 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 everybody up! Nobody go to sleep! The dam is breaking! Rise and shine up and let up! Lights were frantically lit, but not the citizens. They stumbled out of their beds, alarmed by the uproar. Doggone, this mud is ruining my Dr. Denton's. Don't worry about the mud. Look what's coming. Down the street he dashed, pausing long enough to stab his hot branding iron here, there, everywhere. The mark of zero. Thus begins a terrible tale, a tale of endless nights in which the masked marauder tormented the town, not so much as allowing a child to close its eyes and sleep. Red-eyed, thoroughly distraught, the town council held an emergency meeting. Senores, please, no bickering. 
Now, we must hire someone to capture this notorious Knight Rider with the big mouth. Any suggestions? Let's call in the Lone Ranger. No, he's got problems of his own. He just found out Tanto is a girl. Suppose we leave this perplexed group and look in on our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle, whose touring sedan has come to an unscheduled stop atop a hill overlooking Mucho Loma. I think we made a wrong turn when we left Tallahassee. Well, you had the map, Bullwinkle. I had what map, Rob? The one I told you to keep under your hat. This is not a hat. This is a hat rack. I mean, check a bit, Nico. Well, chances are we're lost then and probably out of gas. I shall check the gas tank. And so he did while Rocky surveyed the town below. Sure hope there's a garage down there. Well, I checked the gas tank. It's still there. I know it's there. Is there any gas in it? I shall check. Oh, God. Say, Rock, I can't see inside the tank. Got a match? You strike a match and we'll blow up. <laughs> it must be a joke. Bullwinkle was smart enough not to use a match. <laughs> You're right, sir. I shall use my lighter. <laughs> You couldn't call it a complete mistake, for it not only catapulted the moose back into the car, but sent it reeling down the hill at a breakneck clip. And of all things, right at the Mucho Loma Town Hall. Will they get together? Will they hit it off right? Don't miss the boys bounce back, or springtime in the Rocky. <laughs> Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. It seems that once upon a time, there was a kingdom without a princess. And since no real kingdom should be without a princess, the king decreed that a princess must be found. A princess must be found. The king was interrupted by the court jester, Million Laughs Charlie. How, 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 how? How about a good laugh today, kingy? A funny thing happened to me on our way to the castle. This Irishman says please, to me... Please, please, Charlie, I'm trying to find the princess lost since childhood. Oh, gosh, King, that's a great idea. How are you gonna do it? Nothing to it, Charlie. Just offering a million gold grickles for the princess when she shows up. A million gold grickles? Uh, well, sire, uh, I'd love to help on this project. Do you remember what she looked like at all? No. Good! I, I mean, oh, that's too bad. She was just a baby when she left. But I'll know her by the way she passes the test I have in mind. Sure. Well, see you around, Kingy. I have to go cheer up some shut-ins in the dungeon. Yuck, yuck. But Million Last Charlie wasn't really going to the dungeon. Oh, oh, no, no. He was on his way to find... A million gold grickles. The happy ending. Oh, I just love fairy tales. Charlie. Huh? Let's go to a show tonight. Uh, not now, honey. I got a big deal cooking. Don't bother Charlie now, baby. And the jester entered the house of his good friend, Clyde Clod. Uh, hiya, Charlie. Hiya, Princess. Uh, a Princess? But uh, I'm Never a... say not, Clyde. Just put on his outfit. So Charlie and Clyde Clod set out for the castle to fool the king. Uh, I don't want to be no Princess. These high heels are killing me. Well, King, here she is. The first contender for Princess. Big for her age, isn't she? All right, step this way. Now, if she stays awake on these mattresses overnight, I'll know she is the one. Well, how, how's that? There will be a small P under the bottom mattress. If she's a real princess, she will be so refined, so sensitive, that even a tiny lump like that won't let her sleep. Very clever. The make-believe princess climbed to the top of the pile and lay down. Then, Charlie and the king waited all night. It's time. I'll climb up and see if she's still awake. If she's not, she sure will be. Sure enough. Clyde was sound asleep, but when Charlie's spear came through the mattress... Ooh! Aha! Look! She's sound asleep. That's not the real princess. Out! Deny with that, hussy! Now you've done it, bungler. But, Charlie... Cannot you do anything, right? But, Charlie, uh... Put this on and meet me at the castle and see that you don't muff it this time. Hey, uh, okay, Charlie. Charlie, let's go on a picnic. I'll make peanut butter sandwich. Ah, uh, no, sorry, honey. I'm in the exact middle of a very big deal. In a little while, Clyde was once more climbing onto the mattresses. 
Is the pea still in place, Charlie? I will see your majesty. But while checking the pea, Charlie opened a bottle of mosquitoes. The idea was that they would be sure to keep Clyde awake. Unfortunately, one landed on his nose. So, when the king climbed the ladder to say good night... This girl is asleep already. She's a fake. Out! You imposterous! Oh, Charlie, I can't do it. I ain't no princess. I'm just a... Sure you can, kid. You'll make a great princess. Now, put this on. And here, take this alarm clock. It'll wake you in the nick of time. Sure enough, the next morning, just as the king was climbing up to check the princess, the alarm went off. Another fake. It's disgraceful. You know, you just can't believe anybody these days. You're absolutely right, Charlie. What do you mean? I mean, out and stay out. Uh, I tried, Charlie. Not hard enough. Well, honey, you're in luck. Million Laughs Charlie, yuck, yuck, is now available for that date. No, oh, I can't make it, Charlie. Didn't get a wink of sleep last night. I think there was a pee under my mattress. First, we'll have dinner at a pee. You don't sleep a wink? Yes, this really was the princess. The real princess. The girl that would get the million gold grickles and all the titles of her realm. 999,999. One million gold grickles. You also get your choice of any man in the kingdom. Just sign this receipt. Any man in the kingdom? Darling! You said it! Will you be mine? The uh, for keeps? Well, that's the story. The king had his daughter, the princess had her gold, and Clyde had the princess. Yeah, yeah, they all live happily ever after. I hate fairy tales. <laughs> Time for Bullwinkle's Corner. Today's poem is a ballad of the war between the states. Barbara Fritchie. The spires of Frederick usually stand green-walled by the hills of Maryland. But the town was deserted that autumn day cause Confederate troops were on the way. But there old Barbara Fritchie sat. Her Union heart was loyal yet. And up the street came the fearsome Paul. Ye Stonewall bodies, hi you all! Under his slouch hat left and right he glanced, then saw a wondrous sight. Woo boy! Quick as it fell from the clothesline <laughs> there, Dame Barbara snatched her underwear. Shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare my union suit, she said. <laughs> Foolish girl. Hold it, Stonewall. Who touches the hair of my gray head dies like a dog. March on, I said. I may be patriotic, but I'm not crazy. And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Chinook. A wind that blew through Canada in the fall of 1928, but the biggest Chinook of them all was Dudley Do-Right, who blew through Canada at the turn of the century. Farewell, Mother. I am off to the movies. Take care of yourself, son, and don't forget to write. Dudley spent the next three hours in a neighborhood theater without once seeing the picture. The reason for this was that he had fallen down a manhole and was sitting in a sewer. Oh, my. I am guilty of trespassing. The family code was a Do-Right must always do right. So the conscious stricken lad turned himself in at the closest mounted police post, which was 500 miles miles away in northern Alberta. This particular post was then under the able command of Inspector Ray K. Fenwick, a full-blooded Canadian born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Ordinarily, I'd give you 20 years for your crime. You can have it for nothing if you wish. The inspector knew a comeback when he heard it. How would you like to be a mounted? I would rather live in Philadelphia. But when Dudley saw the official Monte uniform, particularly the string attached to the pistol, he was hooked. A mounty I shall be. After about an hour and a half of basic training, he was ready for his first job. You see that jar of jelly? Read the label. Mother Whiplash's log jam. Right. 
Now spread some jam on a piece of bread and bite. The strapping young Canadian did as he was told. Anything happen? Yes, sir. I've just lost two teeth. That's because that so-called jam is in reality cement. Pointing to a map, the inspector filled our hero in on a hideous but ingenious crime. Timber is Canada's number two industry. But lately, the timber hasn't been coming down the river. That's because a devil named Snidely Whiplash has taken this log jam, poured it over the logs, and created a log jam up at the river's mouth. Why do we not arrest him? With an alias like Mother Whiplash? Why, we'd antagonize every mother in Canada. Oh, no. The only way to solve this problem is to dynamite the log jam and break it up. You see that satchel on the floor? It has a time bomb in it. Now, you take the satchel and stick it into the log jam. To the mouth of the river, horse. We have a deed to do. Let us journey ahead to Mother Whiplash's log jam factory, for it is here that Snidely Whiplash faces a problem he never dreamed would come up. What do you mean my log jam is going over big in the supermarkets? I don't want to be in the jelly business. It's too legitimate. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Um... Whiplash, Snidely Whiplash. I wonder, Mr. Whiplash, if you could spare some water. My horse has a horse throat. For oh, four dollars and eighteen cents, the animal was permitted to quench its thirst at a nearby trough. I'm on a secret mission, you know, which is to blow up Snidely Whiplash's log jam, Mr. Um... Whiplash, Snidely Whiplash. What's in the satchel? A time bomb with which to blow up the log jam. Oh, curses. This lout may put a crimp into my plan. I know. I'll stop him with Eloise. Eloise was a former manicurist who used to trim nails. Now she worked in one of Whiplash's gambling halls where she trimmed suckers. See if you can finagle that mounty into a game of chance. By taking a longer route, Eloise was able to get ahead of Dudley. Hello, handsome. How about a game of poker? Dudley didn't play, but his horse did. They got involved in the game and never even noticed Whiplash, who made off with the satchel. Now, oh, that's some horse you've got, Monty. So far, he's had four flushes and three inside straights. You should see him play domino. Do right. Where's the time bomb? Oh, gee, Winnickers, now where did I... Stop, you... you think? The chase was on. Whiplash led our hero through the dense forest. Then up a huge mountain until, breathless, he paused at the edge of a lofty precipice. Gosh, this is some swell view up here. Listen, Monty, have pity on me. If you were to take the time bomb in this satchel and blow up my log jam, I'd be destitute. Forced to live off social insecurity. <laughs> then, too, think of mother. Who's mother? Your mother, Whistler's mother, anybody's mother. Doesn't that bring a tear to your eye? It brought a lot of tears, which is what Whiplash wanted. <laughs> Poor Snidely. Of all places, that time bomb landed on his log jam. The timber flowed free, and Canada's number two industry was saved. Uh, pardon me, Inspector, but about that log jam... Not now, Do-Right. Your horse has got me stuck. All right, I'll see your five horse, and I raise you 50. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. unite for in our preceding installment that pale banging symbol crashing kept shooting desperado zero gained his vengeance upon the mexican village of mucha Loma by keeping them awake nights we're not doing so well during the days also i wasn't too sure myself that rocky and bullwinkle would be in this story until we saw them parked high on the hill just above the town i don't see any sign saying this is mulholland drive neither do i i'm afraid we're lost they were also perilously low on fuel and you know what they say there's no fuel like I haven't got the guts to finish it. A check of the gas tank brought immediate results. Bullwinkle, you ought to know better than to expose a lighter to a gas tank. That was last episode, Rock. This is this one. Down the hill they rode in a direct line for the town hall. Senors, something tells me that help is on the way. <laughs> they were on the way, all right. Caramba, our beautiful town hall is a mess. Yeah, it's a mess hall now. Honest, fellas, we're awfully sorry this happened. You see... But the forthright little squirrel couldn't explain his way out of it. In jig time, they were in a cell. Say, Mr. Sheriff, could you tell us what we're in for? For about three years. Hokey smokes.
Oh, chin up, Brock. That'll go by like 1,095 days. There was one consolation. At least they could get some sleep, or so they thought. Sure enough, no sooner did the sun go down than Zero made another attack. Can you see what's going on, Bullwinkle? Yeah, there's a guy who looks like Warner Baxter out there. Oh, it couldn't be Warner Baxter. How about Warner Brothers? All night long, a figure in black galloped back and forth, creating a horrendous racket. It wasn't until dawn that he retreated back into the hills. Well, at least now we can get some shut-eye. No, no, senores. It's time for you to receive your sentence. But you told us last night we'd gotten three years. That was for destroying the town hall. Now you get a second term for destroying the mayor's apartment. We in Mucho Loma English translation much mod are very forgiving. You hear that, Brock? He is forgiving us. See, si, I am all for giving you 99 years in jail. However, I'm going to cut that down to 98 years. Your Honor, you do that and you'll never catch that noise making bandit. Momento, senores. What do you know about Zero? He used to run around with a little fella named Glorioski. Right, and we're the only ones who can make him stop riding through town. But we'll only do it if you let us go free. If we let you go after Zero, how do we know you won't stop until you are out of the country? Hold a hostage. Sure. We'll let you keep the sheriff here. It's all right by you, sheriff? It's all right. An hour or so later... No, no, I guess, guess it was more like a half hour. Well, check that. Make it, make it 45 minutes. Our plucky heroes left on their perilous quest. Narrator sounds a little confused. Yeah, it must be the tropic zone. Uh, no, it's my watch. Anyway, although they scoured the area, not a sign of Zero did they find. No. No sense in going any farther. Let's camp before it gets dark. Do you think it's safe? I mean, that Zero guy's liable to sneak up on us, and... This was one of the few times the moose was right. For while they set up camp directly above them on a plateau stood a huge boulder, the same unsteady boulder we've used many times before. And behind it, already hard at work, prying it loose, was Zero. Oh, drop anything important to catch our next thrilling episode, Rock Meets Rock, or Thud and Blunder! <laughs> Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wait to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Mute. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more.
last time we looked in on Muchaloma, it was staggering under the nightly attacks of a noisy night rider. Okay, everybody, out of the pool. Nobody gonna sleep. Here we go, 23 skidoo. Actually, this night rider is Guadalupe Rodriguez. Oh, please, to vamos, senor loudmouth. We must get some eye shot. Never! I have sworn revengeance upon this town. Holy! The Knight Rider became known as the notorious Desperado Zero. That's my mark. Luckily or unluckily, depending on whose side you're on, Rocky and Bullwinkle entered Mucho Loma and were hauled before the judge. Ninety-nine years in jail. For what for, Your Honor? For jaywalking. That's jaywording. Whatever it was, the only way of evading imprisonment was to go out and bring Zero in. Just as we closed last time, the boys were encamped at the base of a towering plateau, unaware that the crafty Zero was attempting to smash their plan. I gonna smash something else besides plans. Meanwhile, just below... Sure wish I had a pillow to rest my sleepy head upon. Try a rock. I don't seem to have a rock, Rock. Here, I'll toss one. Well, it's a good thing I didn't need a mountain. You probably would have thrown the world. Shh. Somebody's up there. And somebody up there doesn't like us. It seemed like a good idea to camp somewhere else. But no matter where they tried to bed down, some large, definitely hostile object always seemed to come perilously close to... See, that's what I told you. The Zero is gonna be tough to capture. We'll find another way, that's all. Say, those wanted posters, could any of those people be Zero? I doubt it. This one here is walking behind you. What's he wanted for? Don't you think a name like that is criminal? Senor behind you is serving time in Guadalajara. Well, he can't be Zero. This next one is Chichi Vasquez, a very shady lady. What did she do, sell umbrellas? Well, she can't be Zero either. Of course not. She's a lady. That's no lady, that's my wife. Look at this last poster, Bullwinkle. Guadalupe Rodriguez, wanted for singing songs. Well, let's look him up. You never know, he could be Zero. Once more, the little squirrel had hit the nail on the head. For at that very moment, near a well on the fringe of town, Guadalupe was washing his branding iron, the iron that Zero used to leave his mark. Oi, senorita, there is mosquita buzzing on your nose. Pretty chiquita, life would be sweeter if your mouth was closed. La, 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 la. Mr. Rodriguez? Uh, who, uh, who is there? It is us, Rocket J. Moose and Bullwinkle J. Squirrel. That isn't us. We'd like to have a few words with you, Mr. Rodriguez. How many words? One or two? See, that's a dandy-looking sword you're polishing. This? Oh, my goodness. Why are you trying to hide it? Say, that's a branding iron with a zero at the end. You must be a rustler. Rustler, my eye, he's zero. Oh, please, senors, I'm a victim of circumstance. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to tell that to the sheriff. Ah, but before they could apprehend the wily bandit, he whistled... <laughs> And out came Esmeralda, who sized up the situation and used her head accordingly. Will it be a long, wet winter for our heroes? The answer lies in a watery grave, or drown among the sheltering ponds. What are you going to read me today, Big Daddy? A little lesson in bravery, Junior. I don't need a lesson in bravery, Pop. Do you want to know why? Uh, why? Well, because I sit here and listen to these fables of yours. And if that isn't bravery... No, 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 Junior, you know. You're confusing bravery with stupidity. I was only kidding, Pop. Actually, you know, I rather enjoy your painting with words, the simple chronicles. Or should I say the necrology... Nick took, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. The things they teach kids in these progressive schools. <laughs> well, anyway, my boy, once upon a time... Once upon a time? Oh, come on, Pa. There lived a family of rabbits. We're not really rabbits, we're hares. Because on account of the name of this fable is the hares and the... <clears throat> hey, why did you do that? because you would have given away the whole point to this story. Well, now, this particular family of rabbits was scared of practically everything. Boo! Yo! 
<laughs> oh, they were even scared of themselves. I can't stand living with these scared rabbits. I'm going out into the world and become brave. But how? I'll tell you how. Just stay with me, boy. I'll tell you. You got to build yourself a rep. You know, like on TV, you got to be top critter. Top critter? Me? A rabbit? Top critter? <laughs> top critter? You rabbits are scared of your own shadows. You couldn't be top anything. Well, uh, that's a start. The winner! You know what this means, naturally? Nope. You are now top critter. Yep. And that means that every punk kid out to make a reputation will be looking for you to have a showdown. Yep. That is, really? I mean, really, I'm not basically mean, you know. I... Every low-down, nasty, downright loathsome critter will be gunning for you. Actually, I'm rather sweet, you know. <laughs> That's it, I'm lovable. What you need is a gimmick. A gimmick? Where do I find this mealy-mouthed, low-down animal claiming to be top critter? Nobody around here answering that description. Just Mr. Frog and little old rabbit-hearted me. You better take off there, skedaddle. While old top critter here is in such a felicitous mood. So you're a top critter, eh? Well, uh, no, that, that is, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm a critter, all right, whether top or not. <laughs> well, it's also relative, isn't it? And I mean, right about now, I feel like the lowest thing. <laughs> a rabbit is top critter. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a funny one, isn't it? He's a better critter than you are, Bear. And you want to know why? Because I'll tell you. Because he's got a gimmick. Rabbit, give him the ears bit. The ears bit? I know you rabbits can wiggle your ears clockwise and counterclockwise. We'll wiggle them and look mean. <laughs> oh, I give up. You're top critter, all right. Anyone with a gimmick like that must be top critter. Now, what was all that about? Because critters are always afraid of gimmicks. All Western top guns on TV have got to have a gimmick. Bat Masterson has his cane, the rifleman has his rifle, and you've... Got your ears. You mean my gimmick is ears? All you got to do is wiggle them, and the critters will back down. You are sitting in my chair, partner. Nobody sits in that chair but me, partner. That's my chair. Well, find another chair. <laughs> Don't wiggle them, top critter. I'm leaving. So, Rabbit was no longer the frightened, cringing critter he once was. As long as he could wiggle his ears, he enjoyed his role of top critter. Uh, that is, until... Uh, top critter. There's a critter sitting in your favorite chair. Well, lead me to him, Frog. I'll ear him down. Just lead me to him. Uh, top critter, I'll, sir. I'll mow him down is what I'll do. There, 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 there's something you should know. Now, where's the critter that's sitting in my chair, pardon? Oops! That's what I was trying to tell you. He's got a gimmick. And so Mr. Rabbit was no longer top critter, because at last he had come up against a critter who had a stronger gimmick than he had. He returned to the rabbit family, although he was never quite as frightened as he had been. Which is the moral of this story? Well, Junior, do you know what it is? Sure. Critters may come and critters may go, but gimmicks go on forever. Gimmicks go <laughs> Oh, my. I couldn't have put it better myself, Junior. And hello, used wisdom lovers everywhere. Today we take up the problem of how to get your money back if not completely satisfied. For instance, if someone has gave you a useless article, like this aperture flywheel grommets with the vacuum gasket, you can return it and get the money instead. Pardon me, sir. Do you cheerfully refund money if not completely satisfied? Absolutely. And there you have it. How to get your money back if not... Just fill out these 26 forms, please, then into our test cabinet. But you said... The first test tells us if the structural strength ratio of the Gramis is less than the designed performance assimilator levels. Oh. Hey, no! Looks like nothing's wrong. Well, I... Let's see if the problem lies in resistance vibration level. No, wait, I... Well, everything is okay there. I got it! Maybe it isn't watertight. 
Now look here. Seems to be in perfect order. Sorry, no refund. But you said you refund money if not completely satisfied. That's just it. I'm completely satisfied. Gosh, Mr. Nordo, what are you going to do with your aperture flywheel grommets with a vacuum gasket? Keep it, I guess. I've really grown attached to it. Attached to a thing like that? Yeah. Got my hand caught in it and I can't get it out. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Hello there, Peabody and Sherman here. Today, through the magic of my Wayback Machine, Sherman and I will become acquainted with that eminent Scandinavian inventor, Alfred Nobel. Isn't he the man who invented prizes, Mr. Peabody? No, Sherman. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. Set their way back for Italy. And the year? 1863. As usual, the way back took us way back instantly, and there we were, standing before a quaint little Italian villa. I believe this is the Nobel residence, Sherman. How can you tell, Mr. Peabody? Sherman's question needed no further answer. Inside the smoke-filled structure, we found Alfred Nobel in what was left of his laboratory. Are you all right, Mr. Nobel? Yes, sure, I'm fine. I assume, sir, you've been conducting an experiment on high explosives. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. It's a little thing I call nitroglycerin. Well, I guess you'll have to give it up now that your laboratory's ruined. Oh, no, on the contrary. He led us into an adjoining room. This one, too, contained a laboratory. A new one. You wouldn't believe this, but at one time, this place consisted of 87 laboratories. This little villa? This little villa was once a huge estate. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get on with my work. I'm expecting the mess here in exactly one hour. The mess? M-E-S-S. -S, the mechanical engineers of Sardinia and Sicily. If I can prove that nitroglycerin is as powerful as I think it is, then by golly, I've got it made. Oops. Careful, Mr. Nobel. You almost had another explosion. Sorry, it must be the light in here. So saying, the great inventor struck a match and lit what appeared to be a candle. There, that's better. More light on the subject. Now, where was I? Uh, you, you'll have to forgive this interruption, sir, but uh, the candle... What about the candle? Well, if your candle maker's initials aren't TNT, -T, then I suggest this candle isn't a candle at all. Oh, it's ridiculous. I know a candle when I see one. Come outside, I prove it to you. We adjourn to the front lawn. Now, the candle is still in my laboratory, correct? Correct. And if it were TNT, it would blow up, also correct? Also correct. Well, it hasn't blown up yet. Therefore, I think I can safely state without the least bit of hesitation that what you assume to be a stick of TNT is in reality... <laughs> a stick of TNT. Fortunately, Mr. Nobel had a few more laboratories left. And this time, Sherman and I kept a constant vigil on the great man. Working feverishly, he concluded his experiment just as the mess delegation arrived. Wouldn't you say this stuff is more powerful than garlic? Far more powerful, sir. This we got to see. Proceed me the test. The test was a simple one. 200 yards from Nobel's villa stood a dilapidated shack. The nitroglycerin sat on its dusty floor. Back at the laboratory, Sherman and I awaited the historic moment. The rest is child's play. I merely press this button, and the shack becomes non-existent. I'm sure those gentlemen will be highly impressed. By the way, where are they? At the best possible vantage point, in the shack. And with that, he calmly pressed the button. Did I say in the shack? Oh, my gosh, there's going to be a disaster. Good gravy, this is going to ruin me. Calm yourselves, please. If you'll notice, the shack is still standing. How could it be? Something must have gone wrong. Uh, I mean, right. It's very simple. It takes electricity to set off the nitroglycerin, doesn't it? Of course it does. Why? Because I took the precaution of removing this fuse, thereby cutting off the electricity. And now, Sherman, if you'll ask those gentlemen to view the test from a safer distance, we'll get on with it. Well, as you can see, the test was immensely successful. Without your help, it would not have been possible. Goodbye, good luck, 
And please accept this as a token of my gratitude. And so we bid Alfred Nobel a fond and not too reluctant goodbye. Later at my penthouse apartment. What was it Mr. Nobel gave you, Mr. Peabody? The Nobel Prize, Sherman. But, of course, I gave him something, too. Really? What? What else? The Peabody Award. Thanks to a wanted poster in the Mucho Loma Huskao. Guadalupe Rodriguez, wanted for singing songs. Rocky and Bullwinkle finally got a line on the true identity of the bandit Zero. <laughs> Must be a jelly, cause jam don't shake like that. Uh, pardon me, senor, but they said you're Guadalupe Rodriguez. It would have been futile for the timid-looking fellow to deny it, for he was caught iron-handed. That branding iron you're cleaning is the one Zero uses. Which can mean only one thing. What's that, Bullwinkle? I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask. Well, it meant that Senor Rodriguez was the one, the only... May Bush! Zero! Let's grab him! Unfortunately, Zero's valiant steed, Esmerella, ran to the rescue and... <laughs> ...deposited our heroes at the bottom of the well. Save me, Rock. I can't swim. Oh, for goodness sake, there's only a foot of water down here. Yes, they wouldn't perish from drowning. Yeah, but we might from starvation unless we can climb out. Pull on the rope, Bullwinkle. See if it's strong enough to hold us. The magnificent moose complied. Did you hear what he called me? Please pull on the rope. He never used an adjective like that before. The rope, Bullwinkle. Suppose he's shining up to me for something. Maybe alone. Bullwinkle, if you don't... Okay, Rock. And his mighty muscle strain tugging desperately at the rope's end, testing its every fiber, investigating every single strand of that life-giving... Magnificent moose, huh? You're just having one of your wordy days, that's all. Well, we can't climb out. I guess it's the old one, too. Ellie! Oh! And up he flew like a veritable bird of paradise, spreading its multicolored... Oh, come on. <laughs> A rocky plummeted out of the well and in no time lowered a ladder which enabled his comrade to also escape. Now what, Rock? Now we got a score to settle. We're gonna catch that zero guy. His flying tail all a bristle, Rocky led the way back into Mucholoma. It wasn't easy getting through the mud, but Rocky was determined to reach old Berry's five and ten. Si, senors. Do you have any Halloween costume? Oh, si. But why should anyone dressed like a moose and squirrel require a costume? These, sir, are our naturals. A bit of bargaining, and seconds later behind the old red barn at the far end of town... Starting to get dark, Bullwinkle. Zero will come riding into town just like he always does, and bam, we'll have him. Right. Bam, we'll have him. You're not afraid? I'm fearless. Good. Put on the costume. Uh, why the costume, Rock? We're gonna trap Zero with it. Like the man of the five and dime said, if I am dressed like a moose, why on the name of Rudolph has to With have... darkness spreading fast, there was no time for an explanation. Rocky took out a coin, flipped it. Tails! Bullwinkle was correct. It landed on Rocky's tail and it came up heads. Always a good loser, Bullwinkle withdrew to the confines of the barn. A moment or two later, he appeared as... Mother of Pearl, I'm dressed like Zero. With one exception, your branding iron has an X at the bottom. You, Bullwinkle, are the bandit X. I know there's not much time left in this episode, so can you tell me how I'm supposed to trap Zero? I'm afraid there's only enough time to look in on the other end of town. <laughs> sure enough, Zero has galloped in to stage another of his noisy attacks. What is Rocky's plan? Will his trap work? Don't miss our next magnificent episode. <laughs> oh, there I go again. The unsatisfied costumer, or why not try Brand X? <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Right. Bye now. 
See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wait to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more. We must get to the north end of Muchaloma. For last time, you may not recall, Rocky instructed Bullwinkle in the art of wearing a disguise. I look like the bandit Zero. Except for one thing. My antlers? Your branding iron. Whereas Zero's had a zero, Bullwinkle's had an X. Don't you see? Zero will come riding into town, you'll jump out, and he'll probably be so shocked at seeing another bandit, he'll probably turn right around and never come back. That word, probably. Couldn't you make that undoubtedly? There was no time for any changes, for just as we closed up shop last time, the object of their attention, and it wasn't Pinky Tomlin, rode into town determined to make more noise than he'd ever made before. Yo, town! Here's your beat, my bandit. Come to make sure you don't get no sleep. Everybody, turn and rise. Eggs on the table. Okay, out of the pool. Here we go. The 12 auto is leaving for Memphis. Like zero. Sounds more like Daddy Warbucks. Down the muddy main street, the noisy Desperado Road, poking his hot branding iron everywhere. Here he comes. Okay, Bullwinkle, jump out and give him the shock of his life. Bullwinkle jumped out and into the deepest mud hole in town. <laughs> Stay back, Rock. Don't let the Oki Pinoki get you, too. He was on the verge of getting out. As the first rays of sunlight poked themselves up over the hills, the sun and Bullwinkle came out. Hokey smokes, all night wasted. You yeah, and that doggone zero feller got away, Bill Scott clean. Not quite, senor. What an agonizing situation to get free of a mud hole only to find a row of rifles pointing at you. Say, what's going on here? Please, to step aside, little one. We only wish to shoot zero. Zero? Where? There. Me? See. Yeah, but he's only dressed like zero. Don't try to confuse us. Aside from the silly hat, he is the spitting image of our hated enemy. Despite the little squirrel's objections, Bowmickle was unceremoniously dumped into the Mucho Lama jail. The very same jail I was in in episode two. Outside his cell window, an angry mob thought of taking matters into their own hands. Tar and feather the rascal! Deport him to Bayonne, New Jersey. Write a letter to his mother. That's when Rocky brought the judge to Bullwinkle's cell. Your Honor, he is not zero. He's Bullwinkle. I shall ask three questions. Numero one, what would you call a Japanese fighting plane during World War II? Zero. Uh-huh. What was little Annie Rooney's dog name? Zero. Senor, you are the one we seek. Yeah, but he isn't. He's too smart to be a bandit. Tell him what your IQ is, Bullwinkle. <sighs> You just slammed the lid on my coffin. Where's our sheriff? Asleep. Since we caught zero, we can siesta. I wish I could siesta. She lives in Frostbite Falls. Well, I guess there's nothing anyone can do. Goodbye, zero. Goodbye, Rock. Hmm? Oh, um, here's a cigar in case you'd like to smoke. It is okay for him to have this. What harm can a cigar do? What good can it do is what I'd like to know. Just make sure you light it near the cell window. You'll get a bang out of it. 
Understand? Oh, if only he did understand, for inside that outer wrapping was a stick of TNT. TNT that could blow the back wall down and provide an avenue of escape. Will it come off? Don't miss our next explosive episode, The Inferior Decorator or Wall-Eyed Moose. <laughs> Five or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... Meet my... Oh! Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. It was once spoken that gratitude is a quality not limited to man. Though just why it was spoken, no one has ever been quite certain. For at the time of the saying, there lived a poor slave named Androcles. My friends call me Andy. However, he was seldom called Andy because... I don't have any friends. Androcles was owned by a wealthy merchant who treated him cruelly and forced him to work very hard. From morning till night, he did the cooking, made the bed, scrubbed the floors and mended his master's torn togas. And for the tiniest little mistake, he was punished severely. Oh, hold still, master. Uh, there's a fly on your nose. Don't hit him with that, you idiot. You'll hurt me. Get the fly spray. Yes, master. <whistles> Got him. All right, that did it. Now you know what's going to happen to you. No, no, master. Not that. Ah, but the merchant showed him no mercy. He made him stand in the corner for two hours. Time after time, Androcles tried to please his master and win his gratitude, but never with any success. Come, master. I have prepared a nice hot bath for you. Well, how nice. Oh! Was the water a tiny bit too hot for master? And, of course, he was again severely punished. I can't stand another minute of this inhuman punishment. I'll run away, and I'll search the world for someone who will give me gratitude for what I do. And so he did. For that very night, as his master lay sleeping, he stole out of the house and scurried away into the darkness. The next morning, Androcles was deep in the forest where he was certain his master would never find him. He was walking along his merry way when suddenly a voice called to him from a dense thicket. <gasps> oh, there, stranger. How yourself? Who speaks? It is I. Androcles found himself face to face with the biggest, fiercest looking lion he had ever seen. He was terrified and turned on his heels to flee and would have gotten away but for a huge tree that slightly blocked his path. Certain that the lion was upon him, he looked over his shoulder but noticed that the beast was simply lying there moaning and whimpering piteously. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble? I have a vicious thorn in my paw and it hurts me terribly. Please have pity. Pull it out for me. Are you kidding? If I got that close to you, you'd grab me and eat me up. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Honest Injun, remove the thorn. I will be your friend for life. The poor beast's pleadings were so convincing, and he seemed so sincere that Androcles decided to take a chance. Careful now, careful. Hold still. Ooh. The lion was overjoyed with relief and thanked Androcles profusely. <laughs> You know, I really feel he's grateful. Oh, I am grateful. Androcles was very pleased, for he had finally earned gratitude for something he had done. So he bid the lion farewell and went on his way. Several days later, however, fate struck Androcles a cruel blow, for he was captured by soldiers and taken to the city and thrown into the dungeon. It was there that he learned that he was to be used in the circus. Being in the circus isn't too bad. I mean, maybe they'll let me be a clown. It isn't that kind of a circus, friend. They're gonna throw you to the lion. This is sure gonna ruin my summer. The following day, the stands were filled, and the emperor and all his court came to view the spectacle. A hush fell over the arena. Androcles trembled. The signal was given. The steel door creaked open, and with a mighty roar, <laughs> a gigantic, ferocious lion bounded into the arena. The beast had been kept without food for several weeks to make him even more fierce, and he shook his great head with rage. 
The quaking Androcles prepared to meet his fate when suddenly he recognized the lion as the same one from which he'd removed the thorn. A wave of relief swept over him as he shouted, Leo, wait, it's me, Andy. Do you remember me? Uh, yeah, yeah, you took the thorn out of my paw. Right, and you were grateful because I did you a favor, so now you won't eat me. <laughs> I sure am hungry. I know, but you still won't eat me. I'm your friend. They didn't feed me for two weeks. But you still won't eat me, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Will you? <gasps> Lion, one, Androcles. Oh, coming. dear, dear, dear. So as you can plainly see, dear friends, the moral to this story is that if you ever do a favor for a great beast with long teeth and sharp claws and he tells you that he will be forever grateful, don't you believe him. <laughs> because you can just bet your boots <laughs> that he's a lion. Thank you, Rocky. Today's poem is that intimate story of life among the royalty. The Queen of Hearts. The Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts. All on a summer's day. Hmm, they look good, Queenie. What kind are they? Soybean, rutabag, asparagus, and turnip. Turnip? Turnip tarts? I use my health food cookbook. Ooh. Well, on with the poem. The knave of hearts, he stole those tarts and took them clean away. Stop, thief! Come back here, you tart napper! The king of hearts called for those tarts and beat the knave full sword. The knave of hearts gave back the tarts and vowed he'd steal no more. Oh, you don't get off that easy. You stole them, friend. You eat them. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Canada, where men were men, unless they were horses. And it was here in this secluded valley that Canada's most valiant steeds roamed wild and unfettered. It was from this vast herd the Canadian Mounted Police selected their mounts. Well, do right, I see you got yours. Yes, Inspector, he's a beauty. Palomino, I think. Tell me, what is that hanging down from underneath? Uh, an extra saddle, Inspector. The Mountie sitting on the cow is our indefatigable hero, Dudley Do-Right, decathlon champion of the 194 Olympics, which were not held that year. Well, sir, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll take Whirlwind here back to the post and give him a brushing down. You do that, Do-Right. For two weeks, Dudley put his noble steed through a rigorous training course, jumping, trotting, saluting, everything that was required of a Mountie horse. It wasn't until the animal gave 14 pints of milk that Dudley became suspicious. Inspector? What is it, Do-Right? I think my horse is sick. Luckily for all concerned, one of the Monty's was an ex-veterinarian. It was he who labeled the horse a cow. Do right, we are in trouble. Colonel Crimcrammer is due here tomorrow. As usual, he wants his Monty's to be mounted. Don't you worry, sir. I'll be on a horse. Colonel Ogden Crimcrammer was at that very moment aboard the Saskatchewan Express. On a vacation, Colonel? No, no, going up to inspect the Monty post. Got a few changes to make. This is where our plot sickens, for directly in back of the Colonel sat that black-hearted rascal, Snidely Whiplash. Again, this situation is positively rampant with evil ramifications. <clears throat> I, um... Uh, Beg your pardon, Colonel Crimcrammer, but the engineer would like to have a word with you. Oh, really? Where is he? In the last car. The Colonel was already in the last car, therefore, when he left it, he left the train. 
Whiplash, posing as Colonel Krim Kramer, appeared at the post the following morning. Good to see you again, Fenwick. You've changed, Colonel. Last year, you were six foot three. Whiplash was about to come up with a reason why he had shrunk when his beady eyes ran down the line of men and focused on Dudley. I must be seeing things. There's a Mountie sitting on a rocking horse. Do right. It was the only horse I could find, Inspector. Steady, boy. You'll have to excuse him, Colonel. He's just getting over a case of hoof and mouth. Get off the rocket, Durai. Durai is the only man here who anticipated my new regulation. What new regulation is that? This one. And Whiplash hastily scribbled an order stating that henceforth all Mounties would ride rocking horses. Naturally, when the criminal element heard of this, they ran wild. Inside of a week, Canada was in the grip of an unprecedented crime wave. Do right, the Canadian National Bank has just been robbed. Go get him. But it was a little difficult to go get him when your horse Millie rocked back and forth. Hours passed and the situation grew more tense. Any sign of the bank robbers, do right? Not yet, Inspector, but I'm on their trail. At that rate, the only way a criminal would be caught was if he happened to come to the post, which is exactly what happened. The bank robbers, loaded with Canadian clubs and carrying sacks of money, darted inside the gate, hoping to use the post as a hideout. Luckily for them, they blundered into Dudley. You men see any bank robbers? They were too shocked to answer. Never mind, I'll get them anyway. Onward, boy, onward! The gang proceeded to take the post over. They overpowered every Mountie they saw, including Inspector Fenwick. It is getting dark, faithful steed. We must return to the post and report. The bank robbers, having bound and gagged everyone, were contemplating passing the time with torture. I say, let's make them watch television. Yeah, turn on some commercials. Before they could carry out their fiendish designs, they were interrupted. Would you mind telling the inspector that my horse and I are still looking for the bank robbers? Oh, there's the inspector. Pardon me, sir, but... Yes, I agree, sir. It is cool in here. I'll throw some wood on the fire. But in the dim light, our dim wit threw not firewood, but firearms. Seconds later... It's the compass! And when the smoke of battle cleared, Dudley stood alone, victorious. Hmm, it's a lot warmer in here now. The gang was carted off to prison. As for the Mounties, they had no time to relax, for the real Colonel Krem Kramer arrived and proceeded with his inspection. Well, Colonel, as you can see, every one of my men is groomed to mount his specification. Yes, yes, but there are some changes I'd like to make. Oh, what did you have in mind? Well... To start with... Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. it, but you are about to witness the stirring conclusion of a long story. A timid little minstrel was thrown into jail for singing during siesta. This so infuriated his Latin blood, he became the masked bandit Zero and rode through the village of Mucho Loma, keeping everybody up all It fell to our heroes to bring the noisemaker in. Either that, or spend 99 years in jail. Bullwinkle, dressed as Zero, was mistaken for the loud night rider, and as we closed our preceding chapter, was languishing in a cell. I tried to free Bullwinkle, but the judge refused. Finally, in desperation... Which is the only way we do things on this show. I gave Bullwinkle a cigar. But I don't smoke, Rock. You don't have to. Put it near the window. Yes, the stogie contained a lethal stick of TNT. Rocky and the judge left the building while the befuddled moose examined his cigar. Hmm. Put it near the window. Must be a smelly cigar. So saying, he struck a match, applied it to the end. <coughs> what he did next was unbelievable for anyone else but Bullwinkle. He nonchalantly tossed the burning cigar out of the window. Hokey smokes that TNT. will never blow the jail wall down now. The TNT exploded, knocked down the chimney, which landed on an awning. The bricks catapulted across the street, crashed through a window. The sharp pieces of glass severed the base of a telephone pole. The pole collapsed right into... You guessed it, Bullwinkle was free. Run for it, Bullwinkle! Alas, the muddy streets of Mucho Loma... English translation, much mud... ...held our antlered friend fast. So, attempting to escape the who's go? Citizens, 
Shoot him! No, wait! I tell you, he's not zero! Okay, little one. We're gonna give you just one minute to prove that statement. There wasn't a dry forehead in that group as our valiant hero struggled to come up with a proof. You got 30 seconds. One idea after another flitted through his nimble, squirrel-like brain. 15 seconds. The task seemed insurmountable, and then... I got it! By George, he's got it! What you got? Rocky didn't answer. He merely flew to a nearby wall, picking up the branding iron with the X along the way. Then, dipping it in the mud, he drew a large, muddy version of a tic-tac-toe game. Let me see. X, zero, X, zero, X, zero, X. Go ahead, Rock. Put another X down at the bottom and you win the game. But it isn't my turn, Bullwinkle. It's zeros. The temptation was too great. Out of nowhere, the masked loudmouth appeared and with a flourish, applied his mark to the wall, winning the game, but losing his freedom. Senor Zero, you are under arrest for a million years. The trial lasted three weeks. Rocky and Bullwinkle appeared as witnesses. You see, Your Honor, Guadalupe didn't know he was breaking the law by singing during siesta. I agree. Okay, we parole him. That is, if there is anyone here who will take him. There was. And to this day, if you ever visit New York City, go see the New York Mets play baseball. Who'll be working the scoreboard? We did score a run so I could take a break. As for Rocky and Bullwinkle... That was a brilliant idea of yours, Rock, that tic-tac-toe game. Thanks, Bullwinkle. Oh, don't thank me. It wasn't my wall you muddied up. Senores, the judge would like very much to see you. Whose wall was it, Bullwinkle? I'll give you three guesses. Be with us again in another 30 days for another adventure with Rocky and Bullwinkle! Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The Steve John Muse. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell.
As our story opens today, there is a great deal of excitement in Frostbite Falls. Excitement that seems to center about today's issue of the daily paper, the Picayune Intelligence. Say, this is news, Caleb. And we better do something about it. Yes, even in Frostbite Falls, the citizens respond to the challenges of the outside world and its geopolitical machinations. Geopolitical macros, my eye. I'm talking about the annual flower show. But, sir, those front page headlines. Don't mean a thing. The Picayune Intelligence has had the same front page for 15 years. The same front page? Why not? It's always the same stories. Cold War continues, plane crashes, world tensions. But inside, that's local stuff. That's interesting. Frostbite Falls dog chases Frostbite Falls cat over Frostbite Falls fence. Frostbite Falls boy meets Frostbite Falls girl. Just fraught with interest, ain't it? But for real heart tug and suspense, look at this. Wow, we. The annual Frostbite Falls flower fair and plant pageant will be held in the high school gymnasium today. First prize, a trip for two to glamorous Wichita, Kansas. How about that, Bullwinkle? Hmm, it's gonna play the dickens with my hopscotch schedule. Bullwinkle, you mean you don't have a flower ready to enter? Rock, I don't even have one ready to come up. It was true. Bullwinkle had been so busy being a TV hero that he had no chance to tend his little garden. The flowers were in terrible shape. I think they've lost the will to live. Then it's too late to plan anything now. Well, let's take your flower to the show anyway. So bearing Rocky's entry, a checkered begonia, our hero started down the old ox road seeking horticultural splendor. Not me. I just want a big flower. A big flower? Did I hear you said a big flower? No, I said horticultural splendor. Not you, him. Oh. Sure, I want to grow a big flower. Well, are you ever in love? I am? Certainly. You see before you in the living natural color flesh, the greatest seed seller in the world. A seed seller? That anything like a salt seller? Say, what's your name, mister? Allow me to introduce myself. Pete McMoss, President Worldwide Seed Company. Pete McMoss? At the law school, Pete McMoss. This is my assistant, Ivy C. Hall. Hello, darling. What's the C for? Covered. Ivy covered holes. Yeah, her I've heard of. That voice. Where have I heard that voice? Rock, that was me. Oh, yeah. And here is the answer to all your problems. That? That's just one seed. One seed? One seed? You know this kind of the echo in here? My dear Moose, this seed is a direct descendant from the original Jack's beanstalk. It is? Certainly. Look here. You remember how in the old story Jack planted the magic beans and they grew clean up to the sky? And there was a giant's castle? And the mean giant chased Jack? And he cut down the beanstalk and destroyed the giant... <laughs> and lived happily ever after. Why are you crying? I hate happy endings. Well, this is a seed from that very same beanstalk. Plant it, and you'll be able to grow a bean blossom as big as your head. That'd win first prize for sure. Okay. Bullwinkle, I don't like this. How come? I got a feeling something bad's gonna happen. Well, look on the bright side of it, Rock. What? We got a whole new plot started already. True enough, and we'll see it begin to thicken next time in Four for the Show or Two Pairs of Plants. <laughs> You all remember the story of Sleeping Beauty? How as a baby she was put under a spell by a wicked fairy? How when she had grown up she pricked her finger with a needle and fell into a deep sleep from which she could be wakened only by a kiss? You remember too how a fence of thorns grew round the castle to prevent anybody from entering. Anybody but me, that is. And just who are you? A prince, naturally. Don't you see the robes, the crown? You want to see my ID card? Well, how do you propose to enter the castle? Easy. I haul out my trusty broadsword and... They don't make broadswords like they used to. The prince was distraught. What was he to do? I'll show you. These they make like they used to. The prince made straight for the tower room. Sleeping beauty, I've come at last. With one kiss, I shall waken you and... Wait a minute. Awake, she's just another princess. Asleep, 
She's a gold mine. I can see it now. Sleeping Beauty comics, Sleeping Beauty hats, Sleeping Beauty bubble gum, and biggest of all, Sleeping Beauty land. Sure enough, the castle was soon made ready as a great tourist attraction. There was moat land. Have your ex coupons ready, please. Have your ex coupons ready. There was entrance hall land. Y coupons, please. There was stair land. That's a Z coupon, folks. A Z coupon. And of course, Sleeping Beauty herself. Sleeping Beauty Land was clearly a great success. One million and one, one million and two. Sorry, the castle's closed till 8 a.m. Hold it, Junior. I'm your land of the wicked fairy that put Sleeping Beauty to sleep. Well, <laughs> that calls for some free coupon books. Books, Nook. I want half of this whole setup, or else. Else what? Else I use my magic powers to wake her up. Well, now, we can't have that, can we, partner? And you are my partner, and a charming one at that. Now, wouldn't you like to see some of our Sleeping Beauty land? Why not? Just step this way to Dungeon Land. My, this is spooky. Well, it's very popular. Some people stay here for a long, long time. How does it work? Well, I put these around your wrist, you see? Yes. Then I leave. Well, have a good time. I'll see you in a couple of years, kid. So, once again, the prince was in business for himself. One million sixty-four. One million sixty-five. Hiya, honey. You're back. You broke the chains. Yeah, they don't make them like they used to. Well, partner, how about trying our special submarine ride? Team. The cement is just a safety precaution. The city makes us do it. I like the way it squishes between my toes. It's quick drying, too. There. Not squishy now, is it? If I like this one, can I go again? I'm afraid not. It's more of a one-way ride. So the prince was once more without a partner. Four million and two. Four million and three. Hello, I'm back. That ride was more fun, especially that first part. But... Imagine half of all this is mine. Yes, uh, including the souvenir sales. Souvenirs? Uh, how much do they sell for? Well, this one is 75 cents. This one is a dollar. This Sleeping Beauty cowboy lasso is only 169. Now, let's see. Carry the four and say, you're in luck, little lady. I am. You betcha. You also get the official Sleeping Beauty Land moon rocket as a bonus gift. Goody! I've always wanted a rocket! And the clever prince had apparently solved his problem. But soon, he had another one. For the next morning, the crowds outside the castle were smaller. And the next day, smaller still. Clearly, Sleeping Beauty was a slipping beauty. And the prince was very sad indeed. Then, suddenly... Hi, sweetie! I'm back! Well, you can have the whole thing back now, Toots. Sleeping Beauty Land is a flop. Now, wait a minute. She's been asleep for 20 years, right? Right. Maybe people would pay money to talk to somebody who's been asleep for 20 years. You mean... Yes, we just wake her up. We'll make a fortune. Go ahead and do it. Who, me? You put her to sleep, didn't you? Well, frankly, no. I'm not really a wicked fairy. I'm just wicked. But then how... Easy. I... You kiss her. You're a prince, aren't you? Well, not exactly. I never joined the union. I really make my living beating pigskins. You mean? Yes. I'm a hog flogger. But just then a remarkable thing happened. Sleeping Beauty's eyes opened and she sat up. Don't worry, kids. I wasn't really asleep. Then why the big 20-year act? I just wanted to see if I could make it in showbiz. lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a... Not that lesson. <coughs> this lesson. And now, here's the one man on television who really makes you think, Mr. Know-It-All. Yeah, and I know what you're thinking, too. Same to you, buddy. Today, friends, we take up the problem of making your neighbor quiet without making him angry. <laughs> Loud radio music, for example. Politeness is the important thing, and it always brings a polite response in return. Hello, kindly neighbor! I'm here to discuss your radio in a friendly, neighborly way. My what? Your radio! Hey! Radio, the radio! Oh, all right! 
hands, however, it may become necessary to make your point in a stronger manner. Take that party next door, for example. One can usually get results by simply tapping gently on the wall. If that doesn't work, one must tap harder. And if that doesn't work... Which, naturally, is just one thing to do, and that is join the party! Excuse me, please. That's him, officer. But, officer, I only blew it once, like this. Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, it doesn't look to me like you're very successful at making your neighbors quiet. Oh, I don't know, Rock. Here in solitary confinement, you can hear a pin drop. Hello out there, Peabody here. And I'm Mr. Peabody's trusty boy, Sherman. Right, trusty boy. And now we'll be off for another exciting journey back into history. Ready, Mr. Peabody. What shall I set the way back for today? For the year 1874. Check. And the place? Deadwood, South Dakota, where we'll meet that colorfulness of the old west, Calamity Jane. The way back responded beautifully, and in less than an instant, we were teleported back through time, where we found ourselves standing in front of the Deadwood Overland Stage Company. Clear the streets! Calamity Jane is coming in with the noon stage, and she's at it again! I beg your pardon, sir, but why all the excitement just because Calamity Jane is driving in the noon stage? That's just it. She ain't driving. She's sitting inside the stage with the passengers. Look out! Here she comes! We just managed to leap to the center of the way when the driver of the stage roared through the center of town, narrowly missed a wagon loaded with dynamite, and came to a thudding halt in a pile of hay near the livery stable. End of the line! Everybody out! Is everybody all right? Yeah, cuss it! It certainly is fortunate that you missed the wagon load of dynamite, or it would have been a calamity. What do you mean, fortunate? I was hoping something like that would happen. That's why I was letting the stage run wild. Golly, what for? Because nothing ever happens to me, that's why. What's the use of having a swell name like Calamity if you can't have a calamity once in a while? Hmm, you do have a point there. Folks is beginning to talk. Watch, I'll show you what I mean. Before our startled eyes, Calamity walked over to the dynamite wagon and calmly lit a stick of dynamite. Now, you'd think that a lit stick of dynamite would cause an awful ruckus, wouldn't you? Uh, well, yeah, yes, I would say that. Mr. Peabody, make her throw it away. It'll go off any second. Oh, don't fret, Sonny. With my luck, it won't go off. But, see, it's a dude. That's dud. And what a shame. You seem to have a nice little calamity going for you there. No, oh, I've got to start having calamities pretty soon, or I'm afraid it's going to break my spirit. Curious to see what Jane's next attempt at having a calamity would be, we followed her to the stockyards, where she entered a corral containing the largest, meanest-looking bull I had ever seen. Uh-oh, she's going to get it this time. Look, the bull is charging. But Jane's unwanted luck still held, for the bull missed her by at least three feet through a fence and into a tree. That's incredible. He missed. He misses every day. The silly critter can't see a thing without his glasses. For the rest of that day, Calamity Jane tried everything imaginable to have a calamity. She even tried to sit on a tack, but was saved by a rivet in her jeans. Now, it's no use. Guess I'll just have to change my name to Lucky Lucy. Forget the whole thing. She can't do that. Can't you think of something, Mr. Peabody? <laughs> I already have, Sherman. I suggest that instead of changing your name, you simply change your luck. How am I going to do that? Very simple. Wait here. Crossing the street to the general store, I made a purchase, then quickly returned and handed the package to Calamity. What am I supposed to do with this? Drop it. Drop it? Drop it. Well, it sounds a little cuckoo, but okay, if you say so. <laughs> no, you done it. I broke something. You were supposed to. You see, there was a mirror in that package. I get it, Mr. Peabody. Now she's going to have seven years' bad luck. That is correct. Shucks, and you look like such a smart little critter. I thought you had an ID, but that breaking a mirror business is the silliest thing I ever heard. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, she doesn't believe in it. 
She will. Any minute now, Sherman. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. What's the matter with you right there? What happened? Calamity Jane just had an awful calamity. Got run over by a wagon load of chicken. Chicken what? Just chicken. There was only one in the wagon. Well, that looks like the start of her bad luck. You did it again, Mr. Peabody. Quite. For in the next seven years, Calamity Jane had one calamity after another, the most famous of which was the time she was trying to light an old stove that exploded and covered the countryside for miles around with black soot. Really, Mr. Peabody? Really, Sherman. How do you think the Black Hills of South Dakota got black? episode, the Frostbite Falls Flower Fair was upon us, and Bullwinkle and Rocky found themselves without a plant to enter. This was very embarrassing. Naturally. You try walking through town without your plants sometimes. But they were stopped on the road by a pair of sharpers. Say the name. Who shall be nameless. Phooey. Who offered them a bean guaranteed to be descended from Jack's original beanstalk. Bullwinkle, I'd think twice about this if I were you. If you were me, you'd have to think twice. There'd be two of you. <laughs> Well, Flatlander, is it a deal? Does that bean grow fast? Just stick it in the ground and jump back. How much you asking for it? Well, I'm asking a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? But I'll take two bits cash. That's more like it. And so our unsuspecting heroes bought the bean and set off for the flower fair and plant pageant. Gee, I can hardly wait. Just think, a bean blossom as big as my ever-loving blue-eyed head. Bullwinkle wouldn't have been so happy if he could have seen the two seed sellers at that moment. <laughs> he fell for it, Natasha. Hook, line, and antler. Oh, boy. Wait till that thing starts to come up. Boris, this is the cheapest, most disgusting, nastiest thing you've ever done. Slimy, dirty, mean. Boris. Yes? You're my kind of guy. The Frostbite Falls High School gym was a lovely sight that evening. Beautiful blossoms cascaded their multicolored forms in every nook and cranny. Giant prize vegetables gleamed in harvest splendor. There was only one little mix-up. Somebody had scheduled a basketball game for the same time. Pass, pass! Take the ball, stupid. I hereby give first prize in the melon class to this magnificent cassava. Jump! Foul free throw! This is terrible, Bullwinkle. Yeah, we're trailing by eight points in a Hubbard squash. And now for the flower judging. You better plant that seed quick. Yeah. And the moose did just that. Borrowing a large flower pot, he thrust the seed deep into the soil and jumped back. Nothing happened. Suppose he sold us a dud? But then the flower pot trembled, there was a furious rumbling noise, and... <coughs> Pokey smoke, Bullwinkle, look at that thing! That's a bean blossom? Well, it may not have been a bean blossom, but the curious plant was big enough and exotic enough to win first prize! Congratulations, Bullwinkle! Thanks, Mr. Mayor! You certainly have a green thumb! Yeah, it's spearmint flavor, too! <laughs> Tell me, Your Honor! Hey, where'd he go? Don't ask me! He was standing right by the flower a minute ago. Huh. Well, let's take our Enterprise winner home. Mm. Gee, it got heavy all of a sudden. And what's more, Bullwinkle, it's getting bigger. Yes, as Bullwinkle held the flower pot, the plant grew noticeably larger. Straining every muscle, Bullwinkle was just able to get the plant through the doorway, and even then, Rocky had to help. Gee, I could swear that these leaves were holding onto the door frame. <sighs> Boy, I gotta put it down for a minute. Hey, you can't leave that there. You're blocking traffic. But, officer... He's right, Bullwinkle. Okay, officer, well... Gee, where'd he go? He was standing right here a second ago and... Rock? What is it? Does our flower look different to you? Yeah. If it wasn't just a flower, I'd say... What? I'd say it was smiling. Well, this begins to look more and more sinister. Don't miss our next creepy episode, Bean by a Blossom or The Petal Pushers. Well, it looks as if our 
our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The theme, John Mew. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Bullwinkle won first prize at the Frostbite Falls Flower Fair, but now it seems that his entry is getting a little out of hand. I wonder what kind of plant it really is, Bullwinkle. Who cares? It's a winner. A winner it may have been, but in the days that followed, Bullwinkle began to wonder if a blue ribbon was worth it. Hey, who took my flower out of its pot and planted it here? Not me. Well, it didn't get out by itself. Uh, did it? I don't know, but we gotta find out more about it. I don't like the looks of that flower. It speaks very highly of you. As fate would have it, an expert appeared on the scene at that very moment. You're the fellows with the oddball flower? Yeah, who you? I'm from the FPI. The FBI? No, FPI, Federal Plant Inspector. A plant inspector? J. Edgar Bloomer is the name. Glad you're here, Inspector. Just how would you classify this plant? Hmm, I'd classify it... Top secret. A top secret flower? You mean we got a hush hush hollyhock? Boys, this is the only living example in this country of the Pottsylvania creeper. Pottsylvania creeper? Look here. Hokey smoke. It says here that the Pottsylvania creeper is a vicious man eating plant. Oh, now that's ridiculous, isn't it, Mr. Bloomer? Mr. Bloomer? Where'd he go? A rock. Huh? The flower. It's smiling again. That does it. Bullwinkle, we're going to cut it down. Cut it down? My prize winning whatever it is. A Pennsylvania creeper. Wonder why they call it a creeper. Who cares? Give me that axe. But as Rocky grabbed the axe, he found out why they called it a creeper. Jumping G-horse that. It's creeping away. Sure enough, the enormous plant began to skulk swiftly around the end of the house. Rocky started to chop, but in vain. So fast with the plant growing that he couldn't chop two times in the same place. Bullwinkle attempted to tackle the galloping vine, but it simply dragged him along the ground. Look out, look! Here it comes again! Sure enough, the enormous blossom had gone completely around the house and was sneaking up from behind on our little furry hero. There was nothing to do but run for it. Run for it! I already heard the man! Into town dashed the panicky squirrel and moose. Hi there, Bullwinkle. What's the rush? We're being chased by a man-eating plant. Well, ask a foolish question, you get a foolish... No, wait just a second, Bullwinkle. Okay, Rock. That's long enough. Come on. But, Bullwinkle, 
We owe something to our town, our own community. We owe something to this country of ours. Rock, this is no time to worry about taxes. No, Bullwinkle. I'm going to go back and face that thing, whatever it is. But why? I'm a TV-type hero is why. I wonder if these things ever happened on radio. Rock, I say, uh... But the moose was talking to empty air, for the plucky squirrel was zooming back in the direction they had come from. Gee, I don't see it anymore. Maybe it's just a false alarm. Maybe it is the man-eater. Maybe this is the last episode. And it might be at that, for Rocky was entangled in the leafy, vine-like clutch of the fearful Pennsylvania creeper. Meanwhile, on a nearby hillside... Well, that does it, Natasha. Squirrel is kaput. When that creeper grabs them, they stays grabbed. This will show fearless leader who's smarter, him or me. Well, which is bad enough? Him, him, you, you. Fearless leader here? But I thought we had laws against that kind of thing. You fool. Laws only keep out honest people. W what do you mean? If you're a crook, you sneak in anyway. But, but... Don't miss our next controversial episode, Vacation Days, or Visit to a Small Panic. <laughs> And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never worked. This time for sure. Resto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a beautiful but wicked queen. This queen would stand before her mirror for hours admiring herself. It was a very special kind of mirror. Mirror, mirror, coin machine. Am I still the cutest queen? You're still the best, but wise up fast. Snow White will soon go whizzing past. Snow White? Where can I find her? With dwarfs she dwells, those sawed-off mugs. And by the way, stop using slugs. And the queen got a poison apple to take to Snow White. An apple that would make her the victim of sleeping death. <laughs> In a little while, the queen was approaching the quaint old house of the seven dwarfs. It wasn't very difficult to find. Inside the house, a plan was taking shape. Now that's it, boys. Look sharp. This could be a gold mine, a veritable... Well, 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 welcome to the seven dwarfs health club. Looks like you got it just in time. Build it up, take it off, make it firm. That's what I always say. A sign here for the lifetime membership. Will you do that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's Snow White? I've got a little something for her. Soon as she eats it, I'll be the fairest in the land. Dear lady, did you know that you could be the fairest in the land forever? Forever? How? The Seven Dwarves Health Club, of course. Seven Dwarves? I see only six. Uh... You sure I could stay the fairies? Come on now, would I kill a queen? The vain queen was so desperate to stay the fairest that she signed the contract and gave her crown as payment. Then, one day, several weeks later... Mirror, mirror, put me straight. Snow White or me, now who's first rate? Good kid you are and rather sweet. But Snow White's the one, she's got you beat. Oh! So, once again, the queen got a poison apple and went to the seven dwarfs' house to find Snow White. But this time, the dwarfs had a brand new enterprise. Welcome. Welcome to the seven dwarfs' dance studio. Walk in, samba out. Never mind that. Is Snow White here? And one, two, three, and one, two, three. Cut that out! Where's Snow White? Never heard of her. Put a little fun in your life. Try dancing. Who's this big guy? I thought you were all dwarfs. Please, lady, shh. Quiet. He's got glam trouble. It's nothing to laugh at. Now, this is for a lifetime membership to the dance club. Sure enough, this time the queen traded all her jewels to the dwarfs. And some weeks later... Mirror, mirror, one, two, three. Is there one as fair as me? Fair at what? Not dancing, pray. Snow White now leads in every way. The queen was clearly slipping fast. All right. Where's Snow White? 
<laughs> Will you look at that posture? That hair. Am I there? Those clothes. No good. If you want to be the fairest in the land, you'll need a lifetime membership. The Seven Dwarfs Charm School. Fairest in the land, eh? How much? At this time, the queen gave the deed to her castle to the dwarfs. So when she returned home, it was to an empty lot. Mirror, mirror on... I know, I know. Snow White at the dwarfs' place, in that order. Listen, Wiseacre. Snow White isn't at the dwarfs' place where you keep sending me. With dwarfs she dwells and... All right, I'll show you. See, no Snow White here, just dwarfs. Oh, will you look at that poor woman? A B1 deficiency. Now, how could you ever hope to be the fairest with improper diet? Improper diet? No, not meats. No yogurt. No wheat germ. But I have nothing left to pay for anything. You need the Seven Dwarfs health food plan. Do you what? Just this mirror. That's all I have left. That's all? Okay, we'll take it. Here. And your health food plan starts with eating these poise, these apples. So the wicked queen wound up with nothing but her own poison apples. But suddenly... Pardon me, do you have a pay mirror I can use? Right over there. Is it a local? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Snow White is the fairest one, but getting there is half the fun. <laughs> Goody, goody, goody. That's me. I'm Snow White. No. There really is a Snow White. Get ready, boys. Another pigeon. And if you want to stay the fairest, you'll need a lifetime membership in the Seven Dwarfs Health Club. Seven Dwarfs? I see only six. Isn't there a seventh one? Well, certainly there is. Meet Max. He has the most important job in our whole operation. Yeah. And boy, it's stuffy in there. mail from some flounder? No, this is what I really call a message. And now, here's Bullwinkle's Corner. Hello there. Today's poem is dedicated to babysitters everywhere. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupation that is known as the children's hour. This is a very useful book. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet the sound of a door that is open, and voices soft and sweet. Gerardo! They whisper and then a silence, but I know by their merry eyes they are plotting and planning together to take me by surprise. Yeah! A sudden raid from the stairway, a sudden rush from the hall by three doors left unguarded, they enter my castle wall. You think, oh, blue-eyed kitties, because you have scaled the wall, that such an old moustache as I am is not a match for you all? Like I said, a very useful book. And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three... Hello, Peabody here. My companions are Wayback and Sherman. Wayback is a time machine. Sherman, a boy. Where do we go today, Mr. Peabody? Our destination, Sherman, is North Carolina. And the time? December 17th, 1903. A date synonymous with aeronautical history. For today, we meet the inventors of the first practical airplane, Wilbur and Orville Wright. Sherman and I were deposited on an antiquated airfield where we directed our attention to a large barn bearing the motto, if you want it done, get it done right. That must be their hangar, Mr. Peabody. You hear me in there? Better let us sons have our airplane or else we'll shoot. Wilbur's right. I'm going to count to three, and if we don't get our airplane, we're going to fire. One, yeah, uh, two, Orville. 
Oh, yeah. Two. That number always throws me. Two. What comes next? Uh, try nine. Pardon me, gentlemen, but can we be of assistance? You sure can. What comes after two? I'll tell you, but first, what seems to be the trouble? There's a critter inside what's got our airplane. I think five comes after two, Orville. But surely this can be settled peaceably. How? Call the sheriff. No, we want to handle this ourselves. Besides, the sheriff's allergic to birds. Birds? Peering through a window, Sherman and I saw a startling sight. The Wright Brothers airplane and a large bird. Know who she is? Yes, but I'm ashamed to say it. Kitty Hawk? Yep. It had to be. We had an airplane out there on the runway, and that there fool bird went and fell in love with it. That was Orville's fault. I told him we better make an ugly plane, not a handsome one. Now, if you fellas will just stand back, we'll blast her. But you can't shoot a poor, harmless bird. The boy's right. I'll think of something now. Wilbur's first idea was to induce Kitty Hawk to leave the hangar. This here is winter, ain't it? Uh-huh. And birds fly north in the summer, don't they? Uh-huh. Then we'll make believe like it's summer, and that fool bird will leave. Moments later, in 20-degree temperature, the brothers Wright cavorted about in swimsuits. Oh, say, it is a hot summer day. Isn't it a hot summer day, Wilbur? Yep, it's a very hot summer day, Orville. And I wish that you would dash some cool water on my poor hot head. Anxious to please, Orville picked up a nearby bucket. As for Kitty Hawk, she was genuinely interested in the performance. But unfortunately, that bucket of water Orville threw at Wilbur turned to ice and... Golly, Mr. Orville, if you'd only let Mr. Peabody help. Yes, Sherman is absolutely right. Now, my plan... Nope, I ain't licked yet. If we can't get that there bird to leave that there plane, then we'll get that there plane to leave that there bird. It wasn't until Kitty Hawk fell asleep that Wilbur put his second plan into operation. Crawling inside the hangar, he attached a long rope to the airplane's wheels. That done, he and Orville pulled the plane out. I told you I'd do it. I told you I'd beat that bird. That plane's gonna fly. Without a propeller. Oh, that Kitty Hawk, that doggone bird. I'm gonna blast her so full of buckshot. Well, Bert, I think your ideas is fine, but they don't work. I think it's time we listen to him. And listen, they did. My plan was to appeal to the mother instinct in Kitty Hawk. We merely took a large egg-shaped rock, tucked some straw around it, and Kitty did the rest. I never saw a happier bird in my life, Mr. Peabody. Of course, even though they had their plane, Wilbur and Orville still had their troubles. You got it now, Wilbur. I'll say contact and you twirl that propeller on the count of three. Ready? One, two, uh... Try 17. Gee, did they ever get off the ground? Eventually, Sherman. In fact, they flew during the day and played poker at night. And Kitty Hawk? She sat right beside them, Sherman, begging for food while they played. <coughs> Come to think of it, that's how the poker term came about. What term? Feed the kitty. In the saga of the Pottsylvania Creeper, things went from bad to worse when fearless leader himself appeared on the scene. Hello, fans. And they went from worse to just awful when the Creeper seized our friend Rocky. Help! Help! Well, we can close the book on that one bad enough. The Creeper never fails. Oh, this is awful. Terrible. You mean about what's happening to the squirrel? No, about I didn't bring my camera. Meanwhile, Rocky was being dragged along by clinging tendrils toward the sinister form of the carnivorous creeper. But suddenly, Bullwinkle dashed into the scene and began a tug of war with the plant for possession of his little friend. Never fear, Rock. I'll get you out if I have to do it piece by piece. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, Let me go, you creep. I'm just trying to help. Not you, Bullwinkle, the other creep. Oh, 
forest will moose win. Silly girl. When the creeper grabs them, they don't get away until it lets go by itself. And at that moment, Bullwinkle, like any red-blooded American <laughs> hero, dashed home and dived Ow. under the bed. You hear, fearless leader? Moose is chicken. Moose is chicken? Yes, moose is chicken. Only in America. But you can't just hide there, Bullwinkle. Who's hiding? I'm looking for something. I always keep it under the bed. You, you, you do? And here it is. Oh, <laughs> yes, the ingenious moose came up with a blowtorch. W what's that for? I'm going to give that creepy creeper a hot root. A good idea, for although the end of the creeper was already halfway to town, its roots were buried right next to Bullwinkle's very own house. So just as the plant was about to engulf Rocky... <laughs> And as the startled plant slackened its grip, the speedy squirrel flashed out of its grasp. Got to get up pretty early in the morning to outwit Bullwinkle J. Moose. Boy, that thing must get up at sunrise. Well, our heroes were safe, but the town of Frostbite Falls wasn't. For the Pottsylvania Creeper grew and grew, covering the little village like a blight. And it did no good to try to fight it, either. What's the matter with you fellas? Haven't you ever had trouble with weeds before? What you gonna do, Eve? I'm gonna give this thing a shot in the head with some triple-strength weed killers, what? Attaboy! Hey! Attaboy! Attaboy! Go to it, Eve! Eve, where'd he go? Look at that creeper. I think that answers your question. It, it's smiling. Sort of a well-fed smile, too. I'm getting out of here. Likewise. No, no, you mustn't panic. Remain calm. Stay where you are. How long, Mr. Mayor? Just till I get a running start. Ah, oh, no! Gee, I never thought one plant would take over the whole town. How'd it be if I got another hot root? But by now, the wily plant had figured out a defense against Bullwinkle's blowtorch. Pokey smoke, it's surrounded by thorns. They're impenetrable. And what's worse, we can't even get through them. But the ultimate horror was yet to come. For as our boys watched, the creeper formed one section of leaf and stem into a giant green vertical tower. What is it, Rock? Oh, boy, now comes the best part, fearless leader. What a sight it will be. Yes. Turn your back, bad enough. Y turn my back? I won't be able to see it happen. I know. There's only one thing better than looking at something wonderful. And that is? Keeping somebody else from seeing it. Oh, boy. Oh, how perfectly schrecklich. Oh, you ought to see this bad enough. Yeah. Well, what can the fearsome spectacle be that Phyllis Leader enjoys so much? We'll find out next time in The Worrying of the Green or The Look of the Irish. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Room for 
one more. Our story opens today in our nation's capital, where the news of the attack of the Pottsylvania Creeper has just hit the streets. X-ray plan captures town! Beats off state militia in two-hour battle! Man-eating plan still at large! Well, Chomsey, that's what I call news. What's that, Edgar? Look here. Vegetable bites man. In the White House, a cabinet meeting was already in progress. Its main subject, how to deal with a Pottsylvania creeper. Our Secretary of State, I say it's a job for agriculture. It's a plant growing in the ground, isn't it? Of course. That's why it's a job for the Interior Department. I hear the plant just grew over a state line. That makes it a Commerce Department case. But it's attacking the country. I think it's a job for the Defense Department. Nope. Why not? It's not a defense plant. The cabinet wasn't the only group perturbed. All over the country, people began to view plants and flowers with suspicion. The city of Squaggum, Connecticut, started obedience schools for house plants. Down, sir! Down, I say! The North Dakota legislature passed a law ordering all snapdragons and dandelions to be muzzled. And in Mount Vernon... George, did you chop down my cherry tree? I cannot tell a lie, Father. It pulled a knife on me. Meanwhile, back in Frostbite Falls, the man-eating Pottsylvania creeper had just about taken over the town. Its ravenous branches grew into every house, into every barn, into every chicken coop. <laughs> and as it grew, its evil blossoms took on more and more of a well-fed smile. Well, at least it doesn't eat just people. That's better. Isn't it? Rock, that means it might also like to munch a moose and swallow a squirrel. But the absolute worst happened when the Pottsylvania creeper whipped its branches and leaves into a great green tower. Golly, Bullwinkle, that looks just like a missile. Yes, the brainy squirrel had guessed it. With a roar, the green leafy missile sailed off the stem and into the air. Now, why do you suppose it does that? Just showing off, I bet. Alas, Bullwinkle was wrong again, for as the leafy projectile reached its apex, it exploded. Hooray! No, Bullwinkle, look! Oh, my stars and body, that missile threw out thousands and thousands of little leafy parachutes. And every one of them has a seed on it. Boris, that means there will be thousands of Pottsylvania creepers all over the country. Makes your blood run colder, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, the Minnesota breeze was scattering thousands of creeper seeds in a wider and wider area. Bowwinkle, there's only one thing to do. Move to Canada. No, somebody's got to catch those seeds. Impossible. Maybe, but I got to try. I'm with you, Rock. Pally! Oop! And the plucky squirrel zoomed upward and began gathering up the tiny parachutes. It's working, Bowwinkle, it's working. Little did Rocky realize that at that moment he was in the crosshairs of a telescopic sight on a rifle in the hands of fearless leader himself. Very well, bad enough. Pin another medal on me. What kind, fearless leader? Sharpshooter. Gee, was that the shot heard around the network? The one that finally got Rocky? Don't ask. Pin. We'll find out next time in It's Only a Flesh Wound or Better Lead Than Dead. <laughs> I 
I thought I told you to whitewash the fence, Junior. I am, Pop. Well, it isn't necessary to write derogatory remarks about your best friend. Skinny Aristotle's no friend of mine. How can you say that? You and he have thrown discuses together for over five years. Well, that's just it, Pop. You get tired of a person in five years. I can't deny that, son. It's like I've always said. Familiarity breeds contempt. Just like in the case of the son of the masked clock. Son of the masked clock? The masked clock was a fox who had an insatiable appetite for timepieces of all kinds. Every night of the week, he would hold up the stage and relieve the passengers of their wristwatches, stopwatches, and anything else they had so long as it ticked. Of course, as I always say, crime doesn't pay, which brings to mind another fable, which I'll save for later. Anyway, the masked clock, or fox, if you prefer, was caught and subsequently languished away in prison. He left behind $20 million, one old pocket watch, and a son named Guy. As your late father's attorney, it's my duty to turn over this money and this watch to you. You can keep the watch. Just give me the money. Not so fast, son. Your father tried to atone for his misdeeds in life. He returned every watch he had stolen, with the exception of this one. Well, I'll return it, but I would like to spend some of this money first. And spend it he did. Two days later at the racetrack, he counted up his losses. How do you like that? I have already lost five million bucks, and I haven't made a bet. Sitting in a nearby box was a familiar figure. Have you returned the watch yet, son of the masked clock? What watch? The one your father didn't give back. No, but I will do that tomorrow. The following day, he took a plane to Monte Carlo, and that evening, standing in front of the roulette table, counted up his losses. How do you like that? I have lost ten million dollars, and I still have not made a bet. Yes, but did you return the watch? What watch? The one you're going to tell me you're going to return tomorrow. Correction, the one I'm going to tell you I'm going to return next week. Ah, but next week found him in a San Francisco real estate office. I got five million dollars left. I want to invest it in real estate. Two minutes later, he was the proud owner of Death Valley. Three minutes later, he was wandering the streets, penniless and destitute. Oh, well, easy come. Easy went. Just then, he spotted a familiar figure coming his way. Say, I will bet this is going to surprise you. Today, I am going to return that watch. What watch? The one my father never returned. Inscribed on the back of the watch was the owner's name and address. Off the young fox went to do his deed. Unfortunately, 10223 was the address of the state prison. I would like to see Mr. Britt, please. Oh, nobody sees him. He's in solitary confinement for life. It's my duty to return this watch, and nothing but nothing will stop me. It suddenly struck the young wolf that the easiest way to get into prison was to commit a crime. Seeing a wanted poster of Tommy Gunn, the notorious bank robber, gave him an idea. Mr. Gunn, I want to join your gang of hoodlums. Well, you're in luck, Buster, because it just so happens we're short one hood. Be at the last national bank at 230. Mr. Hoover? Tommy Gunn is going to rob the last national bank at 2.30. You could catch us all red-headed. Good work, men. Take them down to headquarters. Hold it, Chief. This one doesn't go. He's the one who tipped us off. Congratulations, boy. But don't I get to go to jail? Look at all this money I just robbed. Keep it for a reward, boy. Again, the son of the mask clock returned to the prison wall, willing to try anything to get inside. The fact that it was the darkest night of the year gave him a plan. Rope in hand, he started scaling the wall. But by sunup the next morning, he was still scaling. It was then he discovered he was on the 600th floor of the Gruber building in downtown Bakersfield. And in downtown Bakersfield, this was a felony. Tough luck, buddy. You'll go to state's prison for this. Happy day. Now I can return to watch. What do you think the judge will give me? 30 days? Hard to tell. It's a new judge. It may have been a new judge, but he had an old, familiar face. You again. Did you ever return that watch? Not yet, lawyer of my late father. You say... Quiet! There's been a rash of Gruber building climbing in downtown Bakersfield, and I mean to put a stop to it. I was going to give you 30 days. Instead, I'm giving you 30 years. And so the son of the masked clock finally did return the watch. But the fact that he annoyed the judge throughout the years caused him to spend the best years of his life behind bars. So you see, Junior, that is a perfect example of how familiarity breeds contempt. That's almost right, Pop. Almost? Yeah. In this case, I'd say familiarity breeds contempt of court. And a habeas corpus to you, too, son. And now for the 
educational part of our program. Don't say that or nobody will watch. Anyway, here's Mr. Know-it-all. Hello, friends. Today we take up the problem of how to have a hit record. First, it is necessary to make a record. That part's easy. Oh-oh, balut do to bitty rodo so tiddy fo zoot See? But next, you gotta have it played by a top-flight disc jockey. And there's one now. Disc Dawson. Hello, Disc Dawson. You're my favorite DJ. Would you like to hear my latest hit? No. I'd like you to hear my latest hit. Sounded more like a hit and run. Now, you may think I'm discouraged, and I am, but the essential thing is, he'll remember me. I'll just press my face against the glass here, and he'll recognize me. Hello, disc doll, remember me? How could I forget? If all else fails, you must impress the disc jockey with the prestige of the company that made your record. Hey, look, Mr. Disc Dawson, baby. What do you say to that? Only one thing to say. And that is... Sick him! <laughs> Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, are you gonna make another hit record? No, I'm out of the record business. But isn't that a record you're making there? Nope, it's a pizza! A one of mozzarella coming up! <laughs> Or five or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If my... Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. <laughs> with the television set, Sherman. It's bust. No, it isn't, Mr. Peabody. A spy fixed it this morning. A spy? Well, he snuck in the back door and he was all dressed in black. Well, that doesn't mean he's a spy. Well, he gave us secret service, didn't he? Oh, dear. I had no alternative but to make Sherman stand in a corner, the one occupied by the Wayback Machine. Where to, Mr. Peabody? Well, as long as we're on the subject of spies, let us meet the queen of them all, the legendary Mata Hari. Sherman sent the Wayback Machine toward Newcastle, England, in the early days of the First World War. We arrived just as one of the largest ships of its day was about to be launched. Which one of the people on the launching platform is Mata Hari, Mr. Peabody? From here, it's hard to tell. She undoubtedly is wearing a clever disguise. It was then I spotted a waiter going up the steps, carrying a bottle of champagne with which the ship was to be christened. That, Sherman, is Mata Hari. How can you tell? When a waiter wears high heels, something is afoot. In the name of His Majesty, I hereby christen this ship. Don't swing that bottle, Admiral. Why not? She blew it up. We reported the incident to the counterintelligence department of Scotland Yard. Well, if Mata Hari is in England, it means the war effort is in serious jeopardy. Wonder what she'll do next. Probably steal some secret plans. I doubt that. We have a steel-proof steel safe here, but we shall check anyway. Oh, dear, what did I do with the combination? The combination is six left, 32 right, back to eight, around once to zero, and right to three. Gad, sir, how do you know the combination? I don't really. It happens to be the phone number of my aunt in Peoria. The heavy door swung open, revealing an empty safe. Good, she didn't take a thing. What do you mean, Inspector? Well, the safe is just a blind. I keep the secret plans in my pants pocket. We suddenly realized his pockets were gone, along with his pants. That means Mata Hari got away with the plans. Yes, and without them, England is lost. In a desperate attempt to overtake her before she could leave the country, we dashed for the nearest optometrist. Optometrist? What makes you think she'll be there? Quite obvious, Sherman. All spies need spy glasses. Suddenly before us loomed a shop owned by a Dr. Focals. Rushing inside, we spotted Mata Hari standing by Focals. No use making a spectacle of yourself, Mata Hari. We've got the drop on you. Actually, she had the drop on us, for a trapdoor sprang open and Mata Hari disappeared. Quick, she'll head for the airport now. We arrived just as Mata Hari took off in an old de Havilland. We were quick to follow in a new de Havilland. I didn't know you could fly, Mr. Peabody. I have a little bird dog in me, Sherman. By the time we were halfway across the channel, we were practically on Mata Hari's tail. Open fire, Inspector! Right, sir. Unfortunately, the Inspector misinterpreted Sherman's command. To him, open fire meant to open the cockpit and build a fire. 
we went down in flames, which was the name of a small French town right near the German lines. We disembarked from our burning plane and took stock of our situation. Uh, this Sherman is what is known as no man's land. Years ago, it was a lush forest. But the trees are gone. That's right, Sherman. This is the Argonne Forest. You should have saved that one for the ending, Mr. Peabody. Oh, I have one that's worse than that, Sherman. Right now, our problem is to outwit Matahari before she can deliver the secret plans to the enemy. We shall never catch her now. We shall not only catch her, we shall pass her. Unmindful of the shrapnel, we ran between the falling bombs and reached the enemy trench a good 45 and 3 tenths seconds ahead of Mata. Oh, we're in trouble, Mr. Peabody. Look at all the bayonets. And that gave me an idea. I picked up a string of hot dogs lying in a nearby shell hole and instructed Sherman and the inspector to follow my example. We placed a hot dog at the end of each bayonet. Naturally, the soldiers assumed they were at a weenie bake and being German, rushed off to get some sauerkraut. Now what, Mr. Peabody? Quick, into these uniforms. When Matahari got there, she took us for German officers and promptly handed over the secret plans. I, in turn, promptly handed the plans and Miss Hari over to the inspector. We did it, Mr. Peabody! Yes, don't we always? By the way, Mr. Peabody, what was in the secret plans? Here they are, Sherman. Take a look for yourself. Oh, my gosh, it's just a picture of a giant blimp. That giant blimp, Sherman, was to be England's last resort. In the event they were losing the war, the entire British population was to climb into that blimp and fly to safety. I never heard of that before. Well, of course you have. Where do you think we got the phrase, one nation in dirigible? Oh, no. I warned you, Sherman. <laughs> What started out as just another flower fair in Frostbite Falls has wound up as a national calamity. For Bill Winkle's entry turned out to be a man-eating plant called a Pottsylvania creeper, which proceeded to take over the whole town. Worse, that plant released thousands of little seed-bearing parachutes. And when Rocky tried to recapture the seeds, he became a moving target for Phyllis Leader. Stunned by a near miss, Rocky plummeted downward, but at the very last instant... Wow, that was close. What took you so long, Bullwinkle? Had to run home and get my catcher's mitt. Oh, boy. Of course, by this time, the creeper seeds were flung far and wide, and soon man-eating plants were growing everywhere in the United States. In swamps, in deserts, in solid rock, even in city streets. Immediately, the nation took action. Get me the White House. Get me the Air Force. Get me better homes and gardens. But alas, nobody seemed to know how to attack the creeper. They tried weed killer. <laughs> they tried flamethrowers. <laughs> They tried bombs. <laughs> nothing worked. Within a few months, even the Empire State Building was nothing but an enormous platter. Gentlemen, we'll just have to give up and abandon the country. Well, how do you like those subversive apples, Chief? Superb, bad enough, a triumph. And for your reward? Yes, yes. I am taking you both back with me. Back? back? To Pennsylvania? Yes. Oh, boy. Couldn't we have a five-year vacation in the salt mines instead? Come along. And Phyllis Leader led Boris and Natasha to a handy nearby submarine. I always like to take the 922 sub. It gets you to Pennsylvania in time for the morning executions. Meanwhile, back in Frostbite Falls... It's no use, Rock. We've tried everything but kissing that thing goodnight. That's it, Bullwinkle. What's it? We've tried everything but being nice to the creeper. Being nice to a man-eating plant? What have we got to lose? Us. Nevertheless, at Rocky's suggestion, people did start trying to be nice to the Pottsylvania creepers. They watered them, they fed them vitamin pills, they tucked them in at night, they gave them birthday parties. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Potsy. And the plan worked. The creepers survived well under the worst of conditions, but they didn't know what to make of kind treatment. They began to wilt. Oh, Doctor, I'm so worried it hasn't eaten anybody for days. Mrs. Johnson, you've got a sick, sick plant here. I'd suggest two weeks at some nice summer camp. And in the office of a prominent psychiatrist. Now tell me, when did you start having these feelings of persecution? <clears throat> 
And when the head shriekers begin to move in, it's the beginning of the end, Rook. True. Potsylvania creepers all over the nation had nervous breakdowns, gave up, and simply shriveled on the vine. Do gooding had do good. Soon all that remained of the dreadful invasion of the Potsylvania creeper was one lonesome little seed blowing out over the ocean, whereas fate would have it, it was sucked into the air intake of a mysterious submarine. When the sub came up in Pennsylvania and the hatch was opened, the only thing that emerged was a huge blossom. And look, Dimitri, it's smiling. <coughs> Meanwhile, in Frostbite Falls... Gee, Bullwinkle, where'd you get all those books on plants and flowers and trees? I thought you'd never ask. I got them Oh, don't say it. At the... And so we come to the end of another episode of Rocky and Bullwinkle. The Branch Library. Oh, dear. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop! <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Last episode was switched off in utter disgust by over 37 million anxious viewers. Those two wrongs, Boris and Natasha, were proving they couldn't make a right. A right bad idea. Think, darling, think. There must be something really rotten we can do today. I'm thinking. But the worst I come up with is helping to make Moose and Squirtle show one hour longer. Oh, just like you, darling. Always trying to help others get a little more pain out of life. Then suddenly a thought struck him like a 20,000 volt charge. <laughs> Boris, you have great idea. No, but I have defective cord on electric pencil sharpener. I have it, darling. A contest. I like being evil because, in 25 words or less. I like it. I like it. And so the twisted and foul contest found its way to people in every walk of life. Hey, Gurney, my lunch is wrapped here in a paper telling about that evil contest. You figure to enter? <coughs> Gurney always was one to try a thing out first before he'd send it in. <coughs> I hate to do this, but I've entered that contest. Help yourself. I'm entering, too, so I've been selling fake jewelry all week. 
The wife's home with the real stuff. So by the time you find this note, Fred, I will be gone with a swag and maybe first prize in the contest. The contest was racing across the country like wildfire. Oh, it's gratifying to know there's still some bad left in the world. True enough. To enter a contest this vile, one would have to be a pretty low, contemptible, loathsome type. You left out naughty. A loathsome and naughty type. Or uh, just plain stupid. Hold up a minute, Rock. I gotta mail this contest entry blank in. Bullwinkle, you mean you entered that Why I Like Evil contest? Evil? I thought it said Weevil. Well, why should you like a Weevil? Because I had distributing rights on them for two years. I almost made a fortune. Almost made a fortune? Well, what happened, Bullwinkle? They had cotton all over them. It drove the prices down. And as sure as the post office department sells four-cent stamps commemorating the birth of Raymond Navarro, Bullwinkle had come up with a winning entry in Boris's despicable contest. Listen to this. I like evil because I have complete distributing rights for it in Musselwania. That's it. First prize. Back at the post office. Bullwinkle, do you realize that you mailed a contest blank that says you have the distributing rights on evil someplace? It's just for Musselvania. Musselvania? What's that? What's that? I wish I could remember. Ah, uh, if only Bullwinkle could remember. Musselvania was and is a small land adjacent to the United States, populated by absolutely no one. Zero people, zero production, zero space development, zero everything. But on the other hand, no taxes, no laws, no traffic, no extradition treaties, and no late, late shows that feature Johnny Downs and Richard Dix as two men lost over a Pacific island. I have it! You have what, Bullwinkle? I have Musselvania. I just remembered. It's been handed down in my family. I'm governor, superintendent, owner, and cleanup janitor. But at that very second that Bullwinkle was delivering those staggeringly funny lines, the contest first prize was speeding its way toward him. What did you send, Boris Sweetovich? A complete set of the encyclopedia bad enough. And? And when you open volume seven, mastered on through Moscox. Which includes Musselvania. And also 237 kilotons of TNT. Package for Bullwinkle J. Moose. Oh, goody. I'll bet it's those Billy Sol seed kits I ordered from the Department of Agriculture. Oh, what can happen on our next nerve-pulsating episode? Blast off Speedia with Encyclopedia or off to heaven with Volume 7? <laughs> And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. Once there lived a young man who, more than anything else, wanted to become a traveling minstrel. Yeah, like I want to wander through the kingdom giving concerts on my flat. You mean your flute. This is a flat. A flat is like a flute. You might say it's sort of a flat flute. He had practiced the flat for five years and at last felt he was ready for his debut. He rented the Hamlin Concert Hall, dressed in a variegated suit of clothing, billed himself as the Pied Piper. The house was filled, the lights were dim, silence fell over the great hall, and he began. Unfortunately, however, even after he had begun to play, the hall was still silent, for the flat was such a high-pitched instrument that no human ear could hear it. The only ones able to hear the flat music were the mice of the kingdom, and they did not like what they heard. Oh, my, no. Ooh, that is piercing. That's the flattest, flattest I ever heard. Let's cut out of here. I can't stand it. And with that, mice left the kingdom in droves. But the audience, still unable to hear a thing, just sat, waiting for the concert to begin. In fact, they sat for two weeks before they knew it was over. It seemed as though the poor Pied Piper was a flop as a flattest, but a roaring success as an exterminator. Doing the only thing left for him to do, he took his flat and opened up an exterminator business and was summoned by the king for his very first job. Hi, Highness. You have an exterminating job for me to do? Yes, I do. Fine. What's the pest? Rats, cats, bats, lice, mice? No, my mother-in-law. Mother-in-law? But mothers-in-law are human. Oh, yeah? You fat, pompous little worm! King or no king, you're a nincompoop! And let me tell you! That's human. 
but only mice are able to hear the flat music. And if your mother-in-law can't hear it, it couldn't possibly drive her away. Well, what do mice have that mothers-in-law don't have? Why are they the only ones that can hear you flat? Well, maybe it's something they eat, sire. This set the king to thinking. Hmm. Eating lots of carrots gives you good eyes. Mice eat lots of cheese. Maybe that's what gives them good ears. I think that's logic, sire. I'm going to feed that old meanie cheese until it's coming out of your big ears. <laughs> and with that, the king gathered up cheeses by the score and set them before his mother-in-law. Look, Mama, all for you. You open your big mouth now and eat all you want. You're being nice to me. What are you up to, weasel? Nothing. They're poisoned, aren't they? Oh, come now, Mama. Would I try to poison my own mother-in-law? Yes. You're right. What? I said they're all right. Watch, I'll eat some. The mother-in-law watched the king closely, and when he didn't drop dead, decided it was safe and tried some cheese herself. Say, this is good. Oh, the plan was working, but in order to keep her eating, the king had to eat cheese, too. For three months, they ate gobs of gouda, pecks of provolone, racks of roquefort, and lots of Limburger. Finally, the king figured it was time to put the scheme to a test. Psst, pipey, now, give a blat on your flat, and we'll see what happens. Right, sire. Ah! What was that? <laughs> it worked, it worked, it worked. <laughs> the cheese had done the trick. They had both heard the flat clear as a bell. Now the mother-in-law could be exterminated with no trouble at all. The king packed her bags, had a carriage waiting at the front gate so that she could make a quick getaway, and sent the piper off to do his stuff. The Pied Piper played his flat for the mother-in-law like he had never played before, but with rather surprising results. My, what haunting music. Where could it be coming from? Why, it's you. Yes, ma'am. Doesn't it give you that want-to-run-away feeling? Heavens, no, I simply love it. More. Play more. The Pied Piper, never having had anyone like his flat music before, immediately fell madly in love with the king's mother-in-law and played for her with all of his heart. Like, go, ma'am! Oh, that awful flat music. Stop that this instant, you. I command you. See here, Runt. I happen to like flat music. And if you don't, you know what you can do. The king did know, and he did. He dashed to the waiting carriage, and he sped away for parts unknown, never to be seen again. Now then, are you ready, dear? Yes, my love. It was quite clear that the king's mother-in-law and the Pied Piper were meant for each other, and they were soon married. In the months to follow, it was decided that all in the kingdom should be allowed to enjoy flat music. So the castle was converted into a concert hall, and flat concerts were held nightly. And, oh yes, to ensure the audience of hearing the music, the eating of cheese was highly encouraged. Instead of a popcorn stand, a cheese stand was put in the lobby, so when the patrons came to the concert... Yes, sir. Would you like some cheddar? No. Camembert? No. Gorgonzola? No. Well, for pity's sake, what do you want, then? Take me to your leader, Kron. Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. And now for the poetic part of our show, we present Bullwinkle's Corner. Greetings, culture crowd. Today's poem is an old Greek classic called The Horn. I translate, little boy blue, come blow your horn. The sheep... Hold it, hold it. What, what, what? I forgot my music. Okay, let's go. Oh, uh, that's kind of a big horn, ain't it? It's a big part. Oh. <clears throat> little boy blue, come blow your horn. <laughs> The sheep's in the meadow. The cow's in the corn. Psst. Boy, that's hard work. Oh, where is the boy who looks after the sheep? Don't ask me. I'm a musician myself. He's under a haystack fast asleep is where, doggone it. Why'd you call this poem the horn anyway? Because obviously that's what the little boy blew. <laughs> Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two. And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three.
sunset, the time of day when most Canadians bring home the bacon. And one Canadian brings home the ham. The Canadian is Dudley Do-Right, ace do-gooder of the mounted police. The ham, and he's usually boiled, is that arch-villain and scourge of two continents, Snidely Whiplash. Each day at sundown, Dudley brings Whiplash into the post and places him under lock and key. This is a waste of my time, Do-Right. Each night you lock me up, and each morning I escape. You shall not escape tonight, Whiplash. Dudley's optimism was based on the fact that he had set up an elaborate alarm system completely encircling the cell. He made one slight error. He locked himself in the cell, not Whiplash. Ta-ta, do right. But on his way to the gate, Whiplash ran into trouble, for Dudley's horse, angered at finding water in the water trough, lashed out his great hooves in anger, striking a not-too-innocent passerby. One hour later, Inspector Fenwick, post commander, made a routine check of the jail. Ah, do right. Still up, I see. Yes, sir. I am keeping a vigil on Whiplash. That's doing it the Mountie way, my boy. I must get him out of my slick down hair once and for all. Pen in hand, Whiplash outlined a daring plan. Here is the post. Up here is my sawmill. If I can lure do right to the mill, I can destroy him forever. But how to lure him? Those evil eyes darted about the room until... To knell with love. Horse. Egad, that's it! This time he went in search of Dudley's horse. <clears throat> Once again he received a well-placed hoof, but he was prepared for it. And up he soared out of the post. Do right, I don't know how he did it, but Whiplash has escaped. Are you sure, sir? I mean, have you looked in his cell? You look do right. By George, you're right, sir. He is missing. But never fear, I will bring him in again. At that very moment, his valiant charger was gobbling up a trail of oats that led to Whiplash's sawmill. Ah, here comes the horse. Step number one in my plan. And what a plan it was. The horse walked right into the trap and was made prisoner. And who will come after the horse? Not Dudley. He was having trouble locating the stable. Ah, fair Nell. Have you seen the stable lately? No, I haven't, Dudley, and I can't help you look for it. I have a luncheon engagement with your horse. Oh? Say, after lunch, would you ask him to saddle up? I have a job to do. Nell was on her way to the PX when she spied some familiar hoof prints. Dudley's horse? I'd know them anywhere. And off she went in hot pursuit. Aha, step number two. The fair and lovely Nell is approaching. Nell, too, fell victim to Whiplash's terrible design. And who will come after Nell? Not Dudley. He was still searching for the stable. Pardon me, Inspector, but I seem to have misplaced the stable. No time to help you do, right? I'm due to make a speech at lunch. Mm. With Nell and my horse? Yes. Inspector Fenwick scurried off. Then he, too, spotted the telltale tracks. That horseshoe print with a broken nail, that's Nell's left foot. By three in that afternoon, Whiplash had in his power Dudley's horse, Nell, the inspector, and most of the Mounties in the general area. What's keeping that dolt do right? He should have been here long ago. In case you're wondering, Dudley had found the stable. He was now looking for a way to get out of it. There must be a door somewhere. There was. It opened, and in walked a messenger boy. You constable do right. I think so. Dudley took the telegram and ripped it open. Dear dolt. Can't spell Dudley. Unless you come to my sawmill, I shall blow up Nell, the inspector, your fellow Mounties, and your horse. My horse! He arrived at the sawmill in jigsaw time. And you will let my horse go free if I surrender to you? Everybody goes free. The exchange was made. Inspector Fenwick, Nell, and the Mounties bid a tearful farewell and returned to the post. As for Dudley, he was tied to a chair, a chair infested with sticks of dynamite. Do right. You'll never do right again. A match was struck, the fuse was lit, and whiplash dashed off over the horizon. Daddy, dear, don't keep looking out the window in the direction of the sawmill. It can't help. I know it, Nell. It's only do right we're losing, and yet... Well, there he goes. Just then, the door burst open and... It is me! I, sir! Dudley! Do right! I fooled him, Inspector. I made him think I blew up. But how? With this record. It has 33 and a third long playing explosions on it. He only heard an explosion. But the sticks of dynamite. Don't worry about that, sir. I have them here. Do right! Come down here! Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look.
In our last episode, Boris Badenov and his equally vicious friend Natasha had found the perfect way to acquire a lifetime supply of fiendishly tricky ideas. A contest. I like evil because in 25 words or less. It could be even bigger than the Sonny Tufts for President movement. And it was. Entries poured in from every corner of the world. Merle, don't you think as astronauts we ought to tell them the Earth ain't round, it's got corners? Shucks, Otis, lying to him might be a way to win that evil contest. Shifty people everywhere responded in 25 words or less. Shifty. Or those whose cerebral functions respond conversely to the impulse transitions normally required for a motory reflex action. Or in other words, stupid. Well, I've mailed my contest blank. Bowinkle, you've entered the evil contest. Oh, I thought it was Weevil. And you guessed it. Bowinkle has been judged first prize winner. And the first prize was a complete set of the Encyclopedia Badenov designed to eradicate Bowinkle and Rocky. When they turn to Volume 7, Mastodon through Muscox. Musylvania will be a boom town. Mastodon, Macedonia, mulching. It's here someplace. Now, Dalek, he has turned to Musylvania. Monocle. Mother, here it is, Rock, Mussylvania. Four, three, two, one. Says here, Mussylvania, although eminently qualified for statehood in the U.S., has never made the grade. Huh, wonder why. If the flash lasts this long, the boom will be a Lulu. No flash and no boom, boom, Lulu, Boris. And Bullwinkle read on about the tragically narrow misses Mussylvania had had in its fight for statehood. Then it is agreed, gentlemen, that the 13 original colonies shall join with Mussylvania and become the 14 United States of America. Hey, hold it! When you bring a job to the Betsy Ross Flag Manufacturing Company, there ain't no alterations included. Now, if you want 14 stars instead of 13, that comes extra. Yes, Mussylvania was the first victim of government's fight against deficit spending. Over and over again, Mussylvania had narrowly missed statehood. And as Bullwinkle read on, tears formed in his sympathetic eyes. Golly, Bullwinkle, why are you crying? Well, Rock, it's because... Hello, Moose and Squirrel, first place contest winners. You sure you're reading about Mussolvania? Nope. That's why I was crying. Because I can't read and I was running out of stuff I'd memorized. Look, Moose, you got the wrong book. Eureka through Glefni. Show him, wonderful twisted genius. See? Mastodon, Macedonia, Mulching. Boris, no. Mussolvania. <laughs> But seconds before the dreadful explosion, Rocky and Bullwinkle had slipped away to catch the 526 for Washington, D.C., where they were about to launch a gigantic campaign. State hood for Mussolvania, Rock. Just think. Golly, Bullwinkle, just like Hawaii and Alaska. Gee whiz, Rock, they trying to get it, too? But as the train flashed on, Boris Badenov was no longer idle. Boris, the moose and squirrel, they left on train for Washington. Is all part of Priering's master plan. How despicably clever of you, Dalek. You mean train is... Exactly. Added for fake Washington, D.C. Is really Butte, Montana, completely disguised to look like capital of U.S. What unspeakably twisted scheme does Boris have in mind? We'll find out in our next episode called Resign Your Fate to a 52nd State or Mussylvania Mania. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Right. Bye now. See you next time. A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A whirl and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of Rocky and Bowling.
Frankel and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wait to the people! An autograph. The theme, John Mute. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. freezing episode reached its nearly unbearable climax, our two principals, Rocky and Bullwinkle, were hurtling purposefully toward what they thought was Washington, D.C. Now, let's see, Rock. What were we gonna do in Washington? Gosh, Bullwinkle, you forgot already. We're gonna file for statehood for Musylvania. Oh, that's right. That way, Musylvania can set an example for Texas. But what Bullwinkle and Rocky didn't know was that they were streaming straight for Butte, Montana, which had been cleverly disguised as our nation's capital by no one else than Boris Badenov and his femme fatality, Natasha. Wait till Moose and Squirtle see authentic, artificial, simulated fake capital. But, Dalek, why you do this? If Musylvania becomes a real state in real Washington, we lose chance for distribution rights for evil. Is clear, Boris, precious monster, but why you put Frankenstein on top of Capitol Dome? And while Boris erected the sham Washington, D.C. as a part of a truly sinister scheme, the citizens of Butte, Montana, scarcely took notice. Hey, Merle, some nut come a-running in here and ask me if I'd wear the Supreme Court robe. I know, Selwyn. I used to just want to hit you in the mouth. Now I want to impeach you. The nerve of that feller, Mother, bending our antenna like that. Now Channel 4 don't get nothing but the presidential press conferences. Don't move, Dad. He told me I was the new curator of the Smithsonian, and now I'm putting you on display with that old typewriter. At that identical moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were nearing their mistaken destination. Gee, Bullwinkle, our nation's capital off there in the distance. Doesn't it give you a special feeling? Yeah, Rock. Almost like the feeling I got first time I saw Butte, Montana. Yeah, just look at that gold dome. Funny, I thought Frankenstein was green. And as Rocky and Bullwinkle pulled into the station, a familiar voice could be heard behind an impenetrable disguise. Hey, Moose and Squirrel, give you a nice tour of capital. That voice! Where have I heard that voice before? In about 324 other episodes. But I don't know who it is either. Pardon me, Mr. Guy, but we represent Musylvania, and we'd like you to take us where we can file for statehood. How about in here, Rock? Bullwinkle, that's the wrong building. That's the Bureau of Weights and Measures. Oh, yeah. I guess that's why I got this card with a picture of Peter Lawford on one side, along with 162 pounds and my fortune. Here it is, U.S. Capitol. Here's where old Mooses and Squirrels files for statehood. Thanks, mister. Yeah, and thanks for tying this handkerchief around my eyes, too. But barely a few yards away, a shadowy figure stood ready to perform an unbelievably treacherous act. Now, Boris. You ain't just whistling Dixie, kid. Now. Hey, wait a minute. You're no guide. And that doesn't look like the Capitol building. Come on, Bullwinkle. Let's get out of here. But it was too late, for no matter how fast they ran, Rocky and Bullwinkle were in the direct path of the falling phony Capitol. Rock, you mean the Capitol isn't really made out of one quarter-inch beaver board with plastic clamps? Run, Bullwinkle! I thought you only ran in Washington every fourth year. Run for your life, Bullwinkle! Sounds like as good a reason as any, Rock. Well, our two speedy specimens escaped certain squashing death by the giant 13,000-ton beaverboard capital replica. Watch out in our next nerve-spattering episode titled Bad Day at Flat Rocky or A Record in Bullwinkle's Blunt. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Once upon a time, in the little town of Daniels on the Rocks, there lived a beauty and a beast. Oh, I'm not really a beast. Actually, I'm a prince. But I'm all fudged up like this because of witchcraft. Please. But ugly as he was, he could once again become handsome just by being kissed by a beauty. Kissed? Oh, so that's the bit. Just <laughs> get kissed <laughs> by a... <laughs> Man, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> that was probably the wrong girl anyway. And so, the beast set out to find the beauty whose love would break his magic spell. How do you do, miss? I'm not really a beast, but a prince. The victim of... You're no prince. And you're no beauty either. <laughs> Boy, that's what I really needed. you gorgeous thing. I'm not really a beast, but a prince. The victim of... Oh, witchcraft! Listen to me. This is a true story. I'm... A handsome prince. Well, an inventive beast knows when to change tactics, and this particular beast knew that it was the smart thing to present his case before presenting his face. Call me a beast, will you? Next, the beast posed as an old friend of the family. Ho, 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 ho! How about a big kiss for Shanty? Well, obviously, it was time to look for another approach. A kissing booth at a fair, for instance. There, the beast would simply buy a kiss for himself, and it just might be the kiss. Then again, it might not. Maybe I should quit when I'm ahead. If you didn't call this being ahead. Well, if one can't even buy a kiss, one is forced into devious measures. Something subtle, sophisticated, something ingenious, yet in obvious. <laughs> Fortunately for the beast, there was a wedding taking place in a nearby garden. A natural. The beast simply had to stand in line with the other guests and kiss the bride. This is it. I feel more handsome already. I would like to say a few words about... Stop that dancing up there. Another day, another ugly. But wait, what is this? A fair maid in yon balcony. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? Up, 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 and away! But the damsel did not do good like a Juliet should. However, not to be discouraged, the beast tried again, this time by air. His takeoff was superb, but we can't say as much for his landing. Jousting was an old favorite sport in fairy story days. After the joust, the winner usually threw a rose to the lady of his choice, who, in return, would reward him with a kiss. This seemed like a perfect opportunity to the beast, so he threw the rose, it was high and a little inside, and made ready to receive his reward. But instead... The next good prospect for a kiss was on the edge of disaster, as the beast happened by. I'll save her. They shall kiss me out of gratitude. No, no, wait, stop. Don't do it. Hold it. Don't be rash. Wait, hold on. I'll save you. Well, eventually, even a beast gets discouraged. I'm just a no-good beastnik. So the next time he met a beauty... Hello? Hello? Here, hit me. Go ahead, shock me good. Say so y'all do. But the beast can only become a prince again if a beauty kisses him. The real beauty, black of hair. Black of hair. Red of lips. Red of lips. Fair of skin. Fair of... It's her. I mean, you or she. This is the one. Kiss me. <laughs> Better try again, baby. That one didn't take. Well, the script says that you turn back into a prince. You really are a prince, aren't you? Listen, bud. You get kissed your way, I'll get kissed my way.
become wiser, here is Mr. Know-It-All. Hello, wise guys. Today's dissertation is provocative of Lee's subtitled, How to Remove a Mustache Without Getting Any Lip. Now, you can't shave a mustache unless you have a mustache. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I would like a mustache to go. Which kind do you prefer, the $1,000 type or the $999 type? Actually, I'd like something right in the middle, say, around a buck and a half. I'm sorry, but we only sell expensive mustaches. As you can see, the average mustache remover is bound to run into an occasional obstacle. Yes, sir. I'd like a loan. Any collateral? What'll you give me for a flying squirrel? Say, around a thousand dollars. Just what I need. Where do I sign? This is a stick-up. Doggone pen. Doesn't want to give any ink. Oh, sorry about that, sir. Here, let me hold your gun. <whistles> Sometimes the average mustache remover encounters lots of obstacles. But, your highness, this is all a mistake. Ninety-nine years. Take them away. And so it is with deep regrets I am unable to tell you how to remove Mr. a... Mr. know your lip! You've grown a mustache! I have! Quick, I just have time to remove it! Hand me my miracle mustache remover! But that isn't... We liberally sprinkle all exposed areas with this... But it isn't mustache remover! No? What is it? Vanishing cream! No, he tells me! And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat! But... See? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. Hello there. Peabody here. And this is the Wayback Machine for traveling through time. And this is my boy, Sherman. Speak, Sherman. Hello. Good boy. And today we visit Napoleon. No kidding, Mr. Peabody? I never kid, Sherman. Time? About 1810. Place? Paris. Hmm. The Wayback was working beautifully. We were teleported right into Napoleon's chambers. He wasn't exactly dressed to receive visitors. Who is there? Oh, you are from the Secret Service? Why, sire, is something amiss? Of course, they are gone. What are gone? The Imperial braces. Huh? The Emperor means his suspenders are missing. We. Oui. But why are they so important? Uh, because they hold up my pants up. Crushing logic, sire. You can't be an Emperor without suspenders? Of course not. If I try to draw my sword, see, I cannot order the troops forward. I cannot even salute. And as for making a speech, impossible. Well, why don't you get another pair? Because I am the emperor. I must wear only the imperial suspenders. Sire, who besides you has access to your wardrobe? Only my ever-faithful servant, Pierre Lecomo. And where is he? They come to think of it. I haven't seen him lately. Find Pierre, and you'll find the missing suspenders. But where? There! Yes, through the palace window, Sherman had spotted a skulking figure moving toward the gate. Come on, Mr. Peabody! My dear boy, I'm a genius, not a track star. He went this way, toward the docks. In a trice, we were on the docks. Look, that ship's leaving. We'll lose them. I doubt that. <laughs> when the ship pulled to a stop, Sherman and I made our way to a porthole. Inside was Pierre Lacomo and his conspirators. On the table between them were the royal suspenders. You have done your work well, Pierre. Nothing. When our generals see this, they will know Napoleon is helpless. And they will attack. Then France will fall. Like Napoleon's pants. <laughs> <laughs> but, Pierre, the table is moving. How come? It's simply the rolling of the ship, gentlemen. Yes, it's the rolling of... What? After them! Well, we got the suspenders. Let's run. Unfortunately, we ran in opposite directions. But it was just as well. Quickly! Unless we get those suspenders, our plot is doomed. I've got this one cornered. Peekaboo. Ooh, give me back my sword, you. Oh, very well. <laughs> How's everything, Sherman? Just fine, Mr. Peabody. That's nice. Ah, 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 ah. It's not sporting, you know. 
Who cares? I'm going to get you if it's the last thing I do. What do you know? It was the last thing. You little pest. I'm going to feed you to the sharks. Be calm, Chairman. My guidebook says there are no sharks in these waters. Goodbye, you brat. Monsieur Lacomo, you seem to have cut the hawser. But when I go, he goes. Not necessarily. <laughs> and as the rope parted, Sherman dangled at one end of the Emperor's braces, while Pierre Lacomo fell into the murky water. My, seems the guidebook was wrong about those sharks. Well, now to return these to Napoleon and receive the thanks of the happy populace. They don't look happy. Something the matter? Please, Monsieur Peabody. Don't take the Emperor's suspenders back. Why not? Because it is the first day in 33 years there has been peace and quiet in France. The first day the cannons have been silent. No boom, boom, boom. For years, our people have had to go around with their fingers in their ears. It's the first time I've seen my daddy in 33 years, too. And who is your daddy? Napoleon. Well, we had kept the suspenders from falling into the hands of France's enemies, but there really didn't seem to be any reason for returning them to Napoleon either. And so we didn't. There they are. That's why in all the pictures of Napoleon, his hand is inside his coat. He's really holding up the imperial pants. In our last spleen-shaking episode, our two Musselvania mentors had journeyed to what they thought was Washington, D.C., but which was actually just Butte, Montana, which had been sinisterly disguised by, you guessed it, Boris Badenov and Natasha. Now, Boris, cruel, sweetie. Now. Faster, Bowen, go faster! What, and get arrested for impersonating a jet? Oh, Bullwinkle, it's okay. We can stop now. Do we have to, Rock? I just love to hear the wind whistle through my antlers when I'm doing over 60. Boris, baby, where did we fail? <laughs> and I always try so hard to do the wrong thing. Hey, who cares if Moose and Squirrel not squashed? It's impossible to file for statehood for Musselvania in Butte, Montana, anyway. So true, my dearest <laughs> twisted genius. But was it true? Look, behind where that artificial capital was, there's the Butte, Montana Lumber Company, and it's fallen, too. What do you say to that, Bullwinkle? What else, Rock? Timber! And falling it was, right on Boris Badenov. <laughs> who had no way of knowing that he had not disguised Butte, Montana as Washington, D.C. It was actually Washington, D.C. that had been rigged up to look like Butte, Montana by a clever pressure group in the pay of the Montana Muskmelon Trust. Senator, here we decorated this year whole town to look like Butte, Montana, and still you're voting against our muskmelon bill? Son, I even voted against Medicare, and they wrapped 54 million Band-Aids on the Washington Monument. Well, anyway, it really was Washington, D.C., and at that very moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were entering the Capitol building with their petition for statehood for Mussylvania. This is it, Bullwinkle. Look, they even have a window marked Musselvania. Hey, Moose and Squirrel, Musselvania is explosive issue. Better hurry. Window is closing in one minute in honor of Aaron Burr. Hey, isn't he the one that shot Alexander Hamilton? That's why the window is closing. I got to warn him to get out of town. Well, then give him the petition, Bullwinkle. Okay, Rock, but you better hold this for me. Thank you, Moose and Squirrel. Now Musselvania is never having statehood. Bullwinkle, we gave them our petition and they were fake. Oh, well, at least we still got this little gift that lobbyist from the pressure group gave me. What pressure group? I believe he said it was the New Mexico Dynamite and TNT Trust. Golly, Bullwinkle, this isn't it. 
This is a petition. Then you mean... And once again, Bullwinkle's incredible stupidity had saved the day, for at that very minute, a blinding flash covered the entire metropolitan Washington, D.C. area and parts of Elko, Nevada, as well. Boris, if angle of trajectory is right, we orbit Earth every seven minutes. See, I was right. Mussolvania statehood was explosive issue. Back at the Capitol building, two friendly hands met in congratulations for a momentous event, affecting 185 million Americans. Well, that's it, Bullwinkle. It's filed. You mean Mussolvania's gonna be a state now, Rock? That all depends on how many good Americans get behind it, Bullwinkle. But will Rocky and Bullwinkle be joined in support by people everywhere? Or will the same sinister forces that defeated the Snooky Lanson presidential boom be at work again? Perhaps we'll find out more in further adventures of Rocky Squirrel and Bullwinkle J. Moose. <laughs> Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. show's about to start. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The feed, John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more. There's no question about it. Ask any senior citizen residing in Frostbite Falls what the major event of the year is, and he'll reply... The Frostbite Falls Flotilla Festival. And why is that? Because all the noisy kids are down at Veronica Lake. Ah, peace, it's loudmouth butterfly. You really couldn't call it a lake. It's more of a pond. That is, well, actually, I guess you'd call it a sump. At any rate, every boy in the general area had his boat ready to sail. Bullwinkle, you can't enter the race. I'd like to know why not. The rules clearly stipulate no human over ten can participate. I'm about as inhuman as you can get. You're a moat. And that's another reason. 
Oh, see, there's the warning whistle advising all us marinators to ready sail. Where'd you get that thing? What thing? What it is you're about to launch. And the starry-eyed moose related the story in flashback form of how one day, while ambling along the old rocks road, he stumbled onto an ancient rust-encrusted dhow. Dhow about that. A dhow, spelled D-H-O-W, is a sailing vessel primarily used in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. Well, she sure is dirty. Yes, but she's your. The starting signal was given and 48 trim little boats put out to sea, or sump, all except Bullwinkles, which sank upon contact with the water. She sank! Yarr. It doesn't matter who won the race. What does matter is that the Dow emerged completely rejuvenated. Wow, look at its sparkle. And looky here on the binnacle rock. That's the bow. It says Omar. Goodness? Kayam. Omar Kayam. Hokey smokes, what do you suppose it means? Only the library could provide the answer. Oh, pardon me, ma'am, but could... Shh, can't you read? But we don't smoke. It says silence. Oh, that darn cat, always stomping around. Scat! <coughs> now what is it? Boats, books on boats. Yarr. Aisle 842, lane 30, district 3, shelves 20 to 80 inclusive. Well, it wasn't easy, but some six hours later, they cornered their quarry. Oh, my gosh, two copies of the Ancient Mariner. By Al B. Troth. Suddenly, the setting sun bounced its oh, rays oh, off the glittering dow. This gave the resourceful flying squirrel an idea. It shines like a gem. Say... Come on! The reigning authority on minerals, valuable and otherwise, was Digger Deeper, mine owner, prospector, and babysitter on Saturday nights between 8 and 12. It's a gem, all right. Might be fool's gold. This is rab. Fool's gold is gold. Let me give it a closer look. Hand me my loopy. <whistles> see, I never saw this one before. You boys want to see? We, we sure don't do have time, Digger. Come on, Bullwinkle. And the insistent squirrel led the way to the only jewelry store in Frostbite Falls. You know what you have here? We were hoping that you'd tell us. This little dow here is composed of ruby. Yes, sir, it's rubies. No, it isn't. It's mine. Well, my gosh, if it's made out of rubies, then... If you're hesitating for me to finish the line, you've got a long wait. And I don't have the guts to say it. Okay, then here goes. If it's made out of rubies, then this must be the ruby yacht of Omar Khayyam. Mm. And with that little gem, we ring down the curtain. What does fate have in the jewelry store? Be with us next time for Let's Drink to the Ruby or Stoned Again. <laughs> for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two. And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Once upon a time, there was a miller's daughter named Gladys who would spin straw all day long and sit up nights thinking of how she would like to be famous. Night after night, she would think of all the things she wanted to be. But as for figuring out a way to be them, Gladys was at a loss. Oh, to be famous. Just then, a strange little man appeared before her. Little lady, I can make you famous overnight. Who are you? I am what is known as a PR man. PR man? Public relations, my dear. Public relations. It is my business to glamorize the unglamorous. In my hands, the pedestrian becomes splendorous, the prosaic resplendent. What do you do, baby? Oh, I spin straw. That's it. You spin straw. So? Don't interrupt. It's coming. What? The idea, the spark. I got it. I got it. You spin straw into gold. Yeah, but I can't Doesn't spin straw. Doesn't matter. I'll do the thinking. Now I'll just contact the trades. But wait! Just I... leave it to me, please! And so it happened that overnight, Gladys did become famous. Of course, nobody had ever seen the gold, but through the PR man's magic, and since it had appeared in all the papers, the people believed it. All of them. Everyone. Even the king.
gold out of straw? Bring that girl here! And so Gladys appeared before the king. I understand you spin. Not only do I spin, but I am the best spinner in your entire kingdom. I am so good. That you spin straw into gold, right? Well, I'm going to put you into a room full of my very best straw and have you spin me a room full of your very best gold. But of course, if you can't, you'll be locked forever in my darkest dungeon. Oh. Not so fast, King Boy. Release that girl. <laughs> my client is not giving gold away, you know. However, she will spin for you one room full of gold on one condition. That if she does, she automatically becomes your wife and therefore the queen. Well... Uh, give me the pen already. I'll sign, I'll sign. Gladys signed too. And the king left her to her task. Well, now what? Have I ever let you down, baby? Watch. And true to his word, the little man spun a room full of gold. Why, that's amazing. I know, I know. Now look, dear, our business ends right here. You are now rich and famous, so until your firstborn comes into the world, I bid you adieu. My firstborn? Just read the contract, my dear, the fine print right there. So, Gladys read the fine print, and there it said in black and white that her firstborn child must go to the little man. Well, about a year afterwards, a beautiful child was born to the king and queen. Hello again. I have come for the child, according to the contract. <laughs> what the little man didn't know was that in reading the fine print, Gladys had found the loophole. I have found the loophole. Oh, no. Not the loophole. Yes. Quote, if the party of the first part, that's me, within three days discovers the name of the party of the second part, that's you, uh. the party of the first part shall keep the party of the third part, that's him. But that may not be as easy as you think. Go ahead, lay a name on me. So Gladys laid a name on him. Tom. It was the wrong one. Harry, Alfred, Dick, Bill, Lowry, Sam. She spent all that day thinking of all the names she could, but none of them were right. Oscar. No. Edward, Roger, Leon, Charlie, Theodore. And the second day went as did the first, and as it ended... Louie. Like, uh-uh. Gladys was in despair. Oh, oh. Just then there was a knock. Come in. And the door swung open to reveal a very round man dressed as a town crier. Like, you don't know me, ma'am, but I've got to hip you to some news. Like the other day I'm walking through this cool forest when, ma'am, what do I see but this little cat doing this Weirdsville routine. Like he's going... Skoo skoo ba doo, oo bop she bam. I am the Rumpelstiltskin man. The king's got his gold, the queen's got her fame, and their baby will have my Rumpelstiltskin name. Now, isn't that just too coo coo? Yeah, coo coo. So the next day, when the little man appeared again, the queen said, Skoo skoo ba doo, oo bop she bam. You are the Rumpelstiltskin man, right? Right. Oh man, I really goofed. And so Gladys and the king lived happily ever after, and Rumpelstiltskin was never seen in the kingdom again. There were several reports concerning a young girl who could make diamonds out of turnips. <laughs> oh, but of course, that was in another kingdom, and you can't believe everything you read in the papers. lovers. Today's poem is a story of crime in the big city. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son, stole a pig and away he... Oop. Police officer, what do you got in the bag? It's a sort of a pig. You got a permit to pack a pig? Well, no, I... Better come along with us. You know it's a felony to pack a pig over a state line? No. Pig napping. But it's a pig in a poem. What a pig in a poke, huh? A poke, poem, pig in a poem. Pig poem. But that's okay, just about... You making fun of the way we talk? No, but it's catching. Name? I'm Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. All right, Piper's son, what were you going to do with the pig? Well, the poem says the pig was eat, but... Gonna eat it, huh? No! On a platter, huh? No! Apple in its mouth like that. Certainly not! All right, Piper's son, you can go, but don't leave Tom. Thanks. Can I have my pig back? No, evidence. Darn! One more thing, Piper's son. What's that? You got an apple on you? <laughs> Hey, Rocky!
Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Not enough must leave. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> region of Canada at the close of the 19th century, arch villain Snidely Whiplash stood before a mirror, practicing his leers. Hee-ho! Ho-ha! Ha-ha-ha! Canada's not big enough for the two of us, Bruno, the Royal Canadian Mounties and me. One of us has to go. But Snidely, you're talking about the Royal Canadian Mounties. Gee! Quiet. I have a plan to get rid of them. All of them? Every last red coated always get their man one of them. Gee! Who in the Mounties is the most loyal, trustworthy, brave, fearless, and respected member of the force? Dudley do right? No, Dudley do right's horse. That horse is an inspiration to the entire Mounted Police. If we kidnap do right's horse, the morale of the Mounties will crumble, and they will wander off aimlessly into the woods. But how are we gonna do that, Whiplash? You know Dudley do right won't let that horse out of his sight. Be besides... That's horse stealing. A little late in the game to start thinking about that, Bruno. Come, I've got a plan. <laughs> How come I always figure in the tail end of your plans? Button up your horse suit. It's your fault, do right. Well, I can't help it if I've got a popular horse, Inspector. Too blamed popular, do right. Look. It's unhealthy. That's what it is. Unhealthy. Well, he simply can't help it if he's well liked. You don't understand, do right. He's the only thing that keeps up their morale. I'm afraid if anything happened to him, they would all just wander away from camp aimlessly. Perhaps it's because he's the only horse in the mounted police, Inspector. Maybe if you got some more horses... At ease, do right. Consider the matter closed. There he is now, Bruno. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> What's the matter with you, horse? Haven't you ever seen a pretty face before? <laughs> your horse, Dudley. He met up with a pretty face, Inspector. That was no pretty face, do right. That was Snidely dressed up in a horse suit. You mean my horse ran off with a Snidely dressed horse suit? You want to let the cat out of the bag? You mean horse, Inspector? Dudley, do right. We've got to find that horse before the rest of the camp finds out he's missing. But it wasn't long before a few of the Mounties, their morale crumbling, started wandering aimlessly out of camp into the forest, including our hero. We've got to do something, Dudley. Uh, about what, Inspector? It worked out fine, eh, Snidely? We got Dudley's horse, just like you said. Yes, everything worked out fine, except I can't get out of this horse suit. Well, you got into it. I know I got into it, but now the zipper is stuck. Oh, well, I'd better run over and see how the morale is at the fort. A centaur! A centaur! Inspector, I just caught a centaur! That is no centaur, do right. That is Snidely dressed in half a horse suit. All right, half a Snidely. Tell us what you've done with Dudley do right's horse. Never, Inspector. I shall never tell you where I've hidden him. <laughs> And the morale of the Mounties will crumble. <laughs> hmm, did you see that, Dudley? That gives me an idea. So, in order to keep up the morale of his troops, the inspector made Snidely whiplash Dudley Do-Right's horse. And the troops did not notice the difference. However, Snidely whiplash did. Giddy up there, Snidely, or I'll give you a whiplash. <laughs> Wait a minute, you've almost got me believing I'm a horse. I'll take you to your horse. And so, Inspector, here I am 
and here's my horse. But where is Snidely Whiplash? Oh, he escaped. Escaped from a mountain? That's shameful, do right. Downright shameful. I know, Inspector. He was the best horse I ever had. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Bullwinkle is a... Not that lesson. This lesson. Present Peccadillo was launched on the sandy shores of Veronica Lake. Every boy under ten and one moose had a sailing ship entered in the annual Frostbite Falls Flotilla Festival. They're off in sinking. Yes, Bullwinkle's boat plunged to the bottom. Ah, but when salvaged... It glitters, it gleams. Actually, it took the trained eye of a master jeweler to determine its true identity. First of all, it's running a little slow. It's not a watch, it's a ship. I stood watch on a ship. Mainspring sprung, too. Please, mister, can you tell us what this boat is made of? And if you say sugar and spice... Ruby. This little object is composed of precious ruby. And since the name inscribed on the pinnacle was Omar Khayyam... Then this is the ruby yacht of Omar Khayyam. Well, you just don't come up with an awful thing like that and not hit the front page. Huxtray, read all about it. Rocket hits moon. Wally out for season. Today's big headline. The birth of 24 caterpillars to a moth in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I thought the narrator said we'd hit the front page. We did. The front page of the one ads. See? Moose will sell Ruby Yacht of Omer Khayyam to any interested party. I said I wanted to sail the Ruby Yacht at an interesting party. Well, that's the press for you. Well, I sure hope nobody reads this. A vain wish, I'm afraid, for halfway across the world in the northern section of Lower East Pakistan, the ruler of a remote city perused the ad with more than casual interest. Son of an infidel. Eater of vegetables. What travels you, O oh, illustrious one? This what I peruse in the periodical. For years I wait for the artist to paint pupils in the eyes of little orphanani. Patience, O oh, great one. Rome was not built in a day. What kind of a... Oh! 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 Looky, looky, looky! Oh! Ha! Ha! Fearing that the Pasha was suffering from a stroke, the Grand Vizier pulled the bell cord. Someday I gotta get that fixed. Oh! Oh, boy, what did I read? Something in the paper? You saw something that would cause such a catastrophic... Ooh, they... Sure enough, it was the misquoted ad they saw. Take 30 bags of gold, 90 bars of silver, buy the ruby yacht. A command is like an order. And listen well, my dear vizier. Unless you buy the yacht, you lose your head. Not to mention other various awful things that will happen to you. I comprehend, O oh felicitous one. Fear not, I will beg borrowers steal the sacred ruby yacht. Incidentally, what would you suggest as a starting price for my initial offer? A buck and a half. You can always go up from there. A fast camel, a slow train. It took a great deal of time to affect the passage from Pakistan to Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Eventually, however, the turbaned emissary approached our hero's home. Oh, boy, look at the headache that fellow's got. That's a turban, Bullwinkle. A buck and a half. I'll make it two. Two fifty. I think you're down because I got most of the trump. Say, what's going on here? And the vizier made his final offer. No, sir, Turhan B. My little ship is not for sale at any price. You want to relent? Well, not here in the front room, I won't know. Then look behind you. And there, scimitars in hand, stood 20 fierce soldiers. Uh-oh, there may be some cutting up going on around here. Don't miss our next installment. Rimsky and Kosakoff go to Palm Springs or Song of Indio. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Right. Bye now. 
See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. in your newspaper, but there it was on the front page of the Frostbite Falls Far Flung Flyer. And you can see why it's called Far Flung. Boy, look at the headlines. Moose uncovers long-lost Ruby Yop of Omar Khayyam. <laughs> Pretty little doodad, isn't it? Sure is, and it must be worth thousands. A low estimate to be sure, especially to the ruler of a certain remote city in lower North Pakistan. For years, the ruby yacht floated in this sacred bathtub. It was our talisman. What's a talisman, oh grandiose one? Okay, let's just say it was our good luck token. You desire this humble grand vizier to recover the ruby yacht, oh esteemed one? Let me put it this way. If you don't recover ruby yacht, I shall be oh esteemed off one. And as we close the episode that came before this one, the vizier was trading hotly with a reluctant moose. I give four Roger Maris baseball cards for yacht. Not even if you throw in Leo DeRocher. I give warped LP of Jen Pierce singing Bluebirds of Happiness. Not even for Mildred Pierce. Yes, apparently the ruby yacht had gotten under Bullwinkle's skin. And the same might be said for our swords. Hokey smokes, we're surrounded. Rocky wasn't about to take this socked in. Make for the door, Bullwinkle. Alas, they were both on the same track. Minutes later, the vizier and his burly aides paraded our captive heroes out of town. What's the parade for, Featherby? Don't know. Must be Labor Day or something. I wish it were Doris Day. How about some cribbage? But not all the good folk of Frostbite Falls were taken in. An aroused citizens' committee was formed to investigate the blatant abduction. I've wired the Secretary of State and the U.N. I phoned the gas company. I propose we march on Washington. Shucks, he's been dead for years. It was then that Miss Plumfort, the principal of PS12, spoke up. I always said that Bullwinkle would wind up bad. Any boy that wears antlers in school. Luckily, Miles Standoffish, the turkey farmer, entered the meeting. I don't know what all the fuss is. Shuckins, they'll never get out of the country. What makes you figure that, Miles? Well, you got a moose, a squirrel, six soldiers, and one grand vizier. That's vizier. Uh, yeah. Anyways, the customs men will spot that group for sure. Sure enough, the United States Customs Bureau had every port, every airfield, every train depot saturated with steely-eyed customs agents. Just a moment, sir. What's in that bass violin case? Oh, just some Tommy guns and a bunch of stolen money. That's all, copper. Okay, just checking, that's all. Part of my job. Say, Barney, what is it we're supposed to keep an eye out for again? I told you. A moose, a squirrel, six soldiers... And a partridge in a pear tree, right? No, a grand vizier. Suddenly, the whistle of the SS Plankton announced its departure. That boat, did you check it? No, I thought you did. From gangplank to the wheelhouse, the luxurious ocean liner was given a thorough going over. However, passengers and crew alike were given a clean bill of health. All but one stoker. 
You have scurvy, sir. Get off the boat and eat some oranges. You saw nothing suspicious, eh, Fred? Only thing that bothered me was the ship's orchestra. Boy, are they corny. That is very understandable. Okay, we take it from the top, and please, no clinkers in the reed section. Bullwinkle, we gotta make a run for it. What, and miss my solo? Besides, I can't run very far. You strained your leg? No, they chained my leg. Well, it looks like a long, frustrating passage for our boys. Whatever's on your list, postpone it for The Malady Lingers On, or I Bought You Violence for Your Furs. <laughs> Words of wisdom are food for the mind. Right, Junior? Right, Pop. All right, then. Is your head hungry? Famished. Good. Open wide, and I'll feed it. You ready? Shoot. It is one thing to propose, but quite another thing to execute. That, my boy, is a very wise saying. Feel smarter now? No. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, no. What do you mean, no? I, I don't understand what it means. It means easier said than done. Simple? Yeah. But I still don't get it. Well, then I shall tell you the story of the mice who belled the cat. And that'll explain everything. For years, the mice had been living in constant fear of their arch enemy, the cat. Never did they have a moment's rest, for the cat would ambush them, chase them, jump up and down on them, and toy with them every chance he got. Finally, the poor little mice could stand it no longer, and they called a meeting to see what could be done about their dreadful situation. Something's got to be done. Look, I already got a gray hair. And I'm a nervous wreck. The whole trouble is that cat's too quiet. He's always pussyfooting around. We can never hear him coming until it's too late. Many plans were discussed and rejected. Then at last, a young mouse named Murphy got up and proposed. Oh, uh, why don't we just hang a bell around a cat's neck? Then we could always hear him coming in time to make a getaway. Murphy's plan was very well received, and it was immediately put to a vote. All those in favor of Murphy's idea say aye. 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 Now, being that it's Murphy's idea, all those in favor of letting Murphy bell the cat say aye. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. aye. Nay, nay. But the eyes had it, and Murphy was elected. Good luck, Murphy. Anything you'd like to say before you go? Yes. I got a big mouth. Having no choice but to at least try, Murphy set out to find the cat, which, as he feared, was no trouble at all. What have we here? Uh, would you believe me if I told you that I'm a beaver? What do you think? I think you think I'm a mouse. That is correct, food. And Murphy was forced to flee for his life, narrowly escaping capture by ducking through a hole in a fence inches ahead of the cat. Oh, that was a close one. If I ever expect to get this bell on that monster, I'll have to think up some way to trick him. Reasoning that his task should be quite simple, if only he could put the cat to sleep, Murphy quietly crept up behind the cat and ever so softly whispered into his ear. rock a bye pussy in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. <laughs> Oh, boy, it worked. But just to make sure, are you asleep, cat? What do you think, food? I think I goofed. That is correct. And again, Murphy had to run for his life. This time, I'll take a more direct action. I'll knock him cold. Then he can't play tricks on me. And boldly walking right up to the cat, Murphy hit him with all his might. Well, hello there, food. Oh, what a shame. You broke your bat. So I did. How do you feel? Oh, I got a slight headache, but other than that, just fine. Would you consider giving me a five-minute head start? What do you think? I think it's out of the question. That is correct. Now, Murphy was not a mouse to give up easily, and striking on a plan with which to outsmart the cat, he carefully put the collar with the bell into a box, wrapped it as a gift, and then placed it where the cat would be sure to see it. Mm. Two 
the nice cat from a friend. Oh, boy, a collar with a little bell on it. Oh, just what I've always wanted. The cat quickly put it on and was overjoyed with his new gift. <laughs> tingling, tingling. <laughs> it worked. Never again will he be able to sneak up without us hearing him. Ha, oh, he's coming now. <laughs> he won't fool me this time. He's coming from that direction, and he's getting closer and closer. Now I can get ready to run because he's right. Whoops. Ice cream, ice cream. Get you nice ice cream right here, ice cream. Well, well, what do you know? Well, if that's the ice cream man, what happened to the cat? Uh, what do you think? I think this is the biggest boo-boo I've made yet. That is correct. <laughs> and so you can see, after all was said and done, more was actually said than done. You understand now, Junior? I sure do, Pop. The moral of the story is that if you're full with bells, you're apt to get told off. Huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one way to put it, yes. <laughs> I was wondering why they always call me Fathead. Hello there, friends. Today our subject is for my bestseller, How to Win Friends and Be Influential with People, I quote. Pick out something about a person that you admire, tell them about it, and they will surely be your friend. Pardon me kindly, sir, but I couldn't help admiring your hair. You certainly are fortunate to have such fine, sturdy, good-looking, healthy, well-groomed hair. <laughs> Mind if I take it home and admire it under a better light? Learn the interests and hobbies of those you would like to have as your friends. That's why I have thoroughly studied all the subjects that interest this man that's coming now. Hello there again, kindly sir. You may be interested to know that I am an expert on bowling, baseball, and croquet. Those are his favorites. From my best-selling page 35, I quote, Sometimes those you seek may seem standoffish. It's just that they are shy. Obviously the case here. It simply means you must bring them out by doing little favors for them. Let me carry your package kindly, sir. Oh, I insist. Now you'll see the beginning of a real friendship. Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, can't you win any friends with that book of yours? Oh, sure, Rock. One man promised to be my friend for the rest of my life because of this book. Who was that? The publisher. I promised never to write another one. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Hello out there, Peabody again, and today we set our sights on the year 1493. The place, Mr. Peabody? Rome, where we'll meet history's most infamous bartender, Lucretia Borgia. In a trice, the Wayback Machine escorted us from my penthouse apartment to the castle of the Lord of Pesaro, Lucretia Borgia's second husband. We found his lordship munching on the leg of a chair. Delicious, absolutely delicious. Pardon us, Your Grace, but why are you eating that chair? Uh, because I'm hungry. But why the chair? Well, for one thing, it happens to be the only edible piece of furniture in this room. Uh, you see this? Yesterday was a piano. Wouldn't you rather eat a nice, juicy steak? The last person to eat a steak in this castle was a Lucretius first husband. He's dead, you know. We're quite familiar with your wife's uh, reputation. Yeah, one might say she's a poison. <laughs> but I love her anyway. You realize, of course, what a diet of furniture can lead to. Probably a divorce. But as long as my wife handles food and drinks, I must abstain from normal eating habits. Either of you care for a caster? Thank you, no. Yes, I only wish there was someone who could help me. There is. Who? Mr. Peabody. He can do anything. <laughs> Sherman is prejudiced, Your Grace. Prejudiced, but absolutely correct. That night we joined his lordship at dinner. Hey. Lucretia, she's gonna be down in a minute. 
Remember, if you value your life, don't eat or drink. By the way, do either of you carry a blue cross? Before we could answer, the door swung wide, and there stood Lucretia. It had to be her. She was carrying a decanter of hemlock. Good evening, dear husband. Ah, I see we have a guest. Yes, my love. How nice. Uh, gentlemen, I propose a toast to your health. Without raising suspicion, we managed to empty our glasses in a nearby plant. A nearby dead plant. I hope you enjoy the meal. I prepared it myself. Oh, what happened to the cook? A stomach trouble. As usual, you done it again, Lucretia. This food looks delicious. Uh, you may find it needs a dash of salt. Oh, yes, salt. A-R-S-E-N-I-C, -E salt. Lucretia's constitution must have been an iron one. Her food disappeared rapidly. So did ours, from our plates to the floor. Ah, that hit the spot. Would anyone care for a cigar? Well, yes, I think I... Shh. She soaks them. Uh, darling, why you don't take our guests out for a stroll in the night air? It uh, might help you to clear up your headaches. I don't got a headache. And not yet, you don't. Atop a parapet, we discussed the recent ordeal. You see? Hemlock, arsenic, that food was loaded. If I were you, your lordship, I'd leave her. I can't. I love her too much. Besides, this poison thing is just a hobby. I have an idea. One that will allow you to eat and drink quite freely. We adjourned to the castle basement where Lucretia had her own chemistry lab. Look around you. The greatest the collection of poisons in the entire world. With Sherman and his lordship assisting, we collected samples. Finally, I began my experiment. Two drops of wood alcohol, a dash of belladonna, Paris green for color. There we are, done. It looks delicious. What is it? This glass contains a minute amount of every poison known to man. And to Lucretia? And to Lucretia. By drinking this, you will build up a lifetime immunity. No matter what poison your wife administers, your system will have become adjusted to it. All right. Here's a look at you, I hope. Congratulations, your lordship. You are now immune to poison. From that moment on, his married life changed to one of complete rapture. Hey, you cooking something, my dear? Yes, my love. A cake for your birthday. Ah, ah, ah. Not enough a strychnine. You know I like him, my strychnine. Oh, sorry, my pet. I keep forgetting. Well, Sherman, I think our visit has ended. There's just one thing, Mr. Peabody. And that is? The servants around here. They're not immune to Lucretia's poison. True, but if you'll notice, they go about the castle wearing a plaster patch over their mouths. That way they don't eat, drink, or speak. In fact, Sherman, this may surprise you, but that's how the silent butler came to be. time, Rocky Bullwinkle and the Ruby Yacht were marched out of Frostbite Falls under armed guard. We take you back to remote city in Pakistan for terrible sweet punishment. Couldn't you just give us two demerits and let it go with that? Silence! As might be expected, the citizens of Frostbite Falls quickly summoned help. Well, Sergeant, what do you and your men suggest? I think we better call the police. Not only the local law enforcement agencies, but the federal as well were called in to block any attempts at fleeing the country. Sir, there are 60 young girls here who claim they're supposed to swim in the Olympics. 60, eh? Hold them for questioning. What kind of questioning? Telephone numbers, you know. What about the moose, the squirrel, the grand vizier? Let them get their own girls. Meanwhile, at Pier 62, the SS Plankton pulled away from the wharf. Captain, the Customs Bureau searched the ship and found nothing suspicious. Excellent. Oh, by the way, tell the engineer to oil those engines. Terrible racket. But the engines weren't responsible. The blame lay with Guy Vizier and his tremulous troubadours. From the beautiful rumpus room of the good ship Plankton overlooking the blue specific in the heart of downtown Jersey City, it's the captivating melodies of the makes you want to wretch music man himself. Yours truly is no one else. 
Guy Vizier with a sparkling scintillating two and a half minutes of toe tapping harmonies coming to you indirectly from the locker room of the SS Andrea Doria. Just a short drive from Pier 86 atop the penthouse showroom in East Side, West Side. Here now is number one singer gorgeous Georgia Peach who asked the musical question Tippy Tippy Teen? Bullwinkle, we gotta jump overboard before we're too far out to sea. Not yet, Rock. I got an arrangement coming up in the next set. Look, if you're worried about the chains on your legs, don't. Well, I must admit, they did cross my mind. Ah, but Rocky had a plan. Sure enough, during his bass solo in Four Brothers, the resourceful squirrel attached a hacksaw to his bow and by bar 32 had sawed through their fetters. You can imagine the vizier's surprise when at the start of a five-minute break, Rocky and Bullwinkle dashed from the room. Quick, the dogs are escaping. Shuttleboard games, sun deck bathing, all were shattered by the ensuing wild chase. Hey, what's going on here? Somebody requested running wild, and two of my boys took it literally. There they go. The pursuit lasted well into the wee hours of the night. They got to be somewhere on this tub. Oh, well, we pick up chase at dawn. Phew, lucky for us they didn't look in this lifeboat. Yeah, we sure are lucky. A questionable statement, for the engine room was having trouble maintaining full speed. As I understand it, the ship is overloaded. We must either jettison the lifeboat or the passengers. What do you suggest? Don't ask me, sir. Why not flip for it? Heads, passengers, tails, lifeboat. It came up tails, and wouldn't you know, the lifeboat to be sacrificed was the very one our lads were in. Sea seems to be getting a trifle heavy, Rock. Ah, it's probably a minor squall. Get some sleep. Careful there, men. You don't want it to land in the water upside down, do you? What's it matter? There's nobody in it. But, George, you're right. Throw it over. Sea seems to be getting a trifle heavy, Rock. You said that. Oh, we may be on the brink of a terrible tragedy. Only way to find out is to join us next time for The Deep Six or It's Tough to Fathom. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell.
last time you must recall, Rocky Bullwinkle and the ruby yacht of Omar Khayyam were smuggled out of the country aboard the SS Plankton. Oh, yes, the mastermind behind this daring plan was the Grand Vizier, or Guy Vizier, as he is now known. Boy, what I wouldn't give just to hear a chorus of Kashmiri love songs. During a vocal rendition of Prisoner of Love, Rocky hacks out their way to freedom. Hey, what's coming off in the reed section? Our fetters, that's what. The Grand Vizier and his soldiers gave chase, but the one place they neglected to search was a lifeboat on sea deck. I think we're safe. I think you're right. They were both wrong, for the SS Plankton was up to its plimsoll line in cargo, and something had to be tossed overboard. What'll it be, passengers or lifeboat? Passengers! Well, we couldn't get away with it on a kid's show, so it was the lifeboat they jettisoned. The one occupied by Rocky and Bullwinkle. Shh. Uh, no thanks, Rock. I'm not thirsty. What do you mean you're not thirsty? Well, didn't you just open a canteen and spill some water? Hokey smoke, we're foundering, and we're upside down in the water. Boy, if there's one thing you got, Rock, it's perception. It wasn't easy, but through sheer superhuman moose power, the boys managed to right their crap. Uh-oh. Fog's coming in. Who cares? New York is in that direction. Row, Bowwinkle, row hard. The moose complied for all he was worth. Alas, what he didn't know was that a mooring cable had snagged the prow of the lifeboat. Therefore, no matter how hard he pulled, the boat went right along with the SS Plankton. Stroke! Stroke! I'm stroking! I'm stroking! Two weeks later, the lifeboat stopped, just as the fog and their spirits lifted. There it is, Bowwinkle! New York City! Yeah! Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, India Inc. Company... India, India Inc. The realization that they had been towed all the way to the harbor of Bombay suddenly sank in. I think I shall now be sick. Don't waste it. Wait until you reach our remote city. And that word remote fit most aptly, for high in the Pakistan hills, nestled snugly amid giant boulders, sat the small but exceedingly remote city of Jaipur, whose very name struck terror in the hearts of peaceful men. The Pasha who ruled this tempestuous town had no mercy with those who transgressed against tribal laws. But you're merciless, one. I didn't swipe this ruby yacht. You did, too. For eons and eons, it floated in this sacred shrine. Looks more like a bathtub. That's what it is. Anyways, as long as it floated, the city of Jaipur had good luck. And you mean when it was taken, you had bad luck? Twelve months of steady monsoons. That's a lot of rain, Jack. Yes, I call that bad luck. But you said the ruby yacht disappeared 400 centuries ago. You got sharp ears for a squirrel. Well, listen here, Pasha. I'll have you know I am not 400 years old. I should take your word for it. Take him out and cut off his... Uh, no, that wouldn't hurt him. Aha! Ooh, ooh! Throw him in the cobra pit. The seconds later, Bullwinkle stood swaying at the rim of a pit, while below a covey of cobras watched evilly. We will teach you the error of false pride. See, weren't you in Gunga Din? Over you go! No, no, wait a minute! Actually, we have to wait more than a minute because we've run out of time. Does Rocky have something up his sleeve? Uh, the fur? We'll find out in the New Delhi Catassin or Judgment at Bloomberg's. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle! Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a family of three sisters. The elder sister, Prunelda, was remarkably ugly. You might think that she was the ugliest woman you'd ever seen until you saw the second sister, Grimessa, who looked even worse. With two such hags in the family, it was surprising that the third sister, sweet little Beat, was very pretty, very pretty indeed. And how do you think that made her sisters feel? Terrible! And what do you think they did? We treat her something awful, of course. As a matter of fact, Sweet Little Beat was so used to her treatment that she took no notice of it. Prunella, you'll just ruin that poker. Fun's fun, Grimessa, but this isn't getting the floor mopped. 
When the two sisters tired of thumping on Little Beat, they played ball with her. Okay, put her over. Please, girls, I have to get the silver. Then, one day, as Grimessa was preparing another unpleasant surprise for Little Beat, Prunelda burst in with exciting news. His Highness, Prince Fascinato, was searching for a bride to share his kingdom and his castle, where he now lived alone, attended only by his Prime Minister. The Prime Minister's job was to serve the Prince in every way. This was difficult because the Prince Fascinato was invisible. No one could see him. If he picked up a bowl, you could see the bowl move. If he ate, you could see the food disappear, but you could not see where to. One day, the prince had said to his prime minister, You know, Winnie, I should be married. Yes, your majesty. I'm not on the throne, Winnie. I'm over here. Oh, oh, oh yes, your majesty. There must be a girl somewhere who can see me. You line up all the eligible ladies, and we'll see if any of them can make the grade. So the Prime Minister had sent out word of the contest, and soon all the girls in the kingdom were in front of the castle, waiting to see the invisible prince. Vendors were doing a brisk business in tip sheets and clues. A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A whirl and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Sign an autograph. The feed, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're going to have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure. There's always room for one more. discovered the North Pole, Amundsen the South. However, neither of these esteemed explorers would have had much success finding Frostbite Falls, Minnesota in the dead of winter. Incidentally, that's it, that uh, steeple sticking up out of the snow. Now, with the town submerged under 30 or 40 feet of the soft white stuff, you might wonder how its inhabitants managed to dig their way out. Well, they don't. They rely completely on a snowplow. A snowplow with antlers. Spring will be a trifle late this fall. Bullwinkle, is that you up there? It's me, Granny Goodfoot. Keep talking, Granny, till I get zeroed in. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be here today on this... Gotcha! Oh, <laughs> Bullwinkle, bless your mittens. And that's the way it went throughout the winter. The moose unearthed an average of 20 frostbitten frostbite fallers a day. Here, my boy, here's a ruble for your trouble. No, sir, not one red cent. With the arrival of spring, when the thermometer came all the way up to zero, the grateful town folk decided to reward their faithful snowplow. Let's get him a watch. Let's get him a bigger shovel. No, we must get him something worthy of his labor. So they merged their meager finances and ordered a statue of Fulton J.T. Figsby, the man who first discovered icicles. Why the white tie and tails, Bullwinkle? Haven't you heard, Doc? I'm to be given a testimonial dinner. Yeah, but that's a week away. Besides, you're not fully dressed. Sure I am. I got on my fuchsia spats, my cerise hanky, my... Ooh, shame on you, Rocket J. Squirrel. You let me come out here without a shirt on. Practically stark naked in front of all these people. Now, it's common knowledge that the only laundry in Frostbite Falls is run by a former cookie cutter. All your shirts have holes in them. Yeah. Here's a gingerbread boy. There's a macaroon. Doggone it, I don't have one decent shirt to my... Oh, yes, I do. Ta-da! 
this one I've been saving for a special occasion. That's a shirt? Of course it's a shirt. It even has truffles. It also has a spot. Where? Alas, an infinitesimal dash of Tabasco sauce marred an otherwise ghastly piece of wearing apparel. Get some spot remover. Here you are. That's a rolled up newspaper. Well, I knew a feller who had a dog named Spot, and this was the dog gone the spot remover you ever did see. Not bothering to explain, Rocky proceeded to eradicate the stain. That's funny. A straight line funny? I mean the spot. It's spreading. Sure enough, the ink stain grew larger. You said it was Tabasco sauce. Well, from here it looked like it. It doesn't matter. I shall simply wrap it up thusly and send it to be laundered. To Carl, a cookie cutter? No, to Ed Fu Young's Chinese laundry. I hope you don't mind my asking, Bullwinkle, but exactly where is your shirt going? Well, Rock, when you're looking for a Chinese laundry, you don't look in Switzerland. Oh, don't tell me. Yup. One round-trip ticket to Shanghai. Shanghai? China? They go to Shanghai and Ohio, but they don't do shirts as well. Ah, uh, better make that two round-trip tickets, please. Gee, Rock, does anybody ever wonder where we get all the money to gallivant around the world like we do? Never mind, Bullwinkle. The plane's leaving in an hour. Yeah, but I think it's all so improbable. Like the man said when he built a bigger building, we're off on another story and a tall one at that. <clears throat> Be with us next time for Hello, Orient, or that's some dandy-looking China you have there. Happiness, my boy, is not to be found in borrowed finery. Is that why you dress up in that old sheet? Uh, this isn't an old sheet, Junior. It's an old toga. And an old toga, uh, well, as usual, you've missed the whole point of what I'm trying to teach you. Oh, maybe if you spelled it out for me, Pop. All right, Junior. Now, hand me that scroll over there. Yeah, that's it. There now. Now, let me see. When we left little orphan Annie, she and Daddy Warbuck were... Uh, junior, you haven't handed me the scroll. You've handed me your comic book. Now, let's get with it, lad, huh? Now then, once upon a time... Pop. Yes, son? Do you think fables will ever replace TV? Uh, <clears throat> now, let me continue with the story. Once upon a time, there was this crow. Tell me, man, are you going to be a crow all your life? Well, I have not given that much thought. You know, like, I'm sick of being a crow. I'm sick of going around in the same old tired black suit. Sick, sick, sick. You know what I'm going to be? Well, I have not given that much thought. I'm going to be a peacock. Man, those crazy colors. You know why the peacock has such a gorgeous tail? Well, I have not given that much thought. It's the chicks, man, the chicks. He just flashes that old tail and all those crazy cuckoo colors show up. And those chicks, they really flip. Yes, sir, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a peacock. Of course. You I haven't, haven't given, given it much thought. thought. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but tell me. How can a crow become a peacock? I mean, don't you have to be born that way, peacock-wise, fat ears? Like I've been telling you, it's the tail, man. It's the tail. All you got to do is get some of them wild, multicolored feathers and look out, chicks, because your big daddy is in town. Ooh, ooh, ba doo ska ska bid da you turn out the lights and you call the law. Hey, man, like where can I pick up on some of them crazy feathers you cats carry around to impress the chicks? Oh, I've really got a live one this time. Uh, let me see. Uh, you'd like to purchase a colorful tail, is that it? Oh, Daddy, you are reading me loud and clear. What I mean, I want a tail that is the living end. Well, I think we can fix you up. Let me see. You seem to be a size 34 to me. Listen, you know that old feather duster we have around here? Yeah, boss. Well, stick it in some paint. This crow will buy anything. Is this it? I mean, this is the real thing. A real peacock tail? The real thing? Well, you just watch my dust. Uh, <coughs> just watch your duster. Oh, now that I've got a peacock's tail, why should I fool around with crows? Just black crows. From now on, it is bigger game. Why not the real thing like peacocks? Pardon me, ma'am, but are there any more at home like you? Oh, well, yes. 
But I doubt if there are any more at home like you. And if there are, I certainly hope they stay there. Man, I was doing all right until that sudden snowstorm. Strange, you know, a snowstorm in July. Gad, free moke, what weather. I had better go home and put on a muffler. <laughs> oh, George, I believe I am catching a cold. This unseasonable weather, like, like, wow. Mm, not a bad-looking crow. But what's he doing bundled up like that in July? He must be some kind of a kook. Like, good afternoon, dearie. Uh, better stand back. I've got me a very nasty cold. Listen, I just thought you were a harmless nut. But if you're going to accost young ladies with your stupid practical jokes, I'm afraid... Practical jokes? Please, lady, I'm not a joker. I'm a peacock. Police! Yes, lady. Hey, is this nut bothering you? Well, I was just walking down the street, minding my own business when this creep comes up. All right, Buster. Move along. But, Mr. Brass, sir, it's you two are the nuts dressed like you are in weather like this. Like you're going to catch your death of cold. Now, oh, wait a minute, buddy. At the present time, it's 94 degrees in the shade. Now move along. But you don't understand. I'm a peacock. That is it. It's the cope for you. So poor Crow languished in the clink for impersonating a peacock for a long, long time. So long, in fact, that all of the feathers fell out of his tail, or his feather duster. But he was released on good behavior. Man, you know what I'm going to be? Well, I have not given it much thought. A stork. Man, I'm going to get me a pair of stilts. I'm going to be nine feet tall. You know, the chicks really dig them tall birds. Man, I'm going to get those old sticks, and I'm going to walk me up a storm. And so you see, son, old Crow never did learn his lesson, which just goes to show... That the moral of this fable is very feeble. Huh? You know, Pop... How's that, son? I, I don't think fables will ever replace TV. <laughs> Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. Time now for the biggest thinker of them all, Mr. Know-it-all. Hello, America. Today's mental fire drill comes under the heading of how to be a cow puncher without getting hit back. The simplest way of learning how to punch cows is to join a cattle drive. The person who does the hiring is called a five-man, which is a four-man who got promoted. You with the built-in chaps. It's Betty by time for cattle. You stand guard. You got gun? Sure, right here. Tell me, why you got hot water bottle on gun? <laughs> it's a sick shooter. Not feeling good, huh? Does it shoot? Does it shoot? Now look what you've done. Kettle has stampeded. Never fear. I shall stop them. How do you stop 5,000 fear-crazed beasts? By holding up five fear-crazed fingers and saying, Whoa! That's very good. How do you get them started again? Oh, by saying, Giddy up. After serving his apprenticeship, the full-fledged cowboy now puts his knowledge to use by joining a rodeo. Or radio, they're both correct. And the winner of the Bronco Busting event is Mr. Know-It-All. Golly, Mr. Know-It-All, you sure can ride. Yeah, you're only supposed to stay on ten seconds. I've been on this critter ten hours. How do you manage to stay on him so long? Very simple. I got a pocket full of dimes. Hello out there, Peabody here, along with my pet boy, Sherman, and my Wayback Machine. Sherman is the one in the short trousers. The Wayback's all warmed up, Mr. Peabody. Excellent, Sherman. Set the indicator for the year 1885. And our destination? Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, where we'll meet Annie Oakley. Like all of my inventions, the Wayback behaved flawlessly, transporting Sherman and me inside Annie Oakley's dressing room. We were just in time to witness a...
Superb exhibition of marksmanship. Wow, she didn't miss one. Remarkable, Miss Oakley, remarkable. You mean remarkably bad, don't you? I wouldn't call five out of five bad. I would. I wasn't aiming at them glasses. She directed our attention to a large target hanging on the wall. I've taken 49 shots at that thing and I ain't hit it yet. Watch. I was certain this time she would definitely hit the target, especially since she was standing but two feet away from it. Unbelievable, ain't it? Perhaps if you had your eyes examined. Oh, my eyes is all right. It's this here brand new gun. I just can't get used to it. Now, my old gun. What happened to your old gun, Miss Oakley? It was swiped. Stolen. Uh-huh. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. The reason became apparent as soon as Buffalo Bill stepped into the room. I got good news for you, Annie. I just arranged a special shooting match for tonight. And I bet everything we got. Oh? Who is Miss Oakley's competition? Yeah, a fella named Forrest Primeval. He's dead certain he can outshoot you, Annie. He's got a good bet, Bill. Shucks, Annie. Ain't no one shoots better than you. Yes, sir, I bet everything we got. Annie, what is the major difference between this new rifle and your old one? Ain't much difference, except maybe in the shape. Annie produced a picture of her old gun. And the shape was out of the ordinary. I used to use it for shooting around trees. Couldn't you bend this new rifle to look like the old one, Mr. Peabody? My dear boy, I am a genius, not a Hercules. There was only one thing to do, recover Annie's old rifle. And I had a hunch where it might be. <laughs> By midnight tonight, I'll be richer one Wild West show. Forrest Primeval. Who are you? My name is Peabody. I have come for Annie Oakley's rifle. Oh! Of course, of course, I merely borrowed it. You'll find it lying on the stove. Here, take it, Chairman, and... Sorry, Mr. Peabody, it melted. Oh, I guess I left it on the stove too long. Well, do give my best to Miss Oakley. See you at the match tonight. That evening, a huge crowd assembled in the main tent to witness the titanic struggle. I tell you, if and I have to shoot this here straight rifle, I ain't gonna hit nothing. Except maybe some people. Primeval, on the other hand, was a picture of confidence. Buffalo Bill and I went over the rules this morning. Annie and I both get one shot to hit a one-cent piece that's sitting 100 feet away on top of Buffalo Bill's head. I'll go first. Primeval primed his evil gun, took aim, fired. There. That should be close enough to win. Reluctantly, Annie raised her new rifle. Just then, we arrived on the scene. My gun. Did you bring my trusty old gun? Yes, but we found it in a somewhat liquefied state. Well, even I can't shoot a gun like that. Perhaps I can. Hey, what's going on here? Look, Miss Oakley, either you shoot or forfeit the match. Having no alternative, Annie shouldered the new rifle. Gee, Mr. Peabody, it looks hopeless. Not hopeless, Sherman. Just bad. If I can fire exactly when she does, perhaps I can deflect her bullet to the target. That's impossible, Mr. Peabody. Nothing is impossible for a Peabody. You may shoot when ready, Miss Oakley. At what, pray tell? At the coin on Buffalo Bill's head. Annie shrugged, then fired, and so did I. You did it, Mr. Peabody. What else? Any girl plumb smack in the middle. Needless to say, Buffalo Bill kept his Wild West show, while Annie Oakley kept her reputation. As for Forrest Primeval, he fell into a severe state of shock. So severe, he couldn't move a muscle. And strange as it seems, as the years wore on, Primeval became a national monument. But then I suppose you've heard of him. Petrified Forrest? Let's face it, any moose who spends the winter digging his neighbors out of the snow deserves a tribute. Three cheers for Bullwinkle! Oh, we have to give him more than that. Four cheers? They decided to honor him with a testimonial dinner. Unfortunately, although he had white tie and tails, 
He lacked a shirt. Oh, no, I don't. I've been saving this one for years. Well, you didn't save it long enough. Yes, the shirt was not only gauche, but extremely bizarre. That's where I got the pattern for it. Out of Harper's Bazaar. It wasn't an easy shirt to get close to, but if you managed to get within three feet, you noticed a stain. Shucks, I'll have that out in a jiffy. Rocky didn't have a jiffy. Perhaps that's why the stain expanded. Shortly thereafter, a plane bearing Bullwinkle's shirt took off into the wild blue. Yonder. You're sending your shirt to a laundry, right? Right. To a Chinese laundry, right? Well, they're known for their smart work. However, the Chinese laundry he mailed it to was in Shanghai, China. Two tickets to Shanghai, please. I have to pick it up in order to be back here in time for the banquet. How come we didn't go with a shirt in the first place? You saw that shirt. Would you want to ride with it? Shanghai has a population of millions employed in various occupations, among which is the Mammoth Frap Toy Manufacturing Company, whose slogan, if it's a frap, it's great, is known the world over. Better not go into the laboratory, Mr. Frapp. Professor Steinmetz left orders not to be disturbed. I'm an employer, Miss Bracegirdle. I can disturb anybody. Gently, Boris, gently. You don't got to tell me I got the hands of a sturgeon. That surgeon, Boris. Don't call me Boris. My pseudonym is Steinmetz. Steinmetz, I want to see what you're working on. Go away. Can't you see I'm... Oh, hello, man who pays salary. I kiss your hand. The one you signed the checks with. Good grief. What are you cooking in that hibachi? His great new toy. I call it Mickey Moose Watch. You see, the little hand points to the hour. That's the oldest toy in the world. Steinmetz, you are fired. <laughs> Out, out, both of you, out! Bullwinkle's shirt reached its destination on Monday. Our heroes, due to a monsoon over Santa Barbara, didn't get to Shanghai until Wednesday. There on the corner of Chow and Main, they spotted, uh, perhaps that's the wrong word, Ed Fu Young's Chinese laundry. Well, looks like we finally caught up with the little rascal. It sure does, and I can't wait to... That's odd. Your last word was two. That isn't odd, it's even. Look who's walking into the laundry. Sure enough, Steinmetz, uh, uh, Boris and Natasha were also patronizing Ed Fu Young's. I'm a little too far away to tell, but that looks like our old friend's pick and pat. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on. You can imagine our hero's surprise to discover that the only person in the laundry was a man behind the counter. Well, whoever came in here disappeared. Hello there, man behind the counter. I have come for my shirt. We're very busy. You present ticket, you get shirt. He doesn't have a ticket. You see, this entire... The entire transaction was perpetrated under some extraordinary circumstances. You like to break that down into English? And the little squirrel proceeded to recapitulate episodes one and two. But let us digress and enter a secret room behind the laundry. It is here that Boris and Natasha found refuge from prying eyes. What's going on? I'm afraid we won't know until our next chapter, tentatively entitled, Let's Blow Up New York, or We Bombed Them at the Palace. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. 
Bullwinkle, the show's about to start. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wait to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The theme, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're headquartering in Shanghai, China. Rocky and Bullwinkle, you may recall, are there to pick up Bullwinkle's shirt from a Chinese laundry. All oh, this fuss just to have a clean shirt. Well, you wouldn't expect me to wear a dirty shirt to my testimonial dinner, would you? Don't answer that. Other familiar figures were also in the city, at the Frapp Toy Manufacturing Company, to be specific. Professor Stein, miss, I hired you to create new toys for me. You hit fingernail right on the head, oh boss man. Well, you've been in this lab for six months. What have you got to show for it? 190 yen in take-home pay. But Boris had been working on something, a toy watch. Of course, this was as old as the hills in Hong Kong. Boris and Natasha were fired on the spot. Meanwhile... There it is, Bullwinkle, Ed Fu Young's Chinese laundry. They were about to enter when who should come along and precede them, but... You got 30 Dirty linen to wash? No, but I got dirty plans. Boris went in, Natasha went in, Rocky went in. And Bullwinkle went in. Yes, but inside there was no sign of Boris and Natasha. One clean shirt to go. Without a ticket, it would take some haggling to get his shirt. That's when we peeked into a secret back room. Boris, for why we slave like white-collar workers just to make toy tiki talk. Shh, keep your accent down. Now, you mean to say you thought that was actually really toy watch? Here. Look at master plans. An intricate blueprint was spread before them. Now see here were fireplaces in the kitchen. That's plan for house. For my old age, which was ten years ago. Here is master blueprint. And on the back of a bubblegum wrapper inscribed with the head of a rusty diaper pen was a detailed drawing of the toy watch. Yes, but what does watch do? You see miniature mushroom cloud over watch? No. Yes? No. Again, I got to say yes. This little tiki tack as you so quaintly put it, honey bunch, is really a tiny atom bomb. With weapon like that, me and you can rule the world. But, darling, you never smuggle watch out of Shanghai. They got wanted posters of you all over town. There was even one in the secret room. Don't fear, dear. I'm not going to smuggle watch. I got confederate. You know Jefferson Davis? Look through Peepsol. What do you see? I see shelves filled with shirt packages. Ah, but that small package on the second shelf contained more than a shirt. Now watch doorway. Accomplice comes in, says secret word, gets package, and meets us in U.S. of hay. Say, there are two auspicious characters out there. Never mind, just listen for secret words. Yeah, but those two... Listen for secret words. I tell you, Mr. Young, I have to be back in Frostbite Falls by Saturday night. Go see travel agent. But he needs his shirt. How things look? Confederate show up yet? No, just that move. Secret words. Wait for secret words. Please, Mr. Young, you gotta let Bullwinkle have his shirt. Bullwinkle? That valley ridiculous name. By the by, darling, what are secret words? I quote, perhaps you would rather I be John Philip Sousa? Perhaps you would rather I be John Philip Sousa? You likely repeat that for West Coast? I said... Never mind! Here is a secret package waiting for you. And with time definitely not on their hands, our boys left the shop. Well, be sure not to miss our next episode, Exploding Population, or Pull Yourself Together! five or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... Oh. Now for another of our special features.
Rogers. Should have tried E flat. Once upon a time, in a little pond in the Middle West, lived an ugly duckling who wanted to be a movie star. I ought to be in pictures! Da, 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 da. He was the star of his local dramatic club, and he was written up in his hometown newspaper for his acting in Cyrano the Duckerack, Hamlet the Melancholy Duck, and Duck of a Salesman, but this kind of fame meant nothing to him. He wanted to be a movie star. I'm just ripe for some lucky scout to discover. So the ugly duckling left his little pond and journeyed far away to a place where all the big talent scouts came to scout talent, a place called Schwab's Swamp. All around him were pictures of the ducks who had been discovered there. Duck Penny, Duck Jones, Duck Washers. Gee, even Duck Tracy. And sure enough, talent scouts were discovering ducks all around him. Hey, you. Me? No, him. Sign here. Hey, handsome. Yes? Not you, ugly him. Will a thousand a week be enough? But alas, nobody wanted to discover the ugly duckling. Ugly? Gosh, looks like I'm a has-been before I was even a was. My, for a duck you are certainly a silly goose. What do you mean? You can't just sit there and wait for them. Make them discover you. By golly, I do it. Soon, the ugly duckling was standing before one of the biggest producers in town. J.B. Hogfat himself. Now get this, J.B. Don't you see, Captain? There's no time now. We are thinking of women and children. You're the only one who can get through safely. <laughs> Go, take your last boat. I will stay and keep the ship off the rocks. <laughs> Don't think of me. I've lived my life. I'm thinking of children. <laughs> Magnificent. Oh, you're a great actor, Duck. Then I get a contract? Of course not. You're ugly as a mud fence, but you were superb. Yeah, that figures. The ugly duckling tried and tried. Ah, oh, my little pigeon. Come with me to this swamp. No. In its dark, mysterious byway, you will come to know the ways of love, l'amour. <laughs> Doc, you are greatest lover in world. But, but... You ugly. No soap. No soap. Still, the duckling didn't give up. Such grace, such rhythm. Another stare, a new Gene Kelly. But I'm too ugly for a contract, eh? Oh, much too. Thought so. And it was the same story with everyone he saw. Gracious, you are an ugly one. Cab, please. Yes, Ugg. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, mister. Yes? How come you're so ugly? All right, I get the idea. Broken-hearted, the duck returned to Schwab's swamp. It's no use. I got a face that would stop a clock, even an electric clock. Oh, you silly goose. You give up so easily. Haven't you ever heard of facelifting? I don't want it higher. I want it prettier. Then go to a plastic surgeon. Get your beak bobbed, your feathers lifted. Get handsome. Yes, I'll do it. So, several weeks later, at the hospital... I have good news for you, my boy. Today, the bandages come off. Hurry, Doc. I've I got to know. <whistles> Shh. You're, you're lovely. It's true. You are good looking. It was true. The doctor had done the trick. Without wasting a minute, the handsome duckling dashed back to the producer's office. Well, here I am, J.B. Just slip the contract under here. I'll just sign it. I won't even read it. What do you talk? I won't give you a contract. Why? You're too blamed good looking. Too, too, too. Well, it seemed as if the trend in movie making had switched to horror pictures. The thing in the duck pond. It ducked from outer space. Ugly duck meets wolf man. Sorry, bud. I can't use any good lookers. Excuse me. Hello, Myron. Yeah, me too. 
But there was a duck here last week who'd be perfect for the part. Me? It was me. Face like three days of bad weather. My face? So I told you once, no more pretty boys. Now, Myron, if he shows up again, I'll make a star out of him. And so the little duckling realized that he had left his real happiness back in that little pond in the middle. Hey, now, wait a minute. You're not going back. Of course not. I'm just starting my new job. Okay, you guys, let her go. But why are you... I figure in a week I'll be ugly enough to scare anybody. But meanwhile, I'm still in show business. in a bottle. Fan mail from some flounder? No, this is what I really call a message. Hello there, poetry lovers. Today's poem is a saga of the sports world entitled Jack Be Nimble. Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick, Jack Jump Over the Cat... Hold it, Moose. Who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Nimble's the name, Jack B. Nimble. Nimble? My card. High Jumps Incorporated, Candlewick say specialty. You're sorry. Well, I sort of thought I'd jumpin' over this one myself. Yourself? You got union card? What union? Local 89, Hop, Skip and Jumpers Union. Well, no. You jump over that thing and we'll snuff out every candle in town. Okay, you do it. No, you talking. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candle wick. Ta-da! That'll be $40. $40? How come? Minimum wage law. Minimum wage law? Certainly. Minimum wage is $1 an hour. So? So, obviously, I get $40 a week. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Buenos dias there, Peabody here. I say buenos dias because today Sherman and I are going back to ancient Spain. The Wayback Machine's all set, Mr. Peabody. Excellent, Sherman. Then we're off for a visit with the most romantic figure in history, the legendary Don Juan. My Wayback, ingenious invention that it is, deposited Sherman and me in front of a large villa in Seville. I was about to ring Don Juan's doorbell when Sherman glanced up and saw a figure swaying precariously on the railing of a balcony. It's Don Juan, Mr. Peabody. Would you be so kind as to move a little to the right? You are standing on my spot. He's gonna jump. Just another second, we dashed upstairs. It will do you no good to try to dissuade me, senors. My mind, she is made up. But why, Don Juan? Have you had a financial setback? No. What is it, then? Onions. Onions? Spanish onions, Bermuda onions, onion onions. I love them more. And a man who eat onions can hardly be called Spain's greatest lover. He started about six weeks ago. A very lovely senorita and I were having a midnight snacks. Would you care for some onion soup, mi chiquita? Onion soup? What is onion soup? I took my first taste, and I was hooked. That night, senor, I consumed 54 bowls of onion soup. Needless to say, when it came time to kiss the senorita goodnight, last week, I attended a bullfight with the very same senorita. Well, it was the same old story. The matador killed 16 bulls, I killed 16 onion rolls. And when it came time to kiss the senorita goodnight... A tragic tale, Don Juan. Yes, I know. Well, buenos dias, I jump. Wait, Don Juan, why not give them up? Women? Onions. Sherman is right, you know. With perseverance, you could lick this thing. And Mr. Peabody and I will help you. Our campaign began with a systematic search of the entire house. We found onions under the rug, in the fruit bowl, and even in the chandelier. That is the last of them, I swear. Are you sure? Positive. And now, if you will excuse me, I shall take a bubble bath. 
We disposed of the onions and then quietly entered Don Juan's library. Shall I light a candle, Mr. Peabody? Not yet, Chairman. We don't want to alarm our visitor. Visitor? There's no one here. There will be. Suddenly, a hooded figure appeared on the balcony. It's a burglar! We watched as the dark intruder made his way to a picture on the wall. Behind the picture was a wall safe. Now, Sherman, light the candle. If the, who is there? Don Juan! I, uh, <laughs> I was looking for my bubble bath. I uh, seem to have misplaced that. Come, come, Don Juan. You and I both know there are onions inside that wall safe. See, si, you are right. Lead me to the balcony. I jump. Just a moment. I can't see why you should give up onions. But how can I eat onions and still be a lover? There is one way. Do you have a date for this evening? Senor, Don Juan have a date every evening. Good. Then consume all the onions you wish. Tonight you shall be romantic in spite of them. Don Juan's rendezvous took place in a lush garden on the outskirts of Seville. Due to a small errand, I was the last to arrive. The senorita's inside waiting for Don Juan, Mr. Peabody. See, si, but in my condition, I'm not a fit companion for a skunk. Then take these. What is it? Poison? Never mind what it is. Just take them. Fearing the worst, Don Juan entered the garden and embraced the fair senorita with surprising results. Oh, Don Juan, you are the greatest lover. I don't understand, Mr. Peabody. What happened to his onion breath? It vanished, Sherman, thanks to those pills. Where did they come from? From that pharmacy across the road. The couple who own it, Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez, were kind enough to fill an original prescription of mine. They did such an admirable job that I'm naming the pills after them. Gonzalez pills? Uh, no, their first names are Clara and Phil Gonzalez. Clara Phil pills, Mr. Peabody? Clara Phil pills, Sherman. Breathtaking, aren't they? Last episode, Rocky had a dickens of a time trying to get Bullwinkle's shirt out of a Shanghai Chinese laundry. But we've come all the way from Minnesota for this shirt. I know, Calf, you come all the way from United Slates. No tiki, no shirty. The moose and the squirrel weren't the only ones with a problem. I agree, Boris. Toy watched that his miniature atom bomb is great weapon in hands of diabolical person. I think any one of those adjectives fit me. But how you got watch past sharp-eyed custom agents? I got a complex. And what the villainous scoundrel had done was to hide the watch in a shirt package with explicit instructions that the package was to be handed over to anyone who said, Perhaps you would rather I'd be John Philip Sousa. Those were the right words. You take a package and let out of here. Don't you worry, sir. We don't have much time left. Less time than they think, for the rude handling had started the mainspring, and the watch was set to go off when the hands reached 12. Meanwhile, in the secret back room... What can be keeping Confederate? Looks like him now. And through the peephole, she saw a huge sinister Chinese enter the shop and deliver the secret words. Perhaps you, Lala, I be John Philip Sluza. I know, Kev, you lad, la lock. You got shirts to clean. You heard him give secret words, you give package. No can do. Packaging question just went out front door. I tried to tell you, Boris, but you... What do you mean, package went out front door? Hey, you, no interlop lady. Looky here, Snooky. Oh, boy, accomplice I had this big one. Boris, please to clam up. That's better. Now, Moose and Squirrel picked up package. Moose and Squirrel? And the startled fiend darted out of the laundry, followed closely by Natasha, One Ton Lee, and the proprietor of the laundry who had not been paid by Rocky or Bullwinkle. You go this way, I'll go that. You take the high road and you... Who's my...
finding this door? Well, they split up and went in different directions, but Shanghai is a difficult city not to get lost in, as Rocky and Bullwinkle soon discovered. Hey, this doesn't look like the airport. You're right. It looks more like a river. Yes, they had wandered into Shanghai's notorious waterfront district. I got it. The China Clipper. At a time like this, who needs a haircut? There was no time to explain, for suddenly Boris, Natasha, and Wonton converged upon the area. This is Charlie Blue Leader. Any sign of moose and squirrel? Abel Baker Charlie here. No, I don't see them. Hokey smoke, it's our own nemesis. And there wasn't even any time to work out a pun, for the enemy was closing in. They got to be somewhere near here. Don't worry, Boris. We get shirt package back from them. Why, those sly devils? They're after my shirt. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. Well, I could reword it. Quick! Down this catwalk! Alas, because of the darkness, Rocky mistook a gangplank for a catwalk. What's more, they kept on going until they were in the hold of a broken-down Chinese junk. I'll give you odds we're not in the Hilton Hotel. Shh! Boy, I can't figure it out. We combed the entire city with fine tooth comb and still no sign of moose and squirrel. Well, you leave a search to me. I catch them then, chop chop. Sounds like they're leaving. Sounds like we are, too. Yes, the junk slowly drifted out into the river. And who was at the helm? One Ton Lee, accompanied by you-know-who. Well, this is a turbulent situation, to say the least. Don't miss our next episode, Up the River, or Yangtze with a Laughing Face. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Right. Bye now. See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. is Shanghai, China, a city that has given our heroes a few bad moments. For instance, they started out by going to Ed Fu Young's Chinese laundry to pick up Bullwinkle's shirt. My name is Bullwinkle J. Moose, and I believe you have a package for me. Bullwinkle? That very silly name. Well, perhaps you would rather I be John Philip Sousa. And it just so happened that those words were to be spoken by an accomplice of Boris Badenov. Thus, instead of getting his shirt, Bullwinkle received another package <laughs> containing a miniature 
miniature atom bomb in the form of a toy wristwatch. Well, when Boris found out about it... Quick, get me a can of cleanser. For why you want that, darling? We got to scour the CD. And in a matter of minutes, a gigantic search was launched throughout the greater Shanghai area. Bullwinkle, we gotta get our bearings. Let's skate later, Doc. I have to attend my testimonial dinner by Saturday night. Instead of the airport, they had stumbled into the river section. I got itty the hunch feeling that moose squirrel and shirt package are in vicinity. Capture seemed imminent until Rocky and Bullwinkle found refuge in the hold of a tottering junk. Where'd they find this thing? In a junkyard? <laughs> the junk pulled out into the river, and it appeared as though our lads were free of their pursuers. Alas, that's when we took a look up on deck. You may rely on one ton. If those we chase are on liver, I find a plenty click. I was on liver once. Good for iron in the blood. Dispense with the levity, Natasha. Unless we get that toy watch back, we are sunk. They might be sunk anyway, for the junk was listing to port. That's better than Muscatel. Meanwhile, below deck... Say, Rock, notice anything strange about my shirt? How can I? We're in the dark and the shirt's in the package. I know, but it's ticking. Indeed it was, and the bomb was set to go off at 12. Maybe the laundry gives free prizes away. I'll open it right after I climb out of the pool. Huh? Yes, the keel had split, and the river was coming in. Quick, Bullwinkle, up on deck. Boris, look. Grab him. Well, you just don't gallivant about the deck of a sinking junk and not lose your footing. Whoa! Seconds later, everyone was stroking for the mainland. Swim faster, Bullwinkle. Listen, if you think I'm going to get my shirt wet, you've got another thing coming. Oh, if only he would get it wet, for it was five minutes to 12 and the bomb was already activating. Faster, Natasha, faster. How can I swim faster with you on my back? Well, one of us got to steer. All this time, one ton Lee had gotten into a motorized life raft and had reached dry land way before anyone else. He was waiting with open arms when Bullwinkle staggered out of the river and said, Perhaps you would rather I be John Philip Sousa. No, no, that was last time. This time you say... Oh, yeah, we made it. You make a one false move, you goners. It didn't take long for Boris to set up headquarters in a dilapidated shack. Boy, the budget on this show is awful. A rotting junk, a dilapidated shack. And you better believe old Poopsie Doopsie here, Moose. You will be in the same condition unless you tell what you did with the package. Good work, Bullwinkle. You hid the package. You're doing good than I did, and you'll never find it. Yes, you've got to give Bullwinkle credit. Or do you? For he was sitting on it. And it was now one minute to 12. It may be a short show next time, but join us anyway for The Bomb in the Cellar or Bullwinkle Lowers the Boom. And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once... One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Once upon a time, there was a little kingdom named the Kingdom of Fig, in which there was a castle, in which there was a throne room, in which there was a king named Newton. I thought you'd never get here. This particular day, the king was busy planning one week's dinner menu with the castle cook. How about a nice serosa beef, your highness? Had that last Sunday. I fix a nice suckling a pig with an apple in his mouth. No, I like suckling pig, but suckling pig doesn't like me. How about a chili beans and a chocolate malt? Well, you're getting warmer, but no, no. Uh, how about a roast chicken? Sorry, we don't got a chicken in the palace. Roast turkey? No turkeys in the palace. Roast goose? No goose. We only got the one. Well, mm -hmm. let's have it. But, your highness, uh, she's a kind of a palace pet. A million laughs. <coughs> Stuff and nonsense. If she laid golden eggs or something, it'd be different. But she looks to me just like an eating-type goose. Pop her in the oven. Okay, highness. I make preparations right away. <coughs> hey, Monroe! Well, of course, the goose was terrified, so she did the only thing she could think of. She ran. 
But just before she reached the castle gate, she stopped and thought of what lay beyond it. Four thousand hungry peasants! I can't go out there! But just then, the words of the king came back to her. If she laid golden eggs, it'd be different. If she laid golden eggs, golden eggs... Golden eggs, of course. A moment later, the goose dashed into the kitchen, got a regular egg, and quickly painted it gold. That evening at dinner, when the main course was brought in, the king got quite a surprise. Hi, Highness. That's a good one, eh? <coughs> good heavens! Cook! Yes, Your Majesty. This goose is terribly underdone. Put her back in the oven. Hold it, sire. Take a look at this. It looks like a golden egg. Looks like. Here, take a closer peek at it. Fourteen carat. She's a done it, Your Highness. You got a goose that lays a golden eggs. Well, upon my word. Yes. <laughs> the trick had worked like a charm. News of the king's good fortune spread like wildfire. X3! Local goose lays golden egg! King Newton of Fig hits jackpot! Matter of fact, the news spread a little too far as it reached the eyes of the king's cousin, Duke Porkington of Hog. Hmm. A thing like this is too big for Newton to handle. It must worry him terribly. I'll just relieve him of the responsibility. To arms! And the greedy duke marched on his cousin's castle to take the wonderful goose by force. When King Newton heard about it, he spoke those deathless words by which we remember him even today. Don't give up the goose! Yay! But Duke Parkington was determined. Day after day, he blasted at the castle. You know, Your Grace, you may kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. If I can't have it, nobody can, see? But by then, King Newton's castle was shot away. Uh, why aren't we shooting back? We are the cannonballs, Majesty. All we can do now is to sit and take it. Golden eggs. I wish I'd never heard of golden eggs. Me too. In fact, I'm gonna get rid of this one right now. No, sire, don't throw it! <laughs> Some yo uh, joke, eh, Majesty? Even fool you, eh? <laughs> funny, funny! <laughs> Shall I go get in the oven, sire? But instead of being angry, the king jumped with joy. You're a fraud! <laughs> a phony! You can't do it! Well, I was just... Well, I can tell Parkington that I don't have anything he wants. He'll go away. But just then, a very strange thing happened. Sire, may I have some pickles and ice cream? Of course, I'll go... Pickles and ice cream? Or maybe a little sauerkraut topped with strawberries. Are you feeling all right? Oh, just a little faint. What is it? Nothing. I'm just going to lay an egg, that's all. Ooh. And she did. But what an egg it was. It's so shiny. It looks like solid gold. And it was solid gold. Well, that drops a clod in the churn. Now I can never call off Parkington. But, sire, now we don't have to. Well, what do you mean? I have a plan. And a moment later, as Duke Parkington prepared to storm the castle, a shot rang out and a strange cannonball landed at his feet. Look, Your Grace, it's solid gold. Gold cannonballs! Boy! Here comes another one. Catch it, catch it! Well, of course, when the soldiers tried to catch the golden cannonballs, they were mowed down in rows. And in a little while, Duke Porkington stood alone on the battlefield. Are you going on with the battle? No, Newton. Just picking up souvenirs. So the King Newton and the Goose lived happily ever after and whiled away the time playing games together. I'll bet five. I'll just see that, Majesty, and raise you ten. <laughs> Private Bullwinkle, sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. Today's lecture is entitled Magic Made Easy the Hard Way. There are six basic tricks, the first of which is the trickiest, namely pulling a rabbit out of a hat. This looks familiar. Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! The more I try this, the further away I get. One of the most popular tricks, and least requested, I might add, is sawing a man in half. Here's your saw, Mr. Know-it-all. Thank you. Here we go. Ta-da! Now I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you swear this man was cut in half? Go ahead, sir. Walk off the stage. Both halves, both halves. And now for the most difficult trick of all, the living pincushion. 
Step inside the box, Rock. What are you gonna do? You see these swords? Once you're inside, I shall pierce the box. Then me too. Well, we hope not. Well, I'm not going in there. Very well. Then I shall call upon the services of my pet jersey. Bossy, take your place in the box. <coughs> there. Now Bossy and I will astound you. Taking the swords, I plunge them into every section of the box. Into the bottom. <coughs> the top. The sides. <coughs> <coughs> Sword after sword! Now you will see that although the box is perforated with swords, Bossy is untouched. Take a look inside, Rock. I'm not gonna look in there. All righty, I shall look myself. Now there you see. Holy cow! <laughs> northern region of Canada, Dudley Do-Right was taking his annual two-week vacation, accompanied by his horse. Oh, I don't know what I'll do with myself for two weeks. Jean Earl, don't worry. I'll be back before long. You must know, Dudley, that I can't stand being parted for even a day from your horse. Well, I can't help it if his vacation corresponds with mine. Meanwhile, in a deserted shack, Snidely Whiplash was having a trauma. Home of those Mounties are getting to me. I can't stand them another minute. Another minute, you hear? Wait a minute, what's a trauma? The Mounties can't stand you either, Snidely. You're right, the Mounties hate me like the plague, so I'll give them something to hate. Competition! Competition! Competition, the very thing that makes the world go round. They've been pretty smug, thinking they've cornered the Mountie market. Well, two can play at their game. Homer, I'm going to go into the Mountie business. The Snidely Whiplash Mounted Police, SWMP. SWMP! That's got a nice ring to it, Snidely. So Snidely Whiplash opened his camp right next door to the RCMP camp. He can't do it. He just can't do it. Who ever heard of more than one mounted police in Canada? But, sir, that's competition. That's the Canadian way. Besides, he says that your fence is four feet into his property line. Men, I don't know how to tell you this exactly, but we're no longer the only mounted police in Canada. We are in direct competition with another mounted police whose name I won't mention. And this is the time for stalwartism, braveryism, and most important of all, always get your manatism. Oh, one more thing. From now on, there'll be shorter coffee breaks. Snidely Mounties, you know our purpose to prevent the other Mounties, and I won't mention their name, from always getting their man. And here's how we'll do it. Stop, thief. You can't escape the Snidely Mounties. They always get their man. Your voice, madam. Some Mounty you are. Huh. Hmm. Some Mounty you are. For a whole week, the Mounties did not get their man. This was extremely embarrassing for the Mounties, for they never let a day go by without bringing in something. Get a man today. No, sir, but I did manage to bring in this. The Mounties had become the laughing stock of the town, while Snidely Mounties became the heroes of the town. What the people didn't know was that Snidely was using his own men to be the bad guy. OK, it's your turn to be the bad guy, and I'll be the Snidely Mountie. I can't understand it. How do Snidely Mounties always get there first? Oh, if only Dudley Do-Right was back from his vacation. What the inspector didn't know was that Dudley Do-Right was back. When he had gotten two blocks from camp, he had become hopelessly lost and had spent his first week wandering around in a circle. <laughs> Stupid. Until he found he was right back where he started, except that there were now two camps. That's funny, there was only one when I left. Now, which one is the RCMP camp? Well, I'll just let my horse lead me. They have an instinct about that sort of thing. Hey, buddy, you better get into this uniform. You know how strict the old man is. Oh, change of uniform, eh? Well, mm. black mm. is the stangay. Well, there's something familiar mm. about you. Lost a little weight, eh, Inspector Fenwick? Right, George. <laughs> does you a world of good. I've seen that face somewhere. No, oh, well, doesn't matter. Snidely Mounties, listen, here's my plan. Now the people despise the Mounties. They wouldn't dare. Where have I seen that face? As I was saying, the people despise the Mounties and have a deep affection for us, the Snidely Mounties. Now is the time for the great bank robbery. Something is not quite right here. Hurrah, hurrah. 
the Snidely Mounties are here. Defenders of the right. Hurrah! Shut up and hand over the money. Yes, sir, Snidely Mountie, sir. If you ask for it, you must certainly have some good use for it. Yeah, like we're gonna spend it, all of it. <laughs> oh, no, you're not, Snidely Whiplash. I am Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties. I knew I'd seen that face before. So you caught the Snidely Mounties robbing a bank and broke up the SWMP. But tell me, where's Snidely Whiplash? Oh, I let him get away. You let him get away? Why did you let him get away? I remembered I still have two days' vacation. We're in for an explosive ending to our story, for last time, aboard this Chinese junk, Rocky and Bullwinkle still had possession of the package containing the miniature atom bomb. And possession is nine-tenths of the law. The ticking sound bothered Rocky, but before he could investigate, the tide went out and the junk caved in. Tide's in! Shirts out! Yes, the moose managed to keep the package dry, even when the junk sank and they were forced to swim to shore. Use the butterfly stroke, it's faster! You swim like a butterfly, I'll swim like a moose! And the bomb ticked on with zero hour minutes away. Fortunately, they made it safely to dry land. Or at least to dry land, anyway. You guys, honorable prisoner! Yes, Badenov's hatchet man was Johnny on the spot! Name Wampum, not Johnny. Uh, sorry. Uh, later in a shack outside of town... Tell me where you hid package or... Oh, come on now. You know us good guys don't scare easy. Well, us bad guys don't mind trying you out. Natasha, prepare the torture. Oh, yes, I neglected to mention that Bullwinkle was sitting on the package with detonation barely one minute away. Bullwinkle, your shirt isn't worth it. It's the dean of the thing, Rock. You mean principal. Yeah. Ready with torture, Boris. Roger will go, Natasha. Okay, start eating. And the willing Natasha dug into the most scrumptious chocolate marshmallow strawberry banana split hot fudge sundae you ever saw. Oh, mother of pearl, I can't stand it. I give up, I give up. Here, take the package. Aha! The bad guys win again. Come, Natasha, you two want on. Together we rule world. What about us? You no longer interest me, Inky Pinky Squirrel. Hurry, we may get away over city dump. A deadly silence settled over the shack. Finally, Rocky, tired and wan from the recent ordeal, spoke. Oh, there goes your shirt, Bullwinkle. And there goes the city dump, Rock. Boy, they must have powerful garbage over there. The dump did go up, and for days it came down right on Shanghai. Boris and Natasha and one ton not only received minor powder burns, but 60 days in jail for disregarding the city anti-litter law. Hey, food, not bad here. You ought to try number two dinner. As for Rocky and Bullwinkle, they straightened everything out with the authorities. All right, we'll let you go back to floss bite floors on one condition. You name it. Promise to send shirts to Malik and Laundries. They do good job, too. With but hours remaining, our heroes boarded a jet and streaked for home, hoping they would arrive in time for the dinner honoring Bullwinkle. You rush home and change into your white tie and tails, Bullwinkle. I'll stall the banquet. It's no use, Rock. I don't have a clean shirt, and I won't appear in front of that crowd ill-fitted, so to speak. Oh, for goodness sake, run on home. I'll get a shirt for you. Well, on a Saturday night in Frostbite Falls, there wasn't a clean shirt to be found, not even a dirty one. Ah, but the mind of a flying squirrel is a resourceful one. For five bucks, okay? You got a deal, Rocky. Ten minutes later, after a heart-rending introduction... And so you see, friends, if it hadn't been for my little pal, Rocky, I might be the most embarrassed moose in the world. Yes, sir, that little guy would give you the shirt off his back. That is, if you were a size three. <laughs> Time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Right. Bye now. 
See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Like most Americans, the folks in Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, rely heavily on their television sets. Not just for eating off of, but for the evening news. 80,000 men a year. And now here's tonight's cutie. Crate and Finney of Butte Falls fell into an open manhole, was swept down the Colorado River, and came out 30 days later in the Pacific Ocean. Weather report for tomorrow. Clear, cloudy skies with gusty showers and sunny late mornings following the snowstorm. And now this is... That weather report was about as accurate as one dared to get. For in Frostbite Falls, you never knew what it was going to be next. Phil, don't forget your ghoul lashes. I'm going to bed, Aggie. Day in, day out, the citizens were at the mercy of a very unpredictable climate. They were, that is, until the Committee for Civic Improvement got to work. Well, boys, how's she look? Long as she forecasts the weather, who cares how she looks? For the sum of $33.15, they had purchased a fortune-telling machine from an abandoned penny arcade. You simply put a coin in the slot, the lady in the window dealt cards, and the hand she laid down determined the weather. Four tens. That means light snow. And it did snow lightly for about three weeks. Four kings. Rising temperatures. Sure enough, it got to be 121. Months went by, and tourists from all over the world ogled the odd weather machine. One or two even attempted to buy it without success. It remained for those two flies in the ointment, Boris and Natasha, to spoil what could have been an uninteresting but easy-to-narrate story. Oh, you men are all alike, Boris. You got brunette with you. You look at blonde. I not look at blonde, Natasha. I look at cards. It seems the machine was so well-oiled... Lucky machine. It was operating better than ever. The hands manipulated the cards at blinding speed with a dexterity seldom seen outside of Las Vegas. Who cares about the speed, body boy? I like what cards she holds. Oh, the cunning brain of that man, for sure enough, she never put down a hand without showing at least four of a kind. Yeah, but can she play pinochle? Don't be jealous. She could be the answer to our problems. We don't got no problems. Well, we better get some then or we won't be in the next episode. The clock in the tower at the far end of town struck midnight. Boris struck two under cover of a dense fog. Four queens. He and Natasha escorted the weather lady right out of town. The following morning... Let's go, Rock. Get your glove and let's get down to the field. The team is counting on us, you know. Wait a second. Suppose it rains. Mercy me. We better check. And they dash post-haste to the site where the weather machine had been located. Oh, darn it. That's the fifth nickel I put in and she still won't work. Bullwinkle, you don't seem to realize the weather lady is gone. Maybe if I tried a dime. Hmm. 
Sure is a mystery. Maybe she works on slugs. It was then that Rocky noticed the heavy-duty tire tracks leading away from the scene of the crime. They loaded her here, turned around there, and drove off there. Come on! Hours later, after miles of painstaking plotting, they reached the moving van. Shh! We'll sneak up from both sides. Oh, if it were only fair to warn them, for the bridge that Empty Van was resting on had definitely been tampered with. We might have a disaster here. Don't miss the Rolling Stone or Look Ma, No Moss. Once upon a time, there was a king named Midas. He was a very greedy king indeed. The one thing he loved most in the world was... Gold! The one thing he had the most of was... Gold! And the one thing he wanted more of was... Gold! 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 So, he sent his tax collectors into the kingdom to do his gold gathering for him. As the people grew poorer and poorer from being taxed, Midas grew richer and richer. Finally, the people were reduced to living on a diet of turnips. As a result, King Midas began to get the funny feeling that people didn't like him very much. But I need to do something to make people like me. Then I can tax them even more. So the king called a meeting of his advisors, Bobble, Bangle, Bead, and Benson. Gentlemen, I must be made popular. Well, well sire, I'm just talking off the top of my thatch. What is it, Benson? Well, what about lowering the taxes? We could... That wasn't it, huh? The next day, the king called another meeting of his advisors, Bobble, Bangle, and Bede. Well, let's put this idea on the rack and see how it stretches, K.M. We'll uh, point out your warm human qualities. What warm human qualities? Well, you must have some. Like what? Uh, dogs. Everybody likes dogs. I hate dogs! I can see it now. Heralds all over the kingdom, posters on every wall. Midas loves mutts. Hear ye, hear ye! This day, King Midas will free all dogs in the royal dog pound! Sure enough, as the people watched, the king let all the dogs loose. Maybe he's not all bad. Animals like him. Oh, uh, Your Majesty, would you like to pet Tweaky here? Oh, how nice! A lovely pussycat! Pussycat! And the king was instantly buried in a snarling mass of dogs. Get off, you much! Get off! Oh, I hate dogs! Just as I thought, a fake. And the people once more pelted the king with turnips. Before, they had just disliked him. Now, they despised him. So the next day, Midas called another meeting of his advisors, Bobble and Bangle. All right, now what? Well, let's put this in a crossbow and see how it shoots. Midas, you'll slay a dragon. Me? You. Ooh. Good! Hear ye, hear ye! King to fight dragon! Uh, maybe there's something good about Midas after all. Well, on the appointed day, King Midas rode forth to do battle with the fire-breathing dragon, which, of course, wasn't a real dragon at all. Avant, foul fiend! Unfortunately, as Midas swung, the head flew off his axe and felled a nearby tree. Another fake! So the people again let fly with turnips. Boo, boo, boo. By now, they didn't just despise the king, they actually hated him. Next day, the king called a meeting of his advisor, Bobble. Well, Bobble, what now? Well, sire, let's just throw this in the moat, see if it floats. What about giving you the golden touch? Isn't that expensive? Well, not if you just use this spray gun and this cheap gold paint. Good thinking, Bobble. The word spread in a flash. King has gold touch. Midas, 24 carat monarch. Big free demonstration. People came from all over to watch the king turn things into gold. Hats, canes, bushes, even rocks. That's gold? Looks like gold? Yeah. Feels like gold? Yeah. The king says it's gold? Yeah. It's gold. Hooray, Hooray for, for King, king Midas! Midas! 
Well, the king sprayed more and more things until everything in the kingdom looked as if it were made of gold. Midas, of course, was very popular, but since everybody had more make-believe gold than he could use, gold began to lose its value. Soon, it took a wheelbarrow full of gold just to buy one turnip. But back in his castle, the king was very happy indeed. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> You've done it! The people like me, and I'm still the richest man in the kingdom! Uh, not quite, sire. Huh? The country has gone off the gold standard. What? Oh, well, what is the standard now? Uh, turnips. Turnips? Yes, turnips it was. And, of course, everybody had some turnips. Everybody except King Micus. With nothing but gold, he was the poorest man in his own kingdom. You mean I'm broke, Bubble? Looks like, sire. So the next day, the king called a meeting of his advisers. And, of course, nobody was there but him. Today, King Midas lives in a very modest castle on a little side street. He still has lots and lots of friends. And, of course, he <laughs> still has the golden touch. Remains. Today's subject is how to get into the movies without buying a ticket. The first approach is to go directly to the manager and say, Where's my pass? <laughs> Unruffled by that minor setback, we try phase two, which involves a disguise. Hello there, I'm Flo Ziegfeld. How's my show going tonight? <laughs> phase three. Seeking out the location of the freight elevator, we then proceed down into the basement, where we shall then proceed up to the balcony. That's the deepest basement I ever saw. This gate crashing moose again. Hello, Mr. Theater Manager. I should like to apply for a job as a usher. What experience you got? I've been in the dark most of my life. It's good enough. Of course, job don't pay much. How much? Bag of popcorn and all ticket stops you can find. It's a deal! Donning the usherette's uniform, we then proceed to our post in the mezzanine. Going through a door, we find ourselves... Oop. <laughs> wrong door. Hello, Mr. Theater Manager. I took the wrong... Where's your ticket? I don't need a ticket. I'm your new usher. Don't need no new usher. Just hired new usher. That did it. I wouldn't go in that theater if they gave me the place. Why not? I just happened to notice. I've seen this picture three times already. That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. Peabody and Sherman here. The Wayback Machine, my incomparable invention for traveling through time, has been set for the year 1513. Which direction are we heading, Mr. Peabody? South, Sherman, specifically Florida, and our host will be the illustrious Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon, the man who sought the fabled Fountain of Youth. The Wayback took us way back instantly to a small clearing in the heart of the Florida Everglades. We saw no sign of Ponce de Leon or his men, merely a large tent with a white object flying above it. Ponce de Leon's flag, Mr. Peabody. That's no flag, Sherman. That is a baby's bib. What's more, as we rounded the tent, the clearing abounded in diapers, and there, slaving over a washtub, was the distinguished explorer. Oh, Mondays. How I detest Mondays. Buenos dias, Ponce de Leon. Buenos dias. Ah, tourists. You are on your way to Palm Beach, no doubt. No, Mr. De Leon. We came to see if we couldn't help you find the Fountain of Youth. Oh, that's very noble of you. But it has already been discovered. You found it? Oh, not me. My men. That is them over there playing with blocks. They were grown men when they reached the fountain. 
And they were very thirsty. Drank too much? See, si. Now, instead of blowing taps each night, I play Brahms' lullaby. Oh, it's very degrading. We accepted Ponce's invitation to stay for lunch and sat down to a large bowl of mush. The luncheon progressed nicely, although I was forced into burping Lieutenant Rodriguez, three months of age. We were about to embark on a custard pudding when Ponce noticed that one of his men was missing. Cooper Alconsales! He's not in his high chair! A quick search of the grounds turned up nothing, not even a clue. Oh, this not like Gonzales to go AWOL. He was always a most conscientious soldier. He would not crawl away. Gee, Mr. Peabody, a little baby like that lost in the Everglades. Perhaps he was thirsty. And if he was thirsty, he may be heading for the fountain. Quick, Ponce, lead us to the fountain. Gonzales couldn't stand growing any younger. Ponce de Leon issued orders for his command to remain in their barracks which is to say he unceremoniously dumped them into a playpen. Five minutes later, we arrived at the Fountain of Youth. Look, it's the baby, and he's going to drink. Attention! Stand at attention! But the glass never wavered. Glancing about, I noticed a rattlesnake slumbering blissfully on the limb of a nearby tree. With deft hand, I shook his rattles, taking care not to rouse him. Naturally, the sound of the rattle arrested the attention of Corporal Gonzalez. Corporal Gonzalez, you are under arrest and hereby confined to your bassinet. We returned to the clearing and prepared to give Ponce de Leon's soldier a change of uniform. That's when the attack started. Indians! The Seminole Indians! Herding the soldiers together, we retreated inside Ponce de Leon's tent. I knew that sooner or later they would find us. Quick, issue each man a musket. Musket? They can't even hold a bottle. What'll we do, Mr. Peabody? We're outnumbered. Only one thing to do, Sherman. Fight fire with fire. I waited until darkness, then crept slowly out of camp. Then, suddenly, I was in the midst of the Seminoles. Why we not attack them in darkness? Why must Indian always wait till dawn? We take on pictures of battle. No got flash bulb for night fighting. Assured the Seminoles wouldn't attack till daylight, I continued on. Then, early the following morning, I rejoined Sherman and Ponce. Senor Peabody, quick! I think the Indians are about to attack. But instead of attacking, the Seminole chief came into the clearing all alone. A white flag! They've surrendered! Again, you're wrong, Sherman. That white flag is a diaper. You see, last night I went to the Fountain of Youth, took a generous supply of the water, and crept into the Seminole camp. While the Indians were sleeping, I spiked their water supply. But if that is true, then the Indians are... Babies? Yes. And at that very moment, four of the most ferocious braves crawled out of the brush. White man... I come in peace. I have talcum to trade for diapers. And so the battle never came off. In fact, Ponce and the Seminole chief became such good friends, they erected the Fountain of Youth Nursery School. Well, all's well that ends well, Mr. Peabody. Precisely, Sherman. Uh, by the way, what is that you have in your hand? This? Oh, just an old rusty key I found in the dirt. Well, congratulations, my boy. You are now a landowner. Landowner, Mr. Peabody? Of course, Sherman. You now own one of the Florida Keys. predicting the weather for Frostbite Falls had been overcome. Wife's looking better these days, Mr. Mayor. That's not my wife. City Council purchased this machine from a penny arcade. What cards does she show? Four doses. Hmm. Foggy tonight. It was so foggy, no one ventured out on the streets. No one but those enterprising rascals, Boris and Natasha. A foggy night in Frostbite Falls. Oh, for pity's sake, Boris, why you get a stealing blonde who deals cards? Because, Natasha... Yeah. Ooh, that's heavy. Blonde dealer never deals less than four of a kind. Interesting, but uninformative. Please to zip up your mouth. You want you should give us away? But the town slept solidly, and it wasn't until some 12 hours later that the heinous crime was discovered. They put her in a moving van and drove off in that direction. However, the tire tracks came to a halt not too far from town. In the center of a very unsteady bridge, our heroes cornered their quarry. Let's go get him, Bullwinkle. Someone had sawed away at the understructure. Collapse seemed imminent. Bullwinkle, shh. 
Don't shh me, Rock. Shh the doggone bridge. Meanwhile, at the top of Sam Hill... Let me look, Boris. After all, it was my dime. All you look at, Natasha, is panoramic view. I'm looking for panoramic disaster. Ah, that eliminates moose and squirrel. Also moving van. Natasha, there comes a time when we must shoulder the load, when life's burdens become... Oh, enough! <laughs> I carry the blonde first, Maya. You carry a second. That is fair. Yes, it was, considering it was only a mile to the river. And that was Boris's ultimate goal. Let's rejoin this twosome later and go back to where the bridge crashed into the gorge. They ought to have this bridge condemned. And with that parting shot, the lads retraced their steps back to Frostbite Falls. It was just about that time that Boris, Natasha, and the weather lady reached the little river town of Wachowie Falls. Okay, Samson. Your turn to carry it. Natasha, it will give me great privilege to do so. And he toted it three steps inside a boat-building establishment owned by a man named Hiram Trump. Mr. Trump? My card. Uh, Ace of Diamonds. You a gambling man, mister? No, but with a moniker like Trump, you must be. Who's the sick lady in the sedan chair? That, my friend, is unpositively the world's most fantabulistic card player what it is. She plays cards? Like a snake. Well, this river town was noted for its poker games, and in less than an hour, Trump's interior was jammed with onlookers and players alike. Well, what do you know? Four queens. I'll be... That's the tenth straight hand she's come up with, four of a kind. Well, that cleans us out, I guess. Forty-one thousand, forty-two. Mr. Trump, I don't want your money. Forty... Wow! Here, take this filthy looker back. But you won it, fair and square. Well, maybe square. Look, you give us a little going-away gift and you can keep money. What kind of a gift? Oh, say that steamboat sitting outside by the dock. Say, what's Boris up to besides no good? Well, perhaps we'll find out in our next installment, a southern-style breakfast, or how many grits can you eat? <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell.
The one sure thing about the weather in Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, was that it was changeable. And tomorrow morning, it'll be either sunny, cloudy, raining, snowy, foggy, smoggy, hailing, drizzly. No one was able to make an accurate prognostication until the city council bought a fortune-telling machine. Look, Bullwinkle, four aces. What are they going to sing? Four aces means variable high cloudiness. And two snakes in the grass meant Boris and Natasha. With that machine, Natasha, we could clean up. Why not use broom, darling? Brooms don't hold four of a kind every hand. Thus, on a severely overcast night, the two near-to-wells transported the weather lady right out of Frostbite Falls and down to a river town. There, Boris inveigled the local Knicks into proving their so-called prowess with a game of poker. Ha! Three aces, two kings. Beat that. One, two, three. Oh, what a shameful crime, sir. Lucky lady has four fours. Boris cleaned the town out and used the money to purchase a somewhat antiquated steamboat. Four coats of paint later. Well, Natasha, they always said we'd go up the river. His most striking colors, Captain Badenov, but what do you call her? How about the spirit of St. Louis? He's been took. The Hesperus? Ah, they wrecked that one. Because he wanted to attract gambling customers, Boris settled on the name Sands Hotel. The weather lady was stationed in the main salon and Boris pitted her uncanny luck against all comers. Sure enough, she never failed to produce less than four of a kind. And even on a rare occasion when her opponent held four of a kind, the weather ladies were higher. I've a dog, four trays, beats my four deuces. Sunny skies this morning, drizzles this afternoon. The Sands Hotel navigated its way up and down the river, picking up a passenger here, a bale of cotton there. But mostly sharp-eyed card sharks who had heard of the lady in the booth that had yet to lose a game of poker. Say, ain't you the guy who broke the bank in Monte Carlo? That's right, Captain. Lucky Louis Ledbetter. And I expect to do the same for this boat. Well, Lucky Louis lasted five hands. This battle here, Mr. Ledbetter, is on sale today. Meanwhile, what about Rocky and Bullwinkle? Were they going to take this sitting down? Nope. We just painted the chairs. Listen to this, Bullwinkle. The Steamboat Sands Hotel challenges anybody or anything to a game of poker. Come be beaten by Ruth Booth, the best female poker player on Earth. They're talking about our missing weather lady. That night, two stowaways climbed aboard the Sands Hotel. Lucky for us, the river is low this time of year. Shh, somebody will hear you. A peek through a porthole confirmed the little squirrel's suspicions. The weather lady was indeed Miss Ruth Booth. We gotta sneak her out. Bullwinkle, you create a diversion while I jimmy the lights. Then when the lights go out, you grab the weather lady and swim to shore. Way to shore. Yeah. Some two minutes later, a southern gentleman wearing a beaver hat over what looked like a hat rack sat down opposite the card machine. Good evening, y'all, sir. My name is Colonel Beauregard. Boris is Moose you said you killed in previous episode. Look, it's his show. If he wants to be hard to kill, let him. You come to play Miss Booth here? Oh, oh, you bet. You're the one who does the bedding, Sonny Poopsie. Go get a gun. What kind of gun? Spray? No, a gun gun. The kind goes boom. Uh-oh, will Rocky be able to kill the lights before the moose gets killed? Be with us next time for Bartender, Turn Those Lights Off, or A Shot in the Dark. <laughs> Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never works. This time for sure. Presto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. You wait till your mother sees what you've done to your new Sunday toga, Junior. Well, don't blame it on me, Pop. Blame it on Skinny Flavius' dog. Skinny Flavius' dog is only six weeks old. But that briar patch in our backyard isn't. Is that what tore your toga? Uh-huh. The dog was chasing me, and I jumped over the fence without looking. Mm, by overlooking the briar patch, you overlook one of my most wisest sayings. Look before you leap. Gosh, is that one of yours? Yes, it is, and so is his fable. The country frog and the city frog. Once there was a frog, a poor country frog, 
His only possession was a small farm on which the only thing he could grow were gopher holes. I got holes in my farm, holes in my shoes, and a hole in my head, or I wouldn't still be here. That was the year the world discovered the game of golf. Four! And as anyone can tell you, the object of the game is to put the ball in a hole. That was also the year there was a shortage of holes, but not on the frog's farm. I'll give you 50,000 cash for 18 holes. I'll make it 60,000. The frog sold every gopher hole on his farm and overnight amassed a huge fortune. I'm gonna take me a roll of nickels and I'm going to the big city. I'm gonna have me a time. And then he saw it. The Bijou Theater directly across the street. And on the marquee, the frog gets 50 beautiful dancing frogs. After purchasing a ticket, which incidentally was only a nickel, he took a seat in the very front row. I have done died and gone to heaven. One gorgeous creature in particular caught his fancy, the star of the show, Amphibian. Her performance so unnerved the simple frog that he began popping nickels into his mouth, thinking they were jelly beans. Amphibian had seen a lot of big spenders, but this looked like the biggest of them all. My granny's Miss Fibian. Sure was neighborly of you to let me buy you this here expensive dinner. I worship the bank you keep your money in, honey. A mad courtship followed. Money was no object when it came to Amphibian. She spent nickels like they were pennies. They were nights at the opera, days at the races, and afternoons in the fur shop. Buy me that Alaskan seal, would you, sweetheart? How much is it? Only 20,000 nickels. Well, that sounds reasonable. Needless to say, it wasn't long before the frog was down to his last nickel. What are we gonna do tonight, frog honey? Well, I thought we'd go somewhere and make a phone call. Talk to the operator, things like that. Let's get something straight, big boy. If you want me to be your honey, you gotta spend lots of money. Well, in that case, you wait right here, you hear? In an effort to raise money fast, he took the first job to come along, which happened to be in a circus. Only thing we need right now is a high diver. Tell me what to do. You see that 5,000-foot platform? Dive off of that into this bucket. Ain't that a mite dangerous? Yeah, but it pays good. Willing to risk anything, the frog ascended the ladder and poised athletically at the edge of the platform. Ain't exactly leap year, but here goes. The little frog jumped out into space and plunged like a rocket toward the bucket far below. But as luck would have it, the weather suddenly changed. A cold snap set in, and the water in the bucket froze solid. Well, there's nothing new about a frog diving into a bucket of ice, so he was fired. What in the blue-eyed world am I gonna do? If I don't find me some money, I'll... And then he saw it. In the gutter was a nickel. Maybe my luck has changed. He put the nickel in a weighing machine, and instead of a fortune, two nickels came out. Flushed with his newfound wealth, he dashed into a phone booth to call Amphibian. But instead of getting her number, three nickels fell out. On a bus that would take him to Anne's apartment. He dropped the three nickels into the coin receiver. And out came a transfer. He was as broke as ever. Annie, honey. I'm Nicholas. I don't care what your front name is, honey. I got news. Your broker sold the last of your gopher holes. Here's 10,000 nickels. Hot Ziggy, let's us go make a long-distance phone call. Oh, no, you don't. This wouldn't last me a fortnight. You're going to enter a frog jumping contest and will win a fortune. But, Anna, baby, I can't jump. You won't have to, Green Eyes. We'll bet on another frog. And so on the day of the jumping contest, the little frog took his place on the starting line. Now remember, love, don't jump a foot. You'll lose and we'll win. He had to make it look good, so he took a few steps back to get set for a false effort. But not looking where he was going, he backed into a bush on which sat a bee. And the frog took off on the longest jump ever recorded by man. He won the contest, but he lost his money and amphibian. <laughs> So you see, Junior, look before you leap. I got a better one, Pop. Don't you always? All right, let's have it. Once bitten, twice spry. No, oh, go play in the briar patch, son. Today's lesson is mighty important, remember? Not that lesson. This lesson. Hello there, you wool gatherers. Today's poem is the old classic, 
Maury had a little lamb. Maury? That's Mary. You're a boy, aren't you? Yeah, but... Okay, Maury had a little lamb. It's really me, folks. It's fleas were white as snow. It's fleas were white as snow. They're albino fleas. I got them at... Uh-oh, little rascals got away. Where was I? And everywhere. Oh, yeah, and everywhere that Maury was... Oh! Went the... Oh! Hey, what's going on? Those fleas are biting you, Bullwinkle. Oh, ah! You better get out of that sheepskin. I can't. The zipper's stuck. Oh! Well, hold still, Bullwinkle. I'll shear you. Oh, that's my own personal pelt you're snipping. Well, here, maybe this'll do it. <laughs> so if you have a little lamb, just take a tip from me. If it has fleas as white as snow... Just use some DDT. Yeah. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... <laughs> oh. Features. Should have tried E flat. <laughs> Peabody here. Today, Sherman and I are off to Boston. For beans, Mr. Peabody? No, no, no. For the Battle of Bunker Hill, Sherman. We set the Wayback Machine for June 17th, 1775, and in an instant we were teleported to the scene of the battle. High atop Bunker Hill, we joined the American Army. Look, Mr. Peabody, the British are halfway here already. Oh, indeed they were, and closer and closer they came. Why don't the Americans fire? A good question, Sherman. Uh, uh, pardon me, Lieutenant, but unless you commence firing, the British will be upon you. I know it, but orders are orders. And what were the orders? Not to fire until we see the whites of their eyes. And the way I see it, this battle's gonna be over without us firing a shot. I don't understand, Mr. Peabody. Can't they see the whites of the eyes? I'm afraid not, Sherman. You see, the British are wearing sunglasses. Well, the battle might have begun and ended right there if it hadn't been for British tradition. The clock struck four, and the English broke for tea. One lump of tool, men. Three, please. Quick, Lieutenant, send someone back to headquarters and have those orders countermanded. A good idea. I'll go myself. You realize, of course, everything depends on speed. Don't worry, sir. I'll be back in a week. A week? Headquarters are in New York. Well, give my regards to Broadway. <laughs> Quickly, Sherman, we must invade the enemy camp. It was obvious that unless the British removed their sunglasses, the American cause was doomed. We made our way downhill and hid behind a small wooden fence. Now what, Mr. Peabody? Take the spray can, Sherman. It contains white paint. You see this hole in the fence? Well, every time a British soldier peeks through it, spray his sunglasses. But how are you going to get them to peek through the fence? Curiosity, my boy. Seconds later, a do not look through here sign was posted over the hole, and it brought immediate results. How's it going, Sherman? Just fine, Mr. Peabody. Good. Continue spraying until you've run out of soldiers. Then meet me at the tent of General Burgoyne. By Jove, Major, that sunglasses idea of yours was positively a stroke of genius. Where on earth did you ever pick it up? In one of the far-off colonies called Long Beach, California. All the natives wear them out there. Begging the General's pardon, sir, but we just caught two blinking spies. You didn't catch us, and we are not spies. Uh, General Burgoyne, I am Dr. Peabody, and this is my assistant, Dr. Sherman. D -d doctors What sort of doctors? Aye, specialists. There's an outbreak of spotsitis in the colonies, and... Tea time's up. All right, Major. Have the men resume the attack. Now what's all this polderol about isopotis? Uh, spotsitis. You see, General... General, come quickly. What is it, mate? Are we on the run? No, sir. We're on our backs. Look, every one of our soldiers flat on his back, complaining of spots before the eyes. Spotsitis. Spotsitis? Spotsitis. We set up a field hospital in the general's tent. I say, do you always use a magnet instead of a scalpel? In cases of spotsitis, uh, yes. Now close your eyes, please. Now open them. I can see. I can see! Uh, gets you right here, doesn't it? Why, uh, yes, I suppose so. By the time we were through, every soldier in the British Army had been shorn of sunglasses. 
We presented our bill to Burgoyne and then crept back to the American lines. Here they come, Mr. Peabody! Now remember, men, your orders are not to fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Oh, no, they're not. It's the lieutenant who went to New York. How did you get back so fast? I hit the signals just right. Here are the new orders. To the American army, do not fire until you see the glare of their sunglasses. Oh, no! Well, Sherman, back to the enemy camp again. What do we do this time? We'll have to convince Burgoyne the only preventer for a reoccurrence of spotsitis is to wear sunglasses. That's correct, General. According to my colleague, Dr. Sherman here, your army must wear sunglasses. By the way, old man, isn't Dr. Sherman a trifle young to be a doctor? Well, he skipped his internship. Your sunglasses, General? Thank you, Doctor. And so the British finally assaulted Bunker Hill. We not only saved the American army, but we coined a new phrase. New phrase? Yes. I think what we did with those sunglasses was definitely a frame-up, don't you? you weren't with us last time, Rocky and Bullwinkle located the missing weather lady. There she is, Bullwinkle, and Boris must have been the thief who stole her. The plan to get her back was simple. Bullwinkle would get Boris's attention, Rocky would then short the light circuit. In the darkness, Bullwinkle would grab the weather lady and take her ashore. It was as simple as that. Alas, so was Bullwinkle. So your name is Colonel Beauregard, yeah? That's right, sir, of the Bull Weevil Beauregards. Boris, that is Moose. No. Yes. I thought maybe it was Miles Standish. Maybe you're right. Natasha, go get gone in one bullet. Don't get two bullets. For why? I might use second bullet on you know who. <laughs> Sorry for all the chit chat, Colonel. Now, how would you like to make a bet? You bet. No, we did that one last time, didn't we? Here you are. What's that, piggy bank? Pig in a poke, y'all know. Okay, here is five cards. What you got? Five cards, just like you said. See, how'd you do that? Do what? Deal me five cards and know how many I had. Good thing I brought my mother seals along. Please, Moose, uh, Mr. Beauregard, what cards you hold? A king high. Straight? No, just a king high. And there's four of them. Too bad. I didn't win. No, I got a potsy. A potsy? Two threes and the joker. That beats four kings? On this boat it does. Yeah. By this time, Rocky had found the master light switch, and Natasha had found an elephant gun. Both went into action at the same instant. <laughs> well, you think Otto Priminger made an exodus, huh? In less than ten seconds, the good ship Sands Hotel was devoid of any activity, except, of course, for the captain and the first mate. Darling, what happened? Natasha, you came this close to hitting Moose. This close? I must have hit someone else then. I'm going to be a sport and give you three guesses. Oh, no, Boris, not. It wasn't. He couldn't. Ah, oh, go get needle and thread. While Boris is getting to the seat of his troubles, we'll peek in on Rocky, who is waiting anxiously on shore. Sure wish Bullwinkle would get here, and I hope he has... Hiya, Rocky! Gosh, am I glad to see you. Did you get the weather lady? She's right here, tucked under my... Was then they noticed an alteration in the lady in the booth. She's gone robot on us. Bullwinkle, you grabbed a phone booth. Taking advantage of the situation, Rocky telephoned Boris. Listen, Foxy Squirrel, I wouldn't sell New Dealer for all the tea in bags. Hmm? How much? Fifty dollars tax-free. Hold still. His deal. Send Moose over with money. That's fifty smackaroonies I didn't expect to get. You really sell blonde in booth for fifty bucks. Does money grow on radishes? Suspecting that Boris might pull a fast one, Rocky insisted that the transaction take place in the center of town in front of a few hundred southern gentlemen. Okay, the money's in this sack. And weather lady is in envelope. You stuffed her into that tiny envelope. Kind of hard to believe. Hey, what's coming off here? Key is in here. Key to safety deposit box in depot. Safety deposit box has weather lady. I don't know, 
Oh, that seems like a pretty... Oh, hold still, Boris. There is a mosquito on your cheek. And the moose made a deft swipe. Missed. But the men standing on the sides didn't. Slapped his face. And that gentleman means a duel. Well, this was an unforeseen development. Don't miss our next installment, unhappily entitled Duel Controls, or put it in second. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. To sum it all up, this fortune-telling machine predicted the weather for Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Four lines means it's going to be cloudy. Cloudy in more ways than one, for the jerk of all trades, Boris Badanov... ...and faithful Indian companion, Natasha... ...kidnapped the card machine and set it up in the main salon of Boris's showboat, recently rechristened the Sands Hotel. He's worth a gamble, I always say. Rocky and Bullwinkle tried their darndest to get the weather lady back, and eventually it came down to an out-and-out -out trade. Fifty dollars for the weather lady. It's a deal. And no funny stuff. That's the way it's been so far. Rocky insisted the transaction be held in front of witnesses. Thus, in the middle of Main Street... Here's the money, now where's the... Look out, there's a skeeter in our midst. Actually, it was on Boris's cheek. Well, when the gentleman lining the streets of this southern community viewed that... Struck him in the face, sir. This calls for a settlement on the field of honor. Or in layman's language, a duel. The following morning at dawn, in a quiet field, the opposing parties met. But I thought a duel meant goodbye in French. Quiet, Bullwinkle, and let me think of a way out of this mess. Mr. Badenov, as your second, let me wish you the best of luck. That's very big of you, I'm sure. You're not frightened, are you? Who, me? Listen, Georgie Porgy, my favorite composer is Noel Coward. Yes, neither Bullwinkle nor Boris wanted any part of this affair. But when in Rome... You'll take uh, ten paces, turn, and fire at will. And you can see the kind of a show this is when we don't pun an obvious setup like that. One, two, three, four, five, 
Six. Well, it was such a beautiful day that everyone forgot about the duel. Rocky, the second, and the judge had a picnic. 42, 43, 44. As for Bullwinkle and Boris, they just kept walking. The whole thing blew over, and once more, our heroes attempted to purchase the weather lady. Oh, boy, are my legs stiff. Here's your $50. And here is envelope containing key which unlocks safety deposit box containing weather lady. Alas, it contained a key that unlocked the safety deposit box, all right, but the weather lady wasn't in it. Say, so can't the fella run a room around here with any privacy? That does it. It sure does. Now I'm mad. And when a flying squirrel gets mad... Three dollars and eighty cents between us. That's not enough. But, Winkle, we gotta raise more money. They dug ditches, performed on street corners, scrubbed floors, sold magazine subscriptions. Now how much do we have? Three dollars and eighty-five cents. Yes, the wage scale then was unfortunately low, as were the lad's spirit. And that's when the circus hit town. Wanted high platform diver. That's me, Bullwinkle. The plucky squirrel gave three performances a day. <laughs> Remember when we used to do this in the title rock? And so, when the Diggling Brothers Circus left town, Rocky and Bullwinkle had earned well over a thousand dollars. Well, we did it, Rock. But what did we do it for? You'll see. Come on. The Sands Hotel was jammed with customers, all taking the customary shellacking from the weather lady, when the squirrel plopped the money on the table. One thousand one hundred dollars and fifteen cents that Miss Booth there can be beaten. Well, it's obvious Rocky has a plan in mind. What that plan is will be revealed in our next exciting episode, They Didn't Pick Up Our Option, or Showdown. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? Of our special fairy tales. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red who had an exclusive shop in the Hollywoods where she sold riding hoods. That's why they call me Red Riding Hood. Cute. One day, a very wealthy customer entered her shop. Oh, boy. Uh, yes, madam, may I help you? I should like to buy a wolfskin riding hood. Wolfskin? Yes. Well, perhaps madam would like to try on this matte shrewskin hood. No, thank you. This lemming with lima lining? No. Here's the latest thing from Africa, genuine number one boy. Now, see here, young lady, I want a wolfskin riding hood. Money is no object. I shall be here at three o'clock to pick it up. My, 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 three o'clock. That certainly didn't give Red much time, but she had to get a wolfskin somewhere. Hello? Give me the city zoo. What's that? Uh, no, sorry, lady. We got no extra wolves at this time. Perhaps if you care to call back next spring? Meanwhile, not too far away, a mother wolf was calling to her son. Walter! Yes, Mama, honey? I want you to take this basket to Grandma's house right away. But she was here only yesterday and took a whole basket of stuff. I know, but she forgot her teeth. Now, you don't want Granny to have to sit over there and gum her goodies, do you? Good heavens, no! Give me the basket! Remember now, Walter, you must go through the Hollywoods. Don't you worry, Mama Honey. I'll be careful. And with that, the wolf was on his way to Granny's. Time was growing very short when Red looked out of the window and saw the wolf skipping happily up the street. Oh, what luck! A wolf on the hoof! And off she dashed to intercept the unsuspecting Walter. Buddy, uh, you are a wolf, aren't you? Yeah, isn't that keen? I've been a wolf. Hey, wait a minute. You're a little red riding hood. Yeah, isn't that keen? My mama honey warned me about you. Oh, don't be so touchy. Look, I got a rich customer who'll pay a thousand dollars for a pelt like yours. Really? Sure. So how about selling me your skin? I'll give you ten percent. Well, 
Now, what's the matter? You crazy or something? Man, Walter slipped out of Red's clutches and ran for his life. Red's proposition didn't appeal to him at all. No, I, I figure that skin is worth at least 90% right where it is. Now, there were only 20 minutes left, and Red had to act fast, so she did. A few blocks further on, Walter was stopped by an attractive sign. Get acquainted, offer, free haircuts, today only. Well, I don't know how to work is, but the price is right. Oh, give me a flat top. Leave the sideburns out and we'll skip the conversation. Okay, I'm a do just a like you say. Yeah, that's a pretty cheesy accent you got there. And a horse feel. I don't want to ruin the sleeves. The sleeves? <gasps> You're Red Riding Hood. Oh, darn, I was hoping you wouldn't notice. And again, the wolf dashed away in fright. Come back! All right, I'll give you 30%! Time was running out fast now. There just had to be a way to catch that wolf off guard, and her only chance of doing that was to beat the wolf to Granny's house. The shortcut the wolf took was really the shortest way to Granny's, but it takes longer because that's the freeway. He was bound to be tied up at the cloverleaf for some time. Soon Red arrived at Granny's house and... What luck! Nobody home. She hurried inside, used an old bearskin rug to disguise herself as Granny, hopped into bed, and with only three minutes left to go, the wolf approached Granny's house. Do -de do -de do 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 But on the way, he had been doing a little thinking. Why, a thousand dollars for a wolf skin. I sure could use that kind of money. But where would I get a wolf skin to sell to that rich lady besides my own personal pelt? Come in! Hi, Granny Honey! I brought you... Granny! What beautiful big blue eyes you have! All the better to see you with, my dear. Granny! What beautiful high-quality fur you have! Then it struck him. Granny, wolf skin, a thousand dollars. Oh, come now! Would I sell my own grandmother for a measly thousand dollars? I don't know. Would you? Of course I would. Wait, what are you doing? You forgot the what big teeth bit. No time for that now. I'm on my way to become a thousandaire. And so, shortly after three o'clock on that very afternoon, a very satisfied customer was seen leaving the little fur shop in the Hollywood. It's simply stunning on you, madam. Oh, thank you. I'll wear it every moment. I'll never take it off. Shush! And the wolf? Well, he went into the fur business for himself, and from the looks of things, he was to live happily ever after. Hello, Mater. Walter here. Could you get hold of Uncle Louis, Sid, Herman, and Al, and meet me on the road to Grandma's and say, half an hour? <laughs> Friends, today we benefit from my highly successful book, How to Teach a Mean Bully a Lesson at the Beach. First, it is essential to find a lovely young girl in front of whom you can show off by defending her honor. Pardon me, lovely lady, but I wish to defend your honor should a big, rough, mean, loathsome bully kick sand in your eyes and... <coughs> Which brings us to point two. Always be careful in selecting a real lady to defend. Ah, here's a real one. Now, we wait for a bully to come by and kick sand. Notice how I allow him to build up a false sense of security by pretending to ignore him. Now comes the really meaty part. See, for three months I study my book, How to Teach a Mean Bully a Lesson at the Beach. And now I'm ready. Pardon me, young lady, but should a bully come along, I am prepared to defend your honor. Notice that a bully is approaching. Pardon me, sir, but you are a kid. You threw sand at us, and I am prepared to teach you a lesson you will never forget. Ooh. Well, I lost the battle, but I've gained a friend. Right, little lady? Gosh, Mr. Know-it-all, looks like your book was a failure. No, Rock, it was a brilliant success. Success? Sure, look, that's the book she's been reading. <laughs> Thank you.
It was a fine spring day in the Canadian Northwest, and Dudley Do-Right was in the best of spirits. dum dee dum 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 I feel so tippy-top today, full of pep and raring to go. I just know today will be the day I will bring in Arch, Phil, and Snidely Whiplash to justice. Feeling pretty good, eh, Dudley? Mm, goody, goody, good, good, good. But, Dudley, it's been 23 years that you've been trying to bring in Snidely Whiplash, and you haven't succeeded yet. Well, Nell, as I've said before, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. The trouble with you is you've lost your incentive, and when a mountie has lost his incentive, it's time to turn in his coat. I was feeling so good a minute ago, but now I've got all the incentive any red-blooded, red-coated Canadian youth would want, the RCMP. But that isn't enough, Dudley. You have to have the feeling of being wanted. That is why I want you to wear this locket close to your heart. Open it, Dudley. You see, Dudley, it has a picture of me. Gee, thanks, no? Incentive, Dudley. I hope this little token of my love will make you remember. Don't tell anyone. It will be our secret. Dudley, when an officer of the RCMP enters the room, it is military courtesy to rise. But I am, sir. You are, sir, what? Rise, sir. Ooh, what's the matter, boy? You're all stupid. Oh, no, sir, Inspector. I've always walked like this. Well, do right. I have information that will start your Mountie Hut pounding. Snidely Whiplash is planning to rob the bank. It's your big chance at last. Oh, is that, sir? Snidely Whiplash. Is that the chap with the mustache and the long black cape? Snidely Whiplash, do right. The arch villain that you've been trying to bring in for the last 23 years. What's the matter, Dudley? Have you lost your incentive? No, sir. I have it right here. Meanwhile, Snidely Whiplash was in the best of evil spirits. Such a beautiful, gorgeous day. I haven't lifted a finger, and already Nell Fenwick has fallen into me clutches. Snidely Whiplash, you poor, poor man. What poor? I'm feeling great, and you, Nell, have fallen into me clutches. If you like, Snidely, but it does seem a shame. What's a shame? Twenty-three years. Twenty-three years? Yes, for twenty-three years you've been pursued by Dudley Do-Right of the Mountain. That's right, and he hasn't brought me in yet. Hunted, hounded, forced to skulk about the Canadian in countryside like like some kind of furtive beast. Twenty-three years. Stop already. But it's understandable. What's understandable? That after twenty-three years, you would lose your incentive. I was feeling so good a minute ago. Incentive? Yes, Nidley, but don't worry. Wear this locket close to your heart. It has a picture of me inside. Do you think it will help now? Well, don't tell anyone I gave it to you. It will be our secret. Gee, thanks, now. And here I always thought you for the good guy. Snidely, have you considered taking setting up exercises? You gotta do something about your posture. Man, you're stupid. Not at all, Homer. I've always walked like this. What's on the schedule today? Oh, we got a gym dandy every day today, Snidely. Well, get on with it. Well, at 11 o'clock, we tie that woman down by the bluff to the railroad tracks. Now, Homer, could you handle that? I'm just not up to tying women to railroad tracks. At 12 o'clock, you're supposed to foreclose some mortgages. Now, where will it all end, Homer? Railroad tracks, mortgages. Gee, Snidely, you sound like you've lost your incentive. Of course I haven't lost my incentive. I've got my incentive. Incentive right here. What was that? Nothing, Homer. Carry on. And there's the bank. Oh, yes, the bank. You, we're supposed to deposit money in the bank, Homer. We are not supposed to deposit money in a bank whiplash. We are supposed to rob the bank. You sure you ain't lost your incentive to lead a life of evil doing? I told you, Homer. I've got my incentive right here. Jeez it. Here comes Dudley Do-Right of the mountain. Is that you, Snidely? Oh, yes. What brings you to town, Dudley? Well, I had a reason. But for the life of me, I can't think what it was. How about you? It's something to do with the bank. I can't seem to remember whether I was supposed to deposit some money or withdraw some. Mm -hmm. I, I know how that is. What's the matter with you guys? Mortal enemies, and here you stand. You guys lost your incentive or something? Of, of course, course not. not. I, I have, have it right here. You're wearing Nell's locket. <laughs> Would have been ashamed to see those boys lose their incentive after 23 years.
Well, we're running into the home stretch, and still Rocky and Bullwinkle have not regained possession of the fortune-telling machine. We've been cheated, bamboozled, and hornswoggled. Sounds like a law firm. Fortunately, a circus came to town, and this gave the little squirrel an idea. With the money we could earn working for the circus, we could get the weather lady back. And there are those today who still rave about the Dingaling Brothers' high diving act. Laura, that's effective. Sure is. Mighty talented squirrel. Squirrel, I was looking at that platform. Well, by the time the circus left town, our heroes were financially solvent. One thousand dollars and change. And now we'll try and buy the weather lady back again, correct? Incorrect. That evening, Rocky entered the gambling salon of Betanov's gambling showboat and issued a challenge. I'll bet a thousand dollars she can be beaten. Well, well, it's little bad Penny who always turns up. So you want to make a bet, huh? Okie dokie, here is cards. Just a minute. If I win, I don't want to be paid off in cash. What color stamps you like? If I win, you gotta give the weather lady back to Frost by fall. You must be kidding. Boris, what you got to lose? Blonde always win. Squirrel is bet. Here is cards. Wait a minute. My challenger hasn't arrived yet. Challenger? You got train coming in here? No, it wasn't a train, but it was operating under a full head of steam. Yes, into the room came Bullwinkle, pulling, of all things, another fortune-telling machine. The great predictor tells all. Hey, what is this? According to this newspaper clipping, you challenged anybody or anything to play Miss Ruth Booth here. Boris would have protested had it not been for the customers who insisted he follow through. This must be final episode. Squirtle always gets best of me in end. Okay, start your machine first. There wasn't a relaxed nerve in the house as the man in the booth shuffled and extracted not one, but four kings. We need four aces, darling. Four unmitigated aces. We need our own show. That's what we need. Okay, here goes something. The weather lady performed like a champion. She shuffled, cut, and then proceeded to extract four aces from the deck. One, two. And then it happened. She began shuffling and cutting like a demon. Cards flew everywhere. It happened, just like I figured. Who built this thing, Colin Clive? Don't you see? The other machine was too much for her. She fell in love. No, I see the light. He didn't for long. Boris and Natasha each grabbed a machine and in the darkness managed to lower a lifeboat into the water. Row, Natasha, row. With these two, we can breed a whole new race of dealers. Boris, sign on boat, say capacity 500 pounds. So what? You, me, and two lovey doveys here. Don't weigh that. No, but bag full of ill-gotten gains does. And so as the setting lifeboat sinks into the sea, we bid a fond but reluctant farewell to this part of our story and pick it up in Frostbite Falls some two months later. Sure missed the weather lady. She was downright attractive. This one's just as accurate, though. Hmm. Paradeuces. Paradeuces? That means variable high fogginess gradually clearing by two in the morning, providing it don't rain. Bullwinkle, how's it going? Not bad, Rock. Card's a little sticky, though. Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bowling!
Frankel and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wait to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. Captain Harvey Blood and Viscera Lincolnferter certainly knew what he was talking about when he cried... War is heck! For moments later, he was blown to smithereens while making a run for it during the Battle of San Juan Capistrano. <laughs> Captain Lincolnferter was a hero. We can't all be heroes, but it's perfectly legal to have a hero. What have you got there, Rock? It's my Bullwinkle scrapbook, Bullwinkle. In here, I keep a record of your heroic feats. Come on now, Rocky. My feats aren't heroic. Big, maybe, but not heroic. Just the same, you're my hero, Bullwinkle. Don't you have a hero? Well, I'm only human, of course I do. Who is it? Same one as you, me. That may seem silly, but as Bullwinkle just said, it's only human to have a hero. That's right. Here I am only part human, and even I got hero. Boris, why are you all the time playing with your finger scar nose doll? I just told you, he's my hero. I don't got no namby pamby hero like Squirrel. I got real crummy, rotten, evil, unclean stinker, public enemy number one for hero. Oh, he's nice to have somebody you can look up to, darling. Skarnos has been my hero since the time he turned his own mother in for the reward. Yes, it figures that Boris Badenov would choose Finger Skarnos as his hero. For even as a baby, Skarnos had strong bad guy tendencies. Let's look at the record. Finger Skarnos was born just below the Lower East Side in a section called Hex Kitchen. And when Skarnos was only six weeks old... I'm telling you, Mama, the kid is a bad seed. He's a fink clear through. What kid's that, Papa? Our kid, Fingers, that's who. How can you say such things, Papa? The kid is only six weeks old. It's easy to say things like that. I just went in to kiss him goodnight, and he tried to roll me. That was only the beginning. As Scarnose grew older, he took the stealing hubcaps with the cars still stuck to them. At the age of four, he hijacked a diaper truck, but they couldn't pin a thing on him. He learned to lie, cheat, steal, and make zip guns. And then one day, Skarnos fell in with a bad crowd. Go on, go on. Tell him how he graduated from reform school at the head of his class. He graduated from reform school at the head of his class. That's right. He was magna cum lousy. As everybody knew he would, Finger Skarnos grew from early hoodlumhood into full-grown gangsterhood. Today, he is a mature punk, Mr. Crime himself, kingpin of the underworld. And he is my very own hero. Please don't get so excited, darling. I want to be just like Skarnos when I grow up. You are grown up, Boris. Now quiet and listen. In a recent report at a fact-finding committee, Claire Luce Booth stated that... It's been common knowledge for years that Finger Skarnos is a dastardly criminal. Why hasn't he been flung into prison? Yes, why? Perhaps a DA can answer that. We can't get anything on them. You know, handcuffs, leg irons, things like that. Why not? We've never been able to get anybody to testify against him. You mean there's never been a witness against Finger Scarnos? Oh, yes. The East River's full of them. No, oh, then our hands are tied. So were the witnesses. Does this mean that Finger Scarnos will go on and on making millions through his criminal activities? Will there never be a witness brave enough... Or stupid enough... ...to testify against Finger Scarnos? Be sure to learn the spine-chilling answer to that in our next episode entitled Bullwinkle Sneaks a Peak or There's Room in the River.
Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. That's capital P-I-double-G-S. Yes, yes, of course. These three little pigs, Portland, Penelope, and Alice, were sisters who lived together in a cunning little house, or they did for a while, anyway. Is this the pig residence? Capital P-I-double-G, pig. That's it, lady. Yes, it is. Got a singing telegram for you. <clears throat> Put on the skillet, put on the lid. Your rich uncle just wound up dead. What? That ain't all, I tell you true. He left a million bucks to you. Oh, great. And all the little piggies got moolah, moolah. All the little piggies got moolah now. Collect. Yes, the pig sisters were now rich beyond their wildest dreams, and the first thing they decided to do was... Move out of this cunning little house. So, in a very short time, as these things go, each of the three girls had built a mansion of her own. Portland's was of straw, Penelope's was of sticks, and Alice's of solid brick. Of course, the news of their fortune spread far and wide and finally reached the ears of one Henry Q. Wolfe. Now, there was just one thing that Henry Q. Wolfe wanted in life. I want to live in the big mansion, and this looks just like my chance. That was it. Of course, Henry would never think of getting a job and working to get rich. Ooh, perish forbid. So he planned to marry one of the pig sisters and get rich for free. Oh, he was a rascal. True, true. Oh, true. So one day, Henry arrived at the door of Portland Pig. Now, let's see. Method one, the continental approach. Yes, I, I'll simply sweep her off her feet. Romance-wise, that is. Yes, who is it? Ah, Sacre Bleu. What is it? Your beauty is absolutely breathtaking. Oh, really? Ah, Cherie, may I entrance? Uh, well, I... Merci beaucoup. Oh, what a charming place you have here. Imported straw. Am I wrong? Am I right? No. Wait a minute. Who are you? And... Allow me to introduce myself, my little pork chop. Count Henry Q. Wolf. My friends call me Hank. You can call me Hanky. Well, it looked as if Portland would surely be his victim. He whispered sweet nothings in her ear. Nothing, 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 and likewise nothing. He recited poetry to her. Roses are red, violets are blue. You have a cute little nose, and I do too. <laughs> He played the piano. He even showed a keen interest in good books. Oh, this man has a soul. Portland seemed most impressed, and Henri, uh, <clears throat> Henry, felt that now was the time to pop the question. Ah, uh, Portland, my petit cochon, will you marry me and make me the rich, <laughs> happiest man in the world? Portland's answer came quickly. No! Oh, you play the hard to get. <laughs> I ask you again. No! Would you like to think it over till tomorrow? I guess not. But if you thought this dampened Henry's spirits, you'd be wrong. Sure, there's still two sisters left, you know. So Henry dashed right over to Penelope's house. Let's see now, method two, the caveman approach. Yes, who is it? Okay, beautiful, step aside, I'm coming in. Hmm, got the place done in early American stick, eh? Nice, I guess. But I'm gonna make a few changes around here, baby. See here, what do you want? Just you, that's all, honey bunch. I've made up my mind. You're gonna marry me, baby. How do you like them apples? Obviously, she didn't like them apples. Now, Henry had only one chance left, and he hurried to Alice's house. Method three, the all-out approach. Oh, boy, this one's bound to work. Yes, what do you... I love you, I love you, I adore you, I worship you, I can't live without you. Yes, but I... Please, please say you'll marry me. But... Please, please, please. Well, all right, You but... said yes. Yes, you said yes. Oh, oh, dear rich Alice, you've made me so wealthy, happy. But I... No time for buts, my pet. Come, let us fly together now. Well, they were married immediately, and they set off for a whirlwind honeymoon at Niagara Falls. Look, Alice, you see all the water? Yes, but That's I... enough, that's enough. <laughs> Let's go. And away they went back home, for the wolf couldn't wait to start living in the big brick mansion. Ah, this is the life, eh, hey, Alice? Will you listen to me, loudmouth? I'm not... Cassandra! Cassandra, would you come here, please? Coming, madam. I thought your name was Alice. That's what I've been trying to tell you. That's rich Alice Pig in there. I'm Cassandra. Her poverty-stricken maid, you silly thing. Well, mistakes will happen. I'll just... I'm also your wife, you worm. Get in here. But Cassandra, ow, honey, I, ow, ow. Now, of course, every fairy tale must have a happy ending, so naturally, Henry did get to live in the big brick house surrounded by wealth, but not quite in the way that he'd thought. Yes, sir. Whom, shall I say, is calling whom? Whom?
How to be a human fly. First, we need A, a tall building, and B, a courageous moose. That's me. And thirdly, or seedly, human fly suction cups. Available at all local suction cup stores everywhere. Then all you have to do is climb up the side, touch the flag at the top, and win a prize. <laughs> then, too, there is the stick the things on the building and start from there method, which is fine as long as you have a smooth, dry surface to cling to. Now that the smooth, dry surface has smoothed and dried, there is nothing that can preclude you successfully reaching the top. And... Which brings up the problem of building superintendents. It sometimes becomes necessary to actually look like a fly and simply walk up the stairs to the top. And thus failing, there is always the fire escape, which not only offers protection from the building superintendent, but affords maximum protection in case of fire. And there you have it. Hey, Mr. Nordo, you made it. What's next? Next? Oh, yes, I salute. Should have used the other hand. Gosh, that's too bad, Mr. Nordo. If you touched the flag, what would your human fly prize have been anyway? The prize, the prize. Oh, yes, I remember. A human fly swatter. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? <laughs> Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. <laughs> Peabody here. Sherman there. Say hello, Sherman. Hello, Sherman. <laughs> you may dispense with the levity, Sherman. Yes, Mr. Peabody. Today we shall journey back into time to reveal the true story behind one of history's greatest archers, William Tell. Set the way back for November 18th in the year 1307. Got it. The place, Switzerland, near the community of Uri. All set. Let's go. In the twinkling of an eye, Sherman and I were whisked back in time to a small Swiss village. Keen way to travel, huh, Mr. Peabody? Now what? Well, today is the day the tyrannical Austrian governor, Gessler, has ordered William Tell to shoot an apple from the head of his son. Now we must find just where this event is to take place. I, I beg your pardon, young man, but could you tell us... Don't stop me now, mister. i got to get out of this country before I get killed. Get killed? My word, who would want to kill a little fellow like you? My papa, he's going to shoot me with an arrow. Arrow? Your father wouldn't happen to be William Tell, would he? Yeah, and he... You, Joey, where are you? Uh-oh, here he comes now. So, here you are, Joey, my son. I've been looking all over for you, kid. I happen to be Mr. Peabody. This is my boy, Sherman. Hi. And that is your little boy, Joey. And that is the reason I've got to leave the country. Papa broke his glasses and can't see a thing. Golly, if he can't see without his glasses, he could never hit an apple on Joey's head, Mr. Peabody. Oh, don't worry. I got it all figured out. Just how I'm going to do it. Come on, I'll show you. With that, William Tell directed us to a small orchard not far away, and... Now, you see this apple tree here? The tree is over there. Oh. Yes, we see it. Well, I put every kind of plant food known to man on that tree, and look what happened. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, the apples on that tree are as big as watermelons. That's right. With an apple as big as that on my Joey's head, I can't miss. Hmm, the theory seems correct, but I'm not too sure. Well, give me a hand, Sherman, and we shall see. Sherman and I lifted one of the huge apples and placed it upon the boy's head. But just as I had feared... <laughs> The weighty wine sap squashed the poor boy flat to the ground. As you can see, the Big Apple might be a popular dance, but as a solution to our problem, it's a dismal failure. Come, we shall try another approach. Taking William Tell back 100 paces from the target, I decided to see if I could direct him into a true aim. Uh, talk him in, so to speak. A little more to your right. That's it. Now higher. Higher. A bit more. Steady. Fire! How did I did? It's best you don't know, William. 
Uh oh, here comes the tyrannical Austrian governor, Gessler. So, here you are, William Tell. Are you ready to start me to shooting? No, you'll have to call the whole thing off, tyrannical Austrian governor Gessler. You see... Quiet, Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Tell will be ready in, say, 15 minutes. Good, we're gonna be waiting. Boy, I'm sure glad I ain't gonna be in your shoes, kid. <laughs> but Mr. Peabody... No, but, Chairman... History demands this event take place. But have no fear, for I, naturally, have a plan. What kind of a plan? No time to explain now, Sherman. I shall return directly. Moments later, I arrived on the scene bearing a very special apple that I had selected for the target, and I placed it upon Joey's head. Mr. Peabody, wh what's that? That, Sherman, is an apple. But it's so small. Perhaps, but the best I could do on such short notice. Ladies and gentlemen, you is now gonna see William Tell, who is way over there, try to shoot an apple off the head of this scared little kid who is over here. For the time being, anyway. Is you ready, Willie? Yes, yeah, sure. Then let her rip. <laughs> But you took an awful chance letting him try, Mr. Peabody. I leave nothing to chance, Sherman. You see, I took care to place this powerful little magnet inside the apple so the metal arrowhead would be attracted directly to it. He couldn't possibly have missed. Gosh, Mr. Peabody, that was brilliant. I know. So that's how William Tell became a famous Swiss hero. And because of his poor eyesight, a cause of eye trouble was named after him. A cause for eye trouble was named after William Tell? What's that, Mr. Peabody? Why? Television, of course, Sherman. If you should put them side by side, you would quickly see that there is a vast difference between Rocket J. Squirrel and Boris Badenov. Of course, there is a big difference. Squirrel has blue eyes. But the biggest difference is that Rocky, being true of heart, looks up to Bullwinkle as his hero. That's right, because I am trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and stupid. Bullwinkle is also full of integrity. I am not. I always tell the truth. Boris, on the other hand, looks up to the most successful and dastardly <laughs> criminal in the country as his hero. Fingers, Scarnos. Right, because Scarnos is untrustworthy, disloyal, not helpful, unfriendly, rude, unkind, bad boy, sarpus, crooked, cowardly, dirty, and would sell his own mother for a nickel. Fingers, Scarnos operates right out in the open. He and his criminal activities have been going on for years. And so far, the law has been unable to do anything about it. If I only had a witness to testify against Scarnos, he'd go up the river for 40, 50, maybe 60 days. Chief? We've got a witness. At last, send him in immediately. Impossible. How come? We can't get the cement off his feet. Can this go on forever? You bet your blue booties it will. Nobody will ever put the finger on fingers. Is there no one who will testify against this blight on the nose of society? Is there not a hero who will step forward and bravely say, I will do it. You'll do what? I will go down to the store and pick up a bag of onions. What for? For this peanut butter pound cake I'm baking. The only way I can get it to weigh a pound is to put onions in it. Okay, but don't be gone too long, Bullwinkle. And with no further fooling around, Bullwinkle hurried out of the house and down the street toward the onion store. At the very same instant, Boris and Natasha hurried out of their hideout and ambled along until they finally came to rest in front of the big house on 92nd Street. Here we are, honey bun. This is the house of my hero, Scarnos. Some class, eh? Yes, darling. But why are we here? To get autograph. What else? And look, Natasha, a little something I bet you didn't know I got. What is it, sweetie? Yeast mold? No, his lack of hair from Scarno's. Mm. He's still using that greasy kid stuff. By that time, it was 1.30, the exact time that Scarno, surrounded by his trusted Finks, always left the house to pull a job. It was then that a sickening turn of events took place. The big black getaway car pulled up in front of the local bank. Hey! 
And Scarnose and his mob dashed inside to hold it up. The sickening part is that Bullwinkle's destination, the onion shop, was right next to the bank. Do -do 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 -do. The onion-seeking moose went into the onion shop and immediately came out carrying a bag of onions. For as we all know, it doesn't take long to pick up a bag of onions. Bullwinkle found himself directly in front of the bank just as the holdup went into full swing. My, the mosquitoes are out early this year. I had better take a cab, or I'll be a mass of angry red welts by the time I get home. Mistaking the getaway car for a taxi, the confused moose got inside, followed closely by Scarnose and his getaway-minded mob. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Scarnose did it again. Never mind trying to get the money back. Just find a witness. Watch for a black getaway car with a moose inside. It is believed the moose is a witness. Hokey smoke a moose? There's only one moose I know of around here, and that's Bullwinkle. Will Scarnose and his thugs notice that a moose is in the car with them? Will they realize that Bullwinkle is a witness? Don't let anything keep you from our next episode entitled <laughs> The Half-Shot Moose or Testify My Eye. <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. say that our last episode was a total loss, for as you remember, we learned beyond a doubt that Bullwinkle really takes the cake when it comes to baking a cake. What do you mean, where are the onions? I thought you were baking a cake, Bullwinkle. Well, pity sakes, I am. The mess here in the kitchen should tell you that. You put onions in a cake. Doesn't everybody? No, and we're out of onions. You used the last one on your cornflakes this morning. Darn. Now I will have to trot down to the onion store and get some. I wish Bullwinkle would stop eating so many onions. They might hurt his stomach. Indeed, they might hurt the moose's stomach. In fact, going after those onions might hurt the entire moose to the extent that he is killed dead. For when Bullwinkle left the onion shop with a bag of Bermudas, he passed directly in front of the bank, which at the time was being severely robbed by none other than the notorious Finger Scarnos. 
Good heavens! I wonder why there are so many mosquitoes here in front of the bank. I will avoid their little stingers by taking a cab home. Mistaking the getaway car in front of the bank for a taxi, Bullwinkle got inside, followed closely by Finger Scarnos and his getaway-minded mob. Calling all cars, Finger Scarnos just robbed the bank again. Be on the lookout for a getaway car with a confused moose in it. A getaway car with a confused what in it? Confused moose in it, that is all. Gee, that's got to be Bullwinkle, and he's in trouble. I gotta save him. With that, the plucky squirrel shot into the air to search the city in hopes of finding Bullwinkle in time. But time was rapidly running out, for in the speeding getaway car below... My, look at all of that money. What did you fellas do, rob a bank or something? <laughs> oh, a witness, eh? Let them have it, boys. In an instant, every gun in the gangster-infested car was being pointed at Bullwinkle and his bag of onions. Fortunately, it is difficult to hit even something big as a moose while riding in a speeding getaway car. But though Bullwinkle was left unpunctured, his bag of onions was shot to pieces, filling the car with onion juice. <laughs> <laughs> Just like with East Lynn, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Driving with tears in their eyes, the car spun out of control. At the corner of 42nd and Broadway, Bullwinkle was thrown clear and onto the pavement. Pokey smoke! A moose just fell out of that car down there! It must be Bullwinkle! Rocky zoomed to the side of his fallen friend and was a greatly relieved squirrel to find him unscratched. I may be unscratched, but I got a large bump on my antlers. That makes me a seven-pointer. Bullwinkle, do you know what happened? Well, of course I know what happened. Uh, what? You are a witness to one of Finger Scarno's crimes. I am? Yes, and now you can testify and send Scarno's to prison forever. See, that's right. But what about the overcoat? What overcoat? The cement overcoat Mr. Scarno's will put on me when he finds out. Will you let me worry about that? How comforting. At last, there is a witness against Finger Scarno's, and hot information like that is mighty hard to keep a secret. By that afternoon, every newspaper in the country carried the story. X-ray, X-ray, read all about the moose who's going to sing Scarno's into Sing Sing. Boy, I wouldn't want to be in that moose's shoes. The moose's wear shoes? Okay, so I wouldn't want to be in his hoofs. Who would? Nobody would. Anybody want to buy some moose hoofs cheap? Will Bullwinkle live long enough to be quizzed by the DA? Be with us next time for Whatever Happened to Joel Copperman? Or Get That Quiz Kid! And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle! Oh, dear! Three at once! One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Somebody give you a hot foot, did they, boy? Gosh, no, Pop. I was just trying to jump up there and get one of those big juicy apples out of the tree. Oh, say, they do look good, but I'm afraid you'll never get one by jumping for it. However, if we work together, we can both get one of those apples. Well, how's that, Pop? By using this ladder. Gee, I don't know. That ladder's awful rickety. That, my boy, is why we must work together. Now, you hold the ladder up so that it won't fall, and I'll climb up to get the apples. Okay, I got it. Go ahead. Here's one. I'll toss it down to you. I'll catch it. Junior, you left your post. Would it help to say I'm sorry? Not very much. This certainly goes to prove what I always say. United we stand, divided we fall. Every time? Of course, every time. The perfect example of that is the story of the fox and the minks. Now, listen, I'll tell you about it. Once there lived three little minks who, as little minks go, were very, very happy. Hey, Mushhead, are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. You happy? I'm happy. Is he happy? Are you happy? Of course I'm happy. I'm happier than you are. Now shut up and listen. And so it was. For minks, they really were quite happy. That is, until one day when a very clever fox who had gone into the world to make his fortune came into the forest. Ah, I mean luck. 
Methinks I see Minx. And this made him very happy. Get zooks, but I'm happy. For he had decided that in order to make his fortune, he would catch Minx and sell them for the making of fur coats. And off he dashed to capture the poor, unsuspecting little Minx, who at this point were still very happy. Gee, I'm happy. Me too. You happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Are you happy? Fox is the name, and my, but you'll make a fine sleeve. Hey, fellas, here's a hot one. This is a fox who's gonna make a sleeve out of me. Nyah, nyah, nyah. Fox! And this, of course, made the three little minks very unhappy, for now they were forced to flee for their very life. Quick as minks, they sped to the safety of a hollow stump. But alas, the fox proved to be too fast for them. Ha-ha! <laughs> From that moment on, the minx didn't have a minute's peace. The tireless fox was on their heels at every turn. Finally, just when all seemed lost, they managed to reach the protection of their burrow and quickly held a meeting to see what might be done about their desperate situation. What are we gonna do? We can't even go out to look for food or the fox will get us. And besides that, I'm not happy anymore. Quiet, both of you. I got a plan. A plan? Yeah. If we work together, we can go anywhere we want to, and the fox can never touch us. Now, here's what we'll do. All we gotta do is walk with the A light fox. burned all night in the mink's hole as they worked on their plan. And by morning, they were ready. Bursting with confidence, they marched out of their burrow. Hop, two, three, four. Hop, two, three, four. And the sly old fox, who had been lying in wait for just such a chance as this, sprang to the attack. <laughs> But much to his surprise, the minks were completely unafraid. Ha ha ha! Yourself! And quickly as a flash, they put their plan to work. Alley up! If they had been human, it might be said that they formed a human chain from which the top mink was able to grasp the branch of a tree and nimbly flip them up out of the fox's reach. Ta -ta! Well, now, their plan had worked perfectly, and it certainly seemed that their worries were over. Time after time, the fox tried to catch them, and time after time, they formed the chain to swing to the safety of the trees. Oh, drat! There is nothing worse than sneaky minks, unless it's a sneaky fox. They had managed to foil the fox at every turn, and once again, they were very, very happy. That is, until one day. I'm happy. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. You happy? <sighs> No, I'm tired. Tired? What for? From holding you guys up. Why do I always have to be on the bottom? What's the matter with you? Stop complaining! But, but, but... Just then, the fox appeared again, right on cue. Ha-ha! <laughs> and the minks were forced to quickly leap into action. alley up Oop! 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 But being bottom mink, time and again, had taken his toll on the bottom mink. Now much too weak to support his comrades, he fell, tumbling them all to the ground, where the fox was quick to seize them, flop them into a bag, and trot happily off for the nearest fur factory. Happy, 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 happy. So you can see, Junior, as long as the minks worked together by forming their chain, they were safe. Is that clear now? Yes, sir, Papa. I now see that without a doubt, a chain is only as strong as its weakest mink. But what's that got to do with apples? Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. Hello, you poetry and snow lovers. Today's poem begins this here way. Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. That horse knows the way? Sure. To grandma's, please, and don't spare the horse. See what I mean? Over the river and through the wood. Oh, how the snow... You sure he knows the way? Of course, Rock. Looky there. Over the river and through the woods, now grandmother's cap I spy. Hoorah for the fun. Is the pudding done? Hoorah for the pumpkin pie. Hey, you don't look like no grandma to me. You're no red riding hood yourself, Jack. Bullwinkle, are you sure this is the right house? Oh, it's the right house. It's just the wrong story. Well, how is that possible? Easy. It's a two-story house. And now... Hey, Rocky, 
Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? But the nut must leave. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Hello out there, Peabody, Sherman, and way back here. Uh, Sherman, tell the folks what Marconi invented. Marconi invented spaghetti. You are confusing Marconi with macaroni, my boy. <clears throat> be that as it may, set the way back for Venice, Italy in the year 1896. For today, we shall be on hand when Guglielmo Marconi produces the first successful radio. What's radio, Mr. Peabody? Never mind, get into the way back. One second later, we were standing inside Marconi's lab, and there, before his invention, stood the great man. Stand back, please. I'm going to turn on a juice. The juice was turned on, and so was Marconi. Are you all right, Mr. Marconi? See, si, just a little shock, that's all. Does your radio always short out on you that way? No, most of the time, it go out right in the middle of Arthur Godfrey. I don't know what's the matter. I bet Mr. Peabody can help. With Marconi's permission, I proceeded to inspect his wiring. I knew I'd found the source of the trouble when I discovered the wires leading into a Venice canal. You mean to say I'm a knocking string of wire underwater? Exactly. Then I'm a giving up inventing the radio. I'm gonna try television. I'm afraid the results would be the same. Look, if we can drain the canals for one day, could you finish your invention, then work on it elsewhere, say, in Florence? Sure! Sherman and I went to the executive offices of the Venice Canal Boat Company, owned and operated by a gentleman named Giuseppe Pasto. Drain of the canals? That's ridiculous. But, Mr. Pasto, Marconi must invent the radio. And he can only do it if the water is out of the canals. That's a, he's a tough luck. What now, Mr. Peabody? Come, my boy, there's more than one way to skin a canal. At the far end of the city was a large dam used for draining off the surplus canal water. You see that wheel directly in back of that guard, Sherman? Well, if we can turn that wheel, the canal will drain completely. But how are we gonna do it? There's a guard. We won't do it. The guard will. <clears throat> how do you do, sir? I'm from the Venice Motor Vehicle Bureau. That's a nice. We have a driver's license for you, if you can pass the test. The what test are you talking about? The left-hand turn. If you can show us how you make a left-hand turn, you get your license. That's easy. This is steering a wheel, right? Right. Well, I'm gonna throw out my left hand out of the window like it is. Go on. And then all I gotta do is a turn of the car like it is. You did it, Mr. Peabody. The canals are dry. Quickly, Sherman, we must get Marconi to finish the radio. The rest of that night, Marconi slaved over his invention, desperately striving to complete it in time. Well, that's it. Is it finished? Sure. The brilliant inventor turned the juice on just as he did when we first saw him. It shorted out again. Senor Marconi, are you all right? I think so. But how about that radio? What could be wrong? Again, I traced the wires, and to my surprise, they were in the canal. A water-filled canal. But we drained it. True, but we didn't drain the sky. Huh? It rained last night, Sherman. There was nothing else to do but return to the dam and try to trick the guard once more. Unfortunately, not only had the guards doubled, but they were under the personal supervision of Giuseppe Pasto. Keep your eyes open. If anyone is a touch of daddy wheel, he's a chicken is going to be catch it or it. Uh, pardon me, Senor Pasto, but we're from the Venice Motor Vehicle Bureau. Oh, no, you don't. I already got it, my license. But I'm not here to give you your license, Senor Pasto, but to take it away. What? According to the Bureau, you made an illegal U-turn yesterday. That's not true. Can you prove it? Sure. I was uh, behind the wheel, see? And I was on a one-way street. I'm a lookout of both ways. Street, she's uh, got no one on it. I see. Then what did you do? I make a U-turn. Show us. Oh, no. You think I'm a fool? Uh, you trying to make me turn uh, this wheel. Turn the wheel? Sure. You expecting uh, me to spin uh, the wheel like this? Come, Sherman, back to Marconi. Oh, mamma mia, what a dope. There it is, Senor Peabody, the radio. She's all set. Arrivederci. Well, you did it, Mr. Peabody. But I can't help feeling sorry for Mr. Pasto. Oh, don't feel sorry for him, Sherman. He's going into the salad business, and he's going to make a fortune. 
In fact, he's naming the salad after his aunt. Oh, really? What's he calling it? You really don't know, Sherman? No, sir. Antipasto? Some people have all the luck. Unfortunately, however, Bullwinkle is not a people, and lucky he's not. Being the only witness to a crime committed by the deadly underworld kingpin, Finger Scarnos, Bullwinkle has the dangerous duty of testifying against him. The fact that the moose is going to talk has made him the talk of the town. Tell us, moose, are you really going to testify against Finger Scarnos? Will you I... bet he is. You know what has happened to witnesses in the past, don't you? Will I... That won't stop, Bullwinkle. Aren't you afraid? Will I... Of course not. You're not afraid, are you, Bullwinkle? Not on your life. There's not a cowardly bone in my body. Of course, there's a lot of cowardly moose meat covering those brave bones. Yes, for the moment, there is a real live witness against Finger Scarnos. This is what the DA's office has been waiting for. Gentlemen, with the moose's testimony, we can send Scarnos and his gang to prison for 90 or 100 years. Maybe even life. Are you sure? Word has it that the moose is somewhat on the stupid side. I understand that if you ask him what his RQ is, he says 2020. That makes no difference. All we need from the moose is two things. One, that he testify. And second? That he stays alive long enough to testify. You mugs all know why we are here? Right. You all know that the moose is gonna snitch on me? Right. You all know that if I go up the river, I squeal and take you guys with me? Right. All right. Then will it be a hit or a miss? A, a hit. hit. Okay. I want that moose hit and hit hard. The hit was on. Next in the order of business was to find an out-of-town torpedo, a killer, someone to do the job. Scarnos himself placed a call to the torpedoes union. Hello? Let me talk to hands. Not there? Then let me talk to nails. Gone too, huh? How about feet? Ears? Elbows? Knees? Legs? Belly button? What the hey, isn't anybody there? Why is it you can never find a torpedo when you want one? You called? Who are you? Boris Bedinov at your service. Are you a torpedo? <laughs> Am I a torpedo? <laughs> Tell him, Honeybun. He is a torpedo. Can you get the moose? Uh, can I get the moose? <laughs> Tell him, Natasha. He can get the moose. See? I will kill moose until he's dead for free because you are my hero, Finger Scarnos, big boy. Okay, the job is yours, but you better not miss. Rest easy, boss baby. Moose is practically a memory right now. <laughs> Here we are, Dalek. Now what is plan to kill Moose? Doesn't witches disguise in basket apples give you a hint? Boris, you are going to pull Snow White caper on Moose? Good girl. Only I don't got old-fashioned poison apple. I got apple with bomb inside that will blow Moose to bits. Pure genius, Dalek. Here goes, Natasha. Stand back so you don't get pieces of blown-up Moose all over you. The postman always rings twice, so that must be he. Hey, you're not the postman. You were a sweet little old ugly lady. Hello, Moose. You like to buy apple? Buy apple? Yes, I'm trying to earn enough to send my mother-in-law to summer school. Only a nickel. Wait a minute. This apple has a worm in it. That's not a worm, that's a fuse. Oh, in that case, I'll take it. Here's your nickel. Fire in the hole, head for the hills. Will Bullwinkle really eat that loaded apple? Pity sakes, that's what I bought it for. Be sure to see our next episode entitled Doing the Big Apple or May I Have the Next Dance? <laughs> Our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. Right. Bye now. 
See you next time. Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Unfortunately, Bullwinkle is the only living moose who can testify against the notorious Finger Scarnos. But Boris Badenov has been hired to correct that. Right, to correct the part about moose living, that is. <laughs> and last time, you'll remember, it looked as though Boris was about to succeed in doing just that. He had come to the house disguised as an old witch selling apples. And this apple for moose is loaded. It's got big bomb inside. How about it, big boy? You want to buy apple for Nico? Are you sure this isn't a worm in the apple? I told you before, that's not worm, that's the fuse. Convinced that it wasn't a worm, Bullwinkle took the apple as Boris and Natasha dashed for cover in a nearby alley. Hurry, honey bun. We will hide in garbage can so that we won't get hurt by flying pieces of moose. Hey, what have you got there, Bullwinkle? An apple. Hold it, there's a worm in it. Oh, that's not a worm. The sweet little old ugly lady in the witch's disguise that sold it to me said it is a fuse. Oh, lady, fuse. Could be a worm, though. I can hear his little heart going tick, 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 tick. Hokey smoke, it's a bomb. Quick as a flash, the plucky squirrel plucked the apple away from Bullwinkle and shot out of the window. <laughs> Soaring high into the air, Rocky desperately searched for a place to get rid of the deadly explosive. Gosh, it sounds like it's getting ready to go off. I'll drop it into that garbage can in the alley where it can explode without doing any harm. Bombs away! Oh, boy. 50 million garbage cans in city and squirrel drops bomb into ours. The odds against a thing like that must be fantastic, darling. Wasting no time, our heroes decided to throw Finger Scarnos off the track. They boarded a train and sped south for two hours. Then transferring to a bus, they doubled back and traveled north for an hour and a half. Leaving the bus, they paddled a canoe due east up a creek until noon. Then setting out on foot, they fought their way west through the back country. <sighs> Do you think we've lost Finger Scarnos, Bullwinkle? I don't know, but you certainly threw me off the track. Where are we? Way out in the country. I could tell that by the stickers in my socks. Let's sit down and rest. No, not yet, Bullwinkle. You gotta hide where nobody will ever think to look for you. And I know just the place. Where's that? A mink farm. A mink farm? That little squirrel really knew what he was talking about, for who would ever think to look for a moose on a mink farm? So you fellas desire to work mink, eh? Yes, sir. All right, I'll give you $40 a week and all you can eat. The $40 a week sounds fine, but I don't desire to eat any minks if it's all the same to you. Knowing that Bullwinkle would now be safe until after the trial, Rocky and Bullwinkle went to work. For the next two weeks, they mended mink pens, rounded up stray minks, mixed mink meal, and even sat up nights with a mink who had an infected ear. Everything went along smoothly until the very day Bullwinkle was to testify, when... In just a few hours, you can testify against Scar Nose and it'll be all over, Bullwinkle. Then we can... Hey, what was that? I don't know. 
Pokey Smoke, Bullwinkle. It must be Figure Scar knows his men. You've got to hide so they won't find you. Hide where? Get into this empty mink pen and act like a mink. Uh, what does a mink act like? Well, you should know by now. Just jump up and down and squeak and look expensive. With Bullwinkle in the mink pen, acting like a mink, Rocky ran for the barn where he sought cover in a mink meal barrel just as Boris arrived on the scene. Will Bullwinkle's mink act full, Boris? Or will the slight difference between a mink and a moose give him away? Be sure to watch next time for the act is over, or the big mink is the fink. Once upon a time, there was a very ordinary kingdom full of very ordinary people. They were so ordinary that they would have found life very dull indeed if it weren't for just one extraordinary girl named Beauty. Oh, I spread a little sunshine on my way to make you blithe and bunny all day. She was so lovely and gay that when ordinary people saw her, they didn't feel quite so ordinary. Oh, I spread a little sunshine on my way. I do the best I can to make you gay. I'm always juggling flowers to and fro to bring a little sunshine where I go. This extraordinary girl danced and bounced about so that people called her Leaping Beauty. Then one day, while she was sprinkling flowers and sunshine like crazy, a terrible thing happened. Oh, my toe! Oh, sorry. You and your sprinkling. Do you know the penalty for stomping on a witch's toe? You mean that silly bit about putting me to sleep? That tired poison apple and all that? Yes. But you know how that always turns out. How? Everybody lives happily ever after. Yeah, that's right. Then why don't you broom out of here? Oh, oh, oh but this witch was a smart witch. And she soon got an idea. <laughs> oh, this is a Lulu. Instead of my putting you to sleep... You're going to put other people to sleep. You mean no apple? No. I'm going to invent boredom. Boredom? Never heard of it. Of course not. I hadn't invented it yet. But watch. From my magic medium, come on we and tedium. Dreary, dreary, dull and bleary, beauty's voice will make them weary. Ordinary people sleep, for beauty now is just a creep. <laughs> You know I just have to be kissed by a prince to break the spell. But nobody's going to kiss you, dearie, for you are now a boar, a crashing boar. After the witch was gone, Beauty quickly looked in the mirror. I don't look like a boar. No, nothing had changed except maybe her voice, for she now found she couldn't stop talking. Oh, look at you, you pretty, pretty thing. You haven't changed a tiny bit. <laughs> Love that girl. But she wasn't really the same at all. Look at me, you'll oh, look at me. I'm as lovely as can be. I'm as pretty as a picture, too. Lucky, lucky, lucky you! And ordinary people did get bored. Oh, how nice that you can see. Lovely, gorgeous little me. I should charge admission, though. I'm so cute from head to toe. And they did fall asleep. Oh, my God. Goodness, the Wicked Witch did it. I'm a boar, a dreadful, crashing, sleep-making boar. And I can't do anything about it. Yes, it was true. Beauty had bored all the ordinary people in the kingdom into a deep, deep sleep. All except the king and his prime minister. For we all know that kings and prime ministers are not ordinary people. Otherwise, how would they get to be kings and prime ministers? Look at those ordinary people, Ponsonby. They're all asleep. No, Majesty, they're just bored stiff. Who has done such a thing? A girl called Beauty. Oh, no, she is such a bore. If she's a bore, banish her to the forest with the other boars. But, but she's not quite that kind of bore. Don't tell me what a bore is. To the forest with her. So Beauty was banished to the deepest deep of the deep green forest with all the other boars. Fortunately, at that very moment, Prince Charming happened to be boar hunting in the forest. The prince, whose kiss could break the spell. He'll never make it. <laughs> Watch. Oh, you most extraordinary girl. Why are you crying? 
because you're standing on my foot. Oh, sorry about that. As if I didn't have enough trouble already. I'm a bore, you know, a terrible bore. I'm such a bore, I put an entire kingdom to sleep and all because I'm cursed with this, this fatal beauty. Oh, you don't know what it is to be so lovely and gorgeous and... Oh, dear, I've done it again. Yes. The prince was so bored that he'd gone to sleep standing up. Poor man. The least I can do is make him comfortable. It must be terrible to sleep standing up. Little did Beauty know that a real boar with tusks was right behind the prince. Yike! You kissed me! Yes, a bit of all right, what? And you, you know, I, I don't feel a bit bored. And I... Yes? Uh, I can't think of a thing to say. Oh, good. Yes, the spell was broken, the witch was beaten, and so Beauty and the prince lived happily ever after. All the ordinary people in the kingdom woke up, and they lived happily ever after, too. Which, as any ordinary person will tell you, is really quite extraordinary. discuss how to fix a flat and retire your car. Most people will go a long way to avoid fixing a flat, to a service station even. There is more than one way to handle this unpleasant chore. For example, the Bullwinkle Van Moose method. Oh, drat. Now I'll have to use the spare car, that is. However, the wise motorist knows how to change a tire. This is a simple operation, and a reasonably intelligent 12-year-old can do the job. But since I don't see one, I'll have to take a crack at it myself. At this point, I'd like to demonstrate the first thing the motorist does when he has a blowout. He places the jack under the bumper, like so, and with an easy pumping motion, he raises the wheels off the ground. Well, if we can't raise the wheels, the only thing to do is lower the ground. We take off the hubcap, loosen the wheel nuts, and put them in the hubcap so we don't lose them. Only trouble is, I keep losing the hubcap. Now, we take the spare out of the trunk. What's the matter, Bullwinkle? No spare? Oh, there's a spare, all right, Rock. Problem is, it's a spare flat. What does the motorist do in a situation like this, Bullwinkle? I think that's obvious, Rock. He becomes a pedestrian. Well, you can't get a flat tire that way. No, just flat feet is all. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up must leave. Presto! Uh, wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Dudley Durrett of the Royal Canadian Mounties was feeling fit as a fiddle and ready for love. I'm feeling fit as a fiddle and ready for love, Nell. <laughs> you look terrible. What's that, Nell? I said you look terrible. Your posture's all slumped, your eyes have lost their sparkle, and your complexion is bad. Frankly, Dudley, you look kind of puny. Puny? But, Nell, I'm in the best of shape. Otherwise, what would I be doing in the Mounties? Puny, puny, puny. Here, I'll prove it to you. Let's arm wrestle. Oh, no, that's just being silly. You know you're no match for a Mountie. Just put your muscle where your mouth is, Dudley. Two out of three, no? I saw that, Dudley. I'm not going to have a Mountie of mine lose an arm wrestling contest with a mere slip of a girl. But, Inspector, you look terrible. But look at that posture. Dudley, you go and build yourself up and don't come back until you learn to stand up straight. It wasn't just coincidence that prompted Snidely Whiplash to open his Vic Whiplash gym. It was money. And knowing that Dudley Do-Right wanted to build himself up, who better than Snidely Whiplash could help Dudley Do-Right build himself down 
I'd like to enroll in your gym. Fine, fine. Now, the swimming pool is over there, bowling alley's over there. We have ice skating, rink, golf course, pool hall, bingo room, shooting gallery, race. I, I, I was thinking of a couple of dumbbells and maybe some sitting up exercises, you know. Do you have a gym? Follow me. There. Where are the dumbbells? Oh, that's old-fashioned. Nobody uses dumbbells anymore. All exercise is done by machines. Actually, you don't have to do a thing. The machines will do it all. So Dudley do right. Took the Vic Whiplash six-month course, and sure enough, upon completing the course, Dudley had built himself down. What happened to you, Dudley? You look terrible. What has happened now is that I have completed the Vic Whiplash bodybuilding course, and I'm as strong as an ox. Let's arm wrestle. Dudley, you have been cheated. Snidely Whiplash has not built you up. He has built you down. Goodbye, Nell. I'm leaving the Mounties. There is no place for a chicken-hearted, puny man. But what will you do? How will you live? I guess I'll just have to take a civilian job. Maybe someone has use for a puny man like me. Good luck, Dudley. Oh, 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 don't squeeze so hard already. Oh, you did that on purpose, Nell. So Dudley Durright was forced to look for a job. For weeks, he was turned down because... You're too puny. Sorry we don't hire puny people here. You're so puny. Such a puny. Then I don't get the job? He, I never saw such a puny. Then all at once, Dudley's luck changed. Dudley Do-Right, eh? All right, Do-Right, the job's yours. You know our quota, 20 trees a day. Think you can handle it? Oh, yes, sir. When Dudley was finally able to get the axe off the ground, he started to work with enthusiasm. And in four weeks' time, Dudley's muscles turned to steel. Dudley Do-Right was building himself up. Timber! Why, you're as strong as an ox! No, ma'am, I'm puny. But Dudley didn't realize that he was building himself up. He still thought of himself as puny. Then one day, by mere accident, Dudley happened to run into Nell Fenwick. Don't touch me, you brute. Just because you have all those muscles, don't think you can have your way with a girl like me. Why, Dudley, is that you? Yes, Dudley do write your faithful puny friend. Look out! It's a runaway horse! Run for your lives! I know I did the right thing when I left the RCMP, because there's no room for a puny Mountie in the RCMP. Dudley, you lifted that horse up with one hand. No puny man could do that. You don't have to put me on. I've learned to live with the fact that I am puny. Some people are just puny. Dudley, do right. You are not puny. If I could only believe you know. Dudley, it is all in your mind. Just keep saying, I am not puny. I am not puny. Then then you can get your money back from Snidely Whiplash. I'm not puny. 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 It's good to have you back, Dudley. I can't for the life of me think why I thought you were puny. It's understandable, sir. It all started when Nell and I were arm wrestling like this. Here, you see, we both gripped hands and... I saw that, Dudley. I'm not puny. I'm not puny. I'm not puny. Realizing that Boris had been hired to kill Moose so that he would be unable to testify against Finger Scarnos, Rocky knew that he must hide Bullwinkle where he would be absolutely safe until after the trial. You want me to hide on a horse, Rock? Mink farm. I was afraid that's what you said. Knowing a mink farm would be the last place anybody would ever think to look for a moose, our heroes signed on as mink hands at a local minkery. Everything went well until the very day of the trial when Boris and Natasha arrived at the farm. Hokey smoke! Bullwinkle, we gotta hide you! Shoving Bullwinkle into an empty mink pen, Rocky instructed him to act like a mink. Squeak, 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 squeak! Oh, squeak! Hiding in a mink meal barrel, Rocky waited in the darkness for two hours. Then, when all seemed quiet... They must be gone! Phew, that was a close one! But returning to the mink pen, he found that Bullwinkle was also gone. The mink pen is empty! What happened to Bullwinkle? Who's that? Why is this pen empty? Why, well, I sold the mink that was in it. Biggest son of a gun I ever saw. We put up quite a fight, too, but we finally got him into the sack. You... you sold him? Yep, to a little foreign feller in a black suit. Oh, no! Knowing
knowing that every second counted, Rocky flashed into the air and followed the tire tracks left by Burris's car in the road below. Before long, he found the car parked at a deserted sawmill and swooped down for a look through the window. Well, honey bun, at last I will keep Moose from testifying against my hero, Finger Skarnos. And you will get Moose Skin Babushka out of the deal at the same time. <laughs> oh, you are such a thoughtful little stinker, Boris, darling. Hokey smoke! Bowwinkle is due to testify right now! How will I ever save him and get him there in time? Time was rapidly running out, and with Bowwinkle only inches away from the cruel saw, Rocky struck upon a bold plan. Sneaking to the phone in the sawmill office, he placed a call. Hello, electric company! This is the sawmill calling. I just thought I'd tell you that I can't pay my electric bill. Everybody knows that when you don't pay your bill, they cut off your electricity. Hey, what happened to the electricity? Maybe we blew a fuse, darling. Come on, we fixed it so we can get back to cutting up moose. Rocky, baby, your timing is perfect. Never mind that. We gotta get you to that trial to testify. Right, let's go. Wait, there's one more thing I gotta do first. Stopping by the phone, Rocky made another call to the electric company. Electric company, this is the sawmill again. I just found out that I can pay my bill after all. Watch, Natasha. Here is a trick I learned in the army. You put penny in fuse box and you get the results right away. Please, Boris, this is no time to be showing off. With Boris busy elsewhere, Rocky and Bowickle set off on a dead run for the courthouse. But could they make it in time? Order! Order in the court. Please, Your Honor, can't we wait just a few more minutes? I'm afraid not. Since there is no witness to testify, I'll have to find Finger Scarnose, not... Wait! Who are you? I am the Mooseness. He means witness, Your Honor. Yes, and I am here to testify. He done it. Extra, extra, Moose's hero, Scarnose and gang go to pokey. Read all about it. Yay! You did it, Bullwinkle. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of me, too, for living through the whole thing. And what about the viewers? We're proud of them, too, for living through the whole thing. Don't miss our next adventures of Rocket Chase World and Bullwinkle Moose. <laughs> Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm, mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. <laughs> Jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bowwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell.
Our story opens today on the campus of a large Minnesota college, the University of Wasamata. Inside the administration building, an important meeting is taking place. I don't want to alarm you, gentlemen, but it looks like disaster for what's the matter, you. Well, it's what's a disaster? Mean, what do you mean? What could disaster? What did he say? The Chancellor said we're facing disaster. Seeing what? Disaster. I don't know the words. How about Camp Town races instead? Ah, uh, gentlemen, unless we do something quickly, we will meet our doom. What did he say? Doom, doom, doom. The camp town lady sing this song. Do da, do da. Please, this is no time for levity. Our enrollment has dropped 80%. Our buildings are crumbling away. And what's even worse? Yes, yes, yes. yes. They're taking the Coke machine out of the faculty lounge. Oh, horror. But why, why? The answer is simple, gentlemen. What does every successful university have that we don't have? Well-heeled alumni? Electric lights? The address of the Ford Foundation? No, a successful football team. Do we even have a football team? Yes, Wasamata U did have a team of sorts, but it hadn't scored a goal in 22 years. And it's time we did. Oh, I don't know. Seems a shame to spoil a perfect record like that. But Coach Rocky Canute had something to say about that. I move we get the best football team money can buy. Here, here. But how will we pay for it? How else? We'll fire a few English teachers. Yeah, who needs them? We all speak English already. Some of us do, anyway. Uh, you incinerating that I'm dumb? That you what? Dumb, dumb, dumb. Going to run all night, going to run all day. And so it was settled. Five professors were sacked and five football scouts were hired. All right, you guys, I want you to scour the city, comb the countryside, and especially beat the bushes. Why beat the bushes? The kind of fellas we want are probably living in them. Now, go on. The scouts sought high and low for candidates for football glory. They poked into every nook and cranny in the state. A couple of them even went further than that. They got completely lost and, as a result, wound up in Frostbite Falls, where, as fate would have it, Rocket Squirrel chose that moment to say... Gosh, Bullwinkle, I'm making a salami souffle and I'm all out of wiffle powder. Dad, this is fraught with portent. What's fraught with portent? This picture, see? There's Eddie Frost and George Portent. My fellers. Bullwinkle, I gotta get down to the store and back before the salami souffle flops. Stop snuffling and speak up. Well, give me a hand, Bullwinkle. Delighted. Hurry! Oop! And propelled by mighty moose muscle, Rocky Flash clear to town into the grocery store and back before you can say Jack Robinson. Jack Robinson! Here I am! By golly, I couldn't do that. Of course, all this hadn't gone unnoticed. You know what this means, Chauncey? Certainly, a fluffy souffle. No, it means we found the football sensation of the year. I think he's too furry for a football. And the tail. Not the squirrel, the moose. He's the wrong shape for a football. But he's the right shape for a passer. Come on. And the two scouts dashed into Bullwinkle, pen in hand. Sign here, fella. It's a college scholarship. A scholarship. a scholarship? Certainly. I can see it at a glance. You're brainy. Yeah. You're intelligent. Yeah. You're brilliant. Yeah. Then why don't you sign? I forget how to make a B. Well, maybe he'll remember next time in A College for Two or Rock in Rolls. <laughs> Doggone it, will you never learn? What are you trying to do, Junior? I'm trying to teach Spartacus how to juggle fruit, but he keeps dropping the watermelon. And he'll continue to drop it. You know the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I can't teach him an old trick. That's beside the point, my boy. Now you take the fable of the fox and the hound. Not too many years ago, a fox named Murgatroyd Cornelius Applefinger, or MCA, went out to Hollywood and opened a theatrical agency. Hello, hello, CB. Uh, MCA here. Uh, say, CB, I understand you're making a whale of a picture called Moby Richard, and uh, you need a whale. Uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you, CB, let me tell you. Uh, sure, I got one. And he sings. Yes, the whale could sing all right, but he couldn't swim. Daryl, Daryl, baby, it's MCA here. Look, look, sweetie, according to the trades, I see you casting for the lead in King Kong. Uh, you need a gorilla. 
Uh, let's let's not monkey around, Darrell. I got just the one for you. And and he dances, just like Ruby Keeler. True, he could dance all right, but he couldn't stand high places. Hello, Dory, baby. MCA here. Uh, look, Lolly just called. She tells me you're making an airplane picture called The Fly and the Mighty. Uh, wonderful, sweetie. Guess what I got? Y yeah. What'd you guess? And he plays the drums. Yeah, he could play the drums for the best of them, but he couldn't fly an airplane. And with 10% of nothing coming in, MCA was forced into giving up his luxurious suite of offices. And now, hungry and destitute, he wandered the streets of the sprawling city. The lights of the theater marquees cut deeply. He was no longer a part of the thing he loved. His only thought now was to end it all and go to the low section of the big movie show in the sky. Taking the coward's way out, he took the road to the river and stood at the very brink of Pier 17. And that's when he first heard the sound that was to change his life. Say, that sounds like somebody sleeping on the river. Not on the river, over the river. As he watched, the dog drifted into shore until he was directly overhead. Hey, dog. Doggy baby. Hey, doggy doll. You know what you're doing? Wake up! Uh, hi? What are you, some kind of nut or something? You can't fly, you're a dog. Uh, well, some folks, you know, walk in their sleep. I fly in my sleep, so sue me. MCA knew a good thing when he saw it. A dog that flew would set Hollywood on its ears. Hello, hello, CB. CB, MCA here. Uh, 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 yeah, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it, CB. Yeah, yeah, I know he sank. I saw the picture, remember? I, I understand you're making devil dogs of the air. No, no, now look, I don't got an Airedale. I got a devil of a dog that really flies. You certain? This isn't another one of your fly-by-night tricks, MCA? So help me, Selznick. This dog is a real sleeper. Okay. Have him take this bomb, fly over the field, and drop it on that hangar. Uh, right, right, CB. Okay, Rover. rock a bye doggy in the treetop. The director and the crew had never seen anything like it. The dog rose into the air, and at an altitude of 1,000 feet, did a perfect Immelman and dropped the bomb. There, there. What did I tell you, CB? Amazing, colossal. Of course, uh, he needs a little target practice. You mean he didn't hit the hangar? No, he wiped out Beverly Hills. Who happened to be the leading lady. But they signed up another one, and the next morning they also signed up the dog to a 99-year contract. Production began on Devil Dogs of the Air, and he was destined for stardom. The script called for power dives, strafing trains, diving under bridges and crash landings, and Freddy was superb through all of it. Well, well, CB, what do you say? Great, 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 great? No doubt of it. We got a winner. All we got to shoot is the final love scene. Have Freddy on the set at six in the morning. And that's when the trouble began, because six in the morning is pretty early, and Freddy needed his shut eye. What's with Freddy? How can he do a love scene when he's sound asleep? Oh, no, 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 nothing, nothing, Steve. I'll, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. Come on, Freddy. Up, up, boy, up, up. And Freddy did go up into the air. This posed a problem, for without the love scene, the picture was worthless. Might just as well tear up his contract. No, 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 CB, uh, l l don't, don't be hasty, baby. Don't, uh, wait, I'll, I'll wake him up, I'll wake him. But no matter what he tried, the dog slept and flew on. Finally, in desperation, Freddy was chained to the floor of the huge sound stage, but alas, that didn't work either. The entire cast and crew of Devil Dogs of the Air rose to unbelievable heights and were never seen or heard from again. So you see, Junior, you just can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's not a bad moral, Pop, but I got a better one. Oh, you are not going to say... Yep, let sleeping dogs fly. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. And now, here's that wizard of the financial world with his two cents worth. Hello there. Today our subject is how to be a top flight stock salesman. Well, I see here conditions look very favorable for a upturn for Amalgamated Railroad. Okay, I buy it. But before I can safely recommend it, I owe it to my clients to inspect the equipment. Never mind, I'll buy it. Sir, I never sell a stock unless I am absolutely certain the value of the company is there. 
Not for every stock I can stand behind 100% amalgamated electronics. In fact, I can safely say this is the most attractive stock in electronics. What does it attract? Lightning. But wait kindly, sir. I can in good faith sell you amalgamated barrel stave at 10 cents a share. I'll buy it. Oh, wonderful. It's already up to 50 cents. A dollar, five dollars, 30. 250! It's split! 4,000! 50,000! 200,000! I'm rich! I'm rich! Whoops! <laughs> Back to five cents. Four. One. I'm sorry you're wiped out. You've lost everything you have. <laughs> well, only one thing to do. All these Wall Street traditions. Gee, Mr. Know-it-all, if one of your clients just jumped out the window of a tall building like this, how come you look so happy? I just remembered. Last week, I sold him amalgamated ambulance, and now it's sure to go up. Hello again, Peabody here. Sherman and I are on our way into the past, as usual, and today's journey should be an exciting one. What shall I set the way back for, Mr. Peabody? Date-wise, Sherman set it for July 14th, 1865. And the place? A steep peak in the Alps, 14,780 feet high. It is called the Matterhorn, and we shall be there when it is conquered by Lord Francis Douglas. It was a short journey, and a cold one. Before we could catch our breath, we were standing with Lord Douglas and his party in the town of Zermatt. Towering over us was the mighty Matterhorn. Oh, this infernal delay has worn my nerves to a frazzle. Are you ready to make your ascent, Lord Douglas? Have been, you know, since three this morning. Why are you waiting? Because no one has said go. You mean you and your men have been standing here all that time waiting for somebody to say go? Yes, I suppose that does sound a trifle odd to you. Sherman, do Lord Douglas a favor and say go. I'd be glad to, Mr. Peabody. <clears throat> go. Underway at last, the Douglas party lost no time in climbing. We followed their progress with a spyglass and were startled five minutes later to see they were already halfway up. That must be some kind of record. Yes, it would be, if it were Lord Douglas. Huh? Look again, Sherman. You'll see that Lord Douglas is in a race for those climbers halfway up for a party made up of Italians. How can you be sure? Look closely, my boy, and you'll see... I don't see anything different about them except their snowshoes. That's it, Sherman. Those snowshoes are pizzas. Suddenly, the door of our chalet burst open, and in stumbled one of Lord Douglas's guides. Lord Douglas is doomed! Before he could elaborate, the guide collapsed. What do you suppose he meant, Mr. Peabody? Only one way to find out, Sherman. We must scale the Matterhorn ourselves. Well, the climb was a simple one for Sherman and me, due to the fact that we lived in my penthouse apartment, you know. And for exercise, we would scorn the use of the elevator every so often and use the stairs. Well, we reached Lord Douglas's camp in no time at all. And I say we turn back. But you can't let the Italians beat us, old boy. It isn't the Italians, old man. It's the... It's what, Lord Douglas? The abdominal snowman. The who? A creature who inhabits snow-covered mountains, Sherman, and throws snowballs at people. My words were followed by a bombardment of the aforementioned objects. How the devil can I conquer the Matterhorn with a snowball in my face? Sherman, being all boy and a yard wide, was all for sending up a bombardment of his own. I had other ideas, though, and set the party to constructing three snowmen of our own. This sure is fun, Mr. Peabody. And a half hour later, we were rid of the abdominal snowman and free to resume the climb. For under my direction, we had erected a bridge game consisting of three snowmen, a table, a pack of cards, and four chairs. It wasn't long before our attacker joined the game. And if I knew bridge, this game would last a long time. By George, that was positively wizard. Onward! The ascent continued, and although no one voiced it out loud, each man harbored a fear the Italians would reach the summit first. Unfortunately, as we rounded a bend, we found the Italians had run into bad luck and were quitting. It's all his fault, the Luigi here. I'm a tell him once, I'm a tell him a thousand times. Last a hundred feet to the top, you gotta climb with rope. What does he bring? A spaghetti. And the meatballs. 
We'd give you some of our opal, boy, but we don't have any. I guess we can't get to the top either. Oh, that's it, too bad. Tell you what, you can have a nice dish of hot spaghetti. The spaghetti gave me an idea. I promptly tied the ends together and doused the whole thing in snow. The spaghetti hardened and was as good as the strongest rope, if not better. Lord Douglas, Sherman, and I were the only ones willing to scale the summit with spaghetti, and so while the others watched, we made a final assault. The spaghetti held up, and it wasn't long before the three of us were standing on the top of the Matterhorn. Warmed by the climb, Lord Douglas removed his fur parka and hung it over a scrawny tree. I'll give you three guesses, Sherman, as to what type of tree that is. Pine? No. Oak? No. I give up, Mr. Peabody. What kind of tree is it? <laughs> My boy, that is a Douglas fir. Last time you remember, the trustees of Wasamata U were wondering how to keep their college from going bankrupt. How about giving an honorary degree to Daddy Warbucks? You nanny, he's only a make-believe character. We're real? In the end, of course, they followed the lead of so many other colleges, they decided to get a winning football team. As a result, two scouts are trying to sign a Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle, you know who these fellas are? Pick and Pat? No. Gallagher and Sheen? No. Null and Void? Fair and Wormy? No, they're scouts. If they're scouts, let's see them rub two sticks together. They're football scouts. Then let's see them rub two footballs together. Let's check the little old rule book, Edgar. Uh-oh. Trouble? Says here we can enroll anybody except a moose. Let me see that. Oh, Chauncey, that doesn't say moose. No. That's mouse. Hot diggity! Come on, sign. Okay. X. Bullwinkle, you know how to spell your name. Yeah, but I don't want to look like a show-off. That's Humble, not... that's me. Yeah, but... Mr. Modesty. But... When it comes to humility, I'm the greatest. So I see. And so it came to pass that a few days later, Bullwinkle Moose arrived on the campus of What's the Matter You? It's like a beautiful dream, Rock. There must be a catch in it somewhere. You sure you got everything, Bullwinkle? Well, I see. I'm wearing my bell-bottom trousers and three-tone shoes. Yeah. I got my ukulele and my hair stick em. Uh-huh. Do you have your textbooks? Don't bother me with details, Rock. Mr. Moose, I'm your counselor. Now, about your classes. I just wear them to read. No, no, your classes. I gotta go to classes? Of course. I told you there was a catch in it somewhere. Now, I'd suggest you take introduction to chemical kinetics, differential calculus, and the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. Take them? I can't even pronounce them. Boy, they sound tough. I'll never have time to play football. Oh, you're a football player? The frostbite falls flash. Want to see my clippings? From your last game? No, from my last haircut. It won't be necessary. You'll take the regular classes for an athletic scholarship. Which are? Personal grooming, crocheting, and reading modern classics. That last one sounds tough. What modern classic do I have to read? Dick and Jane at the seashore. Well, that's more like it. I'm afraid so. Well, how you making out, Flash? Just dandy fool, Mr. Scout. You know who this is? Of course. The Scoutmaster. No, this is our coach, Rocky Canute. Put it there, pal. Oh, thanks a mill. It was getting a mite heavy. Uh, maybe you better suit up, Moose. In a few moments, Bullwinkle was attired in his very own football uniform. Bullwinkle, you're barefoot. Yeah, I like to feel my toes grip the earth. Besides, they didn't have any size 22s. Well, let's see you throw one, Moose. Throw a game already? I haven't even started practicing yet. Not a game, a pass. Let's see you throw a forward pass. Okay. How's this? And Bullwinkle faded back, cocked his arm, and fired a forward pass that traveled... A miserable ten feet and fell to the ground. How's that, Coach? Coach? Gee, where'd he go? Over in a 
dead faint, that's where. Well, is this the end of Bullwinkle's sports career? Be sure to see our next episode, The Hidden Ball Play, or Goal is Where You Find It. Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.